Year's Best SF-14 Edited by David G. Hartwell and Catherine Kramer DB-70147 Copyright 2009 by David G. Hartwell and Catherine Kramer Read by Mary Kane This book contains 495 pages Approximate reading time, 17 hours, 30 minutes This book contains markers allowing direct access to the contents, introduction, and stories at level 1 and to the sections at level 2. Library of Congress Annotation 21 Science Fiction Short Stories Published in 2008 Includes Neil Gaiman's Orange Cory Doctorow's The Things That Make Me Weak and Strange Get Engineered Away Michael Swanwick's The Scarecrow's Boy Sue Burke's Spiders and More Strong Language, Some Violence, and Some Descriptions of Sex, 2009. From the Book Jacket Last year's Best Short Form SF, selected by acclaimed award-winning editors and anthologists, David G. Hartwell and Catherine Kramer, offers stunning new extrapolations on what awaits humankind beyond the next dawn. The art of the story is explored boldly and provocatively in this powerful new collection of year's best speculative fiction. About the Editors David G. Hartwell is currently a senior editor at Tor Forge Books. He is the proprietor of Dragon Press, publisher and bookseller, which publishes the New York Review of Science Fiction. He is the author of Age of Wonders and the editor of many anthologies, including The Dark Descent, Masterpieces of Fantasy and Enchantment, The World Treasury of Science Fiction, Northern Stars, The Ascent of Wonder, co-edited with Catherine Kramer, and a number of Christmas anthologies. In addition to editing 14 annual paperback volumes of Year's Best SF, he has also co-edited five volumes of Year's Best Fantasy. He has won the Eaton Award, the World Fantasy Award, and the Science Fiction Chronicle Poll, has been nominated for the Hugo Award 31 times to date and has won the Hugo for Best Editor. Catherine Kramer is a writer, anthologist, and housewife. She has won a World Fantasy Award for Best Anthology for The Architecture of Fear, co-edited with Peter Potts. She was nominated for a World Fantasy Award for her anthology, Walls of Fear. She has co-edited several anthologies with David G. Hartwell and now does the annual Year's Best SF with him. She is on the editorial board of the New York Review of Science Fiction and has been nominated for the Hugo Award 12 times. Her dark fantasy hypertext, In Small and Large Pieces, was published by Eastgate Systems Incorporated. Other books edited by David G. Hartwell Year's Best SF Year's Best SF2, Year's Best SF3, Year's Best SF4, Year's Best SF5, Year's Best SF6. Other books edited by David G. Hartwell and Catherine Kramer. Year's Best SF7, Year's Best SF8, Year's Best SF9, Year's Best SF10, Year's Best SF11, Year's Best SF12, Year's Best SF13, Year's Best SF-14 Year's Best Fantasy Year's Best Fantasy 2 Year's Best Fantasy 3 Year's Best Fantasy 4 Year's Best Fantasy 5 This year we dedicate this volume to Gordon Van Gelder, a stubborn and heroic figure in contemporary SF, who not only kept the magazine of fantasy and science fiction going for another year by dint of enormous effort, but made it, in our opinion, the best of the venues for science fiction in 2008. Acknowledgements This year, a number of anthologists were of particular help to us, including Jonathan Strahan, Ellen Datlow, Gardner R. Dezois, Lou Anders, Ian Waits, and Mike Allen, and together they led in making it a great year for short fiction. Contents Introduction Page Roman numeral 9, Carolyn Ives Gilman, Arkfall, page 1, Neil Gaiman, Orange, page 63, Kathleen Ann Goonan, Memory Dog, page 73, Paolo Bacigalupi, Pump 6, page 105, Elizabeth Bear and Sarah Manette, 
Bujum, page 144, Ted Chang, Exhalation, page 167, M. Rickert, Traitor, page 186, Cory Doctorow, The Things That Make Me Weak and Strange Get Engineered Away, page 201, Vandana Singh, Oblivion, A Journey, page 247, Robert Reed, The House Left Empty, page 273, Michael Swanwick, The Scarecrow's Boy, page 294, Ted Kosmatka, N-Words, page 304, Alistair Reynolds, Fury, page 321, Anne Hallam, Cheats, page 356, Jason Sanford, The Ships Like Clouds, Risen by Their Rain, page 377, Mary Rosenblum, The Eggman, page 400, Daryl Gregory, Glass, page 429, Jeff Vandermeer, Fixing Hanover, page 436, Rudy Rucker, Message Found in a Gravity Wave, page 454, Carl Schrader and Tobias S. Bacall, Mitigation, page 458, Sue Burke, Spiders, page 487, Introduction the year 2008 was the latest in a changing environment for SF. By the end of the year, one major publisher, formerly the largest in paperbacks, Bantam Books, had lost one of its SF editors and become merely an imprint of Valentine Books, who shortly thereafter let one of their SF editors go. The magazine of fantasy and science fiction had announced a change to bi-monthly publication, and Realms of Fantasy announced it would cease publication with the April 2009 issue. Analog and Asimov's had reduced their page counts and changed format slightly. Online magazine Helix had ceased publication and took its stories offline. And Tor.com had become the highest paying market for fiction for the present. Technically, Bain's Universe may pay a higher rate, but does so rarely. There were not a lot of ambitious new online SF ventures, and in the related genres, the venerable Datlow Grant Link, Year's Best Fantasy and Horror, ceased publication with the volume covering 2007. There was an economic collapse worldwide that continues into 2009 as we write, and a major change in the political life of the United States surrounding the 2008 presidential election and the coming change in administration with the election of Barack Obama. For people under age 40, this is probably the worst economic environment of their lives. Those of us who are older than that know how much worse it was on occasion in the 20th century and that it could get in the next few years and hope it will not. Basically, SF book publishing is being forced into a contraction by rising costs without rising sales, and it is likely that fewer books will be published in the genre by trade publishers, at least for a while, especially fewer in mass market paperback, which has lost most of its distribution system to a few concentrated giants that scorn all but the best-selling prospects. There is a collapse in advertising expenditures that affects the Internet as seriously as it affects print media and is driving some mainstream print media to the brink of bankruptcy. We will be interested to see what creative solutions Internet entrepreneurs come up with to generate income in the coming years. A lot of what has grown up in the last decade on the Internet depends on the free time of employed people, or the free time generated by a person with a job in the household, and maybe even some of the household discretionary spending. Some of that free time and money has just evaporated, along with trillions of dollars, from the national economies of the developed countries. So we look forward to creativity on a shoestring and more coffee all around. All that said, it was a fine year for the SF short story, a fine year for quality in the fiction magazines, and an especially excellent year for original anthologies. We are still enjoying a short fiction boom in science fiction and the associated genres of the fantastic, and there were few signs of a halt in 2008. Not an economic boom, no one is getting paid much, but certainly an increase in numbers, and it has been building for several years, and perhaps even growing the audience for short fiction, it appears, 
though an audience that might more readily purchase an anthology than a magazine subscription. The highest concentrations of excellence were still in the professional publications, regardless of their financial decline. The anthologies, from the large and small presses, and the highest paying online markets, though the small press zines and little magazines were significant contributors as well. We had immense riches to choose from for this book. We wish it could be twice as long this year, particularly. There was a notable bunch of really good anthologies of original fiction in the U.S. and U.K. U.S. entries include The Starry Rift, Eclipse 2, Fast Forward 2, Clockwork Phoenix, and nearly a dozen primarily fantasy anthologies that contained some SF. Australia and Canada each produced high spots. Jack Dan's Dreaming Again, and Claude Alumiere's Tesseract's Twelve. High points include Daryl Gregory's first novel, Pandemonium, and Paolo Bacigalupi's first collection, Pump Six and Other Stories, possibly the two most important first books in our field in 2008. We should probably single out Subterranean and P.S. as particularly distinguished small presses this year, with nightshade and small beer of equal quality to them, though with fewer titles. The ambitious UK publication Postscripts announced its evolution from a magazine into an anthology series. Three cool original anthologies from the UK you might otherwise miss are Celebrations, Myth Understandings, and Subterfuge, all edited by Ian Waits under the new Con imprint and all containing interesting selections of fantasy and SF. Among the magazines, fantasy and science fiction had a particularly good year. Interzone got darker, but had some real high spots. Asimov's and Analog got smaller, fewer pages per issue by the end of the year, and postscripts bigger, morphing into an anthology series. In the ether online, Subterranean switched from print to electronic, Orson Scott Card's Intergalactic Medicine Show, Strange Horizons, and Jim Bain's Universe persisted, and Lone Star Fiction, Eon, and Flurb continued and improved, in our opinion. The stories that follow show, and the story notes point out, the strengths of the evolving genre in the year 2008, and the dominant recurring themes and ideas. We like to point out interesting comparisons. This book is full of science fiction, Every story in this book is clearly that and not something else. We have a high regard for horror, fantasy, speculative fiction, and slipstream and postmodern literature. We, Catherine Kramer and David G. Hartwell, edit the year's best fantasy as well, a companion volume to this one. Look for it if you enjoy short fantasy fiction, too. But here we choose science fiction. It is our opinion that it is a good thing to have genre boundaries— if we didn't, young writers would have to find something else, perhaps less interesting, to transgress or attack to draw attention to themselves. We try in each volume of this series to represent the varieties of tones and voices and attitudes that keep the genre vigorous and responsive to the changing realities out of which it emerges in science and daily life. It is supposed to be fun to read, a special kind of fun you cannot find elsewhere. This is a book about what's going on now in SF, so we repeat, for readers new to this series, our usual disclaimer. This selection of science fiction stories represents the best that was published in the genre during the year 2008, and we believe that representing the best from year to year, while it is not physically possible to encompass it all in one even very large book, implies presenting a substantial variety of excellence and we left some worthy stories and talented writers out in order to include others in this limited space. We make a lot of additional comments about the writers and the stories and what's happening in SF in the individual introductions accompanying the stories in this book. Welcome to The Year's Best SF in 2008. Read on. David G. Hartwell and Catherine Kramer, Pleasantville, New York. Arkfall, Carolyn Ives Gilman. Carolyn Ives Gilman lives in St. Louis, Missouri, and is an internationally recognized historian specializing in North American history, particularly frontier and native history. 
Her most recent nonfiction book, Lewis and Clark Across the Divide, published in 2003 by Smithsonian Books, was featured by the History Book Club and Book of the Month Club. She is a curator of the Museum of the Missouri Historical Society and is currently writing a history of the American Revolution west of the Appalachians. She has published 17 or more SF stories since 1986 and one novel, Halfway Human, 1998, in the tradition of groundbreaking SF books that deal with gender. She can reasonably be considered as a writer to be among the descendants of Ursula K. Le Guin. Her most recent book, Aliens of the Heart, 2007, is a collection of short fiction from Aqueduct Press, and her novella, Candle in a Bottle, also appeared from Aqueduct Press in 2006. Arcfall appeared in Fantasy and Science Fiction, which published a particularly notable batch of science fiction in 2008. The Ark Cormoran is a bioship, a partly biological submarine habitat for humans, in the dark seas of a very alien planet being colonized. The humans on it have a communal life, with a detailed and plausible culture upon which their survival depends. And when an undersea volcano erupts disastrously, the rules and habits come into question in their quest to survive. 1. Golconda Station Normally, the liquid sky over Golconda was oblivion black, no motion, no beacons to clock the passage of time. But at arcfall, the abyss kindled briefly with drifting lights. From a distance, they looked like a rain of photisms, those false lights that swim in darkened eyes. First a mere smudge of light, then a globe, and finally a pockmarked little world floating toward the seafloor station. The arcs were coming home. From the luminous surface of the arc cormoran, Usagi felt the opacity that had oppressed her for months lifting. All around her, arcs floated like wayward thoughts, piercing the deep unconsciousness of the sea. The sight was worth having put on the wetsuit and squeezed out to sea. She was oblivious to the pressure of the deep water, having been born and bred to it. Even the chill, only a few degrees above freezing, seemed mild to her, warmed by the volcanic exhalations of the cleft of Golconda on the seafloor below. After months of drifting through the salty sea, the ark swarm had come for respite to the station of Golconda, the place where their rounds began and ended. Osaji's light-starved eyes, accustomed to seeing only the glowing surface of her own ark and any others that happened to be drifting nearby, savored the sense of space and scale that the glowing domes and refinery lights below her created. There was palpable distance here, an actual landscape. It would have looked hellish enough to other eyes. A chain of seafloor vents snaked along the valley floor, glowing in places with reddish rock heat. Downstream, black smokers belched out a filthy brew loaded with minerals from deep under the planet's gravity-tortured crust. Tall chimneys encased the older vents. Everywhere, the seafloor was covered with thick, mucky vegetation feeding on the dissolved nutrients. Fields of tube worms, blind white crabs, brine shrimp, clams, eels, seagrass, tiny translucent fish. The carefully nurtured ecosystem had been transported from far away Earth to this watery planet of Ben. To Osaji, the slimy brown jungle looked like the richest crop, the most fertile field, a welcoming abundance of life. Patient generations had created it. Beside her, a pore in the lipid membrane of the Ark released a jet of bubbles, making the vessel sink slowly toward the flood-lit harbor, where a dozen other Arks already clustered, docked to flexible tube chutes that radiated from the domes like glowing starfish arms. It was time for Osaji to go inside, but still she lingered. All her problems lay inside Cormoran's membrane, neatly packaged. Once she went inside, they would immerse her again. A voice sputtered over her ear radio. Will she be coming in soon? It was the Benite idiom, tentative, non-confrontational, but no less coercive for that. Osaji sighed, making her breather mask balloon out, and answered, she will be pleased, too. Pushing off, she dived downward past the equator of the arc's globe, gliding over its silvery surface. 
The top portion of the ark was filled with bladders of gas that controlled buoyancy and atmosphere, along with the tanks of bacteria and algae that processed seawater into usable components. Only at the bottom did the humans live, like little mitochondria, in their massive host. On the ark's underbelly, Osaji found a pore, tickled its edges till it expanded, then thrust her arms and head in, pulling herself through the soft, clinging lips of the opening. Inside, she shook the water off her short black hair and removed her face mask and fins. She was in a soft-walled, gently glowing tube, leading upward to the living quarters. As she walked, her feet bounced back from the rubbery floor. The quarters seemed brightly lit by the snaking vapor tubes on the ceiling. As soon as Osaji entered the bustling corridor, Dory's two children crowded around her, asking questions. Their mother peered out the aperture of her room and called to them. Is it polite to bother her when she has so much packing to do? The comment was really aimed at Osaji. Dory's family had left her in no doubt that she and her baggage would be leaving the Ark at Golconda. Osaji ran her finger along the sensitive lip of the aperture into her own small rooms, and the membrane retracted to let her through. The first cavity inside, where Osaji had lived for the last round, was stripped bare, all her belongings packed into sacks and duffels. She paused at the aperture to the adjoining vacuole and called out, Moda? Saji? came a thin voice from within. Osaji coaxed the membrane open and had to suppress a groan of dismay. Inside, a frail, white-haired woman sat amid a disorganized heap of belongings. She had not packed a thing since Osaji had left her. If anything, she had emptied out some of the duffels already packed. The old woman's mild face lit up. Thank goodness you're back. I was getting worried. Where did you go? Outside. I told you I was going outside. Did you? She was not contradicting, just commenting. No argument or reproach ever came from Mota. She was the sweetest-tempered aged on the planet. It sometimes drove her granddaughter to distraction. Time is short now, Osaji said, seizing a sack and starting to shove clothes in it. Cormoran docks at Golconda in a few minutes. I remember Golconda, Mota said reflectively. I know you do. You must have been there sixty times. Your mother, Manuko, got off there one round and tried going Barnacle. She could never get used to it. But your sister, she actually married a Barnacle. She said it as if Osaji had never heard the news. Yes, we're going to see her in a few minutes. Oh, good, Mota said. That will be nice. Osaji didn't say, and you are going to stay with her from now on and set me free. The gentle jostle of docking came before Osaji was ready. Dory poked her head in the aperture to say, We've arrived. Everyone can leave now. Seething inside, Osaji said pleasantly, In a moment. Cormoran had not been a happy arc this round. When joining, Osaji had mistaken Dory's conventional expressions of respect for real tolerance of the aged. Once underway, Dory had voiced one sweetly phrased complaint after another, and it had become obvious that she resented Moda's presence. The old lady should not walk the corridors alone, because she might fall. She shouldn't be allowed in the kitchen, because she might put on a burner and forget it. She shouldn't help with the cleaning, because her eyes were too poor to see dirt. Once, Dory had said to Osaji, Caring for an aged is so much responsibility, I already have as much as I can bear. So she had taken no responsibility at all for Mota. Everything had landed on Osaji, making Dory hint with false sympathy that she wasn't pulling her weight around the ark. Mota had ended the round of virtual prisoner in her room, because just seeing her seemed to give Dory a fresh case of martyrdom. The corridors of Golconda Station were a shock to anyone fresh from float about. A floater's world was a yielding womb of liquid, where there was never a raised voice, never a command given. Floaters all went their lone ways, within the elaborate choreography of their shared mission. The Barnacle's world was a gray, industrial place of hard floors, angles, crowds, and noise. Barnacles had to move in coordinated lockstep. Cooperative obedience, they called it. They were packed in too close to survive any other way. 
the two ways of life were the yin and yang of Ben. Each needed the other, but neither partook of the other's nature. A line of porters stood by with electric carts in the hallway, so Osaji approached one, trying to conceal her diffidence. Codes of courtesy were abrupt here, because Barnacles always thought time for interaction was short. The porter named an outrageous price. When she attempted to tell her story, he said the authority set the amount, and there was nothing he could do about it. She gave in, feeling diminished. Mota's baggage filled the cart, so Osaji gave the porter the address, saw the old lady safely seated beside him, and hefted her own bags to walk, more to avoid dealing with another driver than to save the money. Soon she was feeling jostled and invaded upon, the corridor was half blocked off by some noisy construction, and the moving crowd was compressed into a narrow chute made dingy with too many passing feet and too much human exhalation. When she emerged into one of the domes, she looked for a spot out of traffic to gaze at the wonder of wide space. The brightly lit geodesic framework spanned a park-like area of greenery, ringed with company shops and authority offices. A grove of trees soared a breathtaking twenty feet over her head. They lifted her heart on their branches. She, too, had the potential to grow lofty. If only she could worm past this stricture in her life, she would be able to reach up again. And yet, above the trees, the weight of a frigid planetary ocean pressed down. It was a quixotic gesture of the builders, really, to have nurtured a form of life so unsuited to the environment. Perhaps the human genome was coded for this urge to put things where they didn't belong. Osaji knew floaters who spoke of the trees with hauteur, for they were symbols of inadaptability. The floaters were the ones who had pioneered a truly Benite way of life, not this transplanted impossibility of a habitat. Osaji caught her breath in wonder as a bright bird winged overhead. The impulse to act on her long-laid plans grew strong in her, why not now, before she saw her family, so it would be an accomplished fact? She knew the proper place to go, for she had sought it out last round, but without enough resolve, this time would be different. The immigration authority was a neatly aligned place. The agent sat behind a row of plain desks, and the clients sat in three straight lines of chairs facing them, waiting for their numbers to be called. No one looked at anyone else. The agent's soft voices filled the room with a background of sibilant word sounds that made no words. When Osaji's turn came to face an agent, she dropped her bags in an untidy heap on the floor around her chair. She had barely sat down before she blurted out, "'Your client wishes to leave the planet.' The agent was a young woman about Osaji's age, but much prettier, wearing a blue uniform with a crisp white color. Calm and competent, she said, why would that be? Osaji had not come prepared to answer this question. She swam in a sea of reasons, drowning in them. She was afraid to open her mouth, for fear she would choke on them. At last, she chose one that seemed least dangerous, to see new places. So it is a tourism desire, the young woman asked politely. Her hands were folded on the desktop. No, Osaji realized that she had made it sound trivial and self-indulgent. It is necessary for opportunity to broaden oneself. Education, then? Knowing the next question would be which off-world academy had admitted her, Osaji said, no, it is better to work one's way. Financial enrichment? No. That was antisocial selfishness. A person needs to learn the ways of the great worlds, to experience different cultures. How else can a person's mind expand? Ben is small and stifling. Though she had spoken the last words very softly, the agent caught them. Outwardly, the woman did not react, but her questions changed. Has the great work ceased to inspire? No. Osaji shifted nervously. She still felt the great work of creating a habitable planet from this cratered ball of ice was a noble one, and she honored the dedication of the generations who had gotten this far. But it was slow, centuries slow, and she would not live to see it done. If she did not leave, she would never even see what a habitable planet looked like. It is just, we are free to leave. They always say so. The agent smiled, 
making her even more formidably pretty. Of course, it is just that clients often think they wish to leave, when what they really need is to solve some personal problem. It would be very selfish to ask us to spend the resources to send a person off-planet just because someone cannot face an obligation. The shame Osaji felt then was like nausea, a sickness rising from her stomach. The woman had seen right through her. Osaji had tried to cloak her cowardice in brave fantasies to make it look less ugly. The truth was, leaving Ben meant abandoning her own grandmother, that sweet and helpless aged who had raised her and who now chained her with responsibility she didn't want. It was so low, Osaji sat staring at her hands folded in her lap, unable to raise her eyes. And yet, losing her hope of escape felt so painful she couldn't move from the chair, couldn't let some other more deserving person take her place. The agent said gently, "'Very few people who leave Ben like it on other worlds. We are not suited for that sort of life. Besides, it is nobler to face things here than to flee.' Osaji made no sound, but prickly tears began to brim over and drip on her clasped hands. She tried to think as a noble person ought to, about bravely facing her problems, but instead she felt a black resentment. Moda would live for many years yet. Her body did not make her old. Her straying mind was the problem. The disease had come upon her early, so early that Osaji, the last grandchild, did not yet have a life of her own, and so became the family solution. The true tragedy was Moda's. But being her caretaker, there was nothing to aim for, no goal, only monotonous endurance until the end. And then what? All Osaji's chances would be gone by then. At that lowest point, when her prison seemed impenetrable, she was distracted in the most irritating way, by a raised voice at the desk next to her. A wiry, weather-beaten foreigner was berating his agent. "'Are you going to get your prigging rear in gear, or do I have to raise hell?' The man's agent, a timid young woman, who looked acutely embarrassed by the attention he was drawing, tried to calm him in a low tone. Don't you whisper at me, you simpering little bureaucrat, he said even louder. You are going to give me a visa and a ticket on the first shuttle out of this clam steamer, or you are going to hear some real decibels. Please, sir, she pleaded, shouting at your agent will not solve your problem. You don't know what a problem is, sister. At this rate, you're going to know pretty soon. Osaji's agent went to the rescue of her traumatized colleague, what seems to be the issue? The unkempt off-worlder turned on her. He was only half-shaved and wore mercenary coveralls. The issue, my dear, is this whole lick-spittle planet, on which vertebrate life does not yet exist. The entire goddamned culture is based on passive aggression. Don't you all know this is a frontier? Where's your initiative, your self-reliance? Where are your new horizons? I've never seen such an insular, myopic, conformist, small-minded bunch of people in my life. This planet is a small town preserved in formaldehyde. Get me out of here. Osaji had often thought the same things about Ben, but hearing them expressed so coarsely made her bristle. The intensity of the emotions she had been feeling reversed polarity, turning outward at the hateful off-worlder beside her. He had had chances she would never get, and what had he done with them? A manager came out from one of the back offices and tried to draw the man into a private room to pacify him. The off-worlder, perhaps sensing he would lose his audience, stood up to defend his ground. He was short, and his spindly legs were a little bowed, but he had a ferocious demeanor. "'Do you know who you're talking to, son?' he said. "'Ever hear of Scrappin' Jack Halliday, who captured Plamona Outpost in the War of the Wrist?' When no one around him showed the slightest recognition, he gave an oath. Of course not. You bottom-dwellers don't care about anything unless it happens ten feet in front of your noses. The manager tried to be conciliatory, but Osaji could see it would have no effect. Her anger had been burning like a slow fuse all last round, and now it reached the end. She stood up and shouted, Did you come here just to make us listen to your profanity and your complaints? If you can't make it on Ben, that's too bad, but stop whining. Scrap and Jack looked like he had been ambushed 
from the direction he least expected. Rattled, he stared at Osaji as if hearing phantom sniper fire, and all he said was, What the? A little appalled at what she had done, Osaji sat down again, facing her agent. At last, the manager was able to lead the intemperate off-worlder away. The office slowly resumed its normal functioning. That's what they're all like on the other worlds, Osaji's agent said in a low voice. An emigrant has to cope with that, day in and day out. Are you sure? No, Osaji said. I think the live stream put him there to show me something. I am not supposed to leave Ben. The agent smiled encouragingly. I am grateful for your good work. Outwardly composed again, Osaji gathered up her bags and left, feeling wrung out but relieved. 2. Barnacles and Floaters Osaji's sister Kitani lived with her family in a dome that was divided up into pie-shaped domestic units surrounding a central dining and recreation area. Kitty's DU was on the second floor, meaning it was smaller, though the family had been on the waiting list for an upgrade for two months. It was one of the compromises people made to live barnacle. Brother-in-law Juko answered the door with a red-faced, howling baby in his arms. He was a gangling man with a perpetual, slightly goofy smile, and it was just as well, for the hubbub he ushered her into would have induced hypertension in anyone less tuned out. The DU had only two rooms, a sleep room and an everything-else room, and their older daughter was having a tantrum in the sleep room. The main room was simply crammed with furniture, cookware, baby strollers, clothes, and diaper bins. Mota's baggage formed an obstacle in the middle of the floor. "'Tell your Aunt Saji it is good to see her,' Jugo shouted to the baby in his arms. As an in-law, it wasn't polite for him to speak to Osaji directly. Osaji dumped her bags on the floor, there was nowhere else to put them, and tried to give Juko a greeting, just as the baby threw up all down his front. He smiled as if his face didn't know what else to do, and disappeared into the sleep room. Osaji's grandmother sat in an armchair, looking slightly dazed. Kitty came out of the sleep room and gave Osaji a frazzled hug. Looking at the mound of baggage, she said, Is it that you're changing arcs? Yes, Osaji said. It wasn't a good fit with Cormorin. Propriety forbade her to come any closer to speaking ill of others. That's too bad, Kitty said with a remote, distracted sympathy, as if it didn't concern her. Osaji wanted to pull her aside right then and make her plea, but it didn't seem like the right moment. The right moment didn't come that evening, either. A crowded, chaotic succession of rearrangements, feedings, and infant outbursts. Not until the next morning did Osaji and Kitty get some time alone together, when they took the children to the playground in an adjoining dome. They sat on a bench and watched barnacle children frolic under the overhanging sea. Kitty was first to bring up the subject. Modus really deteriorated, she said. The bald declaration, not tentative, not a question, showed how shocked she had been. It made Osaji uncomfortable. You think so? she said, though it was exactly what she had wanted to talk about. Don't you? She's much more weak and unsteady on her feet. You ought to get her more exercise. You know, agents can still build up muscle tone if they work at it. Ah, Osaji said and her mind seems to be wandering. She repeats herself and loses track of what people are saying. You need to stimulate her more, challenge her mentally, get her involved. Isn't it just that she is old? Osaji said. Kitty mistook it for a real question. Age doesn't have to mean deterioration. There are plenty of agents who are still intelligent and active. But Mo does not. No, she needs to be encouraged to improve herself. Osaji felt an upwelling of desperation. I've been wondering whether an ark is the best setting for her. Perhaps she would be better off elsewhere. Where? Kitty said. The domes for the aged are overcrowded, and you can't get anyone in without a medical permit. She's not that badly off. Still, it's really hard in an ark. There's no room for unproductives in an ark. And it's not just her. She makes me an unproductive, too, because I have to look after her. It's two wasted births, not just one. And two wasted lives. Abruptly, Kitty changed the subject. What about you? Have you met anyone? 
Osaji thought back on the slow torture of the last round. Every day regimented by the need to look after Moda punctually. Not once had she broken free from that elastic band of obligation. Not for one moment had Moda been completely out of her mind. There had been no space left for anything else. You could register, you know, Kitty said. The computers do a good job matching people. Most Benites found mates this way, in a place where everyone lived in isolated pockets scattered about the seafloor. It was the most practical way to meet someone compatible. Osaji had resisted it for years, out of a waning hope that she would meet someone the old, magical way, guided by the fateful currents of the life stream. At the thought of her naivete, she felt a sharp ache of disappointment. Who would take a mate with an aged attached? she said, and the bitterness sounded in her voice. Kitty finally heard it. You can't let her ruin your life, she said. Though Kitty had not meant to sound accusatory, Osaji felt it that way. She burst out, Kitty, if you would only take her for a round. Me? Kitty said in astonishment. I have the young ones. You've seen our D.U. I know. But the young ones, the D.U., they were all Kitty's choices. Osaji had had no choices of her own. Kitty's had foreclosed all of hers. The feeling of constriction returned. The thought of another round like the last was unendurable. I'm afraid, Osaji said in a low voice, that I'm going to start to hate her. Warmly, Kitty put an arm around Osaji's shoulder and hugged her tight. Oh, you would never do that. You're a good and loving granddaughter. What you do for her is really admirable. She looked in Osaji's bleak face and said coaxingly, Come on, smile. I know you love her, and that's what counts. Kitty had gotten so used to dealing with children that she couldn't interact any other way. All problems seemed like childhood problems to her, all solutions reduced to lollipops and lullabies. Osaji stood abruptly, wanting to do something evil, wanting to do anything but what a good and loving granddaughter would do. That evening, after dinner, she rose and said, It is necessary to go on an errand. Luckily, Kitty and Juko were busy with the children, and no one offered to go with her. The docks were still crowded with delivery carts, baggage handlers, and floaters coming and going. She walked down the harshly lit aisle, pausing at each tubular port where arcmates had posted their crew needs. She hurried past Cormoran's port, noting resentfully that they were advertising two berths. While she was reading a posting for a hydroponics technician, wondering if she could pass, a too familiar voice made her whirl around and look. There he was, the outworlder, Scrappin' Jack, trying to impress a circle of young longshoremen. She could hardly believe the authorities had not gotten rid of him. As her eyes fell on him, he looked up and saw her. Holy crap! he said. It's the shrew. Quickly, she looked away to avoid any further contact, but he was not so easily discouraged. Pushing through the traffic, he came to her side. He was barely taller than she, a compressed packet of offensiveness. Listen, he said, about yesterday, in that office. You've got to understand, I was tripped out on cocaine. As if that were an excuse. She scowled. Why would an outworld mercenary come here? He gave a dry, rasping laugh. Sister, you're not the first to ask. They asked me all through those god-awful treatments for high-pressure adaptation. But rumor was, there were empty spaces here, unexplored territory, room to spread out. All true, it's just under tons of water, and the habitations are a bit too togetherly for me. An idea occurred to her, brilliant in its spitefulness. Has he considered going on floatabout? That is the way to explore Ben. To spend months trapped in a bubble, drifting through opaque blackness, that was the real Ben. It would drive the man mad. You think so? He said. Yes, she said encouragingly. There is an ark looking for new crew. It's named Cormoran, just down the hall there. An applicant should ask for Dory. He looked like he was actually considering it. Why not? He said. It couldn't get worse. Thanks, kiddo. As he was turning to go, the floor shifted slightly underfoot, and the hanging lamps swayed. He stumbled. Whoa, he said. I thought I was sober. Osaji didn't bother to tell him it had been a ground tremor. 
all too common here along the cleft. She turned to escape the other way. Across the hall, at the mouth to the next port, a tall, lean woman with a patch over one eye was watching, cross-armed. As Osaji passed, she said, Is someone looking for an opening? Osaji stopped. The woman's shaggy hair was gray-streaked, but she looked fit, with a composed, cool look of self-sufficiency about her. The eye patch seemed like an affectation, a declaration of nonconformity, and Osaji suddenly decided she liked it. Lura of Divernon. The woman introduced herself. Osaji of nowhere right now. Divernon needs a hand to help out at odd jobs, particularly wet ones. Osaji looked down. Your applicant enjoys wet. She could not say she was good at it. That would seem unhumble, but she was. Her profile is listed in the registry. I don't need to see her profile, Lura said. I just saw her handle that off-world jerk. Osaji looked up, astonished that anyone would commit to a crewmate without studying their compatibility profile. Lura's one eye was disconcertingly alert, but laughing. From her face, it looked like she often laughed. Does the young adventurer come with anyone else? she asked. Osaji blushed, feeling a pang, but said no. It would not matter if they were less than married. Lura had mistaken the cause of the blush. How many does Divernon hold? Osaji asked, to change the subject. Myself, Mikita, and you. We were hoping to get a couple to join us, but we can't wait any longer. The authority wants us to vacate this port tonight. Just three? It was a skeleton crew. They would work hard, but enjoy a lot of privacy. Divernon's last crew got married and left us, Lura said wryly. Maybe a single would be safer. That sounded like a happy arc, if a little lonely. But just now lonely seemed good. The arc leaves tonight, she said. Can Osaji of nowhere be ready? Yes, she needs to fetch her baggage. Fetch away, Lura said. As Osaji hailed an electric cart, she could scarcely believe what she was doing. Joining an arc on impulse, without studying the other's profiles, without even meeting one of the two she would spend the next round with, it was an act of lunacy or desperation. When she got back to Kitty's DU, she had the cart driver wait out of sight, while she went in, hoping to find the others preparing for bed so she could slip out unseen. Juko was in the sleep room, putting the children to bed but Kitty was still in the front with Moda. She had opened up Moda's baggage and was sorting through it. One wastebasket was already overflowing with items she had decided to discard. What are you doing? Osaji said. Getting rid of some of the useless junk she is hauling around, Kitty said with efficient cheerfulness. Really, Saji, haven't you looked through these bags? Some of this stuff must be fifty years old. She held up a battered wooden flute, missing its reed. What's this for? It was the flute Great Uncle Yamada had played on the day they married the two arcs, Steptoe and Elderon, when Moda was young. Osaji had heard the story so many times, she had often thought she would scream before hearing it again. She looked to Moda, expecting her to start the tale, but the old lady was withdrawn and silent. Do you play it? Kitty asked pointedly. Moda shook her head. Then what use is it? Why carry it around? Do whatever you want with it, Moda said, looking away. I don't mind. Kitty stuffed it in the trash bin. Osaji looked at the discards. There was the dirty plush toy their grandfather had given Moda when she first got pregnant. The rock Yamada had brought from the surface. The little shell pendant for luck. Osaji knew all the stories. Kitty, these things are hers. You can't just throw them out. I'm asking her. Kitty said. She agrees. Osaji could see it now. Moda was going to become an improvement project for Kitty, and Moda would just acquiesce, as she always had done. She had spent so many years trying to please others. She didn't even remember what it was like to want something for herself. A tweak of compassion made Osaji say, Can I talk to her, Kitty? Kitty climbed to her feet. I've got to go check on the little ones. Osaji sat down next to Moda. The old woman took her hand and squeezed it, but said nothing. Moda, I need to know something, Osaji said softly. Do you want to come with me for another round on an ark, or would you rather stay here? Moda said nothing. 
Osaji waited, then said, You have to decide. I'm leaving tonight. I want whatever you want, Moda said. Whatever makes you happy. Even though she had half known that would be the answer, Osaji still felt a familiar burn of frustration. Her grandmother's passivity was a kind of manipulation, a way to put all the responsibility on to others, an abdication of adulthood. Moda had always been like this, and there was absolutely no way to fight it. It made everyone around her into petty dictators. Osaji hated the role, and she hated Moda for forcing her into it. It should have been a decision made in love, but instead it was grim duty in Osaji's heart when she said, All right, you're coming with me. She emptied out the wastebasket and stuffed all the things back into the bag they had come from, then hefted as many duffels as she could carry, and took them down to the waiting cart. The baggage took three trips, and on the fourth she helped Moda to the door. It crossed her mind to leave without saying anything, but at the last moment she stuck her head in the sleep-room door. Kitty, we're going now. Our ark is leaving. Now? Kitty sounded startled, but not unhappy at the news. She got up to hug them both, wish them a happy round, and to press some food on them, which Osaji declined. All the way to the docks, Osaji rehearsed what to say to her new arkmates. But when they got to Divernon, there was no sign of Lura or anyone else. She helped Moda through the flexible tube into the ark, calling out, Hello, Divernons? There was no answer. Finding the spare quarters was easy. So she left Moda inside and went back to ferry in the baggage. It occurred to her that it would be easy to hide Moda's presence till they had embarked, and then it would be too late for anyone to object. She had just hooked the last bag over her shoulder and paid the driver when a shout from down the hall made her freeze. Hey, Shrike! It was Scrap and Jack, coming down the hall like a torpedo locked on her coordinates. She would have ducked inside the ark, but feared he would just follow her. From twenty feet away, he bellowed, What's the idea, sending me to that shrink-wrapped prig? Everyone in earshot was staring, and Osaji could feel her ears glow. A man should be quiet, she pleaded. You thought you could pull a fast one on Scrap and Jack, did you? Well, news flash. It takes more balls than you've got to screw me over. He waved a hand as if to clear away invisible gnats. That didn't come out right. Go away, Osaji commanded. Down the hall, Lura was approaching with another woman at her side. Keenly aware of first impressions, Osaji tried to pretend that the raging eruption in front of her did not exist. She waved at them cheerfully. With a deafening crash, the floor jerked sideways, flinging everyone to the ground. Carts overturned, their contents scattered, and broken glass rained down. Again the floor bucked, sending Osaji skidding across tile into a wall with bruising force. For a moment there was silence, except for the groan of stressed girders and the ominous sound of falling water. A stream of it was running down the floor. Then a third jolt came. Osaji scrabbled for a handhold. Quick, into the ark, said a voice, and Lura's strong hand was pulling her up. Osaji was lying across the entry, blocking the way into the ark. Not trusting her balance, she scrambled on hands and knees up the chute. When she got into the ark, it was bobbing around in the turbulent water like a balloon on a string. Barely able to keep upright, she turned to help Lura through, and found it was not Lura behind her after all. It was the spacer, Jack. What is the awful man doing here? Osaji cried. He looked as buffeted as she. Some pirate dyke shoved me in the umbilical and told me to climb. I climbed. Where is she? At that moment the room turned sideways, and they were thrown in a heap onto the yielding wall. The aperture connecting them to the mooring tube contracted and disappeared. That meant they had broken free of the tube. But still the ark wasn't rising. Instead of floating in the smooth motion of the sea, Divernon was jerking like a leashed animal. There's still a mooring line attached, Osaji said. She snatched up the breather and face mask that had been knocked from their pocket on the wall. I'm going to find Lura. You stay here. There was no time to put on a suit, so she just stripped to her underwear, strapped on the mask, and thrust headfirst through the lips of the orifice. Only a few bubbles of air escaped with her. The first shock was the temperature of the water, bathtub warm. 
The second was the noise, a mere growl inside. Here it was like the roar of a thousand engines. The water was nearly opaque, full of roiled-up sediment. The harbor lights were still on, turning everything into a golden-brown fog. Feeling her way along the surface of the ark, she searched blindly for the line that was tying them down, for it would lead to the station. It was taut when she found it. The ark was tugging on it like a creature mad to escape. By feel, she traced it down to a clip attached to a U-bolt on the dock. Now she realized what must have happened. The other two lines had broken, detaching the ark from the landing tube before Lura and her companion could get in. Now Osaji only had to find the tube in this blinding muck. Before she could move, she felt the metal under her foot bowing out. The last U-bolt was giving way. She clutched the line tight, as if she could pull the ark down and keep it tethered. There was a metallic pop, and the bolt came loose. With Osaji still clinging to the line, the ark rose swiftly into the upwelling water. Instinctively, she hung on as water raced past her ears. They quickly cleared the turbid layer, and Osaji saw what lay below. The cleft of Golconda was erupting. A raging glow of blood-red lava snaked along the seafloor, obscured by hellish clouds of steam. As she looked down on the station, another tremor passed through it, and the panel on the largest dome collapsed. In seconds, the adjacent panels were caving inward, the dome crumpling. A huge bubble of air escaped, and all the lights went out, except the livid lava. The ark was caught in a steam-propelled plume of hot water, flying upward. Darkness closed in. Osaji could no longer see the cleft below, nor the line above. The only light in the world was the dim, bioluminescent globe of Divernon. Her hands were turning numb. She forced them to clamp down on the line. If she let go, she was lost. Her ears began to pop. They were rising too fast. The pressure was dropping dangerously. She needed to get inside quickly. Setting her teeth, she tried to climb the line, hand over hand, but she was pulling against the rushing water and didn't have the strength. Then she felt a tug on the line, and her spirits revived. She kicked to draw closer. Pain shot through her legs. Get me in, she prayed. The skin of Divernon was stretched taut, she saw, as she came closer to it. If the ark kept on rising, it would pop like an overfilled balloon, unless someone inside vented gas. Slowly, too slowly, the distance between her and the ark's skin lessened. At last, she could reach up and grasp the edge of the hole where the line disappeared inside. But when it began to open to admit her, the pressurized gas inside came shooting out in a jet, sending the arc spinning and wrapping the line around it. Osaji's body thumped against the surface hard enough to knock the breath out of her, but it was just what she needed. She let go of the line, and it snaked away into darkness while she clung to the tacky surface of the arc. It felt reassuringly familiar. Slowly, muscles cramping, she crept along till she got to the orifice and dived inside. Someone was swearing. It sounded like bull-banging damn. The arc was still spinning. Osaji was thrown forward on top of Scrap and Jack as the wall turned into the floor, then into a wall again. As the rotation slowed, they came to a rest a few feet apart, staring at each other. What the gutting hell are you doing alive? He said, holding up the empty end of the line. When she had let go, he must have thought her lost. Such concern is touching, she said sourly. Ignoring the shooting pains in her arms, she started barefoot up the rubbery organic tube toward the control pod. Jack followed close on her heels. The control pod of Divernon was more elaborately equipped than any she had seen. Arrayed around a curving console, four screens lit the darkened room in eerie colors. Things tumbled about in the spin still littered the floor. Osaji had been in control pods many times, but had never navigated. Gingerly, she sat down in the swiveling seat, staring at the screens to figure out the arc's status. Jack peered over her shoulder, muttering, Sonar, temperatures, what the hell is that? He pointed at a screen with an animated 3D diagram. Osaji was looking at that one, too. Currents, she said, then pointed to a tiny red point. That is us. It showed their true peril. All around them, angry pillars of heated water rose, a forest of deadly plumes dwarfing them. 
Osaji looked for the pressure ratio and exclaimed, May the life stream preserve us! The pressure inside was enough to burst the ark. We've got to vent gas now, or we'll explode. But her hand hung motionless over the control, for the choice of where to vent was critical. The jet of released air would propel them in the opposite direction, and if they floated into one of those hot plumes, that would be the end. She searched desperately for a safe choice. There was none. What are you waiting for? Jack said. I can't decide. Just do it. Do you want to die? Still, she hesitated, searching for a solution. With an oath, Jack reached over her shoulder and slammed his palm down on the control himself. You evil, reckless man! Osaji cried out. You have killed us! You're the one who'll kill us with your anal dithering! Jack yelled back. The pressure dropped into a safer range, but just as Osaji had feared, they were slowly floating toward one of the hot upwellings. Desperately, she vented more air to stop their motion, but the plumes on the screen were shifting, converging, leaving Divernon no space. Again she vented, as a plume seemed to reach out toward them, but it only sent them into the arms of another. She sat back resignedly. It is our fate. What is? Jack demanded. He had no idea what was going on. She didn't answer. She could feel Divernon shudder, then rock, as the swift current took it. They were rising again, like a bubble in boiling water, little bumps and shifts betraying their speed. Osaji wanted to look away, but couldn't take her eyes from the screen. Even as she watched, the heat was probably killing the bioengineered outer surface of the craft, the membrane on which their lives depended. It did not matter. They would die anyway, in the terrible heights where no human or habitation was meant to be. 3. Through the Gap The sonar screen was showing something strange. To their west was a solid return, something gigantic. Osaji increased the range and felt a flutter of terror in her belly. It was a wall, a sheer cliff towering over them. There was only one thing it could be— the underwater mountain range that rimmed the ancient basin where life had taken such a precarious hold. Improbably, it seemed to curve outward over them like a mouth about to bite down. Osaji stared at the screen for several seconds before she realized what it showed. Save us! she exclaimed. What? Jack asked. It is showing the bottom of the ice. All her life it had been a rumor, the unseen cap on the sky the lightless place where the world turned solid and all life stopped. She could feel it now, hanging above her, miles thick, heavy enough to crush them. She swallowed to quell a claustrophobic flutter in her chest. The light shuns what is not meant to be looked on. She quoted a saying of the Paracletes. Legend said that the underside of the ice was studded with the frozen corpses of people who had died without proper burial and had floated up. I don't understand your problem, Jack said. He pointed to the screen. The upwellings aren't as bad along the mountain range. Can't you just steer over there? Osaji closed her eyes and shook her head at his ignorance. Our visitor thinks like a spacer, she said. So? Arcs are not ships. We have no propulsion system. Jack looked thunderstruck. You mean you can't control this thing? We can rise and fall. In an emergency, we can vent air from the sides. But we go where the currents take us. What if there's no current that happens to be going where you want? Now the visitor understands our problem. As they rose toward the cap of the world, the screen showing the currents above them changed. Where the upwellings hit the bottom of the ice, there was a region of turbulent eddies and horizontal flows. Jack was fidgeting nervously. What happens when we hit that? We will go where the life stream takes us. If the life stream means to feed me to the crabs, I'm swimming against the current. On Ben, feeding crabs is a noble calling, Osaji answered. One was supposed to feel serene about it. It is all part of the great work of seeding the ocean with life. No offense to Ben, said Jack darkly, but a body donation wasn't in my plans. How little anyone's plans counted now. Osaji stood up, saying, I have to go check on something. You're leaving? He said incredulously. Now? 
I need to see if my grandmother is all right. You've got an old lady in the ship? Yes, she is not in good health. It would be good for someone to watch the screens while I am gone. She sprinted down the springy corridor to the quarters where she had left Moda. The room was tumbled and chaotic from the Ark's gymnastics. Moda was sitting on the bed, unharmed, but confused and disoriented. Saji, where am I? she asked. Don't worry, Moda, Osaji said. She was about to explain the situation, the eruption, the heat plumes, their danger, when she saw that what Moda really wanted was much simpler. We're in an ark called Divernon. This is your room. Don't unpack yet. I'll come back as soon as I can. This is my room, Moda said, looking around fearfully. Yes, think about how you want to fix it up. What ark are we in? With a shrinking feeling, Osaji repeated, Divernon? Aren't we going to Golconda? We just came from Golconda. It... The last sight of the station flashed vividly before her, cutting off her voice. She didn't want to say what she feared. She didn't even want to think it. Kitty and Juko, the trees, the playground where they had talked, all dark, all cold, all drowned. She forced it out of her mind. If she thought about it, it might come true. Your sister lives there, Mota said. I don't know how people can live that way, so crowded. Well, you don't have to worry about it, Osaji said. She caught Mota's hand and pressed it between hers, longing for the days when she was the child and Mota the one who took care of things. Mota, I love you, she said. I wish I could keep you safe. She left wondering which would have been the more terrible error, dragging Moda along or leaving her behind. When she got back to the control pod, the displays had changed. While she had been gone, Divernon had hit the turbulent zone, and now a horizontal current was sweeping them swiftly westward toward the rock wall. It looked like they were going to smash into it. Osaji stood next to the chair Jack was occupying to indicate she wanted to sit down in it but he was mesmerized by the screens and didn't notice her body language. She cleared her throat. I might be able to keep us alive a little longer, she said. How? he said. Courtesy was wasted on him. So she said, if you would allow me to sit. At last he got the message and let her have the chair. The cliff was approaching at an alarming rate. Osaji vented air on their forward side to break their speed, but they still felt the jar when Divernon hit, even inside all the cushioning internal organs. Osaji winced for the poor, tortured membrane. They caromed off the cliff and back into the current, spinning like a top. Now the sonar showed cliffs on every side of them. It took Osaji several seconds to realize they had been swept into a narrow cleft in the rim rock. For several minutes, she kept busy sending out strategic jets of air to keep them from crashing into the rocks again. Is it safe to be venting so much air? Jack asked. It was his spacer instincts talking again. Preoccupied, Osaji said, Oxygen is a waste product of the membrane cell's metabolism. We are constantly having to get rid of it. At last, the turbulence eased, and the cliffs drew back, but the current was still swift. Osaji glanced at the compass to see where they were headed. Then she looked again, for what it showed was impossible. That can't be, she said. What? We're still going west, but the mountains are behind us. Ahead the sonar showed a rugged plain sloping downward. Every moment the current was carrying them farther into it. We have been swept through a gap in the mountains, Osaji said. Her lips felt numb around the words. Is that bad? Jack said. There is only one inhabited region on Ben, the Saltese Sea, behind us, beyond the mountains. We are going into the uninhabited waste. There was a short silence as Jack absorbed this information. What's in the uninhabited waste? He said at last. Rocks, water, darkness, no life. No seafloor stations, no other arcs, no human voices. For the next round, perhaps for every round after that, until their arc died. Send out a distress call, Jack said. Osaji reached for the low-frequency radio and spoke into it. 
This is the Ark di Vernon. Can anybody hear me? They waited. Only the hiss of an empty channel came back. Osaji spoke again. This is di Vernon. We have been swept through the mountains on the edge of the Salty Sea. If you can hear us, please answer. Only silence. The empty hiss grew oppressive. Osaji switched it off. There's got to be something we can do, Jack said. Trying to sound calm, Osaji said, If the Ark is not too badly damaged, it should recover. It is a self-sustaining system. It can live for many rounds. You're telling me this is it, he said. I'm trapped till I die, in a goddamned underwater balloon, along with an invalid and a harpy. Osaji gave the grimmest smile in the world. The Outworlder is the lucky one, she said. We are the ones trapped with him. 4. The Wasteland Three days later, Jack was still rebelling against their situation. He was a bundle of restless energy. While Osaji unpacked and arranged her quarters, comfortably for herself and Moda, he prowled the Ark, reading the manuals, trying to find a solution. At first she ignored him, but soon the time came to talk about dividing up the essential tasks of keeping an Ark running. Osaji drew up a task wheel, and brought it into the kitchen to negotiate the division of labor. It was a familiar routine to her, usually done on the third day of round. But the daunting list of jobs made not a dimple in his monomania. All he wanted to talk about was another of his endless schemes. It's not like you don't have engine fuel, Jack said. You've got a bag full of waste hydrogen up there. The hydrogen's not waste, Osaji said. It is for our fuel cells, to make electricity. Then why not rig an electric motor to some propellers? Does someone here know how to make an engine and propellers? He gave off a flare of indignation. I'm not a bleeding mechanic, but damn it, I'd try. It's better than rolling over and taking whatever the life stream sends you. It is antisocial to make one's personal problems into everyone's problems, Osaji said. Thank you, Miss Priss, Jack said acidly. He paced up and down before the kitchen table, two steps one way, two steps back. He was constantly in motion like that. It was like having a trapped animal in your home. What possessed you Benites to invent a vehicle without any controls? An ark isn't a way of getting someplace, Osaji explained. It is a place in itself. He looked ready to ignite, a small, two-legged bag of hydrogen himself. Thanks but I want to sear the place I'm in. This wherever-you-go-there-you-are crap is why you've spent two centuries in the Salty Sea without ever once having poked your noses out to see the rest of Ben. Wasn't anyone curious? No, you're content in your little bubbles. You've got an entire culture of agoraphobes. Irritated at his refusal to focus on the practical demands of their situation, Osaji set a pair of flippers and breather down on the table in front of him. Here, anyone who doesn't wish to be here can swim back. Go to hell. Osaji had had enough of him. She took back the swim gear and said, All right, I am going out. Out? What do you mean? He followed her into the corridor. Someone has to check the membrane. I should have done it before. Isn't that dangerous? Yes. She stopped and turned to him. It will be a shame if you are left without someone to abuse. Now, let me go. Above the living quarters, the enormous bladders for air, fuel, and ballast water were swollen, shadowy shapes in the dim glow of the outer membrane. Taking a handful of the tough, fibrous white roots that grew on the inside of the globe's surface, Osaji hoisted herself up the outer wall. The roots were wet, and soon her hands and feet were glowing white, covered with luminescent bacteria. The smell was fresh and invigorating, for the air here was rich with oxygen. When she had been a child, it had been a favorite game to climb the globe wall and then throw herself down onto the pillowy bladders below. Then she had not appreciated the consequences of accidentally puncturing one of the membranes. She had come this way because, despite her bravado in front of Jack, she was afraid to go out. The main orifice to the outside was at the bottom of the ark, and normally she would have used it. But there were emergency entry pores scattered throughout, and one of them was close to the part of the membrane she most needed to inspect. 
It was odd. She had never been afraid of the outside before. In fact, she had relished escaping from the close confines of the Ark, and always volunteered for wet work. But back home, in the Saltese Sea, she had known exactly what lay outside. All the landmarks were mapped, the waters familiar. Here, her rational mind knew from the censors that nothing was different, but the animal instinct part of her brain didn't care. She squeezed out the aperture like a slippery melon seed into the embrace of cold and silence. At first she clung with her back to the tacky surface of the ark, peering into the water. The dark had a different quality here. In the Saltese Sea, you always knew that light and life hovered just beyond the edge of sight. Here, the dark was absolute ruler. Their ark was a moat in an emptiness the size of continents. She unhooked the battery-powered searchlight from her belt. For a moment before turning it on, she had to steal herself, not quite knowing what she feared. When at last she shone it out into the water, it revealed nothing. Or rather, only one thing. The water was extraordinarily clear. No suspended sediments lit the beam, since this was lifeless water. She aimed it up next, out of irrational fear that ice would be hanging over them, but again the beam disappeared. At last she shone it down. Nothing was visible. A hundred meters below them lay the rugged seafloor terrain of pillow lavas and tumbled boulders, but the beam did not reach so far. Relieved, she pushed away from the ark to scan its surface. It was easy to see where Divernon had collided with the cliff. Since a patch had been scraped clean of the luminous bacteria that made the rest of the craft glow white, she swam in close to run her hand across the surface, smoothing new bacteria onto the injured spot so it would heal. Then she slowly skimmed the circumference of the sphere, checking for scorches and barren spots, till she came to rest on the top, looking out on her world. In its way, Divernon was alive, like a giant cell, a lipid membrane full of organelles designed to feed on the dissolved salts and carbon dioxide of the sea and process them into amino acids and hydrocarbons to release again. It was part of the metabolic chain that would slowly, over the centuries, turn Ben's sea into a living ocean. The Ark was a giant fertilizer, a life creator, an indispensable part of the great work. But out here there was no great work. Isolated from its fellows, Divernon was a lost soul. Why had no Ark ever ventured out here before? Now that her irritation had washed away, the thought flowed into her that Jack was right. For so many generations, Benites had been content to pursue their rounds, following the currents in an ever-renewing cycle. They had never pushed beyond the boundaries of the familiar, out into the places without names. Suddenly, Osaji ached with homesickness for the familiar float-about cycle. If they had left Golconda as usual, just now, they would be coming to the Swirl, a spot where the great current eddied, bringing many arcs together. It was always a festive time. People visited from arc to arc, exchanging gifts and sometimes moving to find more compatible crewmates. The arcs were gaily decorated, full of music, and there was light-hearted romance and water dancing. The cold began to seep into her joints, so she kicked off to view the ark from below. As she dove down along the flank of the great globe, the feeling of something looming in the blackness behind her grew. So when she reached bottom, she abandoned her inspection and wormed into the aperture as quickly as she could. She brought a bulb of warm soup for Moda's lunch. When she entered Moda's vacuole, she noticed the stuffy, rank smell of age. She increased the ventilation. The rhythmic expansion and contraction of the air vessels made it sound like the room was breathing. Lunch, Moda, she said in a cheerful tone. Moda had taken all the clothes from one of the wall pockets and was busy refolding everything and putting it back. She had done it at least ten times before, and with every repetition, the clothes got a little more disordered. She looked up from her work and said anxiously, Saji, where were you? I waited and waited. I thought something had happened to you. I've only been gone an hour, Osaji said, her spirits falling. These reproaches were all she had gotten recently. She knew it would not stop unless she spent every hour of the day in the room. Come eat your soup. 
she set it down on the little table they used to take their meals. Moda looked in agitation at the clothing strewn all over the bed. She picked up a sweater she had just folded, shook it out, then put it down again. Everything is all out of order, she said. It was not the clothes that were out of order. It was something inside of Moda's mind. The behavior was simultaneously so unlike her grandmother and so very like her that Osaji felt trapped between laughter, dread, and impatience. Moda had always had a passion for tidiness. Cleaning up after other people had been half her life, a way of expressing the love she couldn't put in words. Now it seemed like the trait was betraying her. I'll help you after lunch, Osaji said, but suspected that doing the task rather than completing it was what Moda needed. A little reluctantly, the old woman came to the table and sat sipping her soup from the bulb. Her features looked stiff, her lips a little apart, stained with soup. Osaji tried to talk about the ark, but it was hard to keep it up alone. She kept fishing for responses and receiving none. Suddenly Moda roused and got up restlessly. She started wandering around the room, looking for something in the wall pockets, underneath the bedclothes, in the wash vac. After watching a while, Osaji said, What are you looking for? Moda paused, as if having to search her mind for an answer. My hand cream, she said at last. It's in the wash vac, where it always is? Yes, of course. Moda went in the wash vac saw where it was, but did not pick it up. She came back out and settled in her chair. The feeling in Osaji's stomach was much like the homesickness she felt for the salty sea. It was a gnawing feeling that things were wrong, a yearning for a normality that was never coming back. And beneath it all lay buried anger at Mota for letting this confused stranger take over her body, an unworthy feeling. Would you like to go for a walk? Osaji asked. No, thank you, sweetheart. Should I read to you? If you want to, Moda said neutrally. I'm asking if you want me to. Osaji was unable to keep the desperate impatience from her voice. Moda fell silent. Feeling guilty, Osaji said, Or would you like to take a nap? Yes, that would be nice. Moda had only agreed because it would be the least trouble. Nevertheless, Osaji seized upon it. She was feeling claustrophobic in this room, as if the smell was going to hang on to her forever. When she got up, Moda said anxiously, Are you leaving? Yes, I'm going to let you sleep. She came over and kissed the old woman's hair. Moda took her hand and said, You're a good girl, Saji. Controlling her inner rebellion, Osaji said, Have a good rest, Moda. When she was outside in the corridor, Osaji punched the wall with her fist, but it only yielded pliantly. I am not a good girl, she said, fiercely under her breath. How could Moda look at her, selfish and angry as she was, and say such a thing? It denied the reality of her resentment, and that diminished her. Her own grandmother, who ought to know her better than anyone in the world, saw not the individual Osaji, but that generic thing, a good girl. It made her feel like a mannequin, her personality negated. They drifted steadily westward, across a rocky plain that seemed to have no end. There was no navigation to do. The automated systems kept the ark at a steady depth and scanned for underwater obstacles, but there were none. Osaji made sure the machines were recording divergent speed and direction. After that, there was no need to visit the control pod more than once a day. To make sure nothing had changed, nothing ever did. An arc was supposed to work like a symphony, each person playing an indispensable part in the harmonic whole. But Jack made that impossible. He was unpredictable, one day torpid and morose, the next roaming the arc in a restless rage, throwing off sparks. All Osaji's attempts to suggest a useful role for him met a kind of egotistical nihilism. What's the point? he said. It only puts off the inevitable. We're going to die out here. We're going to die no matter where we are, Osaji said. Spare me the philosophy. Come on, how long before we run out of food and fuel? Puzzled by the question, she said, never. We can't restock out here. We don't need to, except for luxuries. The Ark is self-sustaining. That's impossible. 
You would have invented a perpetual motion machine if that were so. The Ark is not a machine, she protested. It is not a closed system at all. It's an open one based on autopoiesis. It's in a state of dynamic equilibrium with the sea. It exchanges chemicals in a chain, a process, that builds up complex molecules from simple ones. That's not possible, not without fuel. The laws of thermodynamics are against it. Life violates thermodynamics all the time, until it dies. Back to that again. All right, the Ark will eventually die, Osagi admitted, but not until after we do. Unless we don't maintain it, we are part of the system. Even that failed to rouse any sense of responsibility in him. There was no alternative. Osagi had to try to do it all herself. And so her days became a numbing rush from one task to the next, never pausing to rest, always dragging her aching body on. One day she went to the clinic to get some sleeping medicine from Moda and found the drug supply ransacked. At first she stood staring at the pilfered wall pockets, unable to believe what she saw. Then her outrage boiled over. She found Jack in the exercise vac, where he often spent time uselessly lifting weights. He was working the bench press with an aggressive intensity when she came in. She stood over him till he put the weights on their rack and sat up. If it isn't the guppy girl, he said. It is impossible not to notice that the drugs are missing, she said. Oh, yeah? She waited for him to look guilty or excuse himself. He did neither. Such egotism is, she searched for a truly damning word, antisocial. How can a man put his own temporary pleasure over the legitimate needs of others? What if one of us gets injured or ill? You have robbed us of life-saving cures that— Oh, put a cork in it, Jack said. Osagi's indignation exceeded her eloquence then. You are an animal, she cried. You have stolen from my grandmother. Slowly, he stood up. He had no shirt on, and though he was short and wiry, his muscles were hard like knotted ropes. She took a step backward for the first time realizing that he could easily overpower her. Fear urged her to flee, but anger made her stand her ground. You see that tube there? She pointed to the corridor outside. On this side of it is yours. On the other side is mine. Don't cross it. If I catch you on my side, I swear I'll do you harm. She turned and fled then. Stopping in the kitchen, she found a sharp knife. Feeling a little safer, she went to Mota's vac and found the old lady dozing peacefully. Osagi settled down, knife in hand, guarding the aperture. Never had she faced such a situation. There were always personality conflicts in arcs, but the social pressure kept them hidden. But here, for the first time in her life, Osagi was not part of a larger community. She was an independent being, who needed to protect herself and her grandmother as best she could. Fingering the knife hilt, she hated Jack for making her into that most contemptible of all things, an egotist. She saw little of Jack in the time that followed. At first, she longed for him to overdose and drop dead, so she could push his body out into the sea and live the rest of her life in peace. But gradually, she began to realize that he had at least been a kind of twisted distraction. Her days came to revolve around Moda's constant needs for feeding, cleaning, and protection, and her other duties suffered. Immersed in age and infirmity day after day, Osagi herself began to feel dead and shriveled. She slept more than ever before and woke with aching joints. When she hobbled to the mirror in the morning, she half expected to see white hair. There was no one day when Moda took a turn for the worse, just a long series of imperceptible declines. It was not so much her hearing and sight failing as her will to hear or see. With her other senses went something Osagi could only describe as her sense of pleasure. No food tasted appealing to Moda. No sensation brought comfort. No activity brought content. Osagi could work until she was exhausted trying to satisfy her, all in vain. Moda's capacity for enjoyment was gone. Osagi's only refuge was in the hydroponic nursery. Looking after the plants was a chore she actually liked. It took very little effort, but she lavished time on it anyway, because in the nursery she could pretend she wasn't on Divernon or even on Ben. 
One day she came, as usual, to tend the plants. The protective gear was still in the sack by the orifice, meaning no one was inside. She put on the hat, gloves, and dark glasses to shield her from the full-spectrum light, and entered. Even with the goggles on, she squinted against the brilliance inside. The nursery was a sausage-shaped vesicle with long trays of greenery lining each wall and a tank down the middle. An adjoining sack held a deep, lightless pool where underwater species grew in a chemical broth that mimicked their natural sea vent habitat. She started down the row of greenery, pinching off dead leaves and spraying the plants with nutrient water. As she parted one thicket of foliage, she noticed something peculiar. On the counter, behind the screen of plants, stood a row of glass jars full of cloudy liquid. They had not been there when she last tended the plants, she was sure. As she reached out to pick one up, a voice behind her grated, Don't touch that! Jolted, she whirled around. Jack was sitting on the floor behind her, hidden by a tank. He raised his hands and said, Lower your weapon. I surrender. She realized she was holding the plant sprayer in front of her like a gun, as if to spritz him with water. Ridiculous as it was, she didn't lower it. What do you want? she demanded. Stiffly, he got up. I want a joint and a ticket out of here, for all the good it does me. He wasn't wearing any protective gear. She said, A man should be wearing glasses. With a harried look, he said, Don't you ever let up? But the radiation is dangerous in here. Don't worry. This is the only room that doesn't seem dim as a dungeon to me. He took a step forward. She pointed the sprayer at him, and he stopped. Okay, okay, he said. Look, we can't go on like this. We're the only two damned people in this ship. We've got to call a ceasefire. Suspicious of this new ploy, she said, So someone can go on raiding our drugs? I apologize for that. He didn't look apologetic, more like desperately irritated at himself. The thing is, I'm going bug-fuddled crazy. I haven't been clean and sober at the same time in about ten years. It doesn't improve me. That's why. He nodded at the jars behind her plants. What are they? She said. I'm making wine. Osaji said, you shouldn't keep them here. Bitterly sarcastic, he said, sorry for polluting your sanctum. No, I mean, they won't ferment properly in the light. They should be somewhere dark and cool. He paused. I knew that. He came over and gathered the jars off the counter. It seemed like he was about to leave, but he stopped. Then, eyes fixed on something beyond her, he began to talk in a rush, as if he were bleeding words. During the war, I was on a ship called Viper. It was a godless piece of junk, really. We used to joke about it, called it the Vindo Viper. One day they sent us in to take over a communication station, owned by an asteroid mining company. Only it turned out to be a secret military installation. They blew our piece of shit cruiser to bits, before we had time to wet our pants. Eleven of us managed to escape in spacesuits, with only a marker buoy to hang to. We waited there for rescue. You know what it's like in space? It's dark, and your body has no weight. There's nothing to smell or see or feel. If you kick, nothing happens. It's just yourself all alone, thinking till your brain echoes like the whole universe. We had a big argument while we were waiting for rescue. Some of them thought the oxygen would last longer if we linked our tanks together. I was against it, me and two others. The rest decided to do it, and eventually persuaded everyone but me. It was four days before a ship picked us up. Their oxygen ran out at three and a half. If I'd helped them, I would have died too. I used to think I was the smart one, the lucky one. Osaji was so taken aback, she forgot to point the sprayer at him. Look, he said, I came to this godforsaken planet to shed myself, like an old dirty t-shirt, into the laundry. I was hunting for a clean break. I wanted to be a new person, but the old person sticks to me like a bad smell. My past is something I stepped in long ago and can't get off my shoe. This only made Osaji's own self-pity well up to match his. You are not the only one trapped here unwillingly. Do you think I do all this work for pleasure? Do you think I want to maintain this ark and wash and dress and feed someone as if I were some kind of appliance? No one would choose this. It is degrading. Finally, he seemed to focus on her. 
then for God's sake, give me something to do. If I have to sit around thinking any more, I'm going to start chewing my leg off. Suspicious at this change, she said, What can a spacer do? I don't know. Teach me while I still have a few brain cells left alive. It came to her then, the job she most wanted rid of. I can teach the spacer to go outside. To her surprise, he blanched. No, you don't want me out there. I'd just be a drag on you. Our breathers are easier to use than yours. You don't have to carry oxygen. The breather extracts it from the water, and it's not like space. When you kick, something happens. Listen, he said, I've got to tell you something. Truth is, I was a complete screw-up as a spacer. You see, I couldn't turn off my mind. I couldn't stop thinking of consequences and caring about them. I couldn't stop seeing the danger and the stupidity and the venality and the faces. He had wandered off again into some haunted territory of his mind. To pull him back, she said, there are no faces in the sea, no venality either. With a hoarse laugh, he said, well, that leaves danger and stupidity. Only if you bring them, shit, 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 he said. Five, through Shadow Valley. The aperture to the outside was located in the floor at the very bottom of the globe. The trick to getting through it was, once suited up, to take a little leap and plunge in feet first, as if jumping into a pool. Osaji had never thought of it as a skill, till she watched Jack trying to follow her out. He got stuck halfway, struggling ineptly and letting air escape in big bubbles that rolled up the ark's side. Trying not to laugh, Osaji grasped one flailing ankle and gave a sharp tug, ignoring the curses emanating from her radio earpiece. He was awkward and jerky in the water, and she had to make him swim to and fro a while to get the hang of the flippers. Then she took him on a tour of the ark's exterior, showing him the emergency entry pores and the scars of their encounter with the heat plumes and the mountain. With Jack beside her, the darkness no longer seemed so oppressive. It gave her the courage to do something she had not contemplated in a long time, gather water samples. They had to be taken at some distance, to avoid contamination from the cloud of organic molecules the Ark gave off. As soon as they left the sheltering bulge of the Ark, they were enveloped in a dark so inky that all direction disappeared. Osaji stripped the covers from the phosphor patches on her suit so Jack could see where she was. She turned back to show him how to do the same, but he had already figured it out. Though they swam slowly, the Ark soon dwindled to a dim ball behind. It was icy cold. Jack switched on the search lamp but the beam just disappeared into water in every direction. They seemed suspended in nothingness. Jack muttered, A dark, illimitable ocean without bound, where length, breath, time, and place are lost. What does that mean? Osaji asked. It's poetry, kid. Damn spooky. That's what it means. Osaji took the sampling bottle from the pack at her belt and held it out at arm's length as she swam, releasing the cap. As she was covering it again, something touched her face. She gave a startled exclamation and was suddenly blinded by the light as Jack turned it on her. What is it? he said. Turn that off. He did, but light still danced before her dazzled eyes. For a terrifying moment, she couldn't even tell up from down. She blinked until the dim glow of Jack's phosphor patches swam into view. Can you see the ark? she said. Right there, he said presumably pointing with an invisible arm. She saw it then as well, dimly, farther off than it should be. But as she started for it, Jack said, Hey, where are you going? The photism she had been following vanished, and as she turned, the real Divernon swam into view. If he had not been there to stop her, she might have wandered off, chasing a mirage. Let's go back, she said, rattled. They raced back as fast as they could swim. When they were inside again, he said, What the hell happened out there? This swimmer thought she felt a heat tendril. What's that? A current of warmer water. No one else felt it? Warm? You've got to be kidding. It must have been an illusion then. Still, she went to check the Ark's temperature records. They were disappointingly flat. She had to tamp down the tiny updraft of hope 
that it had been a hint of geothermal activity. Another rift zone would mean a site for colonization, an energy source for life. She couldn't entirely suppress the thought. The currents here were robust. They had to be driven by something. Just the possibility was like an infusion of energy. She felt buoyant and excited as she went to check on Moda, like the little girl she had once been, running to tell her grandmother of some discovery. Moda roused from an open-eyed doze and smiled sweetly when Osaji told her what had just happened. "'That's nice, dear,' she said. Stiffly, she rose from her chair, and Osaji saw that the back of her dress was soaked. "'Mota, you've wet yourself,' she said, shocked. "'No, I haven't,' Mota said, turning so Osaji couldn't see it. "'Here, I'll help you change,' Osaji tried to make her voice neutral. "'No, no,' Mota said. "'Don't worry, I can do it myself.' She stood looking around uncertainly, as if she had never seen the room before. Silently, Osaji went to the wall pocket and found some dry clothes. She felt irrationally humiliated by this new infirmity. It was so unlike Moda. Moda took a long time changing clothes in the wash vac. Osaji sat at the table, all at once too enervated to move. Her bubble of high spirits was leaking air, and she was sinking into stagnant water again. The trip outside revived Jack's fund of harebrained schemes. What if we were to rig a really big antenna, he said. Maybe we could generate a low-frequency signal that could penetrate all this water and ice. Osaji was skeptical that any length of antenna would help them, but it did no harm to try. So she helped him string floats on a braided carbon steel mooring line and paid it out into the water. Before long, Divernon was trailing a long tail of wire. It did not improve their communications. The radio still hissed white noise. But the antenna did succeed in an unexpected way. As the current carried them inexorably westward, the sea floor landscape became more rugged. The sonar showed the hunched shoulders of hills below them, concealed by inky water. Then one day, the bottom dropped out of the world. On a routine check of the control pod, Osaji was startled to see no sonar reading at all. Going back to check the record, she found that the soundings had stopped only two hours before. When a diagnostic turned up no problem with the equipment, she came to the only plausible conclusion. They had been swept over the edge of an underwater chasm. The ark was caught in a gentle eddy, and as it floated backward, her conjecture was confirmed. For the sonar picked up the edge of fluted organ pipe cliffs dropping away into darkness so deep the signal could not reach the bottom. By then, she and Jack were both watching the screen, mesmerized. What should we do? Osaji asked. It was the first navigation decision they had had to make. What are the options? Jack said. We could go down or stay at our present depth. If we stay, we'll probably pick up the westward current again. If we drop down, yes, he prompted when she failed to continue. Well, there is no telling. There might be no current down there. Then we would just come up again. There might be a current that would sweep us someplace we don't want to be. As opposed to now, Jack said ironically, that is a point. Often, decisions like this took hours, because everyone was afraid to be first to voice an opinion, and they talked until a consensus emerged without anyone having to say it aloud. But Jack suffered no inhibitions about expressing himself. I say go for it. Take the plunge, he said. What good are we doing out here if we don't take time to see the sights? She smiled at him because she agreed. He stared at her open-mouthed till she said, Is something wrong? I don't think I've ever seen you smile before, he said. That made her feel self-conscious, so she turned to the controls and input the sequence of commands that would take them downward. As soon as they dropped below the edge of the cliff, they lost their current. They were close enough to the cliff that the side-sounding sonar could show an image of the stately columns of basalt plunging into unknowable depths below. Osaji pushed back her chair and rose. "'Where are you going?' Jack said. "'It will take a long time to sink.' she said. We have to adjust to the pressure as we go down. It could be ours. 
He couldn't tear himself from the screens, so she left him there watching. In the end, it took three days. As they descended, the water temperature slowly rose one degree, and Osaji's hopes rose with it. When the sonar finally picked up the bottom, they both sat, watching the screen intently, while the detail improved, scan by scan. What it showed was only another tumbled slope of boulders, leading down to a rumpled sea floor. Look at the edges of the rocks, Osaji said, pointing at the screen. They are sharp, not eroded. That means this area could be geologically active. But they saw nothing else in any way remarkable. They did pick up a new current, sweeping them slowly north along the line of the cliffs. The next day, the side sonar picked up another trace opposite them, the other side of the canyon closing in fast. As the gorge became narrower, the current sped up, and Osaji began to fear that the gap would become too narrow for them to pass. What should we do? she said. Ride it out, I guess, Jack said, his eyes glued to the monitors. Like white water ballooning, yee-haw! Soon the giant cliffs were marching by, close on either side. For a moment, the sonar showed nothing but rock in every direction. They were being swept around a curve. A gap appeared ahead. They were heading toward it. Then all motion seemed to stop. The cliffs were behind them. They had entered onto the floor of a dark, hidden valley. At first it seemed that they had just exchanged one lightless wasteland for another. Day by day they traveled northwest, their rocky surroundings unchanged. But there was a difference, as if they had passed a wall severing them forever from home. Even Mota seemed to be drifting into another world Osaji could not enter or imagine. As her memory failed, the old woman lost her ability to detect a sequence of events, to tell the before from the after, and with sequence gone, time itself disappeared. At first her own confusion frightened her, and she asked constantly what time it was, as if to force her experiences into order. But as she grew accustomed to it, she learned to exist in a bath of time, where all the past was present simultaneously. She began to confuse Osaji with long-dead people from her childhood. Whenever it happened, Osaji corrected her more sharply than she should have but she couldn't help it. The reaction came from deep down, like the reflex to breathe or defend her life, except it was her individuality she was defending. As Mota's failing senses saw her less and less distinctly, Osaji felt like she was disappearing, turning invisible as water. She was in Mota's vac when a shudder and a jerk went through the ark. Did you feel that? she said. What, dear? Osaji was very attuned to Di Vernon's motions by now and knew something was amiss. There was a faint rushing sound that seemed to come from everywhere at once. She sprinted up to the control pod, arriving only moments before Jack did. You felt it, she said, forgetting to be polite. Damn straight I did. Osaji's biggest fear, that they had collided with something, turned out not to be true. Di Vernon had come to a sudden halt in midstream. The sound she heard was water flowing past the membrane. The antenna, Jack said. Osaji had forgotten all about it. She saw now what he meant. One or more of the floats must have come loose and allowed the line to sink. They had been dragging a line along the seafloor, and now it was caught on something. We should have brought it in long ago, Osaji said, reproaching herself for irresponsibility. Now we will lose a good mooring cable. We will have to cut it away. Well, maybe we can salvage part of it, Jack said. Do you think someone would be willing to go out there to cut it? Not by myself, Jack said. I'd go with you. They planned it out carefully this time, since there would be more risk than their last job had entailed. The combination of tether and current had brought Di Vernon down closer to the bottom than it ought to be, and as soon as it was freed it would float up. They needed to be sure not to lose it. The water was noticeably warmer to Osaji. It was, of course, just as black. Lit by their headlamps, the mooring cable stretched taut, a straight line leading diagonally downward, punctuated by floats every few yards. They set out, swimming along it. The farther they went before cutting it, the more of it they would be able to salvage. 
The ark disappeared into the darkness behind them. Osaji noticed that she could now see the narrow beam of light from her headlamp. There was something dissolved in the water. For some reason, she did not want to get close to the bottom. The thought of monstrous rock shapes below her, hidden since the beginning of eternity, filled her with dread. She was about to suggest that they had come far enough and should cut the cable when Jack said, What's that? What? she said, drawing in her feet out of fear that they would touch something. Turn on the searchlight, he said. When she did, she gasped. They were surrounded by glass towers. Not solid glass, but intricate meshworks of spun filaments that glinted silver and azure in the beam of Osaji's light. As the searchlight touched the nearest ones, they seemed to ignite in a cascade, as if conducting the light from one glass strand to the next, till the entire landscape around them glowed. Latticework turrets towered over them. Gazebos and arcades of glistering mesh lay below. In the distance, some were broken and toppled but the ones nearby looked perfectly preserved. It was like a city of hoarfrost, magnified to the size of monuments. As her light played over the intricate structures, Osaji could not help the impression that it was a sort of architecture created by design. But what strange intelligence would have built a monument down here, in a lightless gulf where no one would ever see it? Even Jack at her side, after an initial exhalation of astonishment, was awed into silence. He slowly swam forward, and Osaji followed, drawn to touch, to be in the tracery sculpture, to see it from every angle. They glided through arches that dwarfed them, down a tube woven of glowing geometric webs, and looked up from inside an open spiral that towered into the black water sky. They swam along lacework corridors into honeycomb spheres of overlapping glass threads. Nowhere was there any sign of life, not a thing moved but themselves. In a glowing cathedral-like space they found three hexagonal glass pillars of uneven heights, whose surfaces were inscribed with patterns like worm tracks. Jack swam around the cluster of steely, then said what Osaji was thinking. Do you suppose it's writing? I don't know. We ought to record it. All thought of cutting the mooring line was gone now. It had been a stroke of the most astonishing luck that it had caught just here. They swam back toward it, chilled and eager to fetch some recording devices. When they emerged into the womb of the ark and stripped off their diving gear, the awe that had held them in silence broke. And Jack let out a whoop of exhilaration. Holy crap! That was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Who do you think they were? He was leaping to the assumption that Osaji had tried cautiously to suppress. It did not look natural, she admitted. But it might have been a coral or something similar. Great big humping underwater spiders, Jack speculated. But spiders that could read and write. Where's the camera? Osaji was rubbing her feet, which were the color and temperature of oysters. We ought to warm up before going back. If one of us could heat some soup, the other will find the camera. They were about to split up when the ark gave a shudder and moved. The cable was slipping. No! Jack shouted at it. Don't give way! It was too late. There was a jerk. Then suddenly the ark was rising, floating free again. Jack let out a stream of profanity, more heartfelt than any Osaji had heard from him. Can't we drop an anchor? he said. Osaji leaped to draw in the line, but long before they managed to attach an anchor to it, they both knew their chance was gone. The ark had floated on, and they were left with nothing but their memory of what they had seen. That evening Osaji came down from the control pod, where she had been studying the sonar readings to see if they had recorded evidence of the glass city, to find Jack and Moda together in the kitchen. Moda, she exclaimed, what are you doing here? Hello, dear, Moda said brightly. Do you remember Yamada? Osaji felt embarrassed that Jack had seen Moda so confused and was about to usher her back to her vac when he stopped her. We've been having an interesting conversation. How come you've been hiding away this charming lady? Moda giggled like a girl. Osaji stared at Jack, 
suspicious that he was mocking both Moda and her. She's been telling me about one round when a man named Sabo transferred from her arc to another one, Jack said, then turned to Moda. So what happened next? She looked confused. Oh, nothing in particular. It was like most of Moda's stories these days. They trailed off into pointlessness. Osaji stirred restlessly, wanting to get Moda away. I see, Jack said. Well, more power to Sabo. I say that's how a man ought to act. Moda beamed at him fondly. He leaned over and whispered to Osaji, Who the hell is Yamada? Her brother, my great uncle, Osaji said. Bit of a scapegrace, I take it? Osaji nodded. He was her favorite sibling. I'm honored to be him, he said, and rose to fetch a bottle from a cupboard. In view of the occasion, I think we ought to have some wine. It's too soon. Osaji warned him, it will taste awful. Then it should suit me nicely, he said, and broke the seal. She watched him pour some into a glass. He smelled it and winced, then took a mouthful and downed it. He grimaced, then glared at the glass resentfully. It is vile, true, Osaji said. On the contrary, he said, it's a belligerent little vintage with a sarcastic attitude. I like it very much. He took another swig. Osaji took down a glass and held it out. Jack poured her a glassful, and she took a sip. It was vinegary and revolting. Care for some? Jack asked Mota. Oh, don't give it to her, Osaji said. She wants some. An adventurous spirit, I see, he said, and poured her a tiny amount. She sipped and made a sour face. Jack laughed. You're never going to trust me again now, are you? You're always playing jokes on me. Mota said with mock severity. Come on, Mota, this man is a bad influence, Osaji said, rising. Bring her back soon. I'll turn her into a lush yet. Not with that wine, Osaji said. When she had gotten Mota safely back to her vac, Osaji returned to the kitchen. Jack was studying the sonar printouts she had brought down from the control pod. They showed next to nothing. The glass structures had been too fragile and airy to give a clear return. I'd think I had imagined the whole thing if you hadn't seen it too, Jack said. Even if we ever get back, no one will believe us. They continued drinking the wine in silence. Osaji felt as if a vast weight of sadness were hanging above her, pressing inward, making it hard to breathe. Jack, she said, we ought to make an effort to remember— Think of those people, or whatever they were, who built the city. They created all that, and now they are forgotten. So forgotten it's as if they never existed. And now we don't even have any proof we saw the city they made. We owe it to them to remember, to make them real. It's the least we can do. He gave a slight, bitter smile, as if we mattered ourselves. She saw what he meant. They were next to forgotten as well. The farther they traveled from home, the less they would be remembered. No doubt they were already given up for lost. Soon they would drift farther and farther into the night, until all trace of their existence disappeared. Nothing would remain in the end. If everyone has forgotten us, do you suppose we'll still exist? Osaji said. He stirred restlessly. You don't have enough to forget. Try living a life like mine. You'll know then. Memory's a disease. He was silent a while, and she thought he was going to say no more, but he went on. If those city builders thought they'd be remembered, they were crazy. Forgetting is what nature does best. The universe is a huge forgetting machine. It erases information no matter how hard we try to hang on to it. How could it be any different? What if the memory of everything that ever happened still existed? The universe would be clogged with information, so packed with it we couldn't move. We'd be paralyzed, because every moment we ever lived would still be with us. It would be hell. Osaji thought of Moda, in whom memory was the most evanescent thing of all. Already Osaji existed only fleetingly for Moda, and Jack was not even a separate person, only the shadow of the long-dead Yamada. And soon Moda, then all of them, would arrive at the ultimate forgetting, toward which they were traveling. They were all swimming temporarily in a sea of darkness, and then they would be gone. 
the sadness pressed in, crushing her. Her eyes were tightly closed, but seawater was leaking from them anyway. It was for the lost city, for poor Divernon, for Moda, and for herself, the most futile of them all. Jack reached across the table and took her hand. Don't listen to me, kid. I don't think I'm going to forget you. Not a chance. She clutched his hand as if he were the only thing that made her real. 6. Garden of the Deep It was impossible for Osaji to keep Moda and Jack apart in the weeks that followed. Whenever Osaji's back was turned, Moda would creep out looking for him, and when she found him, he teased her, told her inappropriate jokes, and fed her the sweet treats that were the only food she really craved. She would sit in the kitchen playing hostess to him, so polite that only Osaji could tell it was play-acting, like a little girl pretending to be an adult. Gradually, Osaji learned to stop resenting it. As they traveled, she reduced the ark's cruising depth and pored over the censor readings in hopes of finding another underwater city. Though they now kept an anchor ready to drop on a moment's notice, she saw no hint of anything but barren rock and rumpled lava on the sea floor. Then one day the water temperature shot up. When she discovered it, Osaji consulted the sonar, but the images were fuzzy and hard to interpret. She went to find Jack. I think a man should check to see what's outside, she said. Why a man, he said, to be irritating. Because someone else needs to be inside ready to throw the anchor out. They both went down to the hatch pod. Only seconds after, he disappeared through the aperture. Her radio earpiece started emitting ear-blistering vulgarities. What is it? she asked. There was no answer for several seconds. Then, there's light out here. The thought that there might be erupting lava made her hopeful. Then the more likely explanation occurred to her. You mean the Ark? Well, yes, it's glowing like gangbusters, but I meant the trees. Trees? There's a prigging forest out here. Should one drop the anchor? Yes, then get your ass out here. No offense. When she emerged from the Ark, the sight struck her dumb. The ark hovered over an undulating landscape of dimly glowing life forms that covered the sea floor thickly in every direction till they disappeared on the dark horizon. When she trained the search lamp on them, the greenish phosphor glow disappeared, and the biotic canopy proved to be made up of pinkish fronds, gently undulating in the current, attached to tall stalks that looked in every way like tree trunks, except that they were larger than any tree she had seen. Osaji and Jack swam down till they were hovering over the fronds and could see their scale. The central rib of each branch was twenty to thirty feet long, and the splayed-out fern covered an area as wide as Divernon's diameter. Jack reached out to touch the nearest one, and with a violent jerk, the whole thing retracted into its tube, leaving behind a cloud of disturbed water. Several adjacent brush tops retracted as well. They are two worms! Osaji said in astonishment, but two worms of a size she had never dreamed of. What do they eat? Jack said, still rattled by the violent reaction he had stimulated. Not us. They are filter feeders. But it would be easy to get pulled down into the tube and crushed. You're telling me? They swam down into the space thus cleared. Below the palm-like tops, the tubes were ribbed and hard, and so wide around that Osaji and Jack could not span them with their arms, even by linking hands. The trunks were crusted with orange and yellow growths that looked for all the world like fungus, except when touched, they moved. Osaji felt something brush her face, but could see nothing. Turn off your light a moment, she said. When Jack complied, they found themselves in a wholly different world. The water under the tube worm canopy was alive with glowing filaments that outlined segmented bodies, hourglass-shaped bags, lacy things like floating doilies, others like paintbrushes or fringed croissants. It was as if the trees were strung with optic fiber ornaments or fireflies in formation. When Osaji switched her light on again, they all disappeared. Jellies, she said. The light goes right through them. Lower down, there was a dense undergrowth that showed a riot of colors in their lights. There were frilly, orchid-like things, 
huge bushes of feathers, clusters of translucent orange bottles, in one place a fan lazily waving to and fro, stirring the still water. Look, your spiders, Osaji called out, training her light on a china-white creature with six spindly legs, picking its way over a thing that looked like a brain. When they turned around at last, Jack swam ahead, with Osaji lighting the way. She barely saw the thing that came arrowing out of the darkness at him. It hit him in the chest and drove him backward through the water so fast that Osaji lost him for a moment. With panic pounding in her ears, she swept her light around and saw him, seemingly impaled on a two-worm trunk with a thrashing, snake-like body attached to his chest. She churned through the water toward him, and with no weapon but her light, she gave the creature a blow. It did not let go or cease whipping its paddle-shaped tail. Jack now had a hold of it and was trying to pull it away, a maneuver that would almost surely tear his suit. She grasped the paddle tail near the front and squeezed with all her strength. It took what seemed like minutes, but the creature finally went limp and let go. She shone her light on it. It had no head, just a giant sucker where a mouth should be. With an exclamation of revulsion, she threw it away, and it floated downward into the blackness. Is your suit all right? she said, inspecting the place where the paddle tail had attached. To make sure, she took some repair goo from her utility belt and smeared it on. Never mind the suit. What about me? Jack said irritably. Are you all right? Some wear and tear, thanks for asking. Let's get back. They could see the ark through the branches above, like a bright full moon. Its bioluminescent bacteria were thriving in this nutrient-rich water. When they were inside, she inspected the bruise on Jack's chest, but determined that no ribs were broken. We need to be more careful, she said. You have a way with understatement, he answered. They spent three days documenting the new world they had discovered before floating on. At first, they stayed outside a great deal as they floated, anxious not to miss anything. Then Jack figured out how to rig a camera on the outside of the ark, so they could watch from the comfort of the control pod. Osaji marveled that she had never thought of such a thing. But then, in the Saltee Sea, there was nothing to see outside, and no light to see it by anyway. Everything there was focused inward. The underwater woodland of tube worms slowly gave way to a wide plain of seagrass. They sat atop the ark and watched the glowing prairie undulate in the currents, while their light beams picked out ray-like creatures circling in the updrafts above. One day there was a shower of mineral particles. Pebble-sized bits pattered around them like raindrops, and soon a mist of smaller ash descended. It was what was fertilizing this oasis of life. Eventually, the land began to rise, and they saw the first of the smoker chimneys belching out thick clouds of steam and dissolved minerals from deep within the planet's crust. Here, a spiny red growth dominated the ecosystem, like a branched bottle brush the size of a tower. In the sediment below the spine trees grew blooming fields of small tube worms, like chrysanthemums and daisies, and enigmatic things shaped like mesh stockings. They saw many more of the whip-like paddle tails, always swimming upstream in the direction opposite to the one the ark was floating. Occasionally, some of the brainless things would attach to the downstream side of the ark, their tails still paddling frantically as if to push the ark against the current. Then Osaji and Jack would have to go outside and weed the ark. What they never saw, though they looked all the time, was any evidence of the species that had built the glass city. I don't get this, Jack said. We find a city with no life, and life with no city. Osaji wanted to be outside all the time now. The ark's interior seemed drab and claustrophobic, and she rushed through her duties there to get into the water again. They were moored on the edge of a mazy badlands of extinct smokers. Their sides streaked like candles with brightly colored deposits of copper, sulfur, and iron. When the accident happened, Osaji was preparing to go outside when she bustled into Moda's vac and found the old lady lying on the floor, conscious but unable to speak. Panicky, Osaji knelt beside her. Moda, what happened? 
Moda only looked up with round, watery eyes. Her mouth worked. Nothing came out but a thin line of saliva. It filled Osaji with horror to see her grandmother so robbed of humanity. She jumped up and raced out to find Jack. When they tried to move Moda to the bed, she groaned in pain, her eyes wild and staring. She's probably broken something, Jack said. What can we do? Osaji said. Not a lot, Jack said grimly. Make her comfortable. Wait here. I'll be right back. He disappeared. Osaji sat on the floor holding Moda's hand. Moda gripped back, hanging on as if a strong current were sweeping her from the world. We'll try to do something for you, Moda, Osaji said. Just relax. Don't worry. Jack came back with a little sack of pills. Here, see if she can swallow this, he said. What is it? Osaji frowned at the pill he handed her. Codeine, he said. So he hadn't consumed all of them. She glanced at him, but he had turned away. She managed to get Moda to swallow the pill and wash it down from a cup with a straw. Almost at once, far quicker than the drug could have taken effect, Moda closed her eyes and relaxed. They waited till they were sure she was asleep, then moved her onto the bed. When they had done all they could, Jack said, You want me to leave or stay? At first Osaji was unsure of what she wanted. Then at last she said, Stay. So began a long ordeal of waiting. From time to time Moda would rouse and reach out for one of them. It didn't seem to matter which one. As Osaji sat looking at Moda's face, she was forced to think. I longed to be free of her, yet now I don't want her to die. More than anyone Osaji knew, Moda had forsaken her own wants in order to live for others. Selflessness. It was a virtue, everyone said so. And yet, it was as if her individuality had slowly withered away from neglect over the years. She had spent a lifetime making herself transparent till she had no substance of her own, and all you saw was the substance of others seen through her. As Osaji studied Mota's face, it seemed impossible that those mild and vacant features had ever known obsession, rage, or remorse. Had Moda ever believed deeply in something or taken risks? She had never spoken of herself, never even known herself, perhaps. Now she never would. She doesn't deserve this, Osaji said softly. After a few seconds, Jack said, No one does, but we all get it in the end. I mean to die out here, so far from everyone else. She lived for other people. Without them there's nothing left of her. There was a long silence. At last Jack said, Just to warn you, this takes a long time. It's messy and hard. People fight it, even her. He was right. She struggled painfully against the ebbing of her life. Osaji and Jack took turns sitting with her and giving her medicine when she roused. They were soon worn out, but still she hung on. At the very end, she looked up at Osaji and seemed to recognize her. Why is it so dark? she said. Don't worry about it, Moda. We're right here with you. Her hand contracted around Osaji's, and she said, I wish. Osaji never found out what she wished. Osaji dressed Moda's body in her favorite clothes, and they wrapped her in one of the weighted nets used for burial in the salty sea. At home, they would have laid her among barren rocks to nourish the microorganisms, so she could become mother to all the life that followed. Here, they laid her in a spot that was already like a garden, a cushiony bed of two worm flowers. Then they raised the anchor and floated on. It was the next day before the grief came. Osaji had gone to Moda's vac to clean up, and found in one of the wall pockets a sweater that Moda had worn till it was the shape of her. When Osaji held it up, it seemed so empty, and yet still full of her. She hugged it tight, and it gave off the smell of love. All at once Osaji missed Moda so intensely, her throat squeezed tight around her breath and around her heart, and tears pried their way out between her eyelids. She knew then she had lost the only person who would ever love her just for being herself. It was the only inadvertent love she would ever know love as deep as the genes that knit them together, there would never be anyone else who simply had to love her. 
They had come to a place where, far away through the water, they could see the flickering light of eruptions from a line of undersea volcanoes. They went outside to sit on top of the ark and watch. Do you believe in an afterlife? Osaji said. Jack paused, as if considering whether to lie. At last he said, no. So when we die, that's the end? We can only hope. After a few seconds, he added, sorry, I ought to give you comforting platitudes, I suppose. No, I hope death is the end, too, because if Moda knew we'd left her so far from everything familiar, she'd feel lost and scared forever. A paddle tail shot past them, swimming upstream. Where do you suppose they're going? Osaji said. Nowhere. They're just crazy, always swimming against the current, as if... Suddenly he stopped. What? she said. I've got an idea. It was as crazy as all his other ideas, but at least it didn't require technology they didn't have, or skills they couldn't acquire. It wasn't a spacer idea. It was a Benish idea. They set about gathering paddle tails. They used sheets of plastic, scavenged from inside the ark, vat covers, tarpaulins, anything that could be spared. They spread them wide to catch the creatures speeding past. Once affixed to a surface, the paddle tails held on tenaciously, still whipping their tails against the current. As their numbers increased, Osaji and Jack repositioned some to the upstream side of the ark, where they strained against the lines holding them as if they were in harness. Others went to the downstream side to push against the ark like so many flailing motors. The moment when Di Vernon started moving slowly against the current, Osaji and Jack slapped each other's hands in triumph, then swam to catch up with the ark. For many days they experimented and refined the rigging before they were satisfied with the way their herd of snakes was deployed. It looked absurd, as if their washing were spread out in a tattered array all around the ark, but it pulled them slowly, inexorably, backward the way they had come. They still couldn't steer, of course. The paddle tails would go only one direction, upstream, but if they kept going long enough, they would take Divernon home. Back they went, over the seagrass plains, past the two-worm jungle. Every day Osaji went to the control pod to search for the best current, strong enough to keep the paddle tails going, weak enough not to overpower them. Every day she and Jack went outside to catch more, fearful their present herd would die. In a few weeks they began to discover eggs, embedded in the rough outer membrane of the ark, the spawn of their captives. Uncertain of the paddle-tail life cycle, they gathered some to raise in one of their tanks, and left the rest to hatch outside, in hopes that the creature's instincts would bring them back to spawn in the place where they were born. They must have passed the glass city, but they did not see it and could not stop to search, they rose up over the edge of the rift valley and into the primeval waste with some misgiving. The current was much gentler here, so they made better headway, but the paddle tails did not thrive. Carefully they nursed along their second generation, experimenting to see what they ate. One day, having tried everything else, Jack poured some of his home-brewed rotgut into their tank, and they went into a frenzy trying to drink it. Kindred souls! he whooped. They need to be plastered to stay alive. After that, Osaji and Jack devoted as much biomass as they could spare to the production of alcohol. Across the dark plain, Divernon became like a floating distillery. At least something around here is lit, Jack observed. Despite their best efforts, their creatures were much depleted by the time the sonar began to show the outline of mountains ahead. Remembering the strength of the current that had swept them through the gap, Osaji worried that their paddle-tail propulsion system wouldn't have the power to get them through. She and Jack were both in the control pod when they made the first attempt. The paddle-tails pulled them unerringly toward the pass where the current flowed strongest, but as the water velocity increased, the arc slowed. Barely a hundred yards from the gap, they came to a complete stop. The paddle tails, pushing as hard as they could, could not draw them through. We've got to drop down out of the current, Osaji said. They can't do it. We're going to wear them out. Wait, Jack said, looking at the screen. What's that above us? The ice, Osaji said, dread in her heart. Here at the mountain pass, it was perilously close. Go up, he said. 
She shook her head. We could get trapped. People had warned of it all her life. It's our only choice, he said. So, quelling her fear, she input the command that would dump ballast water from the tank and send them slowly upward. As they rose, she watched the image of the ice's underside grow clearer on the screen. It was not smooth, but carved into channels, with knife-like ridges projecting down like the keels of enormous, frozen boats. The water temperature was falling. The cold made the paddle tails sluggish. Soon they would cease to pull. This isn't going to work, Osaji said softly. Hang on, Jack said. They were almost close enough to touch the ice when they felt the stirring of a counter-current flowing east. The paddle tails, paralyzed with cold, did not respond. Divernon started floating toward the mountains again, this time swept on the breath of the sea. Ahead the sonar showed that the ice and the mountain peaks converged. Get into one of those channels in the ice, Jack suggested. But what if— Just try it, for Christ's sake. What have we got to lose? They entered a deep cleft with ice walls on either side. As the mountains rose to block their way, a floor formed beneath them, cutting them off from below. Now there was no longer an option of dropping back down. They were in a tunnel of ice and rock. Ahead, the walls closed in. They felt a gentle jostle, then heard the sound of water rushing past the membrane. Divernon had come to a stop in the stream. The passage was too narrow, and they were stuck. They sat motionless for a few moments. Then Jack said, Sorry. No, Osaji said. We can't give up now. I'm going to vent air. Maybe it will push us past this narrow spot. The first jet of air had no effect. Keep going, Jack said. Less air, smaller balloon. Maybe it'll shrink us down to size. They had vented an alarming amount when Divernon stirred, slipped, and then floated on down the tunnel. Two hundred yards beyond, the floor fell out from beneath them again. Eager to escape the entrapping ice, Osaji commanded the Ark to begin a descent. A valley opened up before them, and the navigational station that had gone dead months before suddenly came to life. It's recognized where we are, Osaji cried out. We're back in the Salty Sea. The map on the screen showed that they had returned over the mountain range, barely twenty miles from the place where they had left it, close to the cleft of Golconda. No longer were there any boiling plumes. Far below them, the familiar currents had resumed. There was even a scattering of dots for the beacons of an ark swarm. Osaji seized the radio and put out a call. Annie Ark, this is Divernon. Please respond. There was silence. She repeated the call. A crackly, faraway voice came from the speaker. Which ark is that? Please repeat your call. It's Divernon, Osaji nearly shouted. Divernon? There was a pause. Where are you? Above you, just under the ice. We've just come back over the mountains. We were swept across when Golconda erupted, but we made it back. There were some staticky sounds from the radio that might have been exclamations of surprise, or a conversation on the other end, or merely interference. Divernon, did you say mountains? The radio finally said. We can't have heard you right. Please repeat. 7. Breaking Free They repeated their story many times in the hours and finally days that followed, as they sank back into the inhabited depths and the radio communication improved. They learned that the seafloor station at Golconda had not been utterly destroyed, though the main dome had collapsed in the earthquake and the port facilities had been severely damaged. The auxiliary domes had survived, and now the main one was being rebuilt. Through a friend of a friend, Osaji even learned that Kitty and her family were all right. She will be very surprised to see her sister again, the woman said over the radio. The name of Osaji was listed among the casualties. The paddle tails revived as they sank into warmer water and started towing them upstream again. Since this would take the ark by the fastest route to Golconda, they let them continue. Osaji relished the idea of arriving pulled by a snake herd in their makeshift harnesses. As they neared the station, Osaji dutifully started to pack and clean in order to vacate their purloined vessel. She had not entered Mota's vacuole since they had started the journey home. It was just as she had left it. Hardening herself against the memories, 
Osaji started to fill a recycling bin with the possessions of Moda's lifetime. She was standing with Uncle Yamada's flute in her hand when Jack peered in. Do you suppose anyone would value Yamada's flute? She said. He came in and took the flute, but gave it back. Not like you would, he said. I can't keep it, she said. Someone else will use this vac next round. One must clear everything away so the next round can begin. She stuffed the flute in the trash. I'll take it then, Jack said, and fished it out. Does it play? she asked. He blew over the air hole and it let out a protesting squawk. I guess I'll have to learn now, he said, or your motto will haunt me. He looked around the small bubble. She was a nice lady, not at all like you. Realizing what he'd said, he winced. That's not what I meant. Osaji knew what he'd meant and didn't mind. She didn't want to be like Mota. At least one person on Ben knew that about her. So what's next for you, he said. You going to settle down and have a normal life now? Osaji felt as if the room were listening for her answer. Claustrophobia suddenly oppressed her. Let's go outside, she said. Maybe we can see Golconda now. All was blackness outside, except the glowing arc itself. They swam around and sat atop it, silent with their crowded thoughts. At last Osaji said, Do spacers always go back to space? No, I think I'll give Ben another try, he said. Good, Osaji answered. He turned to look at her. Through his face mask, his expression was indistinguishable. You never answered my question. Osaji still couldn't answer right away. Even out here, she felt the pull of community and family and duty, tugging at her to become the woman she ought to be. Then, defying it all, she said, I want to go over the mountains again. Really? He said, yes. I want to find what else is out there. I want to explore the glass city and know what happened to its builders. Yeah, he said. Will Jack go back? I think I may. I've decided you Benites have something here, with these arcs, this autopoesis thing. It's not a new idea, Osaji said. It was, in fact, as old as life. No, but it's a better idea than you realize. Permeable membranes, that's the key. A constant exchange between outside and in. You've got to let the world leak in and let yourself flow out into the nutrient bath around you. You've got to let in ideas and observations and, well, affection, or you become hard and dead inside. Life is all about having a permeable self. Not so you're unclear who you are, but so you overlap a little with the others on the edges. Osaji was too surprised to say anything. She could not imagine anyone less permeable than Jack. But as she thought about it and herself, she said hesitantly, Some people are too permeable. They spend their lives trying to flow out and never take in nutrient for themselves. They end up thin and empty inside. Just then, she saw a mote of light ahead. Look, she cried. It was Golconda. Ahead waited joyous reunions, amazing tales, celebrations of a new future. Once they arrived with their news, the planet would never be the same. All the same, Jack said. I think I'll take an outboard motor next time. Orange. Neil Gaiman. Neil Gaiman, www.neilgaiman, N E I L G A I M A N dot com, lives near Minneapolis. He rose to prominence as a popular writer of intellectually and aesthetically satisfying comics, a writer whom champions of the form pointed to when challenged on whether comics could be really literate and good art. Since crossing over to writing novels and short stories, he has been greeted by similarly hospitable audiences who have showered him with awards and honors. Most recently, he won the Newbery Medal for his children's book, The Graveyard Book, 2008. He is the only fantasy writer today other than Stephen King, whose works often get made into movies. The movie of his children's novel, Coraline, came out at the beginning of 2009, and an off-Broadway musical based on Coraline opened in New York City in June 2009. Nonetheless, he remains a public figure in the field, always wears black and remains cool. He is guest of honor at Anticipation, the World Science Fiction Convention in Montreal in 2009. 
Orange, was published in The Starry Rift, an original anthology of SF for teenagers, edited by Jonathan Strahan, and one of the best SF anthologies of a strong year. It is the story of how one teenaged girl handles the invasion of Earth by aliens, told in the form of her responses to an interviewer questioning her about her sister, who has been experimenting with something out of this world. It is insightful and witty. Third Subject's Responses to Investigator's Written Questionnaire Eyes Only 1. Jemima Glorfindel Petula Ramsey 2. 17 on June the 9th 3. The last five years Before that we lived in Glasgow, Scotland Before that, Cardiff, Wales 4. I don't know I think he's in magazine publishing now He doesn't talk to us anymore the divorce was pretty bad, and Mum wound up paying him a lot of money, which seems sort of wrong to me, but maybe it was worth it just to get shot of him. 5. An inventor and entrepreneur. She invented the stuffed muffin, trademarked, and started the stuffed muffin chain. I used to like them when I was a kid, but you get kind of sick of stuffed muffins for every meal, especially because Mum used us as guinea pigs. The complete turkey Christmas dinner stuffed muffin was the worst. But she sold out her interest in the stuffed muffin chain about five years ago to start work on My Mum's Colored Bubbles. Not actually trademarked yet. 6. 2. My sister Nerisse, who was just 15, and my brother, for dairy, 12. 7. Several times a day. 8. No. 9. Through the Internet probably on eBay. 10. She's been buying colors and dyes from all over the world ever since she decided that the world was crying out for brightly colored day-glow bubbles, the kind you can blow with bubble mixture. 11. It's not really a laboratory. I mean, she calls it that. But really, it's just the garage. Only she took some of the stuffed muffins money and converted it. So it has sinks and bathtubs and Bunsen burners and things and tiles on the walls and the floor to make it easier to clean. 12. I don't know. Nerys used to be pretty normal. When she turned 13, she started reading these magazines and putting pictures of these strange bimbo women up on her wall, like Britney Spears and so on. Sorry if anyone reading this is a Britney fan, but I just don't get it. The whole orange thing didn't start until last year. 13. Artificial tanning creams. You couldn't go near her for hours after she put it on, and she'd never give it time to dry after she smeared it on her skin, so it would come off on her sheets and on the fridge door and in the shower, leaving smears of orange everywhere. Her friends would wear it too, but they never put it on like she did. I mean, she'd slather on the cream with no attempt to look even human-colored, and she thought she looked great. She did the tanning salon thing once, but I don't think she liked it, because she never went back. 14. Tangerine Girl, The Oompa Loompa, Carrot Top, Go Mango, Orangina. 15. Not very well, but she didn't seem to care, really. I mean, this is a girl who said that she couldn't see the point of science or math, because she was going to be a pole dancer as soon as she left school. I said, nobody's going to pay to see you and the all together. And she said, how do you know? And I told her that I saw the little quick time films she'd made of herself dancing nudie and left in the camera. And she screamed and said, give me that. And I told her I'd wiped them. But honestly, I don't think she was ever going to be the next Betty Page or whoever. She's a sort of squarish shape for a start. 16. German measles, mumps, and I think Pruderi had chicken pox when he was staying in Melbourne with the grandparents. 17. In a small pot. It looked a bit like a jam jar, I suppose. 18. I don't think so. Nothing that looked like a warning label anyway. Yes, there was a return address. It came from abroad, and the return address was in some kind of foreign lettering. 19. You have to understand that Mum had been buying colors and dyes from all over the world for five years. The thing with the day glow bubbles is not that someone can blow glowing colored bubbles. It's that they don't pop and leave splashes of dye all over everything. 
Mum says that would be a lawsuit waiting to happen, so no. 20. There was some kind of shouting match between Nerisse and Mum to begin with, because Mum had come back from the shops and not bought anything from Nerisse's shopping list except the shampoo. Mum said she couldn't find the tanning cream at the supermarket, but I think she just forgot. So Nerisse stormed off and slammed the door and went into her bedroom and played something that was probably Britney Spears really loudly. I was out the back, feeding the three cats, the chinchilla, and a guinea pig named Roland, who looks like a hairy cushion, and I missed it all. 21. On the kitchen table. 22. When I found the empty jam jar in the back garden the next morning. It was underneath Nerisse's window. It didn't take Sherlock Holmes to figure it out. 23. Honestly, I couldn't be bothered. I figured it would just be more yelling, you know, and Mum would work it out soon enough. 24. Yes, it was stupid, but it wasn't uniquely stupid, if you see what I mean. Which is to say, it was par for the course for Nari stupid. 25. That she was glowing. 26. A sort of pulsating orange. 27. When she started telling us that she was going to be worshipped like a god, as she was in the dawn times. 28. Pruderi said she was floating about an inch above the ground, but I didn't actually see this. I thought he was just playing along with her newfound weirdness. 29. She didn't answer to Nerys anymore. She described herself mostly as either my imminence or the vehicle. It is time to feed the vehicle. 30. Dark chocolate which was weird, because in the old days I was the only one in the house who even sort of liked it. But Pruderi had to go out and buy her bars and bars of it. 31. No, Mum and me just thought it was more Nerisse. Just a bit more imaginatively weirdo Nerisse than usual. 32. That night, when it started to get dark, you could see the orange pulsing under the door, like a glowworm or something, or a light show. The weirdest thing was that I could still see it with my eyes closed. 33. The next morning, all of us. 34. It was pretty obvious by this point. She didn't really even look like Nerisse any longer. She looked sort of smudged, like an afterimage. I thought about it, and it's... okay. Suppose you were staring at something really bright that was a blue color. Then you close your eyes, and you'd see this glowing, yellowy-orange afterimage in your eyes. That was what she looked like. 35. They didn't work either. 36. She let Pruderi leave to get her more chocolate. Mum and I weren't allowed to leave the house anymore. 37. Mostly, I just sat in the back garden and read a book. There wasn't very much else I really could do. I started wearing dark glasses, so did Mum because the orange light hurt our eyes. Other than that, nothing. 38. Only when we tried to leave or call anybody. There was food in the house, though, and stuffed muffins in the freezer. 39. If you'd just stopped her wearing that stupid tanning cream a year ago, we wouldn't be in this mess. But it was unfair, and I apologized afterward. 40. When Pruderi came back with the dark chocolate bars, he said he'd gone up to a traffic warden and told him that his sister had turned into a giant orange glow and was controlling our minds. He said the man was extremely rude to him. 41. I don't have a boyfriend. I did, but we broke up after he went to a Rolling Stones concert with the evil, bottle-blonde former friend whose name I do not mention. Also, I mean, the Rolling Stones— these little old goat men, hopping around the stage, pretending to be all rock and roll, please. So, no. 42. I'd quite like to be a vet, but then I think about having to put animals down, and I don't know. I want to travel for a bit before I make any decisions. 43. The garden hose. We turned it on full while she was eating her chocolate bars, and distracted, and we sprayed it at her. 44. Just orange steam, really. Mum said that she had solvents and things in the laboratory, if we could get in there. But by now, her imminence was hissing mad, literally, and she sort of fixed us to the floor 
I can't explain it. I mean, I wasn't stuck, but I couldn't leave or move my legs. I was just where she left me. 45. About half a meter above the carpet. She'd sink down a bit to go through doors, so she didn't bump her head. And after the hose incident, she didn't go back to her room, just stayed in the main room and floated about grumpily, the color of a luminous carrot. 46. Complete world domination. 47. I wrote it down on a piece of paper and gave it to Pruderi. 48. He had to carry it back. I don't think her eminence really understood money. 49. I don't know. It was Mum's idea more than mine. I think she hoped that the solvent might remove the orange, and at that point it couldn't hurt. Nothing could have made things worse. 50. It didn't even upset her, like the hose water did. I'm pretty sure she liked it. I think I saw her dipping her chocolate bars into it before she ate them, although I had to sort of squint up my eyes to see anything where she was. It was all a sort of great orange glow. 51. That we were all going to die. Mum told Pruderi that if the great Oompa Loompa let him out to buy chocolate again, he just shouldn't bother coming back. And I was getting really upset about the animals. I hadn't fed the chinchilla or Roland the guinea pig for two days, because I couldn't go into the back garden. I couldn't go anywhere, except the loo, and then I had to ask. 52. I suppose because they thought the house was on fire, all the orange light. I mean, it was a natural mistake. 53. We were glad she hadn't done that to us. Mum said it proved that Narice was still in there somewhere, because if she had the power to turn us into goo, like she did the firefighters, she would have done. I said that maybe she just wasn't powerful enough to turn us into goo at the beginning, and now she couldn't be bothered. 54. You couldn't even see a person in there any more. It was a bright orange pulsing light, and sometimes it talked straight into your head. 55. When the spaceship landed. 56. I don't know. I mean, it was bigger than the whole block, but it didn't crush anything. It sort of materialized around us, so that our whole house was inside it, and the whole street was inside it, too. 57. No, but what else could it have been? 58. A sort of pale blue. They didn't pulse, either. They twinkled. 59. More than six, less than twenty. It's not that easy to tell if this is the same intelligent blue light you were just speaking to five minutes ago. Sixty. Three things. First of all, a promise that Narice wouldn't be hurt or harmed. Second, that if they were ever able to return her to the way she was, they'd let us know and bring her back. Thirdly, a recipe for fluorescent bubble mixture. I can only assume they were reading Mum's mind because she didn't say anything. It's possible that her imminence told them, though. She definitely had access to some of the vehicle's memories. Also, they gave Pruderi a thing like a glass skateboard. 61. A sort of a liquid sound. Then everything became transparent. I was crying and so was Mum. And Pruderi said, cool beans. And I started to giggle while crying. And then it was just our house again. 62. We went out into the back garden and looked up. There was something blinking, blue and orange, very high, getting smaller and smaller, and we watched it until it was out of sight. 63. Because I didn't want to. 64. I fed the remaining animals. Roland was in a state. The cats just seemed happy that someone was feeding them again. I don't know how the chinchilla got out. 65. Sometimes. I mean, you have to bear in mind that she was the single most irritating person on the planet, even before the whole her eminence thing. But yes, I guess so, if I'm honest. 66. Sitting outside at night, staring up at the sky, wondering what she's doing now. 67. He wants his glass skateboard back. He says that it's his, and the government has no right to keep it. You are the government, aren't you? Mum seems happy to share the patent for the colored bubble recipe with the government, though. The man said that it might be the basis of a whole new branch of molecular something or other. Nobody gave me anything, so I don't have to worry. 68. Once, 
in the back garden, looking up at the night sky. I think it was only an orangishy star, actually. It could have been Mars. I know they call it the Red Planet, although once in a while I think that maybe she's back to herself again and dancing up there, wherever she is. And all the aliens love her pole dancing because they just don't know any better, and they think it's a whole new art form, and they don't even mind that she's sort of square. 69. I don't know. Sitting in the back garden, talking to the cats, maybe, or blowing silly-colored bubbles. 70. Until the day that I die. I attest that this is a true statement of events. Signed, Date. Memory Dog, Kathleen Ann Goonan. Kathleen Ann Goonan, www.goonan, G-O-O-N-A-N, dot com, lives in Tavernier, Florida, and in the mountains of Tennessee. She drew the attention of the SF field in the mid-1990s with Queen City Jazz, 1995, which became the first of four volumes to date in her Nanotech Chronicles, an ambitious postmodern blend of literary appropriation and hard SF. She has published a number of short stories that often show a fascination with history and popular culture. Her latest novel, In War Times, based on the true experiences of her father in World War II, with SF added, was published in 2007 and won awards. Her forthcoming novel, This Shared Dream, is an independent sequel. Memory Dog was published in Asimov's, which continued to be a leading SF magazine in a declining market. It is an excellent story in a dystopian setting, very much like the year 2008 in some regards, about advances in memory technologies. The protagonist is a man who has chosen to have his personality and memories irrevocably transferred into the body of a dog, knowing that his life is shortened. This he does in penance for the death of his young daughter, for which his ex-wife will never forgive him. Then he returns home in doggy disguise. She is always busy, and today the temperature is dropping. So she splits wood, and I lie next to her, paws outstretched, belly on cold ground, panting breath outflowing, white, memory huge and bleeding, not keeping to one track, mammalian but skipping, skipping. She is ferocious with energy. She is mad. The chips fly everywhere, and so do the split logs. Splinter, splinter, splinter. Kindling. The insides of trees smell sweet, sharp. Arnold Wentworth watches from his wheelchair at the window. She is not angry at him. We brought him here. It was an arduous journey, but my kind likes journeys. Their imperativeness pulls us, gives us purpose. We know we will find you eventually. Take us for a ride. Throw us out of the car and drive off. We will think you made a big mistake and make it home again. Split and long crunch of log fiber. She does not know me, but I know her. She used to be different, and I was too. I am her memory device, but she has lost the key. This happened before our memories were beamed down to us, among us. Our thoughts, our feelings, re-edited and re-cut events, some true, some false, but all completely manipulative, emanate from the all-over station in a constant flood. Some of us knew it was coming, or at least suspected, and took steps. The three of us in our strange symbiosis are immune, but we have to live out here, alone. People would notice, and there are those who want to find us. A pale flare curves against gathering storm clouds. It comes from Evans Ridge, which used to be a tourist town, but which is now a rebel stronghold. They have a missile launcher hidden in a bread delivery truck. At least that's what Jake says. I even hear the small pop when the missile hits the floater, but she cannot. Her senses are dimmer than mine. I would not have guessed how many people just wanted, needed, an excuse to use weapons. Everything went to hell fast, overnight it seemed, and everywhere. Individuals joyously got out their guns, knives, bombs, and missiles. Nations happily suspended diplomatic relations and declared war. We are safe here, at least today. Elizabeth still believes she can change people, that Arthur's smacks can do that. The worst memories, the deepest, most searing, and most universal, are inside a small protective bubble. The bubble is inside of me.
She has no idea. Perhaps I am loving this too much, watching her, being with her, putting off what needs to be done, but I am in heaven. I hear it before her, the low sound of the truck engine, the hiccup of the driver shifting gears, and jump up, stiff, growling. Alerted, she lowers her axe and stands waiting, wondering, is this the time? She picks up the pistol she left on the rock next to the chopping block. Who is a girl? Get him, Daisy. By now I've recognized the sound of Jake's truck, relax, and run down the steep hidden road wagging my tail. Jake, a local farmer that Elizabeth has known since she was a teenager, brings us supplies, food, gasoline for the generator so we can save the propane in the big buried tank, and local news. Not regularly. The dead-end tree-hidden dirt road below us also goes to property he owns, so it is far more likely that the smoke from our wood stove would give us away than Jake's visits. But this has been a vacation hideaway for years, so we could be anyone. Jake understands the need for not revealing who we are. I was cast off, taken for a ride, thrown out of the car, but I came back. I will always come back. I am a dog. Rain strikes the leaves, making them shiver. Fall is almost over, and they are few. By tomorrow, according to the weather news that is so submerged in my brain that I no longer have to access it deliberately, the trees will be cloaked in ice. Jake gone, Elizabeth continues to split wood, glancing at the sky nervously. Weather is just about the only kind of uncorrupted television information she can get now. The rest of television, a million stations with no exaggeration, is sheer entertainment, even what they call the news. I call it the all-over station, because every station and all of the news is the same, essentially. The weight of all-over draws everyone in, together, the same way a hearth fire would. It is almost impossible to resist. It is so full of death and murder and pain that we take it for granted, that this is the way of the world and nothing can be done. They are wrong. Truth comes in the form of news pods, released into the air, drawn hither and yon by the magnetic call of those who swallowed the black market pill that gives them access to a million independent potters. They call these news pods smacks. You get smacked with the truth every once in a while. The pod, an electromagnetic bundle of information, smacks your face, really just a light caress, and then true news, if you believe the source, unfolds within you. Arnold Wentworth was a smacker, one of the most well-known and respected. The smacks were in the air, tangible things, like seeds adrift in the wind, after we all knew that it was truth useless on the airwaves. He composed and sent smacks, and they were not the right smacks because they too often told the truth. He was Elizabeth's mentor, and her fury and her wit brought him here. Many people believed Arnold Wentworth, so many that he was considered to be a threat to the government, and tortured. Millions of people worldwide took the Arnold Wentworth pill, disseminated on the black market, all based on the deepest trust, and Arnold, over the years, had earned that trust. Now only Elizabeth has Arnold's smack code, only she can release his smacks. I am a forbidden creature, or at least I would be in all over. My brain is my entire body, every bit of it pressed into many functions at once, for I am a memory dog, the only one of my kind. I am adrift in places and thoughts that are not really here. Here is quickly bearing branches, lake marsh behind with ice creeping across its surface, low gray sky and gray geese flying, honking, saying simply, go, 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 their amazing brains taken up by getting there, by magnetism. Here is the pile of supplies Jake deposited on the porch before driving away. Here is the strict chop of her axe, her low muttered, fuck them all, which issues as rhythmically as the down blow of the blade, and it's thunk into the block beneath the split log. Fuck them all, thunk. Fuck them all, thunk. Fuck them all. The pile of split wood grows. The man watches from the window, and I am thankful that I do not have his memories too, for they are hideous. Here is free from feeling my own memories, mostly. I still know them, though. Knowing is a form of enormous selfishness. 
I revel, for now, in knowing Wendy, Jolly, Elizabeth, and me, Mike. Sometimes I remember my name is Mike. Arnold may heal eventually. He cannot talk, not yet, but is beginning to. He had a stroke, a specially administered stroke. Tears well constantly and creep down his face, and he cannot or does not bother to wipe them away. I nudge his resting hands with my long nose from time to time, and his hand sometimes stirs and rests on my head. I get little from him, but whatever I get is becoming stronger. Perhaps he is recovering. From her, I get electric anger, stabbing fury, the energy that still cannot be words. She moves quickly, bringing in armfuls of split wood and clonking them onto the pile next to the hot stove. It is too hot in here, but maybe it is good for Arnold. She hauls in the supplies, too, piling them up on the kitchen table, getting them in out of the rain. She was not always so angry. She was in love with Arnold. She potted lyrically to him, and the pods, I know, unfolded within him, potent flowers of information, sharp and intense as her, and he could not help answering. After a year of this, he left his wife, and his wife reported him, out of jealousy and sadness, and the government came because of the truth of his pods, and now we are left with what once was Arnold. I am memory, and memory is pain. But I was made strong enough to bear it, for I made myself. I, the self that knows myself, cannot get out of the bargain, the deep being of my cells. Oh, I could be killed. I could die if injured. I cannot, though, knowingly cause injury to myself. I am like a robot in this regard. I did this because I so often contemplated suicide, so often thought of the tree speeding toward me as I drove, or the wrists in the bathtub, or the gun in the drawer. This dance around oblivion tired me tremendously, but with a long-regarded plan, and then in an instant of strength and resolve, I did away with it. Rain turns to snow outside. Elizabeth plays jazz on the radio, even as the all-over station, behind her, fills the screen with silent, written opinion-molding headlines and alerts. Right now we hear an Oscar Peterson piece. It is a special talent of mine, one I was pleased to retain, a jazz encyclopedia. I can tell who plays instantly, who sings. The sounds are horizontal planes that slide across one another. Mostly, they stay distinct, but sometimes, precisely, they intersect. With a dog's fine ears, augmented by songbird genes, I find my pleasure. It is not the only reason I stick with her, but it is a plus, jazz. The wood in the stove snaps and pops. We are a joyous popping rhythm laced with the anger that is always there, that makes her movements quick and impatient, that erodes her heart with anger-generated substances. She wheels Arnold to the shower room, and I pad along behind. I hope it's warm enough now, she says, and unbuttons his shirt, unbuckles his belt, slides off his clothes, tests the temperature of the water, and rolls him under it, wheelchair and all. Water draws his gray-black curly hair straight down his face, over his eyes. Her long, blonde, pulled-back hair holds beads of water in the fine tendrils around her face. Ja, he says, ja. Uh-huh, she says, good. But her face does not say good. I think he is trying to say the name of his first wife, Jane. He is saying more consonants now, guh. And then his eyes shift, and he looks right at me, muh. Elizabeth twists off the taps and grabs a towel from a pile on a nearby chair. She rubs Arnold's hair. She lifts his chin and looks into his eyes, kisses him swiftly, sighs, and gets his shoulders. Grab hold, she says and he obediently grasps the bar in front of him and pulls himself up, shaking, his pale skin sagging from his ribs, his chest hair white, although he is only fifty. They made him old. She briskly dries his back, his buttocks, the backs of his legs, and plops a dry towel onto the wheelchair seat. Okay, he gasps and falls back into his chair. She's dried his face, so the wet tracks are new tears. She is gentle. Her anger abates when she touches him. I am glad for her. I am sad for her. I am simply a wraith of emotion rising around her. I nudge her elbow. She pats my head absently.
After she dries and dresses him, he sits on the couch. He can sit up without falling over. Every day she makes him exercise, moves his limbs, tries to make him reach or grip or try to repeat sounds or words after her. Kuh, he says slowly, drawing out the sound, Kuh. I lie on my side by the stove into which she has shoved her split logs. The television is on, tuned low. She thinks it helps Arnold. All that is on it is stuff, stuff, stuff. Lies that they call news, celebrities, murders, gossip. A low growling sigh escapes me as I relax into the warmth. I think of Arnold's first face, when they were colleagues, not lovers, and I was Elizabeth's husband. Are these my memories? Hers? Jollies? I no longer know. That is what is so wonderful. It is getting too hot in the cabin. I scratch the door, she lets me out, and I lie on the porch, on guard. Mist flows in and obscures some of the details. Everything is still there, behind the mist, like brilliant red and yellow maples on a far ridge. You know they are there, you just can't see them. Think of the cloud, with its wind-driven fringes, as beautiful. Think of your mind as weather. Think of your brain as a storm. Arnold is stuck in a storm, locked, unable to move. Being a dog is a joyful thing. First, way back when it was new, it was a memory pill. Yes, say it, memory drug. I worked on a lot of the original research. Initially, for those who were terribly impaired, it was such a boon that its quick spread to the rest of the population could not be stopped. It was to help people with memory deficits, which is to say, most people. And it was to help with useful memories. Where did I put the car keys? What the hell is his name? However, it of course did not distinguish between users who were terrifically impaired and the rest of us. And most importantly, it did not sort memories as to importance. It bypassed mechanisms that do such things. It turned up all the signals. So it became the drug of choice for anyone who could lay hands on it. The possible dangers were trumpeted by the press. But if you could enhance your doctoral, legal, or high school pop quiz performance, why not? It raised the bar for everyone. Real and counterfeit pills, injections, and patches were for sale in the third world and in the school parking lot. The world was awash in memories. They were all imperative. People wrote memoirs, previously the domain of those obsessed with the past, just to take the pressure off. The intense numinosity of memories caused constant reruns of one's life. Memory overload became a common plea in traffic accidents. The memory of a grievous wrong sharpened and would not let the wronged one rest until it was avenged. One way or another, when we are stretched out of our previous shape, we jostle the status quo in ways we could not have predicted. So here we all went, our memories stretched and teeming with visual, audible replays, as if we were all schizophrenics, into a well-to-be-remembered future. For some, writers, painters, musicians, those who dealt in emotions, the memory drug was a boon. It produced a heightening of effect. The present always led to the past. The past was therefore always present, layered and linked and resonant with longing, love, and resolution, or hate, revenge, plots laid and hatched and brought to fruition, and the results lived with, and lived with, inescapably. Christian churches, with their confession and absolution, experienced a resurgence. We were all evil, deeply evil, and could not forget it. We could only hand over the guilt to an almighty being, or we remembered joyous, pagan interconnectedness with nature, danced in circles, and our minds floated into a golden ether of fairies, dwarves, witches, tree gods, and druids. Whatever. I'm telling you, the whole thing was a god-awful mess. It was not all bad. Some learned to control their memories. The visual used pictures or objects to set off links of associations. Meditation, emptying one's mind, became big. Our minds and memories tortured us. Forgetting was a blessing. Many people had permanent memory release modules implanted in their bodies, and some, like myself, were genetically engineered to produce the necessary enhancing chemicals. 
I will never forget the whole of Elizabeth's being after Wendy, our three-year-old, died. That, and my own grief, and Jolly's, is the key that I hold. It really was my fault, because Elizabeth screamed after we came home from the hospital, gently ejected from the ER, and then the chapel, and then the lobby, after Wendy was pronounced dead. I had taken too many memory drugs, too much of them, and could no longer pay attention to the simplest thing. Mike, you didn't even know she was out in the street. It was true. I can see the various angles of Elizabeth's fury-stretched face, her anger-stunned eyes, her chest heaving as she gasps for breath, hear the hoarseness of her voice as it devolves into small shreds of sound. Her face is mottled red, like some pale, mineral dappled stone, and her straight blonde hair is pasted onto her cheeks by tears. Her smell is of sweat, too, sharp, one she has never had before. It tastes sour and unpleasant. This grief is memory, and it is Jolly's memory, for our collie rushed out the front door after Wendy, tried to keep her from the road. The neighbor who was also running toward her at the time told us. When we got back from the hospital, Jolly ran to Elizabeth, emitting hoarse barks, licking the back of her hand, pawing at her leg, and then jumping up, planting her paws square on Elizabeth's chest, barking like fury right in her face, until Elizabeth drew Jolly tightly to her, and they both collapsed backwards onto a chair, Elizabeth crying, Jolly licking her face as she was never, never allowed to do, while I stood dumb and stunned and empty. The next day, Jolly disappeared. We knew she was looking for Wendy, trying to find her and bring her back. As Elizabeth made funeral arrangements, I walked the neighborhood, and later that night, while Elizabeth sobbed, I called Jolly out the car window, driving slowly down nearby roads. I put up signs. The next morning, while I was walking into the dog pound, Elizabeth called my cell phone. A man just found Jolly in a ditch next to Bartello Street down where it curves. Her voice was flat. She thought Jolly's death was my fault, too. She was probably right. I was supposed to fix the fence. I hadn't. I went and lifted Jolly from the ditch. He was stiff. I took him down the road to our vets and asked that he be flash-frozen. They do this all the time at the vets. People don't always have time to deal with their dead pets immediately. Step back, he said, as he lifted Jolly's shrink-wrapped body into the open freezer but I didn't, and tears froze on my face. I was not fit to be a person. I wasn't fit to be alive at all, not any more. I shared Elizabeth's opinion in this matter. After everything was done with, after we buried Wendy, after I realized that Elizabeth would never speak to me again, and with good reason, I watched her take up with Arnold, who was a good man, an exemplary man, a man dedicated to the good of humankind and not addicted to memory pills. You would never find him standing in a daze in his kitchen, being perhaps his grandmother, cutting carrots in another high-ceilinged, marble-tabled kitchen while his toddler wandered out the door. He was definitely not me. I decided to become a dog. I would doggedly survive. Perhaps at some point I could be of use to Elizabeth. Oh, of course— the form and deep being of many creatures were inviting to me, as I contemplated. The long life and intelligence of elephants, of parrots. The interior brilliance of panthers, snow leopards, tigers. Yet I could have them all in this form, the dog. No mammal, save the human, kills itself. But there was no room for big cats or elephants, where I was going to live, in this world of humans. Was it penance of a sort? I cannot say I do not remember, for that is about all I do. But there are rooms I do not go into. I do not go into the room of Wendy. There is no understanding that room. I admire Elizabeth. She lives in the room of Wendy. Still, that is her anger. I cannot get in the door, because I am dog. Wendy, the true, real room of Wendy, is in the smack I so carefully composed, encased in its protective bubble. I have locked myself out. If I went in the door, I would kill myself, and that is something I cannot do. Understanding is in the hands of God, and God does not exist. 
There are many logical conundrums on the threshold of Wendy's door, and as a dog, I am free to not examine them. It was not really much of a decision. I remember those days as great swaths of scent, of grief-smelling spring wind that Wendy would never again smell, the green, rich sea smell, fresh and mineral damp, when I lifted a handful of wet sand to my eyes to see what she had seen, translucent prisms of obsidian green, pure true brown, golden, sharp-planed bits that dried and blew away before I could move. So perhaps I was already inclined to dog, thinking in dog memories of overwhelming smell. I guess that somewhat distantly I was considering my options, and I can see so much more clearly now what I was thinking, as I have said, the elephant, the cat. Animal seemed the only option. To change shape, to give misery a different vessel, a different shape in which to bounce its energy about, as if emotion were the straight geometry of billiards. On this day I saw a dog running down the beach between a man and a woman. Their child ran with the dog and grabbed his long black tail. The dog twisted free, frolicked and leapt, and he seemed happy. I craved the relief of what looked like simple happiness. That afternoon I drove back from the beach, went to the Big Mart, and loaded up on dog food. Ellie Wills was in the next line. We all shop at the Big Mart now, even for a gallon of milk. I thought your dog died. Then she looked aghast and embarrassed for an instant, remembering my greater loss. I pretended not to see the look. I'm thinking about getting another one. What kind? Huh, what kind? A dog-like dog. Wag, bark, happy. Another collie. Collies are stupid. I'd never much liked Ellie Wills, but for an instant I purely loathed her. No, they're not, I said, bristling in advance for my future self and for dear Jolly. It was the right choice for various reasons. I wouldn't want to be a menace. Collies are kind, not inclined to viciousness, and filled with love like me, bursting with love, with infinite flavors of regret. I wiped my eyes. I've got a cold. I know, she said. I'm so sorry about Wendy. It's not your fault. I reeled with memories not just of Wendy, but of everything, everything, echoing into forever, and reached for the seventy-five-pound bag and hauled it onto the belt. Any coupons? asked the checkout clerk. Love has no pride. I needed Elizabeth. She did not need me. She despised and hated me. She wished me dead. So when I left the note saying that I was leaving and that she should not try to find me, I am sure she did not grieve. She was probably relieved. There was penance, too, in my decision to become a dog. I had enough reason to feel guilty, certainly, enough for several men for several lifetimes, even without the weight of Wendy. Because of what we did to the snails, the mice, we transferred memories from one mouse to the other, memories of how to run the maze. Then we killed them, casually, by the thousands. It was the job of a grad student, his or her choice about how to do it. But that was long before the drug, long before my addictive hypermanesia, the opposite of amnesia, remembering everything, having, even, mental events that you think are memories, but which are not. Dr. Lorenzo, at first horrified, finally agreed after hearing my whole story, after knowing who I was and what I had done and why it was so necessary to me. I had read of her work for years in journals. We had spoken at the same international meetings. I offered myself as an experiment. There was no paper trail, none at all, so both of us knew that actually it was too subjective to be any kind of an experiment. It was a favor to me. For all she knew, she was murdering me. But I easily convinced her that otherwise I would kill myself anyway, because it was true. It took me several months in the lab to distill the essence I was after. Almost all of us are able to feel grief and loss, but it is so painful and overwhelming that we soon become numb in various degrees. Some of us can kill others without feeling any remorse. We can justify it. Others of us are capable of causing pain on a large scale. We command armies and call it necessary and civilized. What might change this? Arnold Wentworth had his ideas. I had mine. Becoming a Dog 
I cohabited gently, slowly. The initial work took weeks. It was a matter of the cells remembering, deep memories, cross-species, the work of a brilliant memory master, experimental and forbidden. And, remember, we could do specific. So, from Jolly, frozen since her death, I got Jolly's Wendy and Jolly's extreme grief. We could also do long-term change. We could fix an emotion, a vision, a scene, in long-term memory by precisely implanting specific molecules of one brain into the other. In the early days of memory work, we learned how to change the neurostructure of mice in various ways. We took out genes or inserted them. We traced protein encoding. We traced the precise mechanisms by which long-term memories survive in the brain. By then, we were able to transfer exact memories, how to run the maze, what color symbolized an exit, what sound meant food, from one mouse to another. Behavior was then replicated without the experience needed by the first mouse to form the memory. That was the dawn years ago. There were many more steps to go, much more to learn, before we reached the final complex product, me. The puppy had preparatory genetic work done, the infusion of identity structures, mine, distilled from a myriad of information Dr. Lorenzo retrieved from my human body. I am, perhaps, a precursor. Perhaps not. My reasons for becoming a dog are unique, and neither the process as it stands now, nor the product, would be approved by any government. The puppy, so new, welcomed me, not surprised, and our neurons intertwined quickly, for she was growing like all new things, swiftly, her brain branching and branching, I thought I could keep out of her way. I had no real wish to use her body in any way other than to be near Elizabeth. But it was inevitable that we become one. It was just my way of driving into a tree. I am happy with the results. I am always happy now. I am a dog. I had to learn to be a dog. At first it was awkward to have four legs, but then it was liberating. I surprisingly remembered what it was like to be human and a toddler, like Wendy, so low to the ground. As I tumbled along on four short legs, I remembered my own two short ones, the sense of growth and maturity I'd felt when finally I could balance on one leg, take the next step, then balance on that leg and take the next step, instead of putting both feet on each step at the same time. In six months I had grown to be an almost full-sized female collie, tricolored. I was cast off, taken for a ride, thrown out of the car, for the wrong I did, for my deep negligence as a human. But I came back. But it was my own ride, and I will always come back now. I am a dog. One of Dr. Lorenzo's grad students released me near my old house, as agreed, though she hadn't a clue about anything. The student loved me. She'd walked and fed me for weeks. She scratched behind my ears, patted my side heartily, called Dr. Lorenzo three times to make sure. I can't just leave her here. Dog-like, I loved the student so much that I wouldn't have minded staying with her. But she obeyed my previous instructions, sternly relayed by Dr. Lorenzo, and put me out eventually. As you see, this was no remedy for my problem, as I had hoped. Already the minutiae of memory crowded round but it was intimate memory, the memory of learning how to control one's own body, the second sensory explosion my own consciousness, my own identity, had experienced. My love of the world returned, and my guilt receded for a time. First, I walked doubtfully down the sidewalk. Next, I trotted, and then galloped, liquid memory, a mere outline of a dog, through which flowed images, smells, imperative, striking me fully in the brain, loudly, immediately, like a live symphony orchestra. The spring earth was thawing rich and damp. I scrambled beneath the fence, using the same hole Jolly used to escape, which I ought to have boarded up, but assailed with too much memory, paradoxically forgot to do. I ran to the basement crawl space door, pushed away its rotted door, and bellied inside, I ripped through the industrial-strength plastic bag I'd wrapped the dog food in and crunched down on the brown, intensely delicious nuggets. Upstairs I heard Lester Young on the stereo, and Arnold, "'What's for dinner?' he said. "'What's for dinner?' 
The bastard didn't even cook for her. I barked. What's that? she said, and her voice thrilled me. A million instants like stars shot through me in the underhouse darkness. Her. I barked again and ran around to the front door, squealing and jumping up onto the door. She opened it and laughed. Look, Arnold, a collie. I see. She opened the door and let me in. I ran to every corner, sniffing joyfully, whining, and emitting small barks, smelling her, and smelling Elizabeth and Wendy and Jolly and our whole lives. I smelled this, that, and the other thing. I was bursting with the joy and sadness of the past. I ran into every room, her office, mine, the kitchen, faster than fast, at four-legged dog speed, scrabbling and twisting as if bringing a gazelle to ground. Elizabeth laughed hard with great joy. I shook myself into a frenzy, wheeling and barking, until Elizabeth grabbed me and said, Hey, hey! She looked into my eyes, and for an instant I thought she knew. But how could she? Someone's lost him, said Arnold. We need to call the dog pound. Her? She doesn't have a collar. Someone will be looking for her. Dogs like this don't grow on trees. No, we grow in labs. I licked her face. I swallowed her memories. A rumble arose in my chest, and I transmuted it into a sharp bark. Elizabeth reached down, ruffled my head fur, and I happily danced, all dog, threw in a few leaps. Elizabeth said, she stays. Arnold's scent was slightly sour. He smiled. Whatever you want, honey. His eyes, when he looked at me, were irritated. I didn't care. He was not the boss. She was. Memory is anatomical change, period. Neuronal change, synaptic change. A plygia, a giant marine snail, has few brain cells compared to mammals, and they are comparatively large. It was a good subject for early memory studies. It is a beautiful marine animal, its head arching up and around, topped by what looks like fronds of a stubby palm. However, it is usually ensconced in its shell, so you can't see all of that. It is a hermaphrodite. Training creates actual anatomical changes. Memory is physical. I wanted to remember love. I wanted to remember Elizabeth and Wendy. I wanted to remember the extraordinary web of being in which I had lived, and because I did not know whether or not the experiences that you or I might call bad, the disappointments, the setbacks, might have contributed to the overall flavor of that being, like a wash of one pigment over another gives a watercolor depth, or a pinch of spice gives a dish an indefinable flavor, and because, let's face it, I was a memory addict, I wanted it all, all of it in the skull of a dog. The heads of true collies are not pinched, and they are herding dogs so their memories have to do with the big picture and being bossy and with speed, direction, and following complex signals. Their long, flowing coats are beautiful. I chose to be a female because I did not want to be reflexively aggressive, because I wanted to be like Jolly. Lying at Elizabeth's feet, I knew I had made the right choice. After they were in bed that first night, I padded to the door of Wendy's room, this was not the room of Wendy that is inside me, the room I made, the room I can't go into, the room full of pain. This was her real, lovely, physical room, frilly purple and green like she wanted. Moonlight stretched across the bed, washed the pillows. Rumble, her beloved teddy bear, lay there, stub arms outstretched, his black bead eyes facing the window. I whined. I stretched out on my belly, put my chin on the floor. I howled and was surprised. I did not know I could howl. It was a truly mournful sound, a soul-releasing, oh, God damn it, Arnold's voice. Shh, it's okay. Get back in bed. I still had teeth. I could bite if I decided to do so. My growl was low, but sufficiently ferocious. When I heard Elizabeth's moans through the doorway, they did not bother to close the door. I could have shot through that doorway, leapt onto the bed, and torn out Arnold's throat. Rapid pictures filled my mind. Elizabeth's naked legs parted for me. I padded to the kitchen, tipped over the garbage can. What's that? I heard Elizabeth say, and then whatever Arnold did made her shriek with delight. 
I teased a trail of chicken bones and rotted vegetables across the kitchen floor and cracked the delicious bones between my teeth. Bacon grease drooled onto the rug beneath the dining room table. Deeply satisfied, I trotted back to Wendy's room. Without pausing, I leapt onto her bed, curled up, took rumble in my mouth, and fell asleep. My mind a train wreck, a bonfire, an amusement park of memories. A slideshow. I saw it all going one way, each snapshot. Elizabeth's slow joy at realizing our love. A lazy morning in a sunstruck St. Paul hotel room. Her smile across the table at the diner the day she found out she was pregnant. Fast, flash, flash, flash. Now I was going away, seeing it all from the other side. We have to take her to the pound. Arnold's voice was reedy when it rose. She's ruined the rug. It's a very good rug, isn't it? He sounded hopeful. I was sitting rather far away, in the living room, half behind a chair, trying to be small. Elizabeth was on her knees with some cleaner and paper towels. It was her grandmother's oriental rug. It's all right. I don't think so. She looked up at him and said sharply, It's my rug, Arnold, and it's all right. A thrill shot through me. I have two brains. My human brain is evenly distributed throughout my dog body, intertwined with everything else. It makes what we call thinking slow, since distances to be traveled are greater. This was a decision I made. I wanted to be able to control my body easily, and therefore the dog brain needed to be where it had been for hundreds of thousands of years. The dog brain is on tap. It is ready. But where was I? What was I? I was a religious experience. I was, and am, awe of Elizabeth. I was able to lie next to her on the bed, feel her hand absently play with my fur as she read, which is something that my human self would never have felt again. I was, I am, the future I never would have had. I am life beyond death. After a week, I don't want that dog in the bed, Arnold succumbed. You don't want the dog in the bed, but I do, she replied calmly, firmly, and leaving him with no doubt about his choices. We are in that heaven that all the saints so longed for and predicted, pens scritching across rough vellum in damp towers, heads bent beneath sputtering candles, heat, ample light, plenty, near infinite knowing. But man is still enemy to himself, and man still must find God within himself, to go beyond the oppression, the killing. And first, he must find killing wrong. That seems to be a sticking point in some parts. What if, suddenly, we all simply could not kill? If it was impossible, memory drugs might do this. I left my grad students with a particular prototype. If everyone had it, if it became active all at once, all wars, all firing, all missiles would stop. Men in bars poised to cut during the Saturday night knife and gun club boys' night out would drop their knives. Women in the Air Force with a load of cluster bombs would overfly without pressing the button. Any death would be accidental, not intentional, no revenge. How would we pass our time? How would we spend our money? Oh, there were a million problems with this drug. No probability that it would be brought to production in my lifetime. It was just a dream, and there was just one dose, one infinitely expandable dose, which had never been tested. I distilled it into pure, smack-quality intensity and kept it, then handed the information over to Juanita, the brightest and best, the most committed, the most feisty, the one who could muster the most money, the most likely to succeed. I did have a plan. What was it? The memory key. Yes, that's it. My dog self sometimes forgets. When I remember Juanita, I feel hopeful, glad. But I am a dog. Gladness is my nature. I found that I could read. At first it was slow going. Elizabeth had left the newspaper on the floor, opened the Sunday funnies. I tried lying down on top of the paper and looking at it between my paws. But I had to back up and, finally, I stood and looked down at it. This was especially painful. I imagine that stroke patients might feel this way, the loss of an especially treasured skill. But then it came together. A sharp bark. I danced. 
It was just the brain slowness, the long journey of the information. Look, said Arnold, you'd think that silly dog could read. Elizabeth glanced over and looked at me very thoughtfully. I reached down with my head, grasped the edge of the dry newspaper in my teeth, held the page down with my paw, and tore it in half. I am just a silly dog. What is printed on the paper means nothing to me. No, she said, jumping up and grabbing the newspaper. But she continued to look at me thoughtfully, just the same. Well, I no longer had to worry about such things. I was a dog. Wendy, still, was everywhere in the house. I ran through it every morning, as if a spell struck me. I sniffed frantically, disconsolate, while Arnold worked, composing his dangerous, seditious smacks, which said that the government had been subverted by evil men, and that we must all take action. His smacks were, and are, full of specificity. His research was superb. I know. I was quite aware of him before Wendy died. He was Elizabeth's colleague. Her smacks were quieter, but smoothly ferocious, with sharp, sudden legal barbs, like those of sea creatures, emerging to puncture arguments and positions. They really were two of a kind. Occasionally he said, lie down and be quiet, but didn't move from his chair, or even move his eyes from his screen. That particular morning, Elizabeth was out, teaching. The house, with pale winter sunlight striping the dark wood floor, seemed empty. Arnold was invisible to me. I sensed that things were no longer all that good between Arnold and Elizabeth, but I didn't care. I was deeply happy just to be near her. In the afternoon, I jumped up on Wendy's bed, took Rumble gently in my jaws, and stretched out, aching. Arnold came to the doorway and looked at me. You shit! he said. You think I don't know what's possible? I'm working on it. As he walked away, shaking his head, he muttered, but sometimes a dog is just a dog, right? Right? Of course. I'm a dog, I barked. I'm a dog, dog, dog. Shut up, he yelled, and went back into his office. A few hours later, I heard him shout, God damn it! He staggered from his office and leaned against the doorframe of Wendy's room. I rolled my eyes to look at him. He let loose with a sob, dropped his head into his hands, reeled, and walked away. I ran to his side, curious, a dog, overwhelmed by his scent. His pure political goodness engulfed me. How did this smell? Oddly, like the ocean. Several kinds of sea, an openness. This apparently did not translate into personal openness. He was jealous of a dog, and that stunk. But he was famous for this sea goodness, and for the sheer efficaciousness of his sea wrath. A pounding, ceaseless wave of good sense he released daily from relayed locations, helping to keep people open-minded. In a world where we could choose to become dogs, we could quite easily be made into dogs without choosing, right? Right and that was just a small taste of the nasty possibilities. So he was quite necessary. He also emanated the scent of something bad has happened. Worry, defeat, fear. I returned to the bed, jumped onto it, and bit down tightly on Rumble. Elizabeth came home flushed and angry. You wouldn't believe what they've done. She slammed the door behind her. I dashed to her, danced around, carefully, so carefully, not jumping up. She crouched down, hugged me. She was crying. They let me go, fired me. I have tenure, but, oh, hell. Then Arnold was there, pulling her away, up, giving her a long, tall hug, saying, I know, honey, I know. Look, we have to get out of here. I've been packing. It's my fault. It's me. After I crawled onto Wendy's bed, I rested my head on Rumble, who was very damp. It was not Elizabeth's fault. It was not Arnold's fault. Every bad thing in the world was my fault, my memory fault, my memory addiction fault. But I would fix it. Outside, the sky was raining hate. Small pictures of Arnold descended and popped, and neighborhood kids led the police to our house, and they dragged him away. I realized that he had been in hiding. There would have been better places. Elizabeth was magnificent, promising many specific forms of legal action, even when they threatened her, too. 
they did not take Elizabeth, which, I think, made her more angry. They only took Arnold, said that he was a traitor, and that they did not need any further legal justification for taking him. They shoved him in a truck that had a government insignia on it, and that was that. We stood on the wintry stoop. The gray sky backgrounded darker gray trees and the mundane houses of the neighborhoods, their yards yellow and brown, seemed the saddest place in the world. My dogness kept back the surging memory of seeing Wendy lying on the street on a similar day. I was that strong, that much dog, my humanness, my mikeness, firmly tamped into my paws, the tip of my tail, my entrails, and I knew what she was thinking. Loss. Nothing but loss. She collapsed onto the stoop, put her head in her hands, and cried. I pressed next to her, licked her salty tears. She put her arm around me. I was sad for her. I was glad of the moment, deeply satisfied, and some yearning was settled, for just that tipping instant. Finally I could be of some use to her, if only as furry animal into which she could press her face and sob and hug me so tightly that my entire being rejoiced. They were watching Elizabeth, of course, her information paths with their computers, but she knew the triggers as she had defended clients against their prying. Besides, they have so many people to watch. She knew the back alleys to the back alleys, all the ways to make her searches innocuous, all the ways to subvert their attempts. And she found out where they took Arnold. She talked to me, of course, all the time, told me everything she did and everything she planned to do, she forgot to eat and became very thin and ran twice a day with me at her side and got strong. By that time I knew that Arnold would never die, not for her. He left an entire library of smacks, she said. These people are so predictable. He said that tyrants always are. I'll only have to modify each one a bit to make it perfectly up to date when I release it. They will know you are doing it, I barked. I barked straight at her, standing up, as if I were talking to her. I heard each word in my head as I barked. I thought of plans. I could tear out tiny newspaper words and assemble them for her. I could talk to her if I really wanted to. No Mike could talk to her. I knew quite well that she would throw Mike out of the house onto the street. She would never let Mike back in. She really could not suspect who I was. She was already puzzled at times. She leaned back in her computer chair, tired and anxious. They'll know it's me, of course. If they take me, I'll be of no use. But if I do nothing, I'm of goddamn little use either. Hell. For three days, then, she packed. She went into the garage and got out all of our old camping and backpacking gear, our emergency flee the government food about which we laughed, but nervously, when we assembled it years ago. The smells of it all threw me into ecstasies of a million hikes. One year, we hiked the entire Appalachian Trail. When we started in Georgia, in the spring, red trilliums dotted the slopes of the mountains. Our tent smelled of Gore-Tex, a few steps removed from plastic, and as she unrolled it and set it up in the garage to see if it was still good, I went inside, breathed deeply, and if I could have, I would have cried. I curled up there on the sleeping bags she tossed into the door, enveloped in a deeply scented panacea of the past, the good times, us. I know where he is, she said, and the government is going down. It will be chaos. He won't be at all useful. He'll be killed. Here's the plan. Listening? Good dog. I've got an aunt with a cabin in the North Georgia mountains. Her name is Cecile. She's very old, hasn't gone there for years. But first, we have to get him. Why? I thought. We don't need him. My traitor tail, though, thumped in agreement, ringing against a Coleman stove she'd shoved inside. I wanted all of her, everything, just like I had when we'd met. I wanted that still, her first wagon ride, the day she'd fallen from the monkey bars and broken her arm, the feeling she'd had when she'd launched from Cove Mountain into the wind, her arms in the hang-gliding loops, moving the bar. When we met, we'd talked and talked, trying to get to that place where we would be one, the same person. Where does memory reside? We do not know. 
It is a system, a process, a constant recreation. What accounts, then, for its specificity? I'd transfused blood from one white mouse to another after giving them the memory drug. I watched the new mouse run the maze, which it had never before run, perfectly, strange but true. All that information, so compact, just needing the medium into which to expand. I was that medium now. I was like water. Elizabeth and Jolly and Wendy were the folded Japanese paper flower that would unfold inside me. She packed the truck, tied down everything beneath the tarp. The back seat of the truck was full of electrical equipment, which might soon be useless. Cecile had a generator and a huge buried propane tank, and when that was gone, that would be it. Elizabeth took all the money she had in the bank, all the jewelry, odd things she thought might be useful for barter. One night she went next door and traded Mr. Monroe's license plates for ours. He'll never notice, she said, bolting them onto the truck. She was ready to go get Arnold and head for the hills. Inside the hollow garage, sounds were magnified. I heard the car come up the street and jump to my feet. It was three in the morning. What is it, girl? And then she froze, too. Shh! She held me tightly and then held my mouth shut, too. Footsteps coming up the walk. A thump. The car sounds receded down the street. She hurried through the dark house, opened the front door. It was Arnold, tossed like a package onto the doorstep. He was naked, bloody, bruised, curled up, moaning. Oh, no! She tried to pick him up, but he was too heavy. She pulled him onto the hall rug, slammed the door. Arnold! Arnold! He opened his eyes. They were empty, except for the tears. She had her mother's wheelchair and walker and all kinds of old folk equipment in the attic. She worked quickly, fury in every motion. From taking care of her mother, she knew how to position him, how to hoist him into the truck. When she was finished, his clothes were packed, he was wearing a diaper, wheelchair and walker were in the back of the truck. He stared straight ahead. The last thing she put in the truck was Rumble, slowly, sadly, almost as if she wanted to leave Rumble, leave Wendy, behind. She sighed and locked the house door. She said, come on, girl. I jumped into the truck, between her and Arnold, and sat up so I could see where we were going. Everything seemed in order outside. The fast food chains were doing a brisk business. The parking lots at grocery stores were crowded, like before a blizzard, but there was no hysteria. Perhaps no one really understood how long this might last. It was a government coup, them against us. It was spreading, as if a virus had engulfed the entire world. Maybe it had, spread by all over. After we had driven for most of the day, she pulled off a narrow country road and lifted a portable podcaster from the back seat, tucked it beneath her arm. She thrashed through the woods for a few minutes, found a flat rock, set it up, and turned it on. It is a magnetic thing, the potting, the smacks. It is a precise frequency, except that it is constantly changing in order to elude the government, and you swallow it, and it disseminates into your cells and stays there for a while. That's all. You are an antenna, constantly conducting a blisteringly fast search, and you get Arnold's new smack, or whoever's. Arnold's, as I said, was by far the pill most swallowed, internationally. He was the most true, most courageous, most energetic, the most dangerous. This setup would just help disguise the source. She stood up straight and dusted off her hands. There, they'll find it pretty soon, maybe, if they have time. It's kind of like a chain of bubbles, though. One will release several, and those will release several. Time delayed. Some for years. Mike and I went to Czechoslovakia right after it was returned to independence in 1989. There was a museum exhibit there of all of the lost years, the years during which they'd been allowed no news. It was called Lest We Forget. Well, this is my Lest We Forget. My laugh and my tears were just a bark. A slight snow spits outside the cabin. Elizabeth has made it cozy and warm for Arnold. It is too hot for me, but I would rather stay in here with people than go outside and be comfortable. I am a dog. 
I lie on the couch so I can look over Elizabeth's shoulder while she works. She is in touch with the hacker. I think he's in the Netherlands, she says to Arnold. His name is the great and powerful you. You. Get it? All of us. One of us. But maybe you is a woman. She takes a sip of coffee and resumes her work. All the hackers want to figure out a universal hack that will leave us bare to one strong message, one big smack. But what will that message be? Most hackers don't really care. They just want to open everything up. For them, it's a game, a challenge. For most people, it's the ultimate fear, mind control. But you seems to be addicted to Arnold's smacks. She believes in him, in his messages of the importance of truth and transparency. Every day, you posts somewhere about the latest smack that Elizabeth has brought up to date and released. What is the truth? I know what the truth is. Truth is loss, death, grief, and pain, and knowing the preciousness of each individual. Truth is living always on that edge. Truth is trying to prevent all that from happening. Humans have a special way of forgetting truth, of not thinking about what others might feel. Have I said it? Memory is physical. Knowing can be changed. I slowly lick the white top of my paw, straighten the curly fur into smooth lines, feel with my tongue the smack bump inside. It is just a tiny bump, but it is powerful. It contains the essence of what I distilled in the lab. My brain is storm. Much later, when it is dark, and Elizabeth is making dinner, I lie on the floor, still licking the smack bump. It itches. In front of me is the local newspaper, which Jake brought, and which Elizabeth tossed onto the floor. There is news of local militias, an ad for hen-fresh eggs on Angle Ridge Road, obituaries. I move my head so I can see the next page. My, says Arnold, cuh. I start as if I've had an electric shock. My tongue pauses. My ears swivel. I turn my head to look at him. I can't help it. I know that the weird expression on his face is a smile. How would he have known? I told you, his research network was astounding. He could find out anything he wanted to. He worked on many edges. Maybe he had a pod about what I'd done waiting in his library. He might even have tracked down Dr. Lorenzo, held her feet to the coals, forced her to talk. It doesn't matter now. I am asleep on the couch, but her sudden snort wakes me around one in the morning. Ha! Huh, she breathes. Her computer screen glows. The little keys are lit from within. The only other light is from the stove, where the fire flickers with soothing snaps. Arnold snores on the bed. You did it, she breathes. She made the hack. Elizabeth starts the download. Now we've got them. Every fucking person in the world, no matter what kind of smack they usually get, no matter whose pill they've swallowed, and we've got to get to them first. She watches the screen, sighs. Damn, this computer is slow. It is dawn. I am on the porch. Elizabeth is inside, frantically modifying pods, as she does this time of day. Usually we go for a long hike and put them in the relay in the woods. It is stupid and dangerous, but she says that if she doesn't do this, she might as well not be alive anyway. Today is different, though. Today she has the hack. Something, something, has me on my feet and drives my memories down to the tips of my paws, crushes them flat with the pure and absolute present. My barks thunder, and I am like an arrow running to the approaching vehicle. I meet it as it rounds the sharp bend at the top of the hill that keeps us hidden and leap to one side. The soldier is alone in the jeep and surprised by me. There is no door on his jeep and I leap onto him, going for his throat. He is yelling and I smell the cold metal of his pistol. I am a whirlwind, but his other hand reaches the gun and draws. I bite his hand as the pistol goes off. Elizabeth is on the porch, her shotgun raised. Get away, she yells. And I know she means me, but I cannot. I am a pure and total dog, with only a wisp of human somewhere. She fires the rifle. He puts the jeep in reverse and flees. And I know it's time. Are you all right? She runs to me, hugs me. I ignore her. I am chewing, licking, gnawing. Is it a bullet? No. 
The bullet went somewhere else, and it does not matter. It only makes a small sting, an ache. She reaches into the bloody hole I nod and pulls out the blood-smeared bubble, a standard smack-storing bubble. Uh, smack? She is stunned. Yes, I bark. She stares at me hard. What are you? She kicks me. Some kind of spy? I run to the cabin, up the stairs. She follows. They'll be coming soon. Arnold, Arnold, we have to leave. And Daisy? At the door, she whirls on me, still holding the rifle. Arnold makes a grunting sound, moves his arms, makes a horrified face. I bark, bark, bark. She looks back and forth between us. Arnold begins keening. Hmm, 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 hmm. He can still kind of carry a tune. This is easy. The alphabet tune. All right, then, she snaps. Just one try. A, B, C, D. Oh, this is ridiculous. Hmm, hums Arnold. As always, tears creep down his face. I smell his ocean openness coming back. And then, with great difficulty, he roars. My, my, Mike. I bark. I dance. Yes, I say yes, with all my dog tools. I grab Rumble, toss him in the air. It takes a surprising amount of energy. Mike? I brace for another kick, but she hugs me and begins to sob. Mike? Mike? Oh, my God. She steps back, looks at Arnold. How is this possible? How do you know? I can see her thinking then, thinking about all the things I'd done as a memory scientist. I nudge her pocket the smack. She pulls out the bloody, protective bubble. Then she grabs a knife, sets the bubble on the table, and carefully slits it open. Out it falls, the smack that I so carefully, lovingly made. I cringe back, whine. What is it? It is something I cannot do, because I am a dog. But I must. Again, I pick up Rumble, and this time just hold him in my jaws. Then I put him down and lick his face. Okay, she says heavily. Okay, something to do with Wendy. Her shoulders sag. I'll do it. Her smile is wan and she is crying. First. Wendy goes first. She puts the smack I made into the sequence that she has prepared. The sequence is prefaced by use hack. After a minute, the smack is ready. All she has to do is press a key to send it. On the all-over station, firing seems to have gotten heavier this morning. I am not sure why the local soldiers haven't come back. Perhaps there is too much disarray. The television says so. The long, grinding, universal violence is creeping upward, always upward. A deep, low growl shakes the ground. I hear loud cracking sounds. Out the window, I see the tips of trees topple. Must be a tank, says Elizabeth. The bastards! T, says Arnold. T, g, m. Mm. He gestures toward the rifle. He is healing. The smack, I think, might hurry things along. I bark loudly. Go, go, go. She does it. She makes the smack, biological information now converted into electrical signals, rush down the wires at the speed of light, and just as quickly is in the air, relaying, disseminating, smacking. The tank slowly comes round the bend, ponderously slow, and stops fifty yards from the cabin. A gun on top rotates, adjusts straight at us. Fuh! yells Arnold. And then... The top opens, and three men climb out. They hug each other. They are crying. The same thing is happening on the all-over station. A reporter is in some war-torn downtown, where suddenly everyone looks around, bewildered. Two men fling down their rifles. The same look of awful grief comes over their faces. Tears flow. They grab one another, reel around. The television reporter is weeping, too. What is going on? She cries out in a parody of the reporter's false concern. What is going on, sir? She shoves her microphone in someone's face. Sir, how do you feel? I, he gasps, I, oh my God. He falls to his knees. Elizabeth grabs me hard. Wendy, she whispers. It's Wendy. Oh, God, I remember. Oh, my sweet baby. All that grief and longing. 
Now, everyone feels it. Everyone feels the loss of just one child, just one precious person. But there is no revenge, no anger, because this is not just our grief, not just Elizabeth's and mine, distilled and refined and full of blame. It is Jolly's, pure, whole love and longing. That smack and its heavy burden and the chemicals it was secreting are gone, gone from my blood. Mike is leaving, too, heading away. It is good. It is as I planned. I did not plan the bullet. But it doesn't matter. I am, of course, happy. My God! Elizabeth gasps. She just stares at me, then falls and hugs me, hugs me, hugs me. You genius! I glimpse, for a brief instant, a look of horror on her face as she draws back her hand, sticky with blood, before I close my eyes, deeply satisfied. This exquisite grief, this unwillingness to kill, this respect for all others, may last for years, universally, making loss impossible, removing the numbness that most people live with, and leaving them raw and open and kind, unable to hurt another human. Or someone like the wonderful wizard of you might hack it quickly, just for fun, and make everything as it was. I no longer care. I am a brilliance, like when the sun is on the water and you can't see into it. I am the brilliance of Elizabeth and of Wendy, and then I am golden grains of glad, glad sand, blowing in the wind, free of almost all memory. All that is left is one little girl who stands there on the beach. Jolly, she calls and claps her hands. Jolly, I run to her. Pump 6. Paolo Bacigalupi. Paolo Bacigalupi, www.windupstories.com, lives in Paonia, Colorado, where he has worked as a writer and online editor for High Country News. He said in a Locus interview, We can have all the technology in the world and still make some really, really bad decisions. We can create a hell where nothing is left alive except for us, but where we can be very comfortable because we'll accept whatever we have to in order to meet our immediate desires. His first story was Pocketful of Dharma, 1999. He says, Harlan Ellison called me up soon after, told me not to get stuck in the science fiction genre and to get out while I could. I ended up writing three novels, and none of them were sci-fi, one historical fiction piece, one contemporary literary whatever book, and one mystery, and then decided that I actually liked writing science fiction quite a lot and went back to it. His short SF is collected in Pump Six and Other Stories, Nightshade, 2008. His first novel, The Wind-Up Girl, is forthcoming from Nightshade. Pump Six was published in Fantasy and Science Fiction and as the title story in his 2008 collection. It is centrally in the tradition of Cornbluth's The Marching Morons, in this bleak and darkly humorous view of the not very distant future, human selfishness and the pursuit of immediate pleasure have triumphed over intelligence and advanced technology. Pump six is a sewage pump, and the literal shit is about to overflow civilization. Maybe you'll feel better if you take a pill. The first thing I saw Thursday morning when I walked into the kitchen was Maggie's ass sticking up in the air. Not a bad way to wake up, really. She's got a good figure, keeps herself in shape. So a morning eyeful of her pretty bottom pressed against a black mesh nighty is generally a positive way to start the day. Except that she had her head in the oven, and the whole kitchen smelled like gas. And she had a lighter with a blue flame six inches high that she was waving around inside the oven like it was a Tickle Monkey revival concert. Jesus Christ, Maggie, what the hell are you doing? I dove across the kitchen, grabbed a handful of nighty, and yanked hard. Her head banged as she came out of the oven. Frying pans rattled on the stove top, and she dropped her lighter. It skittered across the tough scuff, ending up in a corner. Ow! She grabbed her head. Ow! She spun around and slapped me. What the fuck did you do that for? She raked her nails across my cheek, then went for my eyes. I shoved her away. 
She slammed into the wall and spun, ready to come back again. What's the matter with you? She yelled. You pissed off you couldn't get it up last night? Now you want to knock me around instead? She grabbed the cast iron skillet off the stovetop, dumping nifty freeze bacon all over the burners. You want to try it again, trog wad, huh? You want to? She waved the pan, threatening, and started for me. Come on, then. I jumped back, rubbing my cheek where she'd gouged me. You're crazy. I keep you from getting yourself blown up, and you want to beat my head in? I was making your damn breakfast. She ran her fingers through her black, tangled hair and showed me blood. You broke my damn head. I saved your dumb ass is what I did. I turned and started shoving the kitchen windows open, letting the gas escape. A couple of the windows were just cardboard curtains that were easy to pull free, but one of the remaining hole windows was really stuck. You son of a bitch! I turned just in time to dodge the skillet. I yanked it out of her hands and shoved her away hard, then went back to opening windows. She came back, trying to get around in front of me as I pushed the windows open. Her nails were all over my face, scratching and scraping. I pushed her away again and waved the skillet when she tried to come back. You want me to use this? She backed off, eyes on the pan. She circled. That's all you've got to say to me? I saved your dumb ass? Her face was red with anger. How about thanks for trying to fix the stove, Maggie? Or thanks for giving a damn about whether I get a decent breakfast before work, Maggie? She hawked snot and spat missing me and hitting the wall, then gave me the finger. Make your own damn breakfast. See if I try to help you again. I stared at her. You're dumber than a sack of trogs. You know that? I waved the skillet toward the stove, checking a gas leak with a lighter. Do you even have a brain in there? Hello? Hello? Don't talk to me like that. You're the trogwad. She choked off mid-sentence and sat, suddenly, like she'd been hit in the head with a chunk of concrete rain just plopped on the yellow tough scuff, completely stunned. Oh! She looked up at me, wide-eyed. I'm sorry, Trav. I didn't even think of that. She stared at her lighter where it lay in the corner. Oh, shit! Wow! She put her head in her hands. Oh, wow! She started to hiccup, then to cry. When she looked up at me again, her big brown eyes were full of tears. I'm so sorry. I'm really, really sorry. The tears started rolling, pouring off her cheeks. I had no idea. I just didn't think. I... I was still ready to fight, but seeing her sitting on the floor, all forlorn and lost and apologetic, took it out of me. Forget it. I dropped the pan on the stove and went back to jamming open the windows. A breeze started moving through, and the gas stink faded. When we had some decent air circulation, I pulled the stove out from the wall. Bacon was scattered all over the burners, limp and thawed now that it was out of its nifty freeze cellophane, strips of pork lying everywhere, marbled and glistening with fat. Maggie's idea of a homemade breakfast. My granddad would have loved her. He was a big believer in breakfasts, except for the nifty freeze. He hated those wrappers. Maggie saw me staring at the bacon. Can you fix the stove? Not right now. I've got to get to work. She wiped her eyes with the palm of her hand. Waste of bacon, she said. Sorry. No big deal. I had to go to six different stores to find it. That was the last package, and they didn't know when they were going to get more. I didn't have anything to say to that. I found the gas shut off and closed it, sniffed, then sniffed all around the stove and the rest of the kitchen. The gas smell was almost gone. For the first time I noticed my hands were shaking. I tried to get a coffee packet out of the cabinet and dropped it. It hit the counter with a water balloon plop. I set my twitching hands flat on the counter and leaned on them hard, trying to make them go still. My elbows started shaking instead. It's not every morning you almost get yourself blown up. It was kind of funny, though, when I thought about it. Half the time the gas didn't even work. And on the one day it did, Maggie decided to play repairman. I had to suppress a giggle. Maggie was still in the middle of the floor, snuffling. I'm really sorry, she said again. It's okay, forget it. I took my hands off the counter. They weren't flapping around anymore. That was something. I ripped open the coffee packet and chugged its liquid cold. After the rest of the morning, the caffeine was calming. 
No, I'm really sorry. I could have got us both killed. I wanted to say something nasty, but there wasn't any point. It just would have been cruel. Well, you didn't, so it's okay. I pulled out a chair and sat down and looked out the open windows. The city sky was turning from yellow dawn smog to a gray-blue morning smog. Down below, people were just starting their day. Their noises filtered up. Kids shouting on their way to school, handcarts clattering on their way to deliveries, the grind of someone's truck engine, clanking and squealing, and sending up black clouds of exhaust that wafted in through the window along with summer heat. I fumbled for my inhaler and took a hit, then made myself smile at Maggie. It's like that time you tried to clean the electric outlet with a fork. You just got to remember not to look for gas leaks with a fire. It's not a good idea. Wrong thing to say, I guess. Or wrong tone of voice. Maggie's waterworks started again, not just the snuffling and the tears, but the whole bawling, squalling release thing, water pouring down her face, her nose getting all runny, and her saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, over and over again, like a Yalu odd sample, but without the subsonic thump that would have made it fun to listen to. I stared at the wall for a while, trying to wait it out, and thought about getting my earbug and listening to some real Yalu, but I didn't want to wear out the battery, because it took a while to find good ones, and anyway, it didn't seem right to duck out while she was bawling. So I sat there while she kept crying, and then I finally sucked it up and got down on the floor next to her and held her while she wore herself out. Finally, she stopped crying and started wiping her eyes. I'm sorry, I'll remember. She must have seen my expression, because she got more insistent. Really, I will. She used the shoulder of her nightie on her runny nose. I must look awful. She looked puffy and red-eyed and snotty. I said, you look fine. Great. You look great. Liar. She smiled, then shook her head. I didn't mean to melt down like that. And the frying pan. She shook her head again. I must be PMSing. You take a gynaloft? I don't want to mess with my hormones, you know, just in case. She shook her head again. I keep thinking maybe this time, but... She shrugged. Never mind. I'm a mess. She leaned against me again and went quiet for a little bit. I could feel her breathing. I just keep hoping, she said finally. I stroked her hair. If it's meant to happen, it will. We've just got to stay optimistic. Sure, that's up to God. I know that. I just keep hoping. It took Miku and Gabe three years. We've been trying, what, six months? A year, month after next. She was quiet, then said, Lizzie and Pearl only had miscarriages. We've got a ways to go before we start worrying about miscarriages. I disentangled and went hunting for another coffee packet in the cabinets. This one I actually took the time to shake. It heated itself, and I tore it open and sipped. Not as good as the little brewer I found from Maggie at the flea market, so she could make coffee on the stove. But it was a damn sight better than being blown to bits. Maggie was getting herself arranged, getting up off the floor and starting to bustle around. Even all puffy-faced, she still looked good in that mesh nighty. Lots of skin, lots of interesting shadows. She caught me watching her. What are you smiling at? I shrugged. You look nice in that nighty. I got it from that lady's estate sale downstairs. It's hardly even used. I leered. I like it. She laughed. Now? You couldn't last night or the night before, but now you want to do it? I shrugged. You're going to be late as it is. She turned and started rustling in the cabinets herself. You want a brekkie bar? I found a whole bunch of them when I was shopping for the bacon. I guess their factory is working again. She tossed one before I could answer. I caught it and tore off the smiling foil wrapper and read the ingredients while I ate. Fig and nut, and then a whole bunch of nutrients— like dextroforma albuterol hide. Not as neat as the chemicals that thaw nifty freeze packets, but what the hell, it's all nutritional, right? Maggie turned and studied the stove, where I'd marooned it. With hot morning air blowing in from the windows, the bacon was getting limper and greasier by the second. I thought about taking it downstairs and frying it on the sidewalk. If nothing else, I could feed it to the trogs. Maggie was pinching her lip, 
I expected her to say something about the stove or wasting bacon, but instead she said, We're going out for drinks with Nora tonight. She wants to go to Wiki. Puss girl, that's not funny. I jammed the rest of the brekkie bar into my mouth. It is to me. I warned both of you. That water's not safe for anything. She made a face. Well, nothing happened to me, smarty pants. We all looked at it, and it wasn't yellow or sludgy or anything. So you jumped right in and went swimming. And now she's got all those funny zits on her. How mysterious. I finished the second coffee packet and tossed it and the brekkie bar wrapper down the disposal and ran some water to wash them down. In another half hour, they'd be whirling and dissolving in the belly of pump two. You can't go thinking something's clean just because it looks clear. You got lucky. I wiped my hands and went over to her. I ran my fingers up her hips. Yep, lucky. Still no reaction. She slapped my hands away. What? You're a doctor now. Specializing in skin creams. Don't be gross. I told Nora to meet us at eight. Can we go to Wiki? I shrugged. I doubt it. It's pretty exclusive. But Max owes you. She broke off as she caught me leering at her again. Oh, right. What do you say? She shook her head and grinned. I should be glad, after the last couple nights. Exactly. I leaned down and kissed her. When she finally pulled back, she looked up at me with those big brown eyes of hers, and the whole bad morning just melted away. You're going to be late she said, but her body was up against mine, and she wasn't slapping my hands away any more. Summer in New York is one of my least favorite times. The heat sits down between the buildings, choking everything, and the air just stops. You smell everything, plastics melting into hot concrete, garbage burning, old urine that effervesces into the air when someone throws water into the gutter. Just the plain smell of so many people living all packed together. Like all the skyscrapers are sweating alcoholics after a binge, standing there exhausted and oozing with the evidence of everything they've been up to. It drives my asthma nuts. Some days I take three hits off the inhaler just to get to work. About the only good thing about summer is that it isn't spring, so at least you don't have freeze-thaw dropping concrete rain down on your head. I cut across the park just to give my lungs a break from the ooze and stink, but it wasn't much of an improvement. Even with the morning heat still building up, the trees looked dusty and tired, all their leaves drooping, and there were big brown patches on the grass where the green had just given up for the summer, like bald spots on an old dog. The trogs were out in force, lying in the grass, lolling around in the dust and sun, enjoying another summer day with nothing to do. The weather was bringing them out. I stopped to watch them frolicking, all hairy and horny, without any concerns at all. A while back, someone started a petition to get rid of them, or at least to get them spayed. But the mayor came out and said that they had some rights, too. After all, they were somebody's kids, even if no one was admitting it. He even got the police to stop beating them up so much, which made the tabloids go crazy. They all said he had a trog love child hidden in Connecticut. But after a few years, people got used to having them around, and the tabloids went out of business, so the mayor didn't care what they said about his love children anymore. These days, the trogs are just part of the background, a whole park full of mashed-faced monkey people shambling around with bright yellow eyes and big pink tongues and not nearly enough fur to survive in the wild. When winter hits, they either freeze in piles or migrate down to warmer places, but every summer there's more of them. When Maggie and I first started trying to have a baby, I had a nightmare that Maggie had a trog. She was holding it and smiling right after the delivery, all sweaty and puffy, and saying, Isn't it beautiful? Isn't it beautiful? And then she handed the sucker to me. And the scary thing wasn't that it was a trog. The scary thing was trying to figure out how I was going to explain to everyone at work that we were keeping it. Because I loved that little squash-faced critter. I guess that's what being a parent is all about. That dream scared me limp for a month. Maggie put me on perkies because of it. A trog sidled up. It, or he, or she, or whatever you call a hermaphrodite critter with boobs and a big sausage, made kissy faces at me. 
I just smiled and shook my head, and decided that it was a him because of his hairy back, and because he actually had that sausage instead of just a little pencil like some of them have. The trog took the rejection pretty well. He just smiled and shrugged. That's one nice thing about them. They may be dumber than hamsters, but they're pleasant-natured, nicer than most of the people I work with, really. Way nicer than some people you meet in the subway. The trog wandered off, touching himself and grunting, and I kept going across the park. On the other side, I walked down a couple blocks to Freedom Street, and then down the stairs into the command substation. Chi was waiting for me when I unlocked the gates to let myself in. Alvarez, you're late, man. Chi's a nervous, skinny little guy with suspenders and red hair slipped straight back over a bald spot. He always has this acrid smell around him because of this steroid formula he uses on the bald spot, which makes his hair grow all right for a while. But then he starts picking at it compulsively, and it all falls out, and he has to start all over with the steroids. And in the meantime, he smells like the Hudson. And whatever the gel is, it makes his skull shine like a polished bowling ball. We used to tell him to stop using the stuff, but he'd go all rabid and try to bite you if you kept it up for long. You're late, he said again. He was scratching his head like an epileptic monkey trying to groom himself. Yeah, so? I got my work jacket out of my locker and pulled it on. The fluorescents were all dim and flickery, but climate control was running, so the interior was actually pretty bearable for once. Pump six is broken. Broken how? Chi shrugged. I don't know. It stopped. Is it making a noise? Is it stopped all the way? Is it going slowly? Is it flooding? Come on, help me out. Chi looked at me blankly. Even his head-picking stopped, for a second. You try looking at the troubleshooting indexes, I asked. She shrugged. Didn't think of it. How many times have I told you that's the first thing you do? How long has it been out? Since midnight? He screwed up his face, thinking, no, since ten. You switch the flows over? He hit his forehead with the palm of his hand. Forgot. I started to run. The entire Upper West Side doesn't have sewage processing since last night? Why didn't you call me? Chi jogged after me, dogging my heels as we ran through the plant's labyrinth to the control rooms. You were off duty, so you just let it sit there? It's hard to shrug while you're running full out, but Chi managed it. Stuff's broken all the time. I didn't figure it was that bad. You know, there was that bulb out in Tunnel 3, and then there was that leak from the toilets, and then the drinking fountain went out again. You always let things slide. I figured I'd let you sleep. I didn't bother trying to explain the difference. If it happens again, just remember, if the pumps, any of them, die, you call me. It doesn't matter where I am. I won't be mad. You just call me. If we let these pumps go down, there's no telling how many people could get sick. There's bad stuff in that water, and we've got to stay on top of it. Otherwise, it bubbles up into the sewers, and then it gets out in the air and people get sick. You got it? I shoved open the doors to the control room and stopped. The floor was covered with toilet paper, rolls of it, all unstrung and dangled around the control room, like some kind of mummy striptease had gone wrong. There must have been a hundred rolls unraveled all over the floor, what the hell is this? This? He looked around, scratching his head. The paper, Chi? Oh, right. We had a toilet paper fight last night. For some reason, they triple delivered. We didn't have enough space in the storage closet. I mean, we haven't had ass wipes for two months, and then we had piles and piles of it. So you had a toilet paper fight while Pump 6 was down? Something in my voice must have finally gotten through. He cringed. Hey, don't look at me that way. I'll get it picked up. No worries. Jeez, you're worse than Mercati. And anyway, it wasn't my fault. I was just getting ready to reload the dispensers, and then Suze and Zoo came down, and we got into this fight. He shrugged. It was just something to do, that's all. And Suze started it anyway. I gave him another dirty look and kicked my way through the tangle of TP to the control consoles. She called after me. Hey, how am I going to wind it back up if you kick it around? 
I started throwing switches on the console, running diagnostics. I tried booting up the troubleshooting database, but got a connection error. Big surprise. I looked on the shelves for the hard copies of the operation and maintenance manuals, but they were missing. I looked at Chi. Do you know where the manuals are? The what? I pointed at the empty shelves. Oh, they're in the bathroom. I looked at him. He looked back at me. I couldn't make myself ask. I just turned back to the consoles. Go get them. I need to figure out what these flashers mean. There was a whole panel of them winking away at me, all for pump six. Cheese scuttled out of the room, dragging TP behind him. Overhead, I heard the observation room door open. Sue's coming down the stairs. More trouble. She rustled through the TP streamers and came up close behind me, crowding. I could feel her breathing on my neck. The pump's been down for almost twelve hours, she said. I could write you up. She thumped me in the back, hard. I could write you up, buddy. She did it again, harder. Bam. I thought about hitting her back, but I wasn't going to give her another excuse to dock pay. Besides, she's bigger than me, and she's got more muscles than an orangutan, about as hairy, too. Instead, I said, it would have helped if somebody had called. You talking back to me? She gave me another shove and leaned around to get in my face, looking at me all squinty-eyed. Twelve hours downtime, she said again. That's grounds for a write-up. It's in the manual. I can do it. No kidding. You read that? All by yourself? You're not the only one who can read, Alvarez. She turned and stomped back up the stairs to her office. She came back lugging the maintenance manuals. I don't know how you do this. He puffed as he handed them over. These manuals make no sense at all. It's a talent. I took the plasterine volumes and glanced up at Suze's office. She was just standing there, looking down at me through the observation glass, looking like she was going to come down and beat my head in. A dim-wit promo who got lucky when the old boss went into retirement. She has no idea what a boss does, so mostly she spends her time scowling at us filling out paperwork that she can't remember how to route, and molesting her secretary. Employment guarantees are great for people like me, but I can see why you might want to fire someone. The only way Suze was ever going to leave was if she fell down the observation room stairs and broke her neck. She scowled harder at me, trying to make me look away. I let her win. She'd either write me up or she wouldn't, and even if she did, she might still get distracted and forget to file it. At any rate, she couldn't fire me. We were stuck together, like a couple of cats tied in a sack. I started thumbing through the manual's plastic pages, going back and forth through the indexes as I cross-referenced all the flashers. I looked up again at the console. There were a lot of them, maybe more than I'd ever seen. She squatted down beside me, watching. He started picking his head again. I think it's a comfort thing for him. But it makes your skin crawl until you get used to it. Makes you think of lice. You do that fast, he said. How come you didn't go to college? You kidding? No way, man. You're the smartest guy I ever met. You totally could have gone to college. I glanced over at him, trying to tell if he was screwing with me. He looked back at me, completely sincere, like a dog waiting for a treat. I went back to the manual. No ambition, I guess. The truth was that I never made it through high school. I dropped out of PS 105 and never looked back, or forward, I guess. I remember sitting in freshman algebra and watching the teacher's lips flap and not understanding a word he was saying. I turned in worksheets and got D's every time, even after I redid them. None of the other kids were complaining, though. They just laughed at me when I kept asking him to explain the difference between squaring and doubling variables. You don't have to be Einstein to figure out where you don't belong. I started piecing my way through the troubleshooting diagrams. No clogs indicated. Go to Mechanics Diagnostics, Volume 3. I picked up the next binder of pages and started flipping. Anyway, you've got a bad frame of reference. We aren't exactly a bunch of Nobel Prize winners here. I glanced up at Suze's office. Smart people don't work in dumps like this. Suze was scowling down at me again. I gave her the universal salute. You see? Chi shrugged. I don't know. I tried reading that manual about twenty times on the john, and it still doesn't make any sense to me. If you weren't around, half the city would be swimming in shit right now. Another flasher winked on the console. Amber, 
amber, red. It stayed red. In a couple minutes, they're going to be swimming in a lot worse than that. Believe me, buddy, there's lots worse things than shit. Mercati showed me a list once, before he retired. All the things that run through here that the pumps are supposed to clean. Polychlorinated biphenyls, bisphenol A, estrogen, phthalates, PCBs, heptachlor. I got a super clean sticker for all that stuff. He lifted his shirt and showed me the one he had stuck to his skin, right below his rib cage. A yellow, smiley face sticker a little like the kind I used to get from my grandpa when he was feeling generous. It said, super clean, on the smiley's forehead. You buy those? Sure. Seven bucks for seven. I get them every week. I can drink the water straight now. I'd even drink out of the Hudson. He started scratching his skull again. I watched him scratch for a second, remembering how zit girl Nora had tried to sell some to Maria before they went swimming. Well, I'm glad it's working for you. I turned and started keying restart sequences for the pumps. Now let's see if we can get this sucker started up and keep all the neighbors who don't buy stickers from having a pack of trogs. Get ready to pull a reboot on my say-so. Chi went over to clear the data lines and put his hands on the restart levers. I don't know what difference it makes. I went through the park the other day, and you know what I saw? A mama trog and five little baby trogs. What good does it do to keep trogs from getting born to good folks when you got those ones down in the park making whole litters? I looked over at Chi to say something back, but he kind of had a point. The reboot sequence is completed, and Pump Six's indicators showed primed. Three, two, one, primed full. I said, go, go, go. Chi threw his levers, and the consoles cleared green, and somewhere deep down below us, sewage started pumping again. We climbed the skin of the Kusevik Center, climbing for heaven, climbing for Wiki, Maggie and Nora and Wu and me, worming our way up through stairwell turns, scrambling over rubble, kicking past condom wrappers, and scattering effy packets like autumn leaves. Wiki's synthesized xylophones and Japanese kettle drums thrummed, urging us higher. Trogs and sad sack partiers who didn't have my connections watched jealously as we climbed, watched and whispered as we passed them by, all of them knowing that Max owed me favors and favors and favors, and that I went to the front of the line because I kept the toilets running on time. The club was perched at the very top of the Kusevik, a bunch of old stockbroker offices, Max had torn down the glass cubicles and the old digital wall screens that used to track the NYSE, and had really opened the space up. Unfortunately, the club wasn't much good in the winter anymore, because we'd all gotten rowdy one night and shoved out the windows. But even if it was too damn breezy half the year, watching those windows falling had been a major high point at the club. A couple years later, people were still talking about it, and I could still remember the slow way they came out of their frames and tumbled and sailed through the air, and when they hit bottom, they splashed across the streets like giant buckets of water. At any rate, the open-air thing worked really good in the summer, with all the rolling brownouts that were always knocking out the A.C. I got a shot of Effie as we went in the door, and the club rode in on a wave of primal flesh, a tribal gathering of sweaty, jumping monkeys in half-torn business suits, all of us going crazy, and eyeball wide, until our faces were as pale and big as fish wallowing in the bottom of the ocean. Maggie was smiling at me as we danced, and our whole oven fight was completely behind us. I was glad about that, because after our fork-in-the-outlet fight, she acted like it was my fault for a week, even after she said she forgave me. But now, in the dance throb of Wiki, I was her white knight again, and I was glad to be with her, even if it meant dragging Nora along. All the way up the stairs, I tried to not stare at Nora's zit-pocked skin, or make fun of her swollen-up face. But she knew what I was thinking, because she kept giving me dirty looks, whenever I warned her to step around places where the stairway was crumbling. Talk about stupid, though. She's about as sharp as a marble. I won't drink or swim in any of the water around here. It comes from working with sewage all the time. You know way too much about everything that goes in and out of the system. People like Nora put a Collie Mary pendant between their tits or stick a super clean smiley to their ass cheek and hope for the best. I drink bottled water and only shower with a filter head. 
and sometimes I still get creeped out. No pus rashes, though. The kettle drums throbbed inside my eyeballs. Across the club, Nora was dancing with Wu, and now that my Effie was kicking into overdrive, I could see her positive qualities. She danced fast and furious. Her hair was long and black. Her zits were the size of breasts. They looked succulent. I sidled up to her and tried to apologize for not appreciating her before, but between the noise and my slobbering on her skin, I guess I failed to communicate effectively. She ran away before I could make it up to her, and I ended up bouncing alone in Wiki's kettle drum womb while the crowds rode in and out around me, and the effie built up in ocean throbs that ran from my eyeballs to my crotch and back again, bouncing me higher and higher and higher. A girl in torn knee socks and a nun's habit was mewling in the bathroom when Maggie found us and pulled us apart and took me on the floor with people walking around us and trying to use the stainless steel piss troughs. But then Max grabbed me, and I couldn't tell if we'd been doing it on the bar and if that was the problem or if I was just taking a leak in the wrong place. But Max kept complaining about bubbles in his gin and a riot, a riot, a riot that he was going to have on his hands if these effy freaks didn't get their liquor. And he shoved me down under the bar where tubes come out of vats of gin and tonic, and it was like floating inside the guts of an octopus, with the waves of the kettle drums booming away above me. I wanted to sleep down there, maybe hunt for the nun's red panties, except that Max kept coming back to me with more effie, and saying we had to find the problem, the bubbly problem, the bubbly problem. Take some of this. It will clear your damn head. Find where the bubbles come from, where they fill the gin. No, no, no. The tonic, the tonic, the tonic. No bubbles in the tonic. Find the tonic. Stop the riot. Make it all okay before the gag gas trucks come and shut us down. And damn it, what are you sniffing down under there? Swimming under the bar, swimming long and low, eyeballs wide, prehistoric fishy amongst giant mossy root-laced eggs buried under the mist of the swamp down with the bar rags and the lost spoons and the sticky slime of bar sugar and these huge dead silver eggs lying under the roots growing moss and mildew but nothing else no yoky tonic coming out of these suckers been sucked dry sucked full dry by too many thirsty dinosaurs and of course that's the problem no tonic, none, none at all. More eggs, more eggs, we need more eggs. More big silver tonic dispensing eggs need to rumble in on hand trucks and roll in on white jacketed bow tie bartender backs. More eggs need to take the prod from the long root green sucking tubes, and then we can suck the tonic of their yolk out, and Max can keep on making G and T's. And I'm a hero, hey, 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 a hero, a goddamn superstar, because I know a lot about silver eggs and how to stick in the right tubes. And isn't that why Maggie's always pissed at me, because my tube is never ready to stick into her eggs? Or maybe she's got no eggs to stick, and we sure as hell aren't going to the doctor to find out she's got no eggs and no replacements either, not a single one coming in on a hand truck. And isn't that why she's out in the crowd, bouncing in a black corset, with the guy licking her feet and giving me the finger? And isn't that why we're going to have a riot now, when I beat that trogwad's head in with this chunk of bar that I'm going to get Max to loan me? Except I'm too far underwater to beat up bootlicker, and little smoking piles of effie keep blooming on the floor, and we're all lapping them up because I'm a goddamn hero, a hero, a hero, the fix-it man of all fix-it men and everyone bows and scrapes and passes me Effie, because there isn't going to be a riot, and we won't get shut down with gag gas, and we won't do the vomit crawl down the stairwells to the streets. And then Max shoves me back onto the dance floor with more shots of Effie for Maggie, a big old tray of forgiveness, and forgiveness comes easy when we're all walking on the ceiling of the biggest, oldest skyscraper in the sky. Blue kettle drums and eyeball nuns, zits and dinner dates, down the stairs and into the streets. By the time we stumbled out of Wiki, I was finally coming out of the Effie folds, but Maggie was still flying, running her hands all over me, touching me, telling me what she was going to do to me when we got home. Nora and Wu were supposed to be with us, but somehow we'd gotten separated. 
Maggie wasn't interested in waiting around, so we headed uptown, stumbling between the big old city towers, winding around sidewalk stink ads for Diabolo and Possession, and dodging fish dog stands with after-bar octopi on a stick. The night was finally cool, in the sweet spot between end of midnight swelter and beginning of morning smother. There was a blanket of humidity, wet on us, and seductive after the club. Without rain or freezes, I barely had to watch for concrete rain at all. Maggie ran her hands up and down my arm as we walked, occasionally leaning in close to kiss my cheek and nibble on my ear. Max says you're amazing. You saved the day. I shrugged. It wasn't a big deal. The whole bar thing was pretty hazy, bubbled out by all the effie I'd done. My skin was still singing from it. Mostly what I had was a warm glow right in my crotch and a stuttery view of the dark streets and the long rows of candles in the windows of the towers. But Maggie's hand felt good, and she looked good, and I had some plans of my own for when we got back to the apartment. So I knew I was coming down nice and slow, like falling into a warm feather bed full of helium and tongues. Anyone could have figured out his tonic was empty if we hadn't all been so damn high. I stopped in front of a bank of auto vendors. Three of them were sold out, and one was broken open, but there were still a couple drinks in the last one. I dropped my money in and chose a bottle of Blue Vitality for her and a sweatshine for me. It was a pleasant surprise when the machine kicked out the bottles. Wow! Maggie beamed at me. I grinned and fished out her bottle. Lucky night, I guess. First the bar, now this. I don't think the bar thing was luck. I wouldn't have thought of it. She downed her Blue Vitality in two long swallows and giggled. And you did it when your eyes were as big as a fish— you were doing handstands on the bar. I didn't remember that. Bar sugar and red lace bras, I remembered, but not handstands. I don't see how Max keeps that place going when he can't even remember to restock. Maggie rubbed up against me. Wiki's a lot better than most clubs, and anyway, that's why he's got you, a real live hero. She giggled again. I'm glad we didn't have to fight our way out of another riot. I hate that. In an alley, some trogs were making it, clustered bodies, hermaphroditic, climbing on each other and humping, their mouths open, smiling and panting. I glanced at them and kept going, but Maggie grabbed my arm and tugged me back. The trogs were really going at it, all in a flounder, three of them piled, their skins gleaming with sweat slick and saliva. They looked back at us with yellow eyes and not a bit of shame. They just smiled and got into a heavy groaning rhythm. I can't believe how much they do it, Maggie whispered. She gripped my arm, pressing against me. They're like dogs. That's about how smart they are. They changed positions, one crouching as though Maggie's words had inspired them. The others piled on top of him, or her. Maggie's hand slid to the front of my pants, fumbling with the zipper, and reached inside. They're so... Oh, God. She pulled me close and started working on my belt, almost tearing at it. What the hell? I tried to push her off, but she was all over me, her hands reaching inside my pants, touching me, making me hard. The Effie was still working, that was for sure. Let's do it, too. Here. I want you. Are you crazy? They don't care. Come on. Maybe this time it'll take. Knock me up. She touched me, her eyes widening at my sudden size. You're never like this. She touched me again. Oh, God, please. She pressed herself against me, looking over at the trogs. Like that, just like that. She pulled off her shimmer silk blouse, exposing her black corset and the pale skin of her breasts. I stared at her skin and curves. That beautiful body she teased me with all night long. Suddenly I didn't care about the trogs or the few people walking by on the street. We both yanked at my belt. My pants fell down around my ankles. We slammed up against the alley wall pressing against old concrete and staring into each other's eyes. And then she pulled me into her, and her lips were on my ear, biting and panting and whispering as we moved against each other. The trogs just grinned and grinned and watched us with their big yellow eyes as we all shared the alley and all watched each other. At five in the morning, Chi called again, his voice coming straight into my head through my earbug. In all the excitement and Effie, I'd forgotten to take it out. Pump six was down again. You said I was supposed to call you, he whined. 
I groaned and dragged myself out of bed. Yeah, yeah, I did. Don't worry about it. You did good. I'll be there. Maggie rolled over. Where are you going? I pulled on my pants and gave her a quick kiss. Got to go save the world. They work you too hard. I don't think you should go. And let she sort it out? You've got to be kidding. We'd be up to our necks in sludge by dinner time. My hero, she smiled sleepily. See if you can find me some doughnuts when you come back. I feel pregnant. She looked so happy and warm and fuzzy, I almost climbed back into bed with her. But I fought off the urge and just gave her another kiss. Will do. Outside, light was just starting to break in the sky, a slow yellowing of the smog. The streets were almost silent at the early hour. It was hard not to be bitter about being up at this ungodly, hungover time, but it was better than having to deal with the sewage back up if she hadn't called. I headed downtown and bought a bagel from a girly-faced guy who didn't know how to make change. The bagel was wrapped in some kind of plastic film that dissolved when I put it in my mouth. It wasn't bad, but it ticked me off that bagel boy got confused with the change and needed me to go into his cash pocket and count out my own money. It seems like I always end up bailing everyone out, even dumb bagel guys. Maggie says I'm as compulsive as she. She would have just stood there and waited until bagel boy sorted it out, even if it took all day. But I have a damn hard time watching some trogwad drop dollars all over the sidewalk. Sometimes it's just easier to climb out of the oatmeal and do things yourself. She was waiting for me when I got in, practically bouncing up and down. Five pumps down now. It started with just one when I called you, but now there's five. They keep shutting off. I went into the control room. The troubleshooting database was still down, so I grabbed the hard copy manuals again. Weird how the pumps were all going offline like that. The control room, normally alive with the hum of the machines, was quieter with half of them down. Around the city, sewage lines were backing up as we failed to cycle waste into the treatment facilities and pump the treated water out into the river. I thought about Nora with her rash, thanks to swimming in that gunk. It could really make you nervous. Looks clean, makes you rash. And we're at the bottom of the river. It's not just our crap in it, everyone upstream, too. Our treatment plants pump water up from underground, or pipe it in, and treat it from lakes upstate. At least that's the theory. I don't really buy it. I've seen the amount of water we move through here, and there's no way it's all coming from the lakes. In reality, we've got twenty million-odd people all sucking water that we don't know where it's coming from or what's in it. Like I said... I drink bottled water, even if I have to hike all over the city to find it. Or soda water, or tonic, even. I closed my eyes, trying to piece the evening back together. All those empty canisters of tonic under the bar. Travis Alvarez saves the world while flying to the moon on Effie, and two rounds of sex yesterday. Hell yeah. She and I brought the pressure dines up one by one. All of them came back online except pump six. It was stubborn. We reprimed it, fired, reprimed, nothing. Suze came down to backseat drive, dragging Zoo, her secretary, behind her. Suze was completely strung out. Her blouse was half tucked in, and she had big old fishy effy eyes that were almost as red as the flashers on the console. But her fishy eyes narrowed when she saw all the flashers. How come all these pumps went down? It's your job to keep them working. I just looked at her, zoned out of her mind at 6 a.m., romping around with her secretary girlfriend while she tried to crack the whip on the rest of us. Now that's leadership. Suddenly I thought that maybe I needed to get a different job, or needed to start licking big piles of Effie before I came to work, anything to take the edge off Sue's. If you want me to fix it, I'll need you to clear out so I can concentrate. Suze looked at me like she was chewing on a lemon. You better get it fixed. She poked my chest with a thick finger. If you don't, I'm making Chi your boss. She glanced at Zoo. It's your turn on the couch. Come on. They trooped off. Chi watched them go. He started picking at his head. They never do any work, he said. Another flasher went amber on the console. I flipped through the manual, hunting for a reason. Who does? A job like this? where nobody gets fired? 
Yeah, but there ought to be a way to get rid of her, at least. She moved all her home furniture into the office the other day. She never goes home now. She says she likes the A.C. here. You shouldn't complain. You're the guy who was throwing T.P. around yesterday. He looked at me, puzzled. So? I shrugged. Never mind. Don't worry about Suze. We're the bottom of the pile, Chi. Get used to it. Let's try the reboot again. It didn't work. I went back to the manual. Sludge was probably coming up a hundred thousand toilets in the city by now. Weird how all the pumps shut down like that. One, two, three, four. I closed my eyes, thinking. Something about my Effie spree kept tickling the back of my head. Effie flashbacks, for sure, but they kept coming. Big old eggs. Big old silver eggs. All of them sucked dry by egg-slurping dinosaurs. Wow, that was some kind of weird spree. Nuns and stainless steel eggs. The urinals and Maggie. I blinked. Everything clicked. Pieces of the puzzle coming together. Cosmic effy convergence. Emptied silver eggs. Max forgetting to restock his bar. I looked up at Chi, then down at the manuals, then back up at Chi. How long have we been running these pumps? What do you mean? When did they get installed? Chi stared at the ceiling, picked his head thoughtfully. Hell if I know. Before I came on, that's for sure. Me too. I've been here nine years. Have we got a computer that would tell us that? A receipt? Something? I flipped to the front of the manual in my hands. Pressure dyne, high capacity, self purging, multi platform pumping engine, model 13 44474 888. I frowned. This manual was printed in 2020. Chi whistled and leaned over to finger the plasticized pages. That's pretty damn old. Built to last, right? People built things to last, back then? More than a hundred years? He shrugged. I had a car like that once. Real solid. Engine hardly had any rust on it at all. And it had both headlights, but too damn old. He picked something out of his scalp and examined it for a second, before flicking it onto the floor. No one works on cars anymore. I can't remember the last time I saw a taxi running. I looked at him, trying to decide if I wanted to say anything about flicking scalp on the floor, then just gave it up. I flipped through the manual some more until I found the part I wanted. Individual reporting modules, remote access, connectivity features, and data collection. Following the manual's instructions, I opened a new set of diagnostic windows that bypassed the pressure dyne's generalized reports for pump station managers and instead connected directly with the pump's raw log data. What I got was host source data not found. Big surprise. The rest of the error text advised me to check the remote reporting module extension connectors, whatever those were. I closed the manual and tucked it under my arm. Come on, I think I know what's wrong. I led Chi out of the control room and down into the bowels of the tunnels and plant system. The elevator was busted, so we had to take the access stairs. As we went deeper and deeper, darkness closed in. Grit and dust were everywhere. Rats skittered away from us. Isolated LEDs kept the stairwell visible, but barely. Dust and shadows and moving rats were all you could see in the dim amber. Eventually, even the LEDs gave out. She found an emergency lantern in a wall socket, blanketed with gray, fluffy dust, but it still had a charge. My asthma started to tickle and close in, sitting on my chest from all the crud in the air. I took a hit off my inhaler, and we kept going down. Finally, we hit bottom. Light from Chi's lantern wavered and disappeared in the cavern's darkness. The metal of the pressure dines glinted dimly. Chi sneezed. The motion sent his lantern rocking. Shadows shifted crazily until he used a hand to stop it. You can't see shit down here, he muttered. Shut up, I'm thinking. I've never been down here. I came down once, when I first came on, when Mercati was still alive. No wonder you act like him. He trained you? Sure. I hunted around for the emergency lighting. Mercati had shown the switches to me when he brought me down, nearly a decade before, and told me about the pumps. He'd been old then, but still working, and I liked the guy. He had a way of paying attention to things, focused. Not like most people, who can barely say hello to you before they start looking at their watch, or planning their party schedule, 
or complaining about their skin rashes. He used to say my teachers didn't know shit about algebra and that I should have stayed in school. Even knowing that he was just comparing me to Sue's, I thought it was a pretty nice thing for him to say. No one knew the pump systems as well as he did, so even after he got sick and I took over his job, I'd still sneak out to the hospital to ask him questions. He was my secret weapon until the cancer finally took out his guts. I found the emergency lighting and pulled the switches. Fluorescent lights flickered and came alive, buzzing. Some bulbs didn't come on, but there were enough. Chi gasped. They're huge! A cathedral of engineering. Overhead, pipes arched through cavern dimness, shimmering under the muted light of the fluorescence, an interconnecting web of iron and shadows that centered in complex rosettes around the ranked loom of the pumps. They towered over us, gleaming dully, three stories tall, steel dinosaurs. Dust mantled them. Rust blossoms patterned their hides in complex overlays that made them look like they'd been draped in oriental rugs. Pentagonal bolts as big as my hands studded their armored plating and stitched together the vast sectioned pipes that spanned the darkness and shot down black tunnels in every compass direction, reaching for every neighborhood in the city. Moisture jewels gleamed and dripped from ancient joints. The pumps thrummed on, perfectly designed, forgotten by everyone in the city above, beasts working without complaint, loyal despite abandonment, except that one of them had now gone silent. I stifled an urge to get down on my knees and apologize for neglecting them, for betraying these loyal machines that had run for more than a century. I went over to Pump Six's control panel and stroked the dinosaur's vast belly where it loomed over me. The control panel was all covered with dust, but it glowed when I ran my hand over it. Amber signals and lime text glowing authoritatively, telling me just what was wrong, telling me and telling me, and never complaining that I hadn't been listening. Raw data had stopped piping up to the control room at some point, and had instead sat in the dark, waiting for someone to come down and notice it. And the raw data was the answer to all my questions. At the top of the list, Model 13-44474-888 requires scheduled maintenance. 946,080,000 cycles completed. I ran through the pump diagnostics. Valve ring, part number, 12-33939, scheduled for replacement. Piston parts number 232-2, 222-5, 222-6, 222-7, 222-8, 222-9, 222-10, 222-11, 222-12, 222-13, 222-14, 222-15, 222-16, 222-17, 222-18, 222-19, 222-20, 222-21, 222-22, 222-23, 222-24, 222-25, 222-26, 222-27, 222-28, 222-29, 222-30, 222-31, 222-32, 222-33, 222-34, 222-35, 222-36, 222-37, 222-38, 222-39, 222-40, 222-41, 222-42, 222-43, 222-44, 222-45, 222-46, 222-47, 222-48, 222-49, 222-50, 222-51, 222-52, 222-53, 222-54, 222-55, 222-56, 222-57, 222-58, 222-59, 222-60, 222-61, 222-62, 222-63, 222-64, 222-65, 222-66, 222-67, 222-68, 222-69, 222-70, 222-71, 222-72, 222-73, 222-74, 222-75, 222-76, 222-77, 222-78, 222-79, 222-80, 222-81, 222-82, 222-83, 222-84, 222-85, 222-86, 222-87, 222-88, 222-89, 222-90, 222-91, 222-92, 222-93, 222-94, 222-95, 222-96, 222-97, 222-98, 222-99, 222-100, 222-101, 222-102, 222-103, 222-104, 222-105, 222-106, 222-107, 222-108, 222-109, 222-110, 222-111, 222-112, 222-113, 222-114, 222-115, 222-116, 222-117, 222-118, 222-119, 222-120, 222-121, 222-122, 222-123, 222-124, 222-25, 222-26, 222-27, 222-28, 222-29, 222-30, 222-31, 222-32, 222-33, 222-34, 222-35, 222-36, 222-37, 222-38, 222-39, 222-40, 222-41, 222-42, 222-43, 222-44, 222-45, 222-46, 222-47, 222-48, 222-49, 222-50, 222-51, 222-52, 222-53, 222-54, 222-55, 222-56, 222-57, 222-58, 222-59, 222-60, 222-61, 222-62, 222-63, 222-64, 222-65, 222-66, 222-67, 222-68, 222-69, 222-70, 222-71, 222-72, 222-73, 222-74, 222-75, 222-76, 222-77, 222-78, 222-79, 222-80, 222-81, 222-82, 222-83, 222-84, 222-85, 222-86, 222-87, 222-88, 222-89, 222-90, 222-91, 222-92, 222-93, 222-94, 222-95, 222-96, 222-97, 222-98, 222-99, 222-100, 222-101, 222-102, 222-103, 222-104, 222-105, 222-106, 222-107, 222-108, 222-109, 222-110, 222-111, 222-112, 222-113, 222-114, 222-115, 222-116, 222-117, 222-118, 222-119, 222-120, 222-121, 222-122, 222-123, 222-24, 222-25, 222-26, 222-27, 222-28, 222-29, 222-30, 222-31, 222-32, 222-33, 222-34, 222-35, 222-36, 222-37, 222-38, 222-39, 222-40, 222-41, 222-42, 222-43, 222-44, 222-45, 222-46, 222-47, 222-48, 222-49, 222-50, 222-51, 222-52, 222-53, 222-54, 222-55, 222-56, 222-57, 222-58, 222-59, 222-60, 222-61, 222-62, 222-63, 222-64, 222-65, 222-66, 222-67, 222-68, 222-69, 222-70, 222-71, 222-72, 222-73, 222-74, 222-75, 222-76, 222-77, 222-78, 222-79, 222-80, 222-81, 222-82, 222-83, 222-84, 222-85, 222-86, 222-87, 222-88, 222-89, 222-90, 222-91, 222-92, 222-93, 222-94, 222-95, 222-96, 222-97, 222-98, 222-99, 222-100, 222-101, 222-102, 222-103, 222-104, 222-105, 222-106, 222-107, 222-108, 222-109, 222-110, 222-111, 222-112, 222-113, 222-114, 222-115, 222-116, 222-117, 222-118, 222-119, 222-120, 222-121, 222-122, 222-123, 222-124, 222-125, 222-26, 222-27, 222-28, 222-29, 222-30, 222-31, 222-32, 222-33, 222-34, 222-35, 222-36, 222-37, 222-38, 222-39, 222-40, 222-41, 222-42, 222-43, 222-44, 222-45, 222-46, 222-47, 222-48, 222-49, 222-50, 222-51, 222-52, 222-53, 222-54, 222-55, 222-56, 222-57, 222-58, 222-59, 222-60, 222-61, 222-62, 222-63, 222-64, 222-65, 222-66, 222-67, 222-68, 222-69, 222-70, 222-71, 222-72, 222-73, 222-74, 222-75, 222-76, 222-77, 222-78, 222-79, 222-80, 222-81, 222-82, 222-83, 222-84, 222-85, 222-86, 222-87, 222-88, 222-89, 222-90, 222-91, 222-92, 222-93, 222-94, 222-95, 222-96, 222-97, 222-98, 222-99, 222-100, 222-101, 222-102, 222-103, 222-104, 222-105, 222-106, 222-107, 222-108, 222-109, 222-110, 222-111, 222-112, 222-113, 222-114, 222-115, 222-116, 222-117, 222-118, 222-119, 222-120, 222-121, 222-122, 222-123, 222-124, 222-125, 222-26, 222-27, 222-28, 222-29, 222-30, 222-31, 222-32, 222-33, 222-34, 222-35, 222-36, 222-37, 222-38, 222-39, 222-40, 222-41, 222-42, 222-43, 222-44, 222-45, 222-46, 222-47, 222-48, 222-49, 222-50, 222-51, 222-52, 222-53, 222-54, 222-55, 222-56, 222-57, 222-58, 222-59, 222-60, 222-61, 222-62, 222-63, 222-64, 222-65, 222-66, 222-67, 222-68, 222-69, 222-70, 222-71, 222-72, 222-73, 222-74, 222-75, 222-76, 222-77, 222-78, 222-79, 222-80, 222-81, 222-92, 222-93, 222-94, 222-95, 222-96, 222-97, 222-98, 222-99, 222-100, 222-101, 222-102, 222-103, 222-104, 222-105, 222-106, 222-107, 222-108, 222-109, 222-110, 222-111, 222-112, 222-113, 222-114, 222-115, 222-116, 222-117, 222-118, 222-119, 222-120, 222-121, 222-122, 222-123, 222-24, 222-25, 222-26, 222-27, 222-28, 222-29, 222-30, 222-31, 222-32, 222-33, 222-34, 222-35, 222-36, 222-37, 222-38, 222-39, 222-40, 222-41, 222-42, 222-43, 222-44, 222-45, 222-46, 222-47, 222-48, 222-49, 222-50, 222-51, 222-52, 222-53, 222-54, 222-55, 222-56, 222-57, 222-58, 222-59, 222-60, 222-61, 222-62, 222-63, 222-64, 222-65, 222-66, 222-67, 222-68, 222-69, 222-70, 222-71, 222-72, 222-73, 222-74, 222-75, 222-76, 222-77, 222-78, 222-79, 222-100, 222-101, 222-102, 222-103, 222-104, 222-105, 222-106, 222-107, 222-108, 222-109, 222-110, 222-111, 222-112, 222-113, 222-114, 222-115, 222-116, 222-117, 222-118, 222-119, 222-120, 222-121, 222-122, 222-123, 222-24, 222-25, 222-26, 222-27, 222-28, 222-29, 222-30, 222-31, 222-32, 222-33, 222-34, 222-35, 222-36, 222-37, 222-38, 222-39, 222-40, 222-41, 222-42, 222-43, 222-44, 222-45, 222-46, 222-47, 222-48, 222-49, 222-50, 222-51, 222-52, 222-53, 222-54, 222-55, 222-56, 222-57, 222-58, 222-59, 222-60, 222-61, 222-62, 222-63, 222-64, 222-65, 222-66, 222-67, 222-68, 222-69, 222-70, 222-71, 222-72, 222-73, 222-74, 222-75, 222-76, 222-77, 222-78, 222-79, 222-80, 222-81, 222-82, 222-83, 222-84, 222-85, 222-86, 222-87, 222-88, 222-89, 222-90, 222-91, 222-92, 222-93, 222-94, 222-95, 222-96, 222-97, 222-98, 222-99, 222-100, 222-101, 222-102, 222-103, 222-104, 222-105, 222-106, 222-107, 222-108, 222-109, 222-110, 222-111, 222-112, 222-113, 222-114, 222-115
loyally chugging until it just couldn't go on any more, and the maintenance backlog finally took the sucker down. I went over and started looking at the logs for the nine other pumps. Every one of them was riddled with neglect. Warning dumps, data logs full of error corrections, alarm triggers. I went back to pump six and looked at its logs again. The men who built the machines had built them to last, but enough tiny little knives can still kill a big old dinosaur, and this one was beyond dead. We'll need to call Pressurdyne, I said. This thing is going to need more help than we can give it. Chi looked up from a found magazine with a bright yellow car on the cover. Do they even exist anymore? They better. I grabbed the manual and looked up their customer support number. It wasn't even in the same format as our numbers, not a single letter of the alphabet in the whole damn thing. Not only did Pressure Dine not exist, they'd gone bankrupt more than forty years ago, victims of their overly well-designed pump products. They'd killed their own market. The only bright spot was that their technology had slouched into the public domain, and the net was up for once, so I could download schematics of the Pressure Dines. There was a ton of information, except I didn't know anyone who could understand any of it. I sure couldn't. I leaned back in my desk chair, staring at all that information I couldn't use. Like looking at Egyptian hieroglyphs. Something was there, but it sure beat me what I was supposed to do with it. I'd shifted the flows for pump six over to the rest of the pumps, and they were handling the new load. But it made me nervous thinking about all those maintenance warnings glowing down there in the dark. Mercury Extender Seal, part number 5974-30, Damaged, replace, whatever the hell that meant. I downloaded everything about the pressure dines onto my phone bug, not sure who I'd take it to, but damn sure no one here was going to be able to help. What are you doing with that? I jumped and looked around. Suze had snuck up on me. I shrugged. Dunno. See if I can find someone to help, I guess. That's proprietary. You can't take those schematics out of here. Wipe it. You're crazy. It's public domain. I got up and popped my phone bug back into my ear. She made a swipe at it, but I dodged and headed for the doors. She chased after me, a mean mountain of muscle. I could fire you, you know. Not if I quit first. I yanked open the control room door and ducked out. Hey, get back here. I'm your boss. Her voice followed me down the corridor, getting fainter. I'm in charge here, damn it. I can fire you. It's in the manual. I found it. You're not the only one who can read. I found it. I can fire you. I will. Like a little kid having a fit. She was still yelling when the control room doors finally shut her off. Outside in the sunshine, I ended up wandering in the park, watching the trogs, and wondering what I did to piss off God that he stuck me with a nut job like Sue's. I thought about calling Maggie to meet me, but I didn't feel like telling her about work. Half the time when I tried to explain stuff to her, she just came up with bad ideas to fix it, or didn't think the things I was talking about were such a big deal. And if I called up halfway through the day, she'd definitely wonder why I'd left so early and what was going on, and then when I didn't take her advice about Sue's, she'd just get annoyed. I kept passing trogs humping away and smiling. They waved at me to come over and play. I just waved back. One of them must have been a real girl, because she was distendedly obviously pregnant, bouncing away with a couple of her friends, and I was glad again that Maggie wasn't with me. She had enough pregnancy hang-ups without seeing the trogs breeding. I wouldn't have minded throwing Suze to the trogs, though. She was about as dumb as one. Christ, I was surrounded by dummies. I needed a new job, some place that attracted better talent than sewage work did. I wondered how serious Suze had been about trying to fire me, if there really was something in the manuals that we'd all missed about hiring and firing. And then I wondered how serious I was about quitting. I sure hated Suze. But how did you get a better job when you hadn't finished high school, let alone college? I stopped short. Sudden enlightenment. College. Columbia. They could help. They'd have some sharpie who could understand all the pressure dine information, an engineering department or something. They were even dependent on pump six. Talk about leverage. I headed uptown on the subway with a whole pack of snarly, pissed-off commuters, everyone scowling at each other and acting like you were stealing their territory if you sat down next to them. I ended up hanging from a strap 
and watching two old guys hiss at each other across the car until we broke down at 86 and we all ended up walking. I kept passing clumps of trogs, lounging around on the sidewalks. A few of the really smart ones were panhandling, but most of them were just humping away. I would have been annoyed at having to shove through the orgy if I wasn't actually feeling jealous. I kept wondering why the hell was I out here, in the sweaty summer smog, taking hits off my inhaler, while Suze and Chi and Zoo were all hanging around in air-con comfort and basically doing nothing. What was wrong with me? Why was I the one who always tried to fix things? Mercati had been like that, always taking stuff on, and then just getting worked harder and harder until the cancer ate him from the inside out. He was working so hard at the end, I think he might have been glad to go, just for the rest. Maggie always said they worked me too hard, and as I dragged my ass up Broadway, I started thinking she was right. Then again, if I left things to Chi and Suze, I'd be swimming up the Broadway River in a stew of crap and chemicals, instead of walking up a street. Maggie would have said that was someone else's problem, but she just thought so because when she flushed the toilet, it still worked. At the end of the day, it seemed like some people just got stuck dealing with the shit, and some people figured out how to have a good time. A half hour later, covered with sweat and street grime, and holding a half-empty squirt bottle of rehydrating sweat shine that I'd stolen from an unwary trog, I rolled through Columbia's gates and into the main quad, where I immediately ran into problems. I kept following signs for the engineering building, but they kept sending me around in circles. I would have asked for directions. I'm not one of those guys who can't, but it's pretty damn embarrassing when you can't even follow a simple sign, so I held off. And really, who was I going to ask? There were lots of kids out in the quad, all sprawled out and wearing basically nothing, and looking like they were starting a trog colony of their own. But I didn't feel like talking to them. I'm not a prude, but you've got to draw the line somewhere. I ended up wandering around lost, going from one building to the next, stumbling through a jumble of big old Roman and Ben Franklin-style buildings, lots of columns and brick and patchy green quads, everything looking like it was about to start raining concrete any second, trying to figure out why I couldn't understand any of the signs. Finally, I sucked it up and asked a couple half-naked kids for directions. The thing that ticks me off about academic types is that they always act like they're smarter than you. Rich kid, free ride, prep school ones are the worst. I kept asking the best and brightest for directions, trying to get them to take me to the engineering department or the engineering building or whatever the hell it was. And they all just looked me up and down and gibbered at me like monkeys, or else laughed through their effie highs and kept on going. A couple of them gave me a shrug and a dunno, but that was the best I got. I gave up on directions and just kept roaming. I don't know how long I wandered. Eventually I found a big old building off one of the quads, a big square thing with pillars like the Parthenon. A few kids were sprawled out on the steps, soaking up the sun, but it was one of the quietest parts of the campus I'd seen. The first set of doors I tried was chained, and so was the second, but then I found a set where the chain had been left undone, two heavy lengths of it, dangling with an old open padlock on the end. The kids on the steps were ignoring me, so I yanked open the doors. Inside, everything was silence and dust. Big old chandeliers hung down from the ceiling, sparkling with orangey light that filtered in through the dirt on the windows. The light made it feel like it was the end of day, with the sun starting to set, even though it was only a little past noon. A heavy blanket of dust covered everything. Floors and reading tables and chairs and computers all had a thick gray film over them. Hello? No one answered. My voice echoed and died, like the building had just swallowed up the sound. I started wandering, picking doorways at random, reading rooms, study carols, more dead computers, but most of all books, aisles and aisles with racks full of them, room after room stuffed with books, all of them covered with thick layers of dust. A library, a whole damn library in the middle of a university and not a single person in it. There were tracks on the floor and a litter of Effie packets, condom wrappers and liquor bottles, where people had come and gone at some point, but even the trash had its own fine layer of dust. 
In some rooms, all the books had been yanked off the shelves like a tornado had ripped through. In one, someone had made a bonfire out of them. They lay in a huge heap, completely torched. A pile of ash and pages and backings, a jumble of black ash fossils that crumbled to nothing when I crouched down and touched them. I stood quickly, wiping my hands on my pants. It was like fingering someone's bones. I kept wandering, running my fingers along shelves, and watching the dust cascade like miniature falls of concrete rain. I pulled down a book at random. More dust poured off and puffed up in my face. I coughed. My chest seized, and I took a hit off my inhaler. In the dimness, I could barely make out the title, Post-Liberation America, A Modern Perspective. When I opened it, its spine cracked. What are you doing here? I jumped back and dropped the book. Dust puffed around me. An old lady, hunched and witchy, was standing at the end of the aisle. She limped forward. Her voice was sharp as she repeated herself. What are you doing here? I got lost. I'm trying to find the engineering department. She was an ugly old dame. Liver spots and lines all over her face. Her skin hung off her bones in loose flaps. She looked a thousand years old, and not in a smart, wise way, just in a wrecked, moth-eaten way. She had something flat and silvery in her hand, a pistol. I took another step back. She raised the gun. Not that way. Out the way you came. She motioned with the pistol. Off you go. I hesitated. She smiled slightly, showing stumps of missing teeth. I won't shoot if you don't give me a reason. She waved the gun again. Go on. You aren't supposed to be here. She herded me back through the library to the main doors with a brisk authority. She pulled them open and waved her pistol at me. Go on, get. Wait, please. Can't you at least tell me where the engineering department is? Closed down years ago. Now get out. There's got to be one. Not any more. Go on, get. She brandished the pistol again. Get. I held on to the door. But you must know someone who can help me. I was talking fast, trying to get all my words out before she used the gun. I work on the city's sewage pumps. They're breaking, and I don't know how to fix them. I need someone who has engineering experience. She was shaking her head and starting to wave the gun. I tried again. Please, you've got to help. No one will talk to me, and you're going to be swimming in crap if I don't find help. Pump six serves the university, and I don't know how to fix it. She paused. She cocked her head first one way, then the other. Go on. I briefly outlined the problems with the pressure dines. When I finished, she shook her head and turned away. You've wasted your time. We haven't had an engineering department in over twenty years. She went over to a reading table and took a couple swipes at its dust, pulled out a chair and did the same with it. She sat, placing her pistol on the table, and motioned me to join her. Warily I brushed off my own seat. She laughed at the way my eyes kept going to her pistol. She picked it up and tucked it into a pocket of her moth-eaten sweater. Don't worry, I won't shoot you now. I just keep it around in case the kids get belligerent. They don't very often any more, but you never know. Her voice trailed off as she looked out at the quad. How can you not have an engineering department? Her eyes swung back to me. Same reason I closed the library. She laughed. We can't have the students running around in here, can we? She considered me for a moment, thoughtful. I'm surprised you got in. I must be getting old, forgetting to lock up like that. You always lock it. Aren't you librarians? I'm not a librarian, she interrupted. We haven't had a librarian since Herman Shue died. She laughed. I'm just an old faculty wife. My husband taught organic chemistry before he died. But you're the one who put the chains on the doors? There wasn't anyone else to do it. I just saw the students partying in here and realized something had to be done before they burned the damn place down. She drummed her fingers on the table, raising little dust puffs with her bony digits as she considered me. Finally, she said, If I gave you the library keys, could you learn the things you need to know about these pumps? Learn how they work? Fix them, maybe? I doubt it. That's why I came here. I pulled out my earbug. I've got the schematics right here. I just need someone to go over them for me. There's no one here who can help you. She smiled tightly. My degree was in social psychology, not engineering. And really, there's no one else. 
unless you count them. She waved at the students beyond the windows, humping in the quad. Do you think that any of them could read your schematics? Through the smudged glass doors, I could see the kids on the library steps, stripped down completely. They were humping away, grinning, and having a good time. One of the girls saw me through the glass and waved at me to join her. When I shook my head, she shrugged and went back to her humping. The old lady studied me like a vulture. See what I mean? The girl got into her rhythm. She grinned at me watching and motioned again for me to come out and play. All she needed were some big yellow eyes, and she would have made a perfect trog. I closed my eyes and opened them again. Nothing changed. The girl was still there with all of her little play friends, all of them romping around and having a good time. The best and the brightest, the old lady murmured. In the middle of the quad, more of the students were stripping down, none of them caring that they were doing it in the middle of broad daylight, none of them worried about who was watching or what anyone might think. A couple hundred kids, and not a single one of them had a book, or a notebook, or pens, or paper, or a computer with them. The old lady laughed. Don't look so surprised. You can't say someone of your caliber never noticed. She paused, waiting, then peered at me, incredulous. The trogs, the concrete rain, the reproductive disorders. You never wondered about any of it. She shook her head. You're stupider than I guessed. But, I cleared my throat, how could it? I mean, I trailed off. Chemistry was my husband's field. She squinted at the kids humping on the steps and tangled out in the grass, then shook her head and shrugged. There are plenty of books on the topic. For a while, there were even magazine stories about it. Why breast might not be best, stuff like that. She waved a hand impatiently. Rohit and I never really thought about any of it until his students started seeming stupider every year. She cackled briefly, and then he tested them, and he was right. We can't all be turning into trogs. I held up my bottle of sweatshine. How could I buy this bottle, or my earbug, or bacon, or anything? Someone has to be making these things. You found bacon? Where? She leaned forward, interested. My wife did. Last packet. She settled back with a sigh. It doesn't matter. I couldn't chew it anyway. She studied my sweatshine bottle. Who knows? Maybe you're right. Maybe it's not so bad. But this is the longest conversation that I've had since Rohit died. Most people just don't seem to be able to pay attention to things like they used to. She eyed me. Maybe your sweatshine bottle just means there's a factory somewhere that's as good as your sewage pumps used to be, and as long as nothing too complex goes wrong, we all get to keep drinking it. It's not that bad. Maybe not. She shrugged. It doesn't matter to me anymore. I'll kick off pretty soon. After that, it's your problem. It was night by the time I came out of the university. I had a bag full of books, and no one to know that I'd taken them. The old lady hadn't cared if I checked them out or not, just waved at me to take as many as I liked, and then gave me the keys and told me to lock up when I left. All of the books were thick with equations and diagrams. I would picked through them one after another, reading each for a while, before giving up and starting on another. They were all pretty much gibberish. It was like trying to read before you knew your ABCs. Mercati had been right. I should have stayed in school— I probably wouldn't have done any worse than the Columbia kids. Out on the street, half the buildings were dark. Some kind of brownout that ran all the way down Broadway. One side of the street had electricity, cheerful and bright. The other side had candles glimmering in all the apartment windows, ghost lights flickering in a pretty ambiance. A crash of concrete rain echoed from a couple blocks away. I couldn't help shivering. Everything had turned creepy. It felt like the old lady was leaning over my shoulder and pointing out broken things everywhere. Empty auto vendors, cars that hadn't moved in years, cracks in the sidewalk, piss in the gutters. What was normal supposed to look like? I forced myself to look at good things. People were still out and about, walking to their dance clubs, going out to eat, wandering uptown or downtown to see their parents. Kids were on skateboards rolling past, and trogs were humping in the alleys. A couple of vendor boxes were full of cellophane bagels, along with a big row of sweatshine bottles all glowing green under their lights, 
still all stocked up and ready for sale. Lots of things were still working. Wiki was still a great club, even if Max needed a little help remembering to restock, and Miku and Gabe had their new baby, even if it took them three years to get it. I couldn't let myself wonder if that baby was going to turn out like the college kids in the quad. Not everything was broken. As if to prove it, the subway ran all the way to my stop for a change. Somewhere on the line, they must have had a couple guys like me. People who could still read a schematic and remember how to show up for work and not throw toilet paper around the control rooms. I wondered who they were. And then I wondered if they ever noticed how hard it was to get anything done. When I got home, Maggie was already in bed. I gave her a kiss and she woke up a little. She pushed her hair away from her face. I left out a hot pat burrito for you. The stove's still broke. Sorry, I forgot. I'll fix it now. No worry. She turned away from me and pulled the sheets up around her neck. For a minute, I thought she'd dozed off. But then she said, Trav? Yeah? I got my period. I sat down beside her and started massaging her back. How you doing with that? It's okay. Maybe next time. She was already dropping back to sleep. You just got to stay optimistic, right? That's right, baby. I kept rubbing her back. That's right. When she was asleep, I went back to the kitchen. I found the hot pack burrito and shook it and tore it open, holding it with the tips of my fingers so I wouldn't burn myself. I took a bite and decided the burritos were still working just fine. I dumped all the books onto the kitchen table and stared at them, trying to decide where to start. Through the open kitchen windows, from the direction of the park, I heard another crash of concrete rain. I looked out toward the candle flicker darkness. Not far away, deep underground, nine pumps were chugging away, their little flashers winking in and out with errors, their maintenance logs scrolling repair requests, and all of them running a little harder now that pump six was down. But they were still running. The people who'd built them had done a good job. With luck, they'd keep running for a long time yet. I chose a book at random and started reading. Boojum Elizabeth Bear and Sarah Monette. Elizabeth Bear, www.elizabethbear.com, lives in Hartford, Connecticut. She won the 2005 John W. Campbell Award for Best New Writer and the 2008 Hugo Award for Best Short Story for Tideline. Prolific as well as talented, she has published 14 SF and fantasy novels since 2005, more than 40 stories since 2003, and a collection, The Chains That You Refuse, 2006. Her 2009 novel will be The Norse Fantasy by The Mountain Bound, and she is currently gearing up to help start the second season of the virtual TV show Shadow Unit. Sarah Monette, www.sarahmonette, S-A-R-A-H-M-O-N-E-T-T-E dot -T -T -E com, was born and raised in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, one of the secret cities of the Manhattan Project. She studied English and classics and has a Ph.D. in English literature. Her novels are Melusine, 2005, The Virtue, 2006, The Mirador, 2007, Corambus, 2009, and in collaboration with Elizabeth Bear, A Companion to Wolves, 2007. Her short stories have appeared in Lady Churchill's Rosebud Wristlet, Alchemy, Weird Tales, and Strange Horizons, and are collected in The Bone Key, 2007. Boojum was published in the excellent original anthology of fantasy and SF pirate stories, Fast Ships, Black Sails, edited by Jeff and Anne Vandermeer. It turns the premise of the anthology on its head. A tale of living spaceships that are brain thieves. This story, in the tradition of Anne McCaffrey's The Ship Sang, is one of this year's most entertaining. The ship had no name of her own, so her human crew called her the Lavinia Waitley. As far as anyone could tell, she didn't mind. At least her long, grasping veins curled, affectionately. When the chief engineers patted her bulkheads and called her Vinny, and she ceremoniously tracked the footsteps of each crew member with her internal bioluminescence, giving them light to walk and work and live by. The Lavinia Waitley was a boojum, a deep-space swimmer, 
but her kind had evolved in the high, tempestuous envelopes of gas giants, and their offspring still spent their infancies there, in cloud nurseries over eternal storms, and so she was streamlined, something like a vast, spiny lionfish to the earth-adapted eye. Her sides were lined with gas bags filled with hydrogen, her veins and wings furled tight. Her color was a blue-green, so dark it seemed a glossy black, unless the light struck it. Her hide was impregnated with symbiotic algae. Where there was light, she could make oxygen. Where there was oxygen, she could make water. She was an ecosystem unto herself, as the captain was a law unto herself. And down in the bowels of the engineering section, Black Alice Bradley, who was only human and no kind of law at all, loved her. Black Alice had taken the oath back in thirty-two, after the Venusian riots. She hadn't hidden her reasons, and the captain had looked at her with cold, dark, amused eyes, and said, "'So long as you carry your weight, Cherie, I don't care. Betray me, though, and you will be going back to Venus the cold way.' But it was probably that, and the fact that Black Alice couldn't hit the broadside of a space freighter with a ray gun, that had gotten her assigned to engineering, where ethics were less of a problem. It wasn't, after all, as if she was going anywhere. Black Alice was on duty when the Lavinia Waitley spotted prey. She felt the shiver of anticipation that ran through the decks of the ship. It was an odd sensation, a tick Vinnie only exhibited in pursuit. And then they were underway, zooming down the slope of the gravity well towards Saul, and the screens all around engineering— which Captain Song kept dark, most of the time, on the theory that swabs and deckhands and coal shovelers didn't need to know where they were or what they were doing, flickered bright and live. Everybody looked up, and Demi Jack shouted, There! There! He was right. The blot that might only have been a smudge of oil on the screen moved as Vinny banked, revealing itself to be a freighter, big and ungainly and hopelessly outclassed. Easy prey, easy pickings. We could use some of them, thought Black Alice. Contrary to the e-ballads and com stories, a pirate's life was not all imported delicacies and fawning slaves, especially not when three-quarters of any and all profits went directly back to the Lavinia Waitley, to keep her healthy and happy. Nobody ever argued. There were stories about the Marie Curie, too. The captain's voice over fiber-optic cable, strung beside the Lavinia Waitley's nerve bundles, was as clear and free of static as if she stood at Black Alice's elbow. Battle stations, Captain Song said, and the crew leapt to obey. It had been too solar since Captain Song keelhauled James Brady, but nobody who'd been with the ship then was ever likely to forget his ruptured eyes and frozen scream. Black Alice manned her station and stared at the screen. She saw the freighter's name, the Josephine Baker, gold on black across the stern, the Venusian flag for its port of registry, wired stiff from a mast on its hull. It was a steel ship, not a boojum, and they had every advantage. For a moment she thought the freighter would run, and then it turned and brought its guns to bear. No sense of movement, of acceleration, of disorientation, no pop, no wump of displaced air. The view on the screens just flickered to a different one as Vinny skipped, apported, to a new position just aft and above the Josephine Baker, crushing the flagmast with her hull. Black Alice felt that, a grinding shiver, and had just time to grab her console before the Lavinia Waitley grappled the freighter, long veins not curling in affection now. Out of the corner of her eye she saw a dog collar, the closest thing the Lavinia Waitley had to a chaplain, cross himself, and she heard him mutter, like he always did, Ave grande visimi, morituri vos salutant. It was the best he'd be able to do until it was all over, and even then he wouldn't have the chance to do much. Captain Song didn't mind other people worrying about souls, so long as they didn't do it on her time. The captain's voice was calling orders, assigning people to boarding parties port and starboard. Down in engineering, all they had to do was monitor the Lavinia Waitley's hull and prepare to repel boarders, assuming the freighter's crew had the gumption to send any. Vinnie would take care of the rest, until the time came to persuade her not to eat her prey before they'd gotten all the valuables off it. That was a ticklish job, 
only entrusted, to the chief engineers, but Black Alice watched and listened, and although she didn't expect she'd ever get the chance, she thought she could do it herself. It was a small ambition, and one she never talked about, but it would be a hell of a thing, wouldn't it? To be somebody a boojum would listen to. She gave her attention to the dull screens in her sectors, and tried not to crane her neck to catch a glimpse of the ones with the actual fighting on them. Dog Collar was making the rounds with sidearms from the weapons locker, just in case. Once the Josephine Baker was subdued, it was the junior engineers and others who would board her to take inventory. Sometimes there were crew members left in hiding on captured ships. Sometimes unwary pirates got shot. There was no way to judge the progress of the battle from engineering. Wasabi put a stopwatch up on one of the secondary screens as usual, and everybody glanced at it periodically. Fifteen minutes ongoing meant the boarding parties hadn't hit any nasty surprises. Black Alice had met a man once who'd been on the Margaret Mead when she grappled a freighter that turned out to be carrying a division's worth of marines out to the Jovian moons. Thirty minutes ongoing was normal. Forty-five minutes, upward of an hour ongoing, and people started double-checking their weapons. The longest battle Black Alice had ever personally been part of was six hours, forty-three minutes, and fifty-two seconds. That had been the last time the Lavinia Waitley worked with a partner, and the double cross by the Henry Ford was the only reason any of Vinnie's crew needed. Captain Song still had Captain Edward's head in a jar on the bridge, and Vinnie had an ugly ring of scars where the Henry Ford had bitten her. This time, the clock stopped at fifty minutes thirteen seconds. The Josephine Baker surrendered. Dog Collar slapped Black Alice's arm. With me, he said, and she didn't argue. He had only six weeks seniority over her, but he was as tough as he was devout, and not stupid either. She checked the Velcro on her holster and followed him up the ladder, reaching through the rungs once to scratch Vinnie's bulkhead as she passed. The ship paid her no notice. She wasn't the captain, and she wasn't one of the four chief engineers. Quartermaster mostly respected crew's own partner choices, and as Black Alice and Dog Collar suited up, it wouldn't be the first time, if the Josephine Baker's crew decided to blow her open to space rather than be taken captive, he came by and issued them both tag guns and X-ray pads, taking a retina scan in return. All sorts of valuable things got hidden inside of bulkheads, and once Vinny was done with the steel ship, there wouldn't be much chance of coming back to look for what they'd missed. Wet pirates used to scuttle their captures. The boojums were more efficient. Black Alice clipped everything to her belt and checked dog collar seals. And then they were swinging down lines from the Lavinia Waitley's belly to the chewed open airlock. A lot of crew didn't like to look at the ship's face, but Black Alice loved it. All those teeth, the diamond edges worn to a glitter, and a few of the ship's dozens of bright sapphire eyes blinking back at her. She waved, unselfconsciously, and flattered herself that the ripple of closing eyes was Vinnie winking in return. She followed Dog Collar inside the prize. They unsealed when they had checked atmosphere, no sense in wasting your own air when you might need it later, and the first thing she noticed was the smell. The Lavinia Waitley had her own smell, ozone and nutmeg, and other ships never smelled as good, but this was, this was, what did they kill, and why didn't they space it? Dog Collar wheezed, and Black Alice swallowed hard against her gag reflex, and said, one will get you twenty, we're the lucky bastards that find it. No takers, Dog Collar said. They worked together to crank open the hatches they came to. Twice they found crew members, messily dead. Once they found crew members alive. Gillies, said Black Alice. Still don't explain the smell, said Dog Collar. And to the Gillies, look, you can join our crew, or our ship can eat you. Makes no never mind to us. The Gillies blinked their big, wet eyes and made finger signs at each other, and then nodded, hard. Dog Collar slapped a tag on the bulkhead. Someone will come get you. You go wandering. We'll assume you changed your mind. The Gillies shook their heads hard and folded down onto the deck to wait. Dog Collar tagged searched holds, green for clean, purple for goods, red for anything Vinnie might like to eat, 
that couldn't be fenced for a profit, and Black Alice mapped. The corridors in the steel ship were winding, twisty, hard to track. She was glad she chalked the walls, because she didn't think her map was quite right, somehow, but she couldn't figure out where she'd gone wrong. Still, they had a beacon, and Vinny could always chew them out if she had to. Black Alice loved her ship. She was thinking about that, how, okay, it wasn't so bad, the pirate game, and it sure beat working in the sunstone mines on Venus, when she found a locked cargo hold. Hey, dog collar, she said to her cum, and while he was turning to cover her, she pulled her sidearm and blastered the lock. The door peeled back, and Black Alice found herself staring at rank upon rank of silver cylinders, each less than a meter tall and perhaps half a meter wide, smooth and featureless, except for what looked like an assortment of sockets and plugs on the surface of each. The smell was strongest here. Shit, she said. Dog collar, more practical, slapped the first safety orange tag of the expedition beside the door and said only, Captain'll want to see this. Yeah, said Black Alice cold chills chasing themselves up and down her spine. Come on, let's move. But of course it turned out that she and Dog Collar were on the retrieval detail too, and the captain wasn't leaving the canisters for Vinny. Which, okay, fair. Black Alice didn't want the Lavinia Waitley eating those things either, but why did they have to bring them back? She said as much to Dog Collar, under her breath, and had a horrifying thought. She knows what they are, right? She's the captain, said Dog Collar. Yeah, but I ain't arguing, man. But if she doesn't know... She lowered her voice even farther so she could barely hear herself. What if somebody opens one? Dog Collar gave her a pained look. Nobody's going to go opening anything. But if you're really worried, go talk to the captain about it. He was calling her bluff. Black Alice called his right back. Come with me. He was stuck. He stared at her, and then he grunted and pulled his gloves off, the left and then the right. Fuck, he said, I guess we oughta. For the crew members who had been in the boarding action, the party had already started. Dog Collar and Black Alice finally tracked the captain down in the rec room, where her marines were slurping stolen wine from broken-necked bottles. As much of it splashed on the gravity plates epoxied to the Lavinia Waitley's flattest interior surface as went into the Marines, but Black Alice imagined there was plenty more where that came from, and the faster the crew went through it, the less long they'd be drunk. The captain herself was naked in a great extruded tub, up to her collarbones in steaming water dyed pink and heavily scented by the bath bombs sizzling here and there. Black Alice stared. She hadn't seen a tub bath in seven years. She still dreamed of them sometimes. Captain, she said, because Dog Collar wasn't going to say anything, we think you should know we found some dangerous cargo on the prize. Captain Song raised one eyebrow. And you imagine I don't know already, Cherie? Oh, shit. But Black Alice stood her ground. We thought we should be sure. The captain raised one long leg out of the water to shove a pair of necking pirates off the rim of her tub. They rolled onto the floor, grappling and clawing, both fighting to be on top. But they didn't break the kiss. You wish to be sure, said the captain. Her dark eyes had never left Black Alice's sweating face. Very well, tell me. And then you will know that I know, and you can be sure. Dog Collar made a grumbling noise deep in his throat, easily interpreted, I told you so. Just as she had when she took Captain Song's oath and slit her thumb with a razor blade and dripped her blood on the Lavinia Waitley's decking so the ship might know her, Black Alice, metaphorically speaking, took a breath and jumped. Their brains, she said, human brains, stolen, black market, the fungi, my go. Dog Collar hissed, and the captain grinned at him, showing extraordinarily white, strong teeth. He ducked, submissively, but didn't step back, for which Black Alice felt a completely ridiculous gratitude. My go, Black Alice said. My go, fungi, what did it matter? They came from the outer rim of the solar system, the black, cold, hurtling rocks of the Upic Oort cloud. Like the Bojums, they could swim between the stars. 
They collect them. There's a black market. Nobody knows what they use them for. It's illegal, of course, but they're alive in there. They go mad, supposedly. And that was it. That was all Black Alice could manage. She stopped and had to remind herself to shut her mouth. So I've heard, the captain said, dabbling at the steaming water. She stretched luxuriously in her tub. Someone thrust a glass of white wine at her, condensation doing the outside. The captain did not drink from shattered plastic bottles. The Mygo will pay for this cargo, won't they? They mine rare minerals all over the system. They're said to be very wealthy. Yes, Captain, Dog Collar said, when it became obvious that Black Alice couldn't. Good, the captain said. Under Black Alice's feet, the decking shuddered, a grinding sound as Vinny began to dine. Her rows of teeth would make short work of the Josephine Baker's steel hide. Black Alice could see two of the gillies, the same two. She never could tell them apart unless they had scars, flinch, and tug at their chains. Then they might as well pay us as someone else, wouldn't you say? Black Alice knew she should stop thinking about the canisters. Captain's word was law, but she couldn't help it, like scratching at a scab. They were down there, in the third subhold, the one even sniffers couldn't find cold and sweating, and with that stench that was like a living thing. And she kept wondering, were they empty, or were there brains in there, people's brains going mad? The idea was driving her crazy, and finally, her fourth off-shift after the capture of the Josephine Baker, she had to go look. This is stupid, Black Alice, she muttered to herself as she climbed down the companionway, the beads in her hair clicking against her earrings. Stupid, stupid, stupid! Vinnie bioluminesced, a traveling spotlight, placidly unconcerned whether Black Alice was being an idiot or not. Half-hand Sally had pulled duty in the main hold. She nodded at Black Alice, and Black Alice nodded back. Black Alice ran errands a lot, for engineering and sometimes for other departments, because she didn't smoke hash and she didn't cheat at cards. She was reliable. Down through the subholds, and she really didn't want to be doing this, but she was here, and the smell of the third subhold was already making her sick, and maybe, if she just knew one way or the other, she'd be able to quit thinking about it. She opened the third subhold, and the stench rushed out. The canisters were just metal, sealed, seemingly airtight. There shouldn't be any way for the aroma of the contents to escape, but it permeated the air nonetheless. Bad enough that Black Alice wished she had brought a rebreather. No, that would have been suspicious. So it was really best for everyone concerned that she hadn't. But oh, gods and little fishes, the stench. Even breathing through her mouth was no help. She could taste it, like oil from a fryer, saturating the air, oozing up her sinuses, coating the interior spaces of her body. As silently as possible, she stepped across the threshold and into the space beyond. The Lavinia Waitley obligingly lit the space as she entered, dazzling her at first as the overhead lights, not just bioluminescent, here, but LEDs chosen to approximate natural daylight, for when they shipped plants and animals, reflected off rank upon rank of canisters. When Black Alice went among them, they did not reach her waist. She was just going to walk through, she told herself. Hesitantly, she touched the closest cylinder. The air in this hold was so dry there was no condensation. The whole ship ran to lip-cracking, nosebleed dryness in the long weeks between prizes. But the cylinder was cold. It felt somehow grimy to the touch, gritty and oily like machine grease. She pulled her hand back. It wouldn't do to open the closest one to the door, and she realized, with that thought, that she was planning on opening one. There must be a way to do it. A concealed catch or a code pad? She was an engineer, after all. She stopped three ranks in, lightheaded with the smell, to examine the problem. It was remarkably simple once you looked for it. There were three depressions on either side of the rim, a little smaller than human fingertips, but spaced appropriately. She laid the pads of her fingers over them and pressed hard, making the flesh deform into the catches. The lid sprang up with a pressurized hiss, Black Alice was grateful that even open it couldn't smell much worse. 
she leaned forward to peer within. There was a clear membrane over the surface and gelatin or thick fluid underneath. Vinny's lights illuminated it well. It was not empty. And as the light struck the grayish surface of the lump of tissue floating within, Black Alice would have sworn she saw the pathetic unbodied thing flinch. She scrambled to close the canister again, nearly pinching her fingertips when it clanked shut. Sorry, she whispered, although, dear sweet Jesus, surely the thing couldn't hear her. Sorry, sorry. And then she turned and ran, catching her hip a bruising blow against the doorway, slapping the controls to make it fucking close already. And then she staggered sideways, lurching to her knees, and vomited until blackness was spinning in front of her eyes, and she couldn't smell or taste anything but bile. Vinny would absorb the former contents of Black Alice's stomach, just as she absorbed, filtered, recycled, and excreted all her crew's wastes. Shaking, Black Alice braced herself back upright and began the long climb out of the holds. In the first subhold, she had to stop, her shoulder against the smooth, velvet slickness of Vinny's skin, her mouth hanging open while her lungs worked. And she knew Vinny wasn't going to hear her because she wasn't the captain or a chief engineer or anyone important. But she had to try anyway, croaking, Vinny, water, please? And no one could have been more surprised than Black Alice Bradley when Vinny extruded a basin and a thin, cool trickle of water began to flow into it. Well, now she knew, and there was still nothing she could do about it. She wasn't the captain, and if she said anything more than she already had, people were going to start looking at her funny. Mutiny, kind of funny. And what Black Alice did not need was any more of Captain Song's attention, and especially not for rumors like that. She kept her head down and did her job, and didn't discuss her nightmares with anyone. And she had nightmares, all right. Hot and cold running enough, she fancied, that she could have filled up the captain's huge tub with them. She could live with that. But over the next double dozen of shifts, she became aware of something else wrong, and this was worse, because it was something wrong with the Lavinia Waitley. The first sign was the chief engineer's frowning and going into huddles at odd moments. And then Black Alice began to feel it herself, the way Vinny was. She didn't have a word for it, because she'd never felt anything like it before. She would have said balky, but that couldn't be right. It couldn't but she was more and more sure that Vinny was less responsive somehow, that when she obeyed the captain's orders, it was with a delay. If she were human, Vinny would have been dragging her feet. You couldn't keel-haul a ship for not obeying fast enough. And then, because she was paying attention so hard she was making her own head hurt, Black Alice noticed something else. Captain Song had them cruising the gas giant's orbits, Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, not going in as far as the asteroid belt, not going out as far as Uranus. Nobody Black Alice talked to knew why, exactly, but she and Dog Collar figured it was because the captain wanted to talk to the Migo without actually getting near the nasty cold rock of their planet. And what Black Alice noticed was that Vinny was less balky, less unhappy, when she was headed out, and more and more resistant the closer they got to the asteroid belt. Vinny, she remembered, had been born over Uranus. Do you want to go home, Vinny? Black Alice asked her one late night shift, when there was nobody around to care that she was talking to the ship. Is that what's wrong? She put her hand flat on the wall, and although she was probably imagining it, she thought she felt a shiver ripple across Vinny's vast side. Black Alice knew how little she knew, and didn't even contemplate sharing her theory with the chief engineers. They probably knew exactly what was wrong and exactly what to do to keep the Lavinia Waitley from going core meltdown like the Marie Curie had. That was a whispered story, not the sort of thing anybody talked about, except in their hammocks after lights out. The Marie Curie had eaten her own crew. So when Wasabi said, four shifts later, Black Alice, I've got a job for you, Black Alice said, yes, sir, and hoped it would be something that would help the Lavinia Waitley be happy again. It was a suit job, he said, replace and repair. Black Alice was going because she was reliable and smart and stayed quiet, and it was time she took on more responsibilities. The way he said it made her first fret, because that meant the captain might be reminded of her existence, and then fret because she realized 
the captain already had been. But she took the equipment he issued, and she listened to the instructions, and read schematics, and committed them both to memory and her implants. It was a ticklish job, a neural override repair. She'd done some fiber-optic bundle splicing, but this was going to be a doozy, and she was going to have to do it in stiff, pressurized gloves. Her heart hammered as she sealed her helmet, and not because she was worried about the EVA. This was a chance, an opportunity, a step closer to Chief Engineer. Maybe she had impressed the captain with her discretion after all. She cycled the airlock, snapped her safety harness, and stepped out onto the Lavinia Waitley's hide. That deep blue-green, like azurite, like the teeming seas of Venus under their swampy eternal clouds, was invisible. They were too far from Saul. It was a yellow, stylus dot, and you had to know where to look for it. Vinny's hide was just black under Black Alice's suit floods. As the airlock cycled shut, though, the Boojum's own bioluminescence shimmered up her veins and along the ridges of her sides, crimson and electric green and acid blue. Vinny must have noticed Black Alice picking her way carefully up her spine with barbed boots. They wouldn't hurt Vinny. Nothing short of a space rock could manage that, but they certainly stuck in there good. The thing Black Alice was supposed to repair was at the principal nexus of Vinny's central nervous system. The ship didn't have anything like what a human or a gilly would consider a brain. There were nodules spread all through her vast body, too slow otherwise, and Black Alice had heard Boojums weren't supposed to be all that smart. Trainable, sure, maybe like an earth monkey. Which is what made it creepy as hell, that as she picked her way up Vinny's flank, though up was a courtesy under these circumstances, talking to her all the way, she would have sworn Vinny was talking back, not just tracking her with the lights, as she would always do, but bending some of her barbels and veins around, as if craning her neck to get a look at Black Alice. Black Alice carefully circumnavigated an eye. She didn't think her boots would hurt it, but it seemed discourteous to stomp across somebody's field of vision, and wondered only half-idly if she had been sent out on this task, not because she was being considered for promotion, but because she was expendable. She was just rolling her eyes and dismissing that as borrowing trouble when she came over a bump on Vinny's back, spotted her goal, and all the ship's lights went out. She tongued on the comm. Wasabi? I got you, Blackie. You just keep doing what you're doing. Yes, sir. But it seemed like her feet stayed stuck in Vinny's hide a little longer than was good, at least fifteen seconds before she managed a couple of deep breaths, too deep for her limited oxygen supply, so she went briefly dizzy, and continued up Vinny's side. Black Alice had no idea what inflammation looked like in a boojum, but she would guess this was it. All around the interface she was meant to repair, Vinny's flesh looked scraped and puffy. Black Alice walked tenderly, wincing, muttering apologies under her breath, and with every step the tendrils coiled a little closer. Black Alice crouched beside the box and began examining connections. The console was about three meters by four, half a meter tall, and fixed firmly to Vinny's hide. It looked like the thing was still functional, but something— a bit of space debris, maybe, had dented it pretty good. Cautiously, Black Alice dropped a hand on it. She found the access panel and flipped it open. More red lights than green. A tongue click, and she began withdrawing her tethered tools from their holding pouches and arranging them so that they would float conveniently around. She didn't hear a thing, of course, but the hide under her boots vibrated suddenly, sharply. She jerked her head around just in time to see one of Vinny's feelers slap her own side five or ten meters away, and then the whole boojum shuddered, contracting, curved into a hard crescent of pain, the same way she had when the Henry Ford had taken that chunk out of her hide, and the lights in the access panel lit up all at once, red, red, yellow, red. Black Alice tongued off the send function on her headset phone so Wasabi wouldn't hear her. She touched the bruised hull, and she touched the dented edge of the console. Vinny, she said, does this hurt? Not that Vinny could answer her, but it was obvious. She was in pain. And maybe that dent didn't have anything to do with space debris. Maybe. Black Alice straightened, looked around, and couldn't convince herself that it was an accident that this box was planted right where Vinny couldn't quite reach it. 
So what does it do? She muttered. Why am I out here repairing something that fucking hurts? She crouched down again and took another long look at the interface. As an engineer, Black Alice was mostly self-taught. Her implants were second-hand, black market, scavenged. The wet work done by a ghillie on Providence Station. She'd learned the technical vocabulary from Gogglehead Kim before he bought it in a stupid little fight with a ship named the V.I. Ulyanov. But what she relied on were her instincts, the things she knew without being able to say. So she looked at that box wired into Vinny's spine and all its red and yellow lights, and then she tongued the comm back on and said, Wasabi, this thing don't look so good. What do you mean, don't look so good? Wasabi sounded distracted, and that was just fine. Black Alice made a noise, the auditory equivalent of a shrug. I think the node's inflamed. Can we pull it and lock it in somewhere else? No, said Wasabi. It's looking pretty ugly out here. Look, Blackie, unless you want us to all go sailing out into the big empty, we are not pulling that governor. Just fix the fucking thing, would you? Yes, sir, said Black Alice, thinking hard. The first thing was that Wasabi knew what was going on, knew what the box did, and knew that the Lavinia Waitley didn't like it. That wasn't comforting. The second thing was that whatever was going on, it involved the big empty, the cold vastness between the stars. So it wasn't that Vinnie wanted to go home, she wanted to go out. It made sense, from what Black Alice knew about Boojums. Their infants lived in the tumult of the gas giant's atmosphere, but as they aged, they pushed higher and higher until they reached the edge of the envelope, and then, following instinct or maybe the calls of their fellows, nobody knew for sure, they learned to skip, throwing themselves out into the vacuum like earthbirds leaving the nest. And what if, for a boojum, the solar system was just another nest? Black Alice knew the Lavinia Waitley was old for a boojum, Captain Song was not her first captain, although you never mentioned Captain Smith if you knew what was good for you. So if there was another stage to her life cycle, she might be ready for it, and her crew wasn't letting her go. Jesus and the cold, fishy gods, Black Alice thought. Is this why the Marie Curie ate her crew? Because they wouldn't let her go? She fumbled for her tools, tugging the cords to float them closer, and wound up walloping herself in the bicep with a splicer. And as she was wrestling with it, her headset spoke again. Blackie, can you hurry it up out there? Captain says we're going to have company. Company? She never got to say it, because when she looked up, she saw the shapes, faintly limbed in starlight, and a chill as cold as a suit leak crept up her neck. There were dozens of them, hundreds. They made her skin crawl and her nerves judder, the way Gillies and Boojums never had. They were man-sized, roughly, but they looked like the pseudo-roaches of Venus, the ones Black Alice still had nightmares about, with too many legs and horrible stiff wings. They had ovate, corrugated heads, but no faces, and where their mouths ought to be, sprouting, writhing tentacles, and some of them carried silver, shining cylinders, like the canisters in Vinny's subhold. Black Alice wasn't certain if they saw her crouched on the Boojum's hide, with only a thin laminate between her and the breath-sucker, but she was certain of something else. If they did, they did not care. They disappeared below the curve of the ship, toward the airlock Black Alice had exited, before clawing her way along the ship's side. They could be a trade delegation, come to bargain for the salvaged cargo. Black Alice didn't think even the Migo came in the battalions to talk trade. She meant to wait until the last of them had passed, but they just kept coming. Wasabi wasn't answering her hails. She was on her own and unarmed. She fumbled with her tools, stowing things in any handy pocket, whether it was where the tool went or not. She couldn't see much. Everything was misty. It took her several seconds to realize that her visor was fogged because she was crying. Patch cables. Where were the fucking patch cables? She found a two-meter length of fiber optic with the right plugs on the end. One end went into the monitor panel, the other snapped into her suit com. Vinny, she whispered, when she thought she had a connection. Vinny, can you hear me? The bioluminescence under Black Alice's boots pulsed once. Gods and little fishes, she thought. 
and then she drew out her laser cutting torch and started slicing open the case on the console that Wasabi had called the governor. Wasabi was probably dead by now or dying. Wasabi and dog collar and, well, not dead. If they were lucky, they were dead. Because the opposite of lucky was those canisters the Maigo were carrying. She hoped dog collar was lucky. You want to go out, right? She whispered to the Lavinia Waitley, out into the big empty. She'd never been sure how much Vinny understood of what people said, but the light pulsed again. And this thing won't let you. It wasn't a question. She had it open now, and she could see that was what it did. Ugly fucking thing. Vinny shivered underneath her, and there was a sudden pulse of noise in her helmet speakers, screaming. People screaming. I know, Black Alice said. They'll come get me in a minute, I guess. She swallowed hard against the sudden lurch of her stomach. I'm gonna get this thing off you, though. And when they go, you can go, okay? And I'm sorry, I didn't know we were keeping you from— She had to quit talking, or she really was going to puke. Grimly, she fumbled for the tools she needed to disentangle the abomination from Vinny's nervous system. Another pulse of sound, a voice, not a person, flat and buzzing and horrible. We do not bargain with thieves. And the scream that time? She'd never heard Captain Song scream before. Black Alice flinched and started counting to slow her breathing. Puking in a suit was the number one badness, but hyperventilating in a suit was a really close second. Her heads-up display was low res and slightly miscalibrated so that everything had a faint shadow double. But the thing that flashed up against her own view of her hands was unmistakable. A question mark. Vinny? Another pulse of screaming, and the question mark again. Holy shit, Vinny! Never mind, never mind. They, um, they collect people's brains, in canisters, like the canisters in the third subhold. The bioluminescence pulsed once. Black Alice kept working. Her heads up pinged again. Alice? A pause. Question mark. Um, yeah. I figured that's what they'll do with me, too. It looked like they had plenty of canisters to go around. Vinny pulsed, and there was a longer pause, while Black Alice doggedly severed connections and loosened bolts. Want? said the Lavinia Waitley. Question mark. Want? Do I want? Her laughter sounded bad. Um, no. No, I don't want to be a brain in a jar. But I'm not seeing a lot of choices here. Even if I went commentary, they could catch me. And it kind of sounds like they're mad enough to do it, too. She'd cleared out all the moorings around the edge of the governor. The case lifted off with a shove and went sailing into the dark. Black Alice winced. But then the processor under the cover drifted away from Vinny's hide, and there was just the monofilament tethers and the fat cluster of fiber optic and superconductors to go. Help? I'm doing my best here, Vinny, Black Alice said through her teeth. That got her a fast double pulse, and the Lavinia Waitley said, Help. And then Alice. You want to help me? Black Alice squeaked. A strong pulse, and the heads up said, Help Alice. That's really sweet of you, but I'm honestly not sure there's anything you can do. I mean, it doesn't look like the Maigo are mad at you, and I really want to keep it that way. Eat, Alice, said the Lavinia Waitley. Black Alice came within a millimeter of taking her own fingers off with the cutting laser. Um, Vinny, that's, um, well, I guess it's better than being a brain in a jar. Or suffocating to death in her suit if she went commentary and the Maigo didn't come after her. The double pulse again, but Black Alice didn't see what she could have missed. As communications went, Eat Alice was pretty fucking unambiguous. Help Alice, the Lavinia Waitley insisted. Black Alice leaned in close, unsplicing the last of the governor's circuits from the Boojum's nervous system. Save Alice. By eating me? Look, I know what happens to things you eat, and it's not— She bit her tongue— because she did know what happened to things the Lavinia Waitley ate. Absorbed, filtered, recycled. Vinny, are you saying you can save me from the Maigo? A pulse of agreement. By eating me? Black Alice pursued, needing to be sure she understood. Another pulse of agreement. 
Black Alice thought about the Lavinia Waitley's teeth. How much me are we talking about here? Alice, said the Lavinia Waitley, and then the last fiber optic cable parted, and Black Alice, her hands shaking, detached her patch cable and flung the whole mess of it as hard as she could straight up. Maybe it would find a planet with atmosphere and be some little alien kid's shooting star. And now she had to decide what to do. She figured she had two choices, really. One, walk back down the Lavinia Waitley and find out if the Mygo believed in surrender. Two, walk around the Lavinia Waitley and into her toothy mouth. Black Alice didn't think the Mygo believed in surrender. She tilted her head back for one last clear look at the shining black infinity of space. Really, there wasn't any choice at all, because even if she'd misunderstood what Vinny seemed to be trying to tell her, the worst she'd end up was dead, and that was light years better than what the Mygo had on offer. Black Alice Bradley loved her ship. She turned to her left and started walking, and the Lavinia Waitley's bioluminescence followed her courteously all the way. Veins swaying out of her path. Black Alice skirted each of Vinnie's eyes as she came to them, and each of them blinked at her. And then she reached Vinnie's mouth, and that magnificent panoply of teeth. Make it quick, Vinnie, okay? said Black Alice, and walked into her leviathan's maw. Picking her way delicately between razor-sharp teeth, Black Alice had plenty of time to consider the ridiculousness of worrying about a hole in her suit. Vinny's mouth was more like a crystal cave, once you were inside it. There was no tongue, no palate, just polished, macerating stones, which did not close on Black Alice, to her surprise. If anything, she got the feeling that Vinny was holding her breath, or what passed for it. The boojum was lit inside as well, or was making herself lit for Black Alice's benefit. And as Black Alice clambered inward, the teeth got smaller and fewer, and the tunnel narrowed. Her throat? Alice thought, I'm inside her. And the walls closed down, and she was swallowed. Like a pill, enclosed in the tight sarcophagus of her spacesuit, she felt rippling pressure as peristalsis pushed her along, and then greater pressure, suffocating, savage. One sharp pain, the pop of her ribs as her lungs crushed. Screaming inside a spacesuit was contraindicated, too, and with collapsed lungs, she couldn't even do it properly. Alice. She floated, in warm darkness, a womb, a bath. She was comfortable, an itchy soreness between her shoulder blades felt like a very mild radiation burn. Alice. A voice she thought she should know. She tried to speak, her mouth gnashed, her teeth ground. Alice, talk here. She tried again, not with her mouth this time. Talk here. The buoyant warmth flickered past her. She was drifting, no, swimming. She could feel currents on her skin. Her vision was confused. She blinked and blinked, and things were shattered. There was nothing to see anyway but stars. Alice, talk here. Where am I? Eat, Alice. Vinny. Vinny's voice but not in the flatness of the heads-up display any more, Vinny's voice alive with emotion and nuance and the vastness of herself. You ate me, she said, and understood abruptly that the numbness she felt was not shock. It was the boundaries of her body erased and redrawn. Exclamation point. Agreement. Relief. I'm in you, Vinny? Equal sign slash equal sign. Not a no. More like, this thing is not the same, does not compare to this other thing. Black Alice felt the warmth of space so near a generous star slipping by her. She felt the swift currents of its gravity, and the gravity of its satellites, and bent them, and tasted them, and surfed them faster and faster away. I am you! Exclamation point. Ecstatic comprehension, which Black Alice echoed with passionate relief. Not dead, not dead after all, just transformed, accepted, embraced by her ship, whom she embraced in return. Vinny, where are we going? Out, Vinny answered. And in her, 
Black Alice read the whole great naked wonder of space, approaching faster and faster as Vinny accelerated, reaching for the first great skip that would hurl them into the interstellar darkness of the big empty. They were going somewhere. Out, Black Alice agreed, and told herself not to grieve, not to go mad. This sure beat swampy hell out of being a brain in a jar. And it occurred to her, as Vinny jumped, the brainless bodies of her crew already digesting inside her, that it wouldn't be long before the loss of the Lavinia Waitley was a tale told to frighten spacers, too. Exhalation Ted Chang Ted Chang lives in Bellevue, Washington. He is a technical writer who occasionally writes distinctive and highly accomplished short SF that is widely admired, then usually nominated for or the winner of awards. His short fiction was collected in Stories of Your Life and Others, 2002, and his novella, The Merchant and the Alchemist's Gate, was published as a book in 2007. His short stories are among the best in the science fiction field, and since they are so infrequent, they are awaited with eager anticipation. China Mieville said in The Guardian, In Chang's hands, SF really is the literature of ideas. It is often held to be, and the genre's traditional sense of wonder is paramount. Chang says, To the extent that a work of SF reflects science, it's hard SF, and reflecting science doesn't necessarily mean consistency with a certain set of facts. More essentially, it means consistency with a certain strategy for understanding the universe. Science seeks a type of explanation different from those sought by art or religion, an explanation where objective measurement takes precedence over subjective experience. Exhalation was published in Jonathan Strahan's anthology of SF and Fantasy, Eclipse Two, the second in this important annual series. The protagonist devises an unusual way to explore the nature of the universe. As Chang says above, this is a work of hard SF. It has long been said that air, which others call argon, is the source of life. This is not in fact the case, and I engrave these words to describe how I came to understand the true source of life, and as a corollary, the means by which life will one day end. For most of history, the proposition that we drew life from air was so obvious that there was no need to assert it. Every day we consume two lungs heavy with air. Every day we remove the empty ones from our chest and replace them with full ones. If a person is careless and lets his air level run too low, he feels the heaviness of his limbs and the growing need for replenishment. It is exceedingly rare that a person is unable to get at least one replacement lung before his installed pair runs empty. On those unfortunate occasions where this has happened, when a person is trapped and unable to move, with no one nearby to assist him, he dies within seconds of his air running out. But in the normal course of life, our need for air is far from our thoughts, and indeed many would say that satisfying that need is the least important part of going to the filling stations, for the filling stations are the primary venue for social conversation, the places from which we draw emotional sustenance as well as physical. We all keep spare sets of full lungs in our homes, but when one is alone, the act of opening one's chest and replacing one's lungs can seem little better than a chore. In the company of others, however, it becomes a communal activity, a shared pleasure. If one is exceedingly busy or feeling unsociable, one might simply pick up a pair of full lungs, install them, and leave one's emptied lungs on the other side of the room. If one has a few minutes to spare, it's simple courtesy to connect the empty lungs to an air dispenser and refill them for the next person. But by far the most common practice is to linger and enjoy the company of others, to discuss the news of the day with friends or acquaintances, and in passing offer newly filled lungs to one's interlocutor. While this perhaps does not constitute air sharing in the strictest sense, there is camaraderie derived from the awareness that all our air comes from the same source, for the dispensers are but the exposed terminals of pipes extending from the reservoir of air deep underground, the great lung of the world, the source of all our nourishment. Many lungs are returned to the same filling station the next day, 
but just as many circulate to other stations when people visit neighboring districts. The lungs are all identical in appearance, smooth cylinders of aluminum, so one cannot tell whether a given lung has always stayed close to home or whether it has traveled long distances. And just as lungs are passed between persons and districts, so are news and gossip. In this way, one can receive news from remote districts, even those at the very edge of the world, without needing to leave home, although I myself enjoy traveling. I have journeyed all the way to the edge of the world and seen the solid chromium wall that extends from the ground up into the infinite sky. It was at one of the filling stations that I first heard the rumors that prompted my investigation and led to my eventual enlightenment. It began, innocently enough, with a remark from our district's public crier. At noon of the first day of every year, it is traditional for the crier to recite a passage of verse, an ode, composed long ago for this annual celebration, which takes exactly one hour to deliver. The crier mentioned that on his most recent performance, the turret clock struck the hour before he had finished, something that had never happened before. Another person remarked that this was a coincidence, because he had just returned from a nearby district where the public crier had complained of the same incongruity. No one gave the matter much thought beyond the simple acknowledgment that seemed warranted. It was only some days later when there arrived word of a similar deviation between the crier and the clock of a third district, that the suggestion was made that these discrepancies might be evidence of a defect in the mechanism common to all the turret clocks, albeit a curious one to cause the clocks to run faster rather than slower. Horologists investigated the turret clocks in question, but on inspection they could discern no imperfection. In fact, when compared against the timepieces normally employed for such calibration purposes, the turret clocks were all found to have resumed keeping perfect time. I myself found the question somewhat intriguing, but I was too focused on my own studies to devote much thought to other matters. I was, and am, a student of anatomy, and to provide context for my subsequent actions, I now offer a brief account of my relationship with the field. Death is uncommon, fortunately, because we are durable and fatal mishaps are rare, but it makes difficult the study of anatomy, especially since many of the accidents serious enough to cause death leave the deceased's remains too damaged for study. If lungs are ruptured when full, the explosive force can tear a body asunder, ripping the titanium as easily as if it were tin. In the past, anatomists focused their attention on the limbs, which were the most likely to survive intact. During the very first anatomy lecture I attended a century ago, the lecturer showed us a severed arm, the casing removed, to reveal the dense column of rods and pistons within. I can vividly recall the way, after he had connected its arterial hoses to a wall-mounted lung he kept in the laboratory, he was able to manipulate the actuating rods that protruded from the arm's ragged base, and in response, the hand would open and close fitfully. In the intervening years, our field has advanced to the point where anatomists are able to repair damaged limbs and, on occasion, attach a severed limb. At the same time, we have become capable of studying the physiology of the living. I have given a version of that first lecture I saw, during which I opened the casing of my own arm and directed my students' attention to the rods that contracted and extended when I wiggled my fingers. Despite these advances, the field of anatomy still had a great unsolved mystery at its core, the question of memory. While we knew a little about the structure of the brain, its physiology is notoriously hard to study because of the brain's extreme delicacy. It is typically the case in fatal accidents that, when the skull is breached, the brain erupts in a cloud of gold, leaving little besides shredded filament and leaf, from which nothing useful could be discerned. For decades, the prevailing theory of memory was that all of a person's experiences were engraved on sheets of gold foil. It was these sheets, torn apart by the force of the blast, that was the source of the tiny flakes found after accidents. Anatomists would collect the bits of gold leaf, so thin that light passes greenly through them, and spend years trying to reconstruct the original sheets, 
with the hope of eventually deciphering the symbols in which the deceased's recent experiences were inscribed. I did not subscribe to this theory, known as the inscription hypothesis, for the simple reason that if all our experiences are in fact recorded, why is it that our memories are incomplete? Advocates of the inscription hypothesis offered an explanation for forgetfulness, suggesting that over time the foil sheets become misaligned from the stylus, which reads the memories, until the oldest sheets shift out of contact with it altogether. But I never found it convincing. The appeal of the theory was easy for me to appreciate, though. I, too, had devoted many an hour to examining flakes of gold through a microscope, and can imagine how gratifying it would be to turn the fine adjustment knob and see legible symbols come into focus. More than that, how wonderful would it be to decipher the very oldest of a deceased person's memories, ones that he himself had forgotten? None of us can remember much more than a hundred years in the past, and written records, accounts that we ourselves inscribed but have scant memory of doing so, extend only a few hundred years before that. How many years did we live before the beginning of written history? Where did we come from? It is the promise of finding the answers within our own brains that makes the inscription hypothesis so seductive. I was a proponent of the competing school of thought, which held that our memories were stored in some medium in which the process of erasure was no more difficult than recording, perhaps in the rotation of gears, or the positions of a series of switches. This theory implied that everything we had forgotten was indeed lost, and our brains contained no histories older than those found in our libraries. One advantage of this theory was that it better explained why, when lungs are installed in those who have died from lack of air, the revived have no memories and are all but mindless. Somehow the shock of death had reset all the gears or switches. The inscriptionists claimed the shock had merely misaligned the foil sheets, but no one was willing to kill a living person, even an imbecile, in order to resolve the debate. I had envisioned an experiment which might allow me to determine the truth conclusively, but it was a risky one, and deserved careful consideration before it was undertaken. I remained undecided for the longest time, until I heard more news about the clock anomaly. Word arrived from a more distant district that its public crier had likewise observed the turret clock striking the hour before he had finished his New Year's recital. What made this notable was that his district's clock employed a different mechanism, one in which the hours were marked by the flow of mercury into a bowl. Here the discrepancy could not be explained by a common mechanical fault. Most people suspected fraud, a practical joke, perpetrated by mischief-makers. I had a different suspicion, a darker one that I dared not voice, but it decided my course of action. I would proceed with my experiment. The first tool I constructed was the simplest. In my laboratory I fixed four prisms on mounting brackets and carefully aligned them, so that their apexes formed the corners of a rectangle. When arranged thus, a beam of light directed at one of the lower prisms was reflected up, then backward, then down, and then forward again in a quadrilateral loop. Accordingly, when I sat with my eyes at the level of the first prism, I obtained a clear view of the back of my own head. This solipsistic periscope formed the basis of all that was to come. A similarly rectangular arrangement of actuating rods allowed a displacement of action to accompany the displacement of vision afforded by the prisms. The bank of actuating rods was much larger than the periscope, but still relatively straightforward in design. By contrast, what was attached to the end of these respective mechanisms was far more intricate. To the periscope I added a binocular microscope mounted on an armature capable of swiveling side to side or up and down. To the actuating rods I added an array of precision manipulators, although that description hardly does justice to those pinnacles of the mechanician's art. Combining the ingenuity of anatomists and the inspiration provided by the bodily structures they studied, the manipulators enabled their operator to accomplish any task he might normally perform with his own hands, but on a much smaller scale. 
Assembling all of this equipment took months, but I could not afford to be anything less than meticulous. Once the preparations were complete, I was able to place each of my hands on a nest of knobs and levers, and control a pair of manipulators situated behind my head, and use the periscope to see what they worked on. I would then be able to dissect my own brain. The very idea must sound like pure madness, I know, and had I told any of my colleagues, they would surely have tried to stop me. But I could not ask anyone else to risk themselves for the sake of anatomical inquiry, and because I wished to conduct the dissection myself, I would not be satisfied by merely being the passive subject of such an operation. Autodissection was the only option. I brought in a dozen full lungs and connected them with a manifold. I mounted this assembly beneath the work table that I would sit at and positioned a dispenser to connect directly to the bronchial inlets within my chest. This would supply me with six days' worth of air to provide for the possibility that I might not have completed my experiment within that period. I had scheduled a visit from a colleague at the end of that time. My presumption, however, was that the only way I would not have finished the operation in that period would be if I had caused my own death. I began by removing the deeply curved plate that formed the back and top of my head, then the two more shallowly curved plates that formed the sides. Only my faceplate remained, but it was locked into a restraining bracket, and I could not see its inner surface from the vantage point of my periscope. What I saw exposed was my own brain. It consisted of a dozen or more sub-assemblies, whose exteriors were covered by intricately molded shells. By positioning the periscope near the fissures that separated them, I gained a tantalizing glimpse at the fabulous mechanisms within their interiors. Even with what little I could see, I could tell it was the most beautifully complex engine I had ever beheld, so far beyond any device man had constructed that it was incontrovertibly of divine origin. The sight was both exhilarating and dizzying, and I savored it on a strictly aesthetic basis for several minutes before proceeding with my explorations. It was generally hypothesized that the brain was divided into an engine located in the center of the head, which performed the actual cognition, surrounded by an array of components in which memories were stored. What I observed was consistent with this theory, since the peripheral subassemblies seemed to resemble one another, while the subassembly in the center appeared to be different, more heterogeneous, and with more moving parts. However, the components were packed too closely for me to see much of their operation. If I intended to learn anything more, I would require a more intimate vantage point. Each subassembly had a local reservoir of air, fed by a hose extending from the regulator at the base of my brain. I focused my periscope on the rearmost subassembly, and using the remote manipulators, I quickly disconnected the outlet hose and installed a longer one in its place. I had practiced this maneuver countless times, so that I could perform it in a matter of moments. Even so, I was not certain I could complete the connection before the subassembly had depleted its local reservoir. Only after I was satisfied that the component's operation had not been interrupted did I continue. I rearranged the longer hose to gain a better view of what lay in the fissure behind it, other hoses that connected it to its neighboring components. Using the most slender pair of manipulators to reach into the narrow crevice, I replaced the hoses one by one with longer substitutes. Eventually, I had worked my way around the entire subassembly and replaced every connection it had to the rest of my brain. I was now able to unmount this subassembly from the frame that supported it and pull the entire section outside of what was once the back of my head. I knew it was possible I had impaired my capacity to think and was unable to recognize it, but performing some basic arithmetic tests suggested that I was uninjured. With one subassembly hanging from a scaffold above, I now had a better view of the cognition engine at the center of my brain, but there was not enough room to bring the microscope attachment itself in for a close inspection. In order for me to really examine the workings of my brain, I would have to displace at least half a dozen sub-assemblies. Laboriously, painstakingly, I repeated the procedure of substituting hoses for other sub-assemblies, 
repositioning another one farther back, two more higher up, and two others out to the sides, suspending all six from the scaffold above my head. When I was done, my brain looked like an explosion frozen an infinitesimal fraction of a second after the detonation, and again I felt dizzy when I thought about it. But at last, the cognition engine itself was exposed, supported on a pillar of hoses and actuating rods leading down into my torso. I now also had room to rotate my microscope around a full 360 degrees and pass my gaze across the inner faces of the subassemblies I had moved. What I saw was a microcosm of auric machinery, a landscape of tiny spinning rotors and miniature reciprocating cylinders. As I contemplated this vista, I wondered, where was my body? The conduits which displaced my vision and action around the room were in principle no different from those which connected my original eyes and hands to my brain. For the duration of this experiment, were these manipulators not essentially my hands? Were the magnifying lenses at the end of my periscope not essentially my eyes? I was an inverted person with my tiny, fragmented body situated at the center of my own distended brain. It was in this unlikely configuration that I began to explore myself. I turned my microscope to one of the memory subassemblies and began examining its design. I had no expectation that I would be able to decipher my memories, only that I might divine the means by which they were recorded. As I had predicted, there were no reams of foil pages visible, but to my surprise, neither did I see banks of gear wheels or switches. Instead, the subassembly seemed to consist almost entirely of a bank of air tubules. Through the interstices between the tubules, I was able to glimpse ripples passing through the bank's interior. With careful inspection and increasing magnification, I discerned that the tubules ramified into tiny air capillaries, which were interwoven with a dense latticework of wires on which gold leaves were hinged. Under the influence of air escaping from the capillaries, the leaves were held in a variety of positions. These were not switches in the conventional sense, for they did not retain their position without a current of air to support them, but I hypothesized that these were the switches I had sought, the medium in which my memories were recorded. The ripples I saw must have been acts of recall as an arrangement of leaves was read and sent back to the cognition engine. Armed with this new understanding, I then turned my microscope to the cognition engine. Here, too, I observed a latticework of wires, but they did not bear leaves suspended in position. Instead, the leaves flipped back and forth almost too rapidly to see. Indeed, almost the entire engine appeared to be in motion, consisting more of lattice than of air capillaries, and I wondered how air could reach all the gold leaves in a coherent manner. For many hours I scrutinized the leaves, until I realized that they themselves were playing the role of capillaries. The leaves formed temporary conduits and valves that existed just long enough to redirect air at other leaves in turn, and then disappeared as a result. This was an engine undergoing continuous transformation, indeed modifying itself, as part of its operation. The lattice was not so much a machine as it was a page, on which the machine was written, and on which the machine itself ceaselessly wrote. My consciousness could be said to be encoded in the position of these tiny leaves, but it would be more accurate to say that it was encoded in the ever-shifting pattern of air driving these leaves. Watching the oscillations of these flakes of gold, I saw that air does not, as we had always assumed, simply provide power to the engine that realizes our thoughts. Air is, in fact, the very medium of our thoughts. All that we are is a pattern of airflow. My memories were inscribed, not as grooves on foil or even the position of switches, but as persistent currents of argon. In the moments after I grasped the nature of this lattice mechanism, a cascade of insights penetrated my consciousness in rapid succession. The first and most trivial was understanding why gold, the most malleable and ductile of metals, was the only material out of which our brains could be made. Only the thinnest of foil leaves could move rapidly enough for such a mechanism, and only the most delicate of filaments could act as hinges for them. 
by comparison, the copper burr raised by my stylus as I engrave these words and brushed from the sheet when I finish each page is as coarse and heavy as scrap. This truly was a medium where erasing and recording could be performed rapidly, far more so than any arrangement of switches or gears. What next became clear was why installing full lungs into a person who has died from lack of air does not bring him back to life. These leaves within the lattice remain balanced between continuous cushions of air. This arrangement lets them flit back and forth swiftly, but it also means that if the flow of air ever ceases, everything is lost. The leaves all collapse into identical pendant states, erasing the patterns and the consciousness they represent. Restoring the air supply cannot recreate what has evanesced. This was the price of speed. A more stable medium for storing patterns would mean that our consciousnesses would operate far more slowly. It was then that I perceived the solution to the clock anomaly. I saw that the speed of these leaves' movements depended on their being supported by air. With sufficient air flow, the leaves could move nearly frictionlessly. If they were moving more slowly, it was because they were being subjected to more friction, which could occur only if the cushions of air that supported them were thinner and the air flowing through the lattice was moving with less force. It is not that the turret clocks are running faster. What is happening is that our brains are running slower. The turret clocks are driven by pendulums, whose tempo never varies, or by the flow of mercury through a pipe, which does not change. But our brains rely on the passage of air, and when that air flows more slowly, our thoughts slow down, making the clock seem to us to run faster. I had feared that our brains might be growing slower, and it was this prospect that had spurred me to pursue my autodissection. But I had assumed that our cognition engines, while powered by air, were ultimately mechanical in nature and some aspect of the mechanism was gradually becoming deformed through fatigue, and thus responsible for the slowing. That would have been dire, but there was at least the hope that we might be able to repair the mechanism and restore our brains to their original speed of operation. But if our thoughts were purely patterns of air, rather than the movement of toothed gears, the problem was much more serious, for what could cause the air flowing through every person's brain to move less rapidly. It could not be a decrease in the pressure from our filling station's dispensers. The air pressure in our lungs is so high that it must be stepped down by a series of regulators before reaching our brains. The diminution in force, I saw, must arise from the opposite direction. The pressure of our surrounding atmosphere was increasing. How could this be? As soon as the question formed, the only possible answer became apparent. Our sky must not be infinite in height. Somewhere above the limits of our vision, the chromium walls surrounding our world must curve inward to form a dome. Our universe is a sealed chamber rather than an open well, and air is gradually accumulating within that chamber until it equals the pressure in the reservoir below. This is why, at the beginning of this engraving, I said that air is not the source of life. Air can neither be created nor destroyed. The total amount of air in the universe remains constant, and if air were all that we needed to live, we would never die. But in truth, the source of life is a difference in air pressure, the flow of air from spaces where it is thick to those where it is thin. The activity of our brains, the motion of our bodies, the action of every machine we have ever built, is driven by the movement of air, the force exerted as differing pressures seek to balance each other out. When the pressure everywhere in the universe is the same, all air will be motionless and useless. One day we will be surrounded by motionless air and unable to derive any benefit from it. We are not really consuming air at all. The amount of air that I draw from each day's new pair of lungs is exactly as much as seeps out through the joints of my limbs and the seams of my casing exactly as much as I am adding to the atmosphere around me. All I am doing is converting air at high pressure to air at low. With every movement of my body, I contribute to the equalization of pressure in our universe. With every thought that I have, I hasten the arrival of that fatal equilibrium. 
Had I come to this realization under any other circumstance, I would have leapt up from my chair and ran into the streets. But in my current situation, body locked in a restraining bracket, brain suspended across my laboratory, doing so was impossible. I could see the leaves of my brain flitting faster from the tumult of my thoughts, which in turn increased my agitation at being so restrained and immobile. Panic at that moment might have led to my death, a nightmarish paroxysm of simultaneously being trapped and spiraling out of control, struggling against my restraints until my air ran out. It was by chance as much as by intention that my hands adjusted the controls to avert my periscopic gaze from the latticework, so all I could see was the plain surface of my work table, thus freed from having to see and magnify my own apprehensions I was able to calm down. When I had regained sufficient composure, I began the lengthy process of reassembling myself. Eventually I restored my brain to its original compact configuration, reattached the plates of my head, and released myself from the restraining bracket. At first the other anatomists did not believe me when I told them what I had discovered, but in the months that followed my initial autodissection, more and more of them became convinced. More examinations of people's brains were performed, more measurements of atmospheric pressure were taken, and the results were all found to confirm my claims. The background air pressure of our universe was indeed increasing and slowing our thoughts as a result. There was widespread panic in the days after the truth first became widely known, as people contemplated for the first time the idea that death was inevitable. Many called for the strict curtailment of activities in order to minimize the thickening of our atmosphere. Accusations of wasted air escalated into furious brawls, and in some districts, deaths. It was the shame of having caused these deaths together with the reminder that it would be many centuries yet before our atmosphere's pressure became equal to that of the reservoir underground that caused the panic to subside. We are not sure precisely how many centuries it will take. Additional measurements and calculations are being performed and debated. In the meantime, there is much discussion over how we should spend the time that remains to us. One sect has dedicated itself to the goal of reversing the equalization of pressure and found many adherents. The mechanicians among them constructed an engine that takes air from our atmosphere and forces it into a smaller volume, a process they call compression. Their engine restored air to the pressure it originally had in the reservoir, and these reversalists excitedly announced that it would form the basis of a new kind of filling station, one that would, with each lung it refilled, revitalize not only individuals, but the universe itself. Alas, closer examination of the engine revealed its fatal flaw. The engine itself is powered by air from the reservoir, and for every lungful of air that it produces, the engine consumes not just a lungful, but slightly more. It does not reverse the process of equalization, but like everything else in the world, exacerbates it. Although some of their adherents left in disillusionment after this setback, the reversalists as a group were undeterred, and began drawing up alternate designs in which the compressor was powered, instead, by the uncoiling of springs or the descent of weights. These mechanisms fared no better. Every spring that is wound tight represents air released by the person who did the winding. Every weight that rests higher than ground level represents air released by the person who did the lifting. There is no source of power in the universe that does not ultimately derive from a difference in air pressure, and there can be no engine whose operation will not on balance reduce that difference. The reversalists continue their labors, confident that they will one day construct an engine that generates more compression than it uses, a perpetual power source that will restore to the universe its lost vigor. I do not share their optimism. I believe that the process of equalization is inexorable. Eventually all the air in our universe will be evenly distributed, no denser or more rarefied in one spot than in any other, unable to drive a piston, turn a rotor, or flip a leaf of gold foil. It will be the end of pressure, the end of motive power, the end of thought. The universe will have reached perfect equilibrium. 
Some find irony in the fact that a study of our brains revealed to us not the secrets of the past, but what ultimately awaits us in the future. However, I maintain that we have indeed learned something important about the past. The universe began as an enormous breath being held. Who knows why, but whatever the reason, I am glad that it did, because I owe my existence to that fact. All my desires and ruminations are no more and no less than eddy currents generated by the gradual exhalation of our universe. And until this great exhalation is finished, my thoughts live on. So that our thoughts may continue as long as possible, anatomists and mechanicians are designing replacements for our cerebral regulators, capable of gradually increasing the air pressure within our brains and keeping it just higher than the surrounding atmospheric pressure. Once these are installed, our thoughts will continue at roughly the same speed, even as the air thickens around us. But this does not mean that life will continue unchanged. Eventually, the pressure differential will fall to such a level that our limbs will weaken and our movements will grow sluggish. We may then try to slow our thoughts, so that our physical torpor is less conspicuous to us. But that will also cause external processes to appear to accelerate. The ticking of clocks will rise to a chatter as their pendulums wave frantically. Falling objects will slam to the ground as if propelled by springs. Undulations will race down cables like the crack of a whip. At some point, our limbs will cease moving altogether. I cannot be certain of the precise sequence of events near the end, but I imagine a scenario in which our thoughts will continue to operate, so that we remain conscious but frozen, immobile as statues. Perhaps we'll be able to speak for a while longer, because our voice boxes operate on a smaller pressure differential than our limbs. But without the ability to visit a filling station, every utterance will reduce the amount of air left for thought, and bring us closer to the moment that our thoughts cease altogether. Will it be preferable to remain mute, to prolong our ability to think, or to talk until the very end? I don't know. Perhaps a few of us, in the days before we cease moving, will be able to connect our cerebral regulators directly to the dispensers in the filling stations, in effect, replacing our lungs with the mighty lung of the world. If so, those few will be able to remain conscious right up to the final moments before all pressure is equalized. The last bit of air pressure left in our universe will be expended driving a person's conscious thought. And then... Our universe will be in a state of absolute equilibrium. All life and thought will cease, and with them, time itself. But I maintain a slender hope. Even though our universe is enclosed, perhaps it is not the only air chamber in the infinite expanse of solid chromium. I speculate that there could be another pocket of air elsewhere, another universe besides our own that is even larger in volume. It is possible that this hypothetical universe has the same or higher air pressure as ours. But suppose that it had a much lower air pressure than ours, perhaps even a true vacuum. The chromium that separates us from this supposed universe is too thick and too hard for us to drill through, so there is no way we could reach it ourselves, no way to bleed off the excess atmosphere from our universe and regain motive power that way. But I fantasize that this neighboring universe has its own inhabitants, ones with capabilities beyond our own. What if they were able to create a conduit between the two universes and install valves to release air from ours? They might use our universe as a reservoir, running dispensers with which they could fill their own lungs and use our air as a way to drive their own civilization. It cheers me to imagine that the air that once powered me could power others. To believe that the breath that enables me to engrave these words could one day flow through someone else's body. I do not delude myself into thinking that this would be a way for me to live again, because I am not that air. I am the pattern that it assumed temporarily. The pattern that is me, the patterns that are the entire world in which I live, would be gone. But I have an even fainter hope that those inhabitants not only use our universe as a reservoir, but that once they have emptied it of its air, they might one day be able to open a passage and actually enter our universe as explorers, 
They might wander our streets, see our frozen bodies, look through our possessions, and wonder about the lives we led. Which is why I have written this account. You, I hope, are one of those explorers. You, I hope, found these sheets of copper and deciphered the words engraved on their surfaces. And whether or not your brain is impelled by the air that once impelled mine, through the act of reading my words, the patterns that form your thoughts become an imitation of the patterns that once formed mine, and in that way I live again through you. Your fellow explorers will have found and read the other books that we left behind, and through the collaborative action of your imaginations, my entire civilization lives again. As you walk through our silent districts, imagine them as they were, with the turret clocks striking the hours, the filling stations crowded with gossiping neighbors, criers reciting verse in the public squares, and anatomists giving lectures in the classrooms. Visualize all of these the next time you look at the frozen world around you, and it will become, in your minds, animated and vital again. I wish you well, explorer, but I wonder, does the same fate that befell me await you? I can only imagine that it must that the tendency toward equilibrium is not a trait peculiar to our universe, but inherent in all universes. Perhaps that is just a limitation of my thinking, and your people have discovered a source of pressure that is truly eternal. But my speculations are fanciful enough already. I will assume that one day your thoughts, too, will cease, although I cannot fathom how far in the future that might be. Your lives will end just as ours did, just as everyone's must. No matter how long it takes, eventually equilibrium will be reached. I hope you are not saddened by that awareness. I hope that your expedition was more than a search for other universes to use as reservoirs. I hope that you were motivated by a desire for knowledge, a yearning to see what can arise from a universe's exhalation. Because even if a universe's lifespan is calculable, the variety of life that is generated within it is not. The buildings we have erected, the art and music and verse we have composed, the very lives we've led, none of them could have been predicted, because none of them were inevitable. Our universe might have slid into equilibrium, emitting nothing more than a quiet hiss. The fact that it spawned such plenitude is a miracle, one that is matched only by your universe giving rise to you. Though I am long dead as you read this, explorer, I offer to you a valediction. Contemplate the marvel that is existence and rejoice that you are able to do so. I feel I have the right to tell you this because, as I am inscribing these words, I am doing the same. Traitor M. Rickert Mary Rickert lives in Cedarburg, Wisconsin. Her short fiction began appearing in Fantasy and Science Fiction in 1999. She has published 25 or more fantasy and science fiction stories to date. Most of them are collected in her first story collection, Map of Dreams, 2006. It won the IAFA Crawford Award for Best First Fantasy Book. In 2007, she began to win awards for her fiction. She is one of the most impressive new writers to emerge in this decade. She characteristically writes about families, about fears and anxieties and pathologies. Her major mode is the fantastic but she can sure turn out a potent SF story occasionally. Trader was published in fantasy and science fiction and is both a psychological horror story and a science fiction story perhaps in the lineage of Bruce Sterling's We Think Differently. It is about a future in which Mama teaches little girls to be suicide bombers. To paraphrase Thomas M. Dish, this story predicts the present. Since it was published, there have been news stories out of Iraq along the same lines. If, as some maintain, SF always reflects the present in which it is written, we had better change. Alika with her braids of bells comes walking down the street, chewing bubblegum, and singing, Who I am I'll always be, God bless you and God bless me, America, America, the land of the free. Rover says, What's that song you're singing, Alika? That ain't no song. Alika, only nine, ignores him the same way she's seen her mama ignore the comments of men when she walks with her to the bus stop or the quick mart. Hey, I'm talking to you, Rover says. 
but Alika just walks on by, and Rover just watches her pass. The girl is only nine, and he is nearly twelve. He shakes his head and looks down the street in the other direction, besides which she is crazy. Shit, he spits at the sidewalk. Damn, he can't help it. He turns and watches her walking away, her braids jangling. America, America, oh, I love America, my beautiful country, my own wonderful land, my homeland, America loves me. Alika's mom watches her and shakes her head. She drags her cigarette. Smoke swirls from her nostrils and mouth. Her fingers, with the long green painted nails, tremble. Alika sees her sitting there on the stoop. Hi, Mama, she calls. The bells ring as she comes running down the walk, running right toward her Mama, who sits there with smoke coming out of her ears and nose and mouth. Hey, baby, Alika's mother says. Where you been? Alika stops in mid-running step. Bells go bring, bring. She looks at her Mama. Her Mama looks at her. A truck passes. Fans and air conditioners hum. Alika watches a bird fly into the branches of a tree, disappear into the green. Alika, where you been, honey? Alika shrugs. The bells jingle softly. Come here, child. Alika walks over to her mama. Sit down. Her mama pats the step right beside her. Alika's butt touches her mother's hip. Alika's mother smells like cigarettes and orchid shampoo. She brings a trembling hand to her lips, drags on the cigarette, turns to face Alika. Alika thinks she is the luckiest girl in America to have a mama so beautiful. You don't remember none of it, she says. Alika shakes her head. It always happens like this. Her mother puts an arm around her, pulls her tight. Alika's bells ring with a burst. Good, her mama says. Well, all right then, good. They sit there until their butts get sore, and then they go inside. Alika blinks against the dark, and she hums as she runs up the stairs. Her mother follows behind, so slow, that Alika has to wait for her at the door. While she waits, Alika hops from one foot to another. The bells make a quick ring, but Alika's mother says, Shush, Alika, what did I tell you about making noise out here? Alika stands still while her mother unlocks the door. When she opens it, fans whirl the heat at them. Alika's mom says, Shit. She closes the door, locks it, chains it. Alika says, Won't do much good. Alika's mother turns fast. What? She says with a sharp, mean voice. Alika shrugs. Bring. She spins away from her mother, singing, Oh, America, my lovely home. America for me. America, America, the bloody and the free. Alika, her mother says. Alika stops in mid-spin. Bells go bring, bring, ring, tingle, tap. She keeps her arms spread out and her feet apart, her eyes focused on the light switch on the wall. I'm going into the room, Alika's mother says. Alika knows what that means. I'll be out in a couple of hours. Your dinner is in the refrigerator. Nuke it for three minutes and be careful when you take off the plastic wrap. Do you hear me, Alika? Nod, bring. You're a good girl, Alika. Don't turn the TV too loud. Maybe we'll go get ice cream. Alika's mother goes into the room. Alika resumes spinning. The room is red, the color of resistance. It is stifling hot with all the shades pulled down. She's considered an air conditioner, but it seems selfish when the money could be better spent elsewhere. The resistance isn't about her being comfortable. She takes off her clothes and drops them to the floor. She walks across the room and flips on the radio. It cackles and whines as she flips through the noise. Damn station is always moving. It's never where it was the day before. Finally, she finds it. Music comes into the room and fills it up. She is filled with music and red. She walks over to stare at the wall of the dead. She looks at each photograph and says, I remember. They smile back at her in shades of black, white, and gray. Sometimes she is tempted to hurry through this part, or just say a general, I remember, once, to the entire wall, but she knows it isn't her thinking this. Resistance begins in the mind. I remember. She looks at each face. She remembers. It is never easy. When that's finished, she walks to the work table. She sits down on the towel, 
folded across the chair. She looks at the small flag pasted on the wall there, the blue square filled with stars, the forbidden stripes of red and white. She nods. I remember. Then she flicks on the light and bends over her work. Alika spins six more times until she is so dizzy she spins to the chair and plops down. When things fall back in order, she looks at the closed door behind which her mother works. Red, Alika thinks, and then quickly shakes her belled braids to try not to think it again. Alika's mother doesn't know. Alika has been in the room. She's seen everything. Hours later, after Alika has eaten the meatloaf and mashed potatoes and several peas, after the plate has been washed and dried and her milk poured down the drain, while she sits in the dim heat watching her favorite TV show, This Is the Hour, her mother comes out of the room, that strange expression on her face, her skin glossy with sweat, and says, Hey, honey, want to go for ice cream? Alika looks at her and thinks, Traitor. She nods her head, vigorously. The bells ring, but the word stays in her mind. It's a hot evening, so everybody is out. Hi, Alika, they say. Hi, Pauline. Alika and her mother smile and wave, walking down the street. When somebody whistles, they both pretend they don't hear. And when they pass J.J., who sits on his stoop braiding his own baby girl's hair, and he says, my, 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 they just ignore him, too. Finally, they get to the quick mart. What flavors you got today, says Alika's mother. Sometimes, when Mariel is working, they stand around and talk, but this is some new girl they've never seen before. She says, today's flavors are vanilla, chocolate, and ice cream. Alika's mother says, oh. Alika says, what's she mean, ice cream? Of course the ice cream is flavored ice cream. But Alika's mother doesn't pay much attention to her. She looks right at the girl and says, So soon. The girl says, She's already nine. She's going to start remembering. Then she looks at Alika and says, What flavor you want? Alika says, You said vanilla, chocolate, and ice cream. The girl smiles. Her teeth are extraordinarily white. Alika stares at them. Did I say that? The girl says, I don't know what I was thinking. Flavors today are vanilla, chocolate, and hamburger. Hamburger? Alika looks at her mother. This girl is nuts. But her mother is standing there, just staring into space, with this weird look on her face. I'll have chocolate, Alika says. I always take chocolate. The girl nods. Those sure are pretty braids, she says, as she scoops chocolate ice cream into a cone. I only get one scoop, says Alika. Well, today we're giving you three, says the girl with the brilliant white teeth. Alika glances at her mother. Don't worry, the tooth girl says. She already said it would be all right. Alika doesn't remember that. She says, I don't remember. But her mother interrupts her in that mean voice. Oh, Alika, you never remember anything. Take the ice cream. Just take it. Alika looks at the girl. That's not true, she says. I remember some things. The girl's eyes go wide. Alika's mother grabs her by the wrist and pulls her, walking briskly out the door. Alika's bell's ringing. Mama, she says. You forgot to pay that girl. It doesn't matter, Alika's mama says. She's a friend of mine. Alika turns, but the girl no longer stands behind the counter. Some little kids run in, and she can hear them shouting, Hey, anyone here? Alika's mother lets go of her wrist, but continues to walk briskly. Alika's bell's ring. Her mama says, You're more like me than anyone else. Alika looks up at her beautiful mama and smiles. But Alika's mama doesn't look at her. She stares straight ahead. She walks fast. Alika has to take little running steps to keep up. She can't hardly eat her ice cream. It drips over her fingers and wrist and down her arm. Alika licks her arm. Mama, she says. Her mama doesn't pay her any mind. She just keeps walking, her legs like scissors, push, 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 her face like rock. Alika thinks, scissors, paper, rock. Her mama is scissors and rock. That makes Alika paper. Hey, mama, Alika says, I'm paper. But her mother just keeps walking. Push, push, push. Alika turns her wrist to lick her arm. The top two ice cream scoops fall to the sidewalk. Shit, she says. What did you say? 
The scissors stop and turns her rock face on Alika. What did I just hear you say? I'm sorry, Mama. You're sorry? The rock stands there, waiting for an answer. Yes, Mama, Alika says in a tiny, papery voice. The rock grabs Alika by the wrist, the one that is not dripping and sticky. Pauline, that girl of yours giving you trouble? The rock turns to face the voice, but does not let go of Alika's wrist. This little thing? She couldn't give trouble to a fly. The ice cream in Alika's other hand drips down her arm, the cone collapsing. Alika doesn't know what to do, so she drops it to the sidewalk. The rock squeezes her wrist. What did you do that for? Ow, Mama, Alika says. You're hurting me. Her bells clack against each other. Stop it, Alika, says the rock. I mean it now. Stop your twisting around this instant. Alika stops. The rock bends down, face close to Alika's. I don't want you arguing or crying about some stupid ice cream cone. Do you hear me? Alika can see that the rock is crying. She nods. Bring, bring. The rock lets go of Alika's wrist. Alika has to run to keep up, her bells ringing. Hey, Pauline. Hey, Alika. Scissors, rock, and paper. Paper covers rock. Scissors get old and rusty. Alika spreads her arms wide. She runs right past her mama. Alika, Alika! But she doesn't stop. She is a paper airplane now, or a paper bird. She can't stop. Alika, Alika! Her bells ring. Alika! Her mother doesn't even scold her when she finds her waiting at the top of the stairs. She just says, time for bed now. While Alika gets ready for bed, Pauline goes into the red room. She takes the photographs down from the wall of the dead. She doesn't think about it. She just does it. She goes to the work table, stares at it for a while, and sighs. She'll have to stay up late to finish. What's she been doing anyway, with her time? Mama, I'm ready for my story. She sets the stack of the dead on the work table. Mama, I'm coming, she hollers. She doesn't even bother turning off the light. She'll be back in here soon enough up half the night, getting everything ready. What I'm going to tell you about tonight is ice, from before, when there were winters and all that. When I was a little girl, I snuck in my daddy's truck one night. He and my brother, Jagger, were going ice fishing the next morning. They said girls couldn't come along, so I decided to just sneak a ride. I lay there in the back of that truck all night. Let me tell you, it was cold. I had nothing but my clothes and a tarp to keep me warm. I know you don't understand about cold. It was like being in the refrigerator, I guess. The freezer part, you know, because that's where it's cold enough for ice. I lay there and looked at the stars. I tried to imagine a time like the one we live in right now. I tried to imagine being warm all over. I closed my eyes and pretended the sun was shining on my face. I guess it worked, because after a while I fell asleep. I woke up when Daddy and Jagger came out the door and walked over to the truck. I could hear their footsteps coming across the snow. It sounded like when you eat your cereal. They put the cooler in the back, but they didn't see me hid under the tarp. They didn't discover me until we got to the lake. My Daddy was mad, let me tell you. Jagger was, too. But what were they going to do? Turn around? Daddy called my Mama and told her what I did. I could hear her laughing. Jagger could hear her, too. We stood there by the side of the frozen lake and stared at each other. You never had a brother. You don't know what it's like. Daddy hung up the phone, put it in his pocket, and said, Your mama is very disappointed in you. Then he told me all the rules, how I had to be quiet and stay out of the way. He gave me two big nails to carry in my pocket. They were supposed to help me grab hold of the ice if I fell in. The lake was all frozen and pearly white at the edges. You could see the lights shining in half a dozen little shanties. Mama had made red and white curtains for ours. Walking across that ice, the sky lit with stars, the faint glow of lights and murmur of voices coming from the shanties, I felt like I was in a beautiful world. Even the cold felt good out there. It filled my lungs. I pictured them, red and shaped like a broken heart. When we get into our shanty, my dad lifts the wooden lid off the floor, and Jagger starts chipping through the ice there, which was not so thick, my daddy said, since they'd been coming regularly. And then they sat on the benches, and my dad popped open a beer. Jagger drank a hot chocolate out of the thermos my mama had prepared for him. 
He didn't offer to share, and I didn't ask. It smelled bad in there, a combination of chocolate, beer, wet wool, and fish. So I asked my dad if it was all right that I went outside. He said, just don't bother the other folk and don't wander too far from the ice shanties. I walked across the ice, listening to the sound of my footsteps, the faint murmur of voices. The cold stopped hurting. I looked at all the trees surrounding the lake, a lot of pine, but also some bare oak and birch. I looked up at the stars and thought how they were like fish in the frozen sky. Anyhow, that's how I came to be practically across the lake when I heard the first shouts, and the next thing I know, ice shanties are tilting and everything is sinking. I hear this loud noise, and I look down. Right under me, there is a crack. Come all the way from where the ice shanties are sinking to under my feet. I finger the nails in my pocket, though I am immediately doubtful that they will do me much good. At the same time, I start to step forward, because even though I'm just a kid, I want to help. But when I lean forward, the crack gets deeper. When I lean back to my original position, the ice cracks again. Men are shouting, and I even hear my daddy calling Jagger's name. But there are only islands of ice between me and the drowning men. I am maybe a half mile away from the opposite shore. The ice in that direction is fissured and cracked, but appears to be basically intact, though even as I assess it, more fissures appear. What I have to do is walk away from my father and brother and all the drowning men. I was not stupid. I knew that it wouldn't take long for them to die, that it would take longer for me to walk across the ice. If I made it across, I would say that right at that moment, when I turned away from the men whose shouts were already growing weak, something inside of me turned into ice. It had to, don't you see? I decided to save the only person I could save, myself. I want you to understand, I never blamed myself for this decision. I don't regret it either. So I clutched the nails in my fist and stepped forward. The ice cracks into a radiated circle, like those drawings you used to make of the sun. What else can I do? I lift my foot to take another step. Right then, a crow screams. I look up. It's as though that bird is shouting at me to stop. I bring my foot back, slowly. When I set it down again, I can hear my breath let out. That's when I notice that there is no sound, just my breath. There is no more shouting. I picture them under the ice, frozen. I picture their faces and the nails falling from ice fingers. It almost makes me want to give up. But instead, I take a careful step, and just when I feel that ice under me, I exhale, slowly. I want you to understand. I know now, and I knew then, that ice doesn't breathe. But it was like I was breathing with the ice. I took the next step fast, and right beneath me the fissure separated. I had to forget about the dead. I had to stop my heart from beating so hard. I had to make myself still. Then carefully, I lifted my leg, slowly, breathing like ice. I breathed like ice, even when I started sweating. And I kept breathing like ice, even when the tears came to my eyes. I did this until I got to the shore on the other side. Only then did I turn around and start bawling. There's a time for emotions, right? Trucks and cars were parked all along the opposite shore. I could see our red Ford, but no one was standing there. Mist was rising off the lake. I ran and walked halfway back before Mrs. Fando found me. She was driving out to scold her husband because he was late for work. Folks treated me different after that. Everyone did. Everyone treated me the way Jagger used to, like I was too ugly to be alive, or like I was some kind of a traitor. Even my own mother. Like I broke that ice under all those men and boys and murdered them myself. I tried to describe to them what happened and how I made it out by learning to breathe like ice, but no one took me seriously for a long time. Then, when I was seventeen, this stranger came to town. People noticed her because she dressed so well, drove a nice car, and was asking about me. She had this old torn newspaper article from way back, and she said, Is this you who survived that ice breakup? I said yes, it was. I thought she was maybe someone's girlfriend or a grown daughter, coming to tell me she wished I had died and her man had lived. Folks said stuff like that. But what she said was, I think you need to come with us. She was a recruiter for the new army. You heard about that, I'm sure. Yep. 
That's what I want you to know about me, little girl. I never told you this before. I want you to understand what I do isn't for death. All those years ago I chose life, and I've been choosing it ever since. I have some special skills, is all. I can walk like water, for instance, breathe like ice. I can build things. I have seen many people die, and I still choose to stay alive. Those are qualities they look for in soldiers. What I want you to understand is that all the time since then, I think I turned partly into ice, until you came along. You came along and thawed me out, I guess. It's like that feeling I had when I was walking out on the ice, and I thought the world was a beautiful place. I have that feeling again with you. I couldn't love you more if you were my natural-born daughter. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? I bet none of this makes any sense to you at all. Pauline leans down and kisses Alika's forehead. Alika rolls over, her bells going bring. Damn bells, says Pauline. She shuts off the light, walks out of the room. Alika opens her eyes. She sits up, slowly. Alika knows how to move so carefully that the bells don't ring. Alika grabs the end of one of the braids. Slowly, she twists the bell off. It doesn't make a sound. What do they think? She's stupid or something? She has to keep herself awake for a long time. Her mama is in the forbidden room almost all night long. She keeps herself from falling asleep by remembering the pictures she saw on that wall. All those photographs of smiling children wearing backpacks. My sisters, Alika thinks. It is already light out when she hears the forbidden door open and shut, her mother walking across the apartment to her own bedroom. When Alika leaves her room, she doesn't make a sound. The bells remain on her pillow. The first thing she notices is the smell of paint. The forbidden room is no longer red. It is white. All the pictures are gone. The work table is folded up against the wall beside the bookshelf. Alika can just barely see where the flag had been pasted. The paint there is a little rougher, but the flag is gone. Next to the door is her mama's suitcase and a backpack and a camera. Alika opens up the backpack very carefully. She sighs at the wires. Be one with the backpack, she says to herself. Breathe like ice, she rolls her eyes. By the time she leaves the room, it is bright out. She just gets the last bell in her hair when her mama comes in and says, Get up now, honey. Today is going to be a special day. I got you a new backpack. Alika gets up. Her bells go bring. She goes to the bathroom. She can just see the top of her eyes in the mirror over the sink. She changes into her yellow butterfly top and her white shorts. It's already hot. She eats a big bowl of cereal, sitting alone at the kitchen table. Her bells make little bursts of sound that accompany her chewing, which is like the sound of footsteps walking across snow, her mama said. Sun pours through the white curtain on the window over the sink. After she brushes her teeth, she stands in the kitchen and sings, America, America, how I love you true. America, America, the white stars and the blue. Okay, child, come here now. Alika's mama stands in the forbidden room. The door is wide open. Look what I have for you, a new backpack. Alika spins. Her bells go bring, bring, bring. Alika, Alika, her mama says. Stop spinning now. Alika stops spinning. Let me put this on you. Alika looks up at her mama, the most beautiful mother in the world. There's something you should know about me, Alika says. Alika's mama sighs. She keeps the backpack held out in front of her. What is it, Alika? I'm not stupid. Alika's mama nods. Of course you're not, she says. You're my little girl, aren't you? Now come here and put this thing on. After Alika's mama buckles the backpack on her, she locks it with a little key and puts the key into her own pocket. Don't I need that? Alika says. No, you don't, her mama says. Today we're doing things a little different. You get to keep this backpack, not like the others that you had to drop off somewhere. This one is for you to keep. Your teacher will unlock it when you get to school. I gave her the extra key, okay? Now come over here. I want to take your picture. Alika follows the map her mother drew. You have to take a different way to school today, she said. Her hands were shaking when she drew it. Alika follows the wavy lines. 
down Arlington Avenue, past the drug store and video place, turning right on Market Street. Alika's bells ring once or twice, but her step is slow. The backpack is heavy. She has to concentrate on these new directions. Hey, where are you going? Rover stands right in front of her. Ain't you supposed to be at school? Alika shrugs. I'm taking a different way. Rover shakes his head. Are you crazy, girl? This is no place for you. Don't you know you are heading right into a war zone? Alika smirks. This is what my mama wants me to do. You better turn around right now, Rover says, lest your mama wants you dead. Alika doesn't mind turning around, because suddenly she remembers everything. She walks back home. She doesn't feel like singing. When she gets to their building, she looks up and sees that the windows are all open, even the windows in the forbidden room. She walks up the hot, dark stairs. She gets there just as her mama is stepping into the hallway with her suitcase. Hi, Mama, Alika says. Alika's mama turns, her face rock, liquid rock. What are you doing here? I forgot to hug you goodbye, Alika says. Her mama steps back. Then, with swift precision, she steps forward as she reaches into her pocket, pulls out the little key, and unlocks Alika's backpack. She runs across the apartment and throws the backpack out the window. Even before it hits the ground, she is wrapped around Alika. They are crouched in tight embrace. After a few seconds, she lets go. You all right, Mama? Alika says. She nods, slowly. I don't know what to tell my teacher about my books. What should I tell her, Mama? Pauline gets up, walks across the apartment, and leans out the window. Scattered on the ground below is the backpack and several large books. She is shaking her head, trying to understand what has happened. When she sees Alika, with her belled braids, skipping down the steps, walking wide around the scattered contents of her backpack, then, with a quick look up at the window, Alika breaks into a run, her bells ringing. Pauline turns fast. She looks at her suitcase in the hallway, runs to it, thinking, Alika? She will toss it out the window, but she is not fast enough. All the dead children are reaching for her. She tries to exhale, but there is no breath. She sinks where she steps, grabbed by the tiny, bony fingers pulling her into the frozen depths. Rusty nails clutched in the ice children's hands pierce her skin. How quiet it is, the white silence, punctuated only by the distant sound of bells. Why, that's Alika, she thinks. That's my girl. Astonished, proud, angry. Alika stands, gazing at the bombed building, feeling certain there is something she has forgotten. An annoying fly, which has been circling her head, lands on her arm, and Alika soundlessly slaps it leaving a bright red mark on her skin, which she rubs until the burning stops. Then she turns and skips down the walk in this mysterious, silent world, even her belled braids gone suddenly mute. An ambulance speeds past, the red light flashing but making no sound, and Alika suddenly understands what has occurred. She has fallen into the frozen world. Surely her mother will come for her. Surely her brave mother will risk everything to save her. Alika looks up at the white sky, reaches her arms to the white sun, bawling like a baby, waiting for her beautiful mother to come. The things that make me weak and strange get engineered away. Cory Doctorow Cory Doctorow, www.craphound.com, is a science fiction writer, blogger, and technology activist. He is the co-editor of the popular weblog Boing Boing www.boingboing.net, and a contributor to Wired, Popular Science, The New York Times, and many other papers, magazines, and websites. Presently living in London, in 2006 he served as the Fulbright Chair at the Annenberg Center for Public Diplomacy. A collection of short stories, A Place So Foreign and Eight More, 2004, won the Sunburst Award, his latest short story collection is Overclocked, Stories of the Future Present, 2007. His latest novel, Little Brother, published for teenage readers, is one of the significant SF novels of 2008. His next novel for adults, Makers, publishes in 2009. 
The Things That Make Me Weak and Strange Get Engineered Away was published online by Tor.com, a community-building enterprise of Tom Doherty Associates that is, at present, the highest-paying fiction market in SF. This is perhaps its first appearance in print. It is an excellent story about a future in which monk-like techies retreat into secular cults where they can work without dealing with everyday life in dystopia. But their seclusion is illusory, and the world intrudes. Cause it's gonna be the future soon, and I won't always be this way, when the things that make me weak and strange get engineered away. Jonathan Colton, The Future Soon Lawrence's cubicle was just the right place to chew on a thorny log file problem, decorated with the votive fetishes of his monastic order, a thousand calming, clarifying mandalas, and saints devoted to helping him think clearly. From the nearby cubicles, Lawrence heard the ritualized muttering of a thousand brothers and sisters in the order of reflective analytics, a susurration of harmonized, concentrated thought. On his display, he watched an instrument widget track the decibel level over time, the graph overlaid on a 3D curve of normal activity over time and space. He noted that the level was a little high, the room a little more anxious than usual. He clicked and tapped and thought some more, massaging the log file to see if he could make it snap into focus and make sense, but it stubbornly refused to be sensible. The data tracked the custody chain of the bit stream. The order munged for the securitat, and somewhere in there a file had grown by 68 bytes blowing its checksum and becoming an anomaly. Order lore was filled with anomalies, loose threads in the fabric of reality, bugs to be squashed in the data set that was the order's universe. Starting with the pre-order sysadmin, who tracked a 75-cent billing anomaly back to foreign spy ring that was using his systems to hack his military, these morality tales were object lessons to the order's monks, Pick at the seams, and the world will unravel in useful and interesting ways. Lawrence had reached the end of his personal picking capacity, though. It was time to talk it over with Gerda. He stood up and walked away from his cubicle, touching his belt to let his sensor array know that he remembered it was there. He counted his steps and his heartbeats and his EEG spikes as he made his way out into the compound. It's not like Gerda was in charge. The order worked in autonomous little units with rotating leadership, all coordinated by some group wear, that let them keep the hierarchy nice and flat, the way that they all liked it. Authority sucked. But once you instrument every keystroke, every click, every erg of productivity, it soon becomes apparent who knows her shit and who just doesn't. Gerda knew the shit cold. Question, he said, walking up to her. She liked it brusque, no nonsense. She batted her handball against the court wall three more times, making long dives for it, sweaty gray hair whipping back and forth, body arcing in graceful flows. Then she caught the ball and tossed it into the basket by his feet. Lester, huh? All right, surprise me. It's this, he said, and tossed the file at her pan. She caught it with the same fluid gesture, and her computer gave it to her on the handball court wall which was the closest display for which she controlled the lock file. She peered at the data, spinning the graph this way and that, peering intently. She pulled up some of her own instruments and replayed the bitstream, recalling the log files from many network taps from the moment at which the file grew by the anomalous 68 bytes. You think it's an anomaly, don't you? She had a fine blonde mustache that was beaded with sweat, but her breathing had slowed to normal, and her hands were steady and sure as she gestured at the wall. I was kind of hoping, yeah. Good opportunity for personal growth, your anomalies. Easy to say why you'd call it an anomaly, but look at this. She pulled the checksum of the injected bites, then showed him her network taps, which were playing the traffic back and forth for several minutes before and after the insertion. The checksummed block moved back through the routers, one hop, two hops, three hops, then to a terminal. The authentication data for the terminal told them who owned its lock file then. Zbigniew Krotowski. Login, Zbigkrot. Gerda grabbed his room number. 
Now, we don't have the actual payload, of course, because that gets flushed. But we have the checksum, we have the username, and look at this. We have him typing 68 unspecified bytes in a pattern consistent with his biometrics, 5 minutes and 8 seconds prior to the injection. So, let's go ask him what his 68 characters were and why they got added to the Securitas data stream. He led the way because he knew the corner of the campus where Zbigkrot worked pretty well, having lived there for five years when he first joined the order. Zbigkrot was probably a relatively recent inductee, if he was still in that block. His belt gave him a reassuring buzz to let him know he was being logged as he entered the building, softer haptic feedback coming as he was logged to each floor as they went up the clean-swept wooden stairs. Once he'd had the work detail of restaining those stairs, stripping the ancient wood, sanding it baby skin smooth, applying ten coats of varnish, polishing it to a high gloss. The work had been incredible, painful, and rewarding, and seeing the stairs still shining gave him a tangible sense of satisfaction. He knocked at Zbigkrot's door twice before entering. Technically, any brother or sister was allowed to enter any room on the campus, though there were norms of privacy and decorum that were far stronger than any law or rule. The room was bare, every last trace of its occupant removed. A fine dust covered every surface, swirling in clouds as they took a few steps in. They both coughed explosively and stepped back, slamming the door. Skin, Goethe croaked, collected from the ventilation filters. DNA for every person on campus in a nice, even Gaussian distribution. Means we can't use biometrics to figure out who was in this room before it was cleaned out. Lawrence tasted the dust in his mouth and swallowed his gag reflex. Technically, he knew that he was always inhaling and ingesting other people's dead skin cells, but not by the mouthful. All right, Curtis said. Now you've got an anomaly. Congrats, Lawrence. Personal growth awaits you. The campus only had one entrance to the wall that surrounded it. Isn't that a fire hazard? Lawrence asked the guard who sat in the pillbox at the gate. Nah, the man said. He was old, with the serene air of someone who'd been in the order for decades. His beard was combed and shining, plaited into a thick braid that hung to his belly, which had only the merest tint of a little pot. Comes a fire, we hit the panic button, reverse the magnets lining the walls, and the foundations destabilize at twenty sections. The whole thing had come down in seconds, but no one's going to sneak in or out that way. I did not know that, Lawrence said. Public record, of course, but pretty obscure, too tempting to a certain prankster mindset. Lawrence shook his head, learn something new every day. The guard made a gesture that caused something to depressurize in the gateway. A primed hum vibrated through the floorboards. We keep the inside of the vestibule at ten atmospheres, and it opens inward from outside. No one can force that door open without us knowing about it in a pretty dramatic way. But it must take forever to repressurize. Not many people go in and out, just data. Lawrence patted himself down. You got everything? Do I seem nervous to you? The old-timer picked up his tea and sipped it. You'd be an idiot if you weren't. How long since you've been out? Not since I came in. Sixteen years ago, I was twenty-one. Yeah, the old-timer said. Yeah, you'd be an idiot if you weren't nervous. You follow politics? Not my thing, Lawrence said. I know it's been getting worse out there. The old-timer barked a laugh. Not your thing? It's probably time you got out into the wide world, son. You might ignore politics, but it won't ignore you. Is it dangerous? You going armed? I didn't know that was an option. Always an option, but not a smart one. Any weapon you don't know how to use belongs to your enemy. Just be circumspect. Listen before you talk. Watch before you act. They're good people out there, but they're in a bad, bad situation. Lawrence shuffled his feet and shifted the straps of his bindle. You're not making me very comfortable with all this, you know. Why are you going out anyway? It's an anomaly, my first. I've been waiting sixteen years for this. Someone poisoned the Securitas data and left the campus. I'm going to go ask him why he did it. The old man blew the gate. 
The heavy door lurched open, revealing the vestibule. Sounds like an anomaly, all right. He turned away, and Lawrence forced himself to move toward the vestibule. The man held his hand out before he reached it. You haven't been outside in fifteen years. It's going to be a surprise. Just remember, we're a noble species, all appearances to the contrary notwithstanding. Then he gave Lawrence a little shove that sent him into the vestibule. The door slammed behind him. The vestibule smelled like machine oil and rubber gaskety smells. It was dimly lit by rows of white LEDs that marched up the walls like drunken ants. Lawrence barely had time to register this before he heard a loud thunk from the outer door and it swung away. Lawrence walked down the quiet street, staring up at the same sky he'd lived under, breathing the same air he'd always breathed, but marveling at how different it all was. His heartbeat and respiration were up. The tips of the first two fingers on his right hand itched slightly under his feedback gloves, and his thoughts were doing that race condition thing, where every time he tried to concentrate on something, he thought about how he was trying to concentrate on something and should stop thinking about how he was concentrating and just concentrate. This was how it had been sixteen years before, when he'd gone into the order. He'd been so angry all the time then, sitting in front of his keyboard, looking at the world through the lens of the network, suffering all the fools with poor grace. He'd been a bright fourteen-year-old, a genius at sixteen, a rising star at eighteen, and a failure by twenty-one. He was depressed all the time. His weight had ballooned to nearly three hundred pounds, and he had been fired three times in two years. One day he stood up from his desk at work. He'd just been hired at a company that was selling learning, trainable vision systems for analyzing images, who liked him because he'd retained his security clearance when he'd been fired from his previous job and walked out of the building. It had been a blowing, wet, gray day, and the streets of New York were as empty as they ever got. Standing on Sixth Avenue, looking north from Midtown, staring at the buildings, the cars and the buses and the people and the tall walkers, that's when he had his realization. He was not meant to be in this world. It just didn't suit him. He could see its workings, see how its politics and policies were flawed, see how the system needed debugging, see what made its people work, but he couldn't touch it. Every time he reached in to adjust its settings, he got mangled by its gears. He couldn't convince his bosses that he knew what they were doing wrong. He couldn't convince his colleagues that he knew best. Nothing he did succeeded. Every attempt he made to right the wrongs of the world made him miserable and made everyone else angry. Lawrence knew about humans, so he knew about this. This was the exact profile of the people in the order. Normally, he would have taken the subway home. It was forty blocks to his place, and he didn't get around so well anymore. Plus, there was the rain and the wind. But today he walked, huffing and limping, using his cane more and more as he got further and further uptown, his knee complaining with each step. He got to his apartment and found that the elevator was out of service, second time that month, and so he took the stairs. He arrived at his apartment so out of breath, he felt like he might vomit. He stood in the doorway, clutching the frame, looking at his sofa and table, the piles of books, the dirty dishes from that morning's breakfast in the little sink. He'd watched a series of short videos about the order once, and he'd been struck by the little monastic cells each member occupied, so neat, so tidy, everything in its perfect place, serene and thoughtful, so unlike his place. He didn't bother to lock the door behind him when he left. They said New York was the burglary capital of the developed world, but he didn't know anyone who'd been burgled. If the burglars came, they were welcome to everything they could carry away, and the landlord could take the rest. He was not meant to be in this world. He walked back out into the rain, and what the hell, hailed a cab, and hail Mary, one stopped when he put his hand out. The cabbie grunted when he said he was going to Staten Island, but what the hell, he pulled three twenties out of his wallet and slid them through the glass partition. The cabbie put the pedal down. The rain sliced through the Manhattan canyons and battered the windows, and they went over the Verrazano Bridge, and he said goodbye to his life and the outside world forever, 
seeking a world he could be a part of. Or at least, that's how he felt, as his heart swelled with the drama of it all. But the truth was much less glamorous. The brothers who admitted him at the gate were cheerful and a little weird, like his co-workers, and he didn't get a nice clean cell to begin with, but a bunk in a shared room and a detail helping to build more quarters. And they didn't leave his stuff for the burglars. Someone from the order went and cleaned out his place and put his stuff in a storage locker on campus, made good with his landlord, and so on. By the time it was all over, it all felt a little ordinary. But in a good way, ordinary was good. It had been a long time since he'd felt ordinary. Order, ordinary, they went together. He needed ordinary. The Securitat van played a cheerful engine tone as it zipped down the street towards him. It looked like a children's drawing, a perfect little electrical box with two seats in front and a meshed-in lock-up in the rear. It accelerated smoothly down the street towards him, then braked perfectly at his toes, rocking slightly on its suspension as its doors gull-winged up. Cool, he said involuntarily, stepping back to admire the smart little car. He reached for the life logger around his neck and aimed it at the two Securitat officers, who were debarking, moving with stiff grace in their armor. As he raised the life logger, the officer closest to him reached out with serpentine speed and snatched it out of his hands, power-assisted fingers coming together on it with a loud plasticky crunk as the device shattered into a rain of fragments. Just as quickly, the other officer had come around the vehicle and seized Lawrence's wrists, bringing them together in a painful, machine-assisted grip. The one who had crushed his life logger passed his palms over Lawrence's chest, arms, and legs, holding them a few millimeters away from him. Lawrence's pan went nuts, intrusion detection sensors reporting multiple hostile reads of his identifiers millimeter wave radar scans, herf attacks, and assorted shenanigans. All his feedback systems went to full alert, going from itchy, back-of-the-neck, liminal sensations into high-intensity pinches, prods, and buzzes. It was a deeply alarming sensation, like his internal organs were under attack. He choked out an incoherent syllable, and the Securitat man who was hand-wanding him raised a warning finger, holding it so close to his nose he went cross-eyed. He fell silent while the man continued to wand him, twitching a little to let his pen know that it was all okay. "'From the cult, then, are you?' the Securitat man said, after he'd kicked Lawrence's ankles apart and spread his hands on the side of the truck. "'That's right,' Lawrence said, "'from the order.' He jerked his head toward the gates. Just a few tantalizing meters away. I'm out. You people are really something, you know that? You could have been killed. Let me tell you a few things about how the world works. When you are approached by the Securitat, you stand still, with your hands stretched straight out to either side. You do not raise unidentified devices and point them at the officers. Not unless you're trying to commit suicide by cop. Is that what you're trying to do? No. Lawrence said, no, of course not. I was just taking a picture for, and you do not photograph or log our security procedures. There's a war on, you know. The man's forehead bunched together. Oh, for a shit's sake. We should take you in now, you know it. Tie up a dozen people's day just to process you through the system. You could end up in a cell for, oh, I don't know, a month? You want that? Of course not. Lawrence said. I didn't realize. You didn't, but you should have. If you're going to come walking around here where the real people are, you have to learn how to behave like a real person in the real world. The other man, who had been impassively holding Lawrence's wrists in a crushing grip, eased up. Let him go, he said. The first officer shook his head. If I were you, I would turn right around, walk through those gates, and never come out again. Do I make myself clear? Lawrence wasn't clear at all. Was the cop ordering him to go back, or just giving him advice? Would he be arrested if he didn't go back in? It had been a long time since Lawrence had dealt with authority, and the feeling wasn't a good one. His chest heaved, and sweat ran down his back, pooling around his ass, then moving in rivulets down the backs of his legs. I understand, he said, thinking... I understand that asking questions now would not be a good idea. 
The subway was more or less as he remembered it, though the long line of people waiting to get through the turnstiles turned out to be a line to go through a security checkpoint, complete with bag search and x-ray. But the New Yorkers were the same. No one made eye contact with anyone else. But if they did, everyone shared a kind of bitter shrug, as if to say, ain't it the fucking truth? But the smell was the same, oil and damp, and bleach, and the indefinable human smell of a place where millions had passed for decades, where millions would pass for decades to come. He found himself standing before a subway map, looking at it, comparing it to the one in his memory to find the changes, the new stations that must have sprung up during his hiatus from reality. But there weren't new stations. In fact, it seemed to him that there were a lot fewer stations. Hadn't there been one at Bleecker Street, and another at Cathedral Parkway? Yes, there had been. But look now, they were gone, and, and there were stickers, white stickers, over the places where the stations had been. He reached up and touched the one over Bleecker Street. I still can't get used to it either, said a voice at his side. I used to change for the F train there every day when I was a kid. It was a woman, about the same age as Goethe, but more beaten down by the years, deeper creases in her face, a stoop in her stance, but her face was kind, her eyes soft. What happened to it? She took a half step back from him. Bleecker Street, she said. You know, Bleecker Street? Like 911? Bleecker Street? Like the name of the station was an incantation. It rang a bell. It wasn't like he didn't ever read the news, but it had a way of sliding off of you when you were on campus, as though it was some historical event in a book, not something happening right there on the other side of the wall. I'm sorry, he said. I've been away. Bleecker Street, yes, of course. She gave him a squinty stare. You must have been very far away. He tried out a sheepish grin. I'm a monk, he said. From the order of reflective analytics, I've been out of the world for sixteen years, until today, in fact. My name is Lawrence. He stuck his hand out, and she shook it like it was made of china. A monk, she said. That's very interesting. Well, you enjoy your little vacation. She turned on her heel and walked quickly down the platform. He watched her for a moment, then turned back to the map, counting the missing stations. When the train ground to a halt in the tunnel between 42nd and 50th Streets, the entire car let out a collective groan. When the lights flickered and went out, they groaned louder. The emergency lights came on in sickly green, and an incomprehensible announcement played over the loudspeakers. Evidently, it was an order to evacuate, because the press of people began to struggle through the door at the front of the car, then further and further. Lawrence let the press of bodies move him, too. Once they reached the front of the train, they stepped down onto the tracks, each passenger turning silently to help the next, again with that ain't-it-the-fucking-truth look. Lawrence turned to help the person behind him and saw that it was the woman who'd spoken to him on the platform. She smiled a little smile at him and turned with practiced ease to help the person behind her. They walked single file on a narrow walkway beside the railings. Securitat officers were strung out at regular intervals, wearing night scopes and high rubberized boots. They played flashlights over the walkers as they evacuated. Does this happen often? Lawrence said over his shoulder. His words were absorbed by the dead subterranean air, and he thought that she might not have heard him, but she sighed. Only every time there is an anomaly in the head count— when the system says there's too many or too few people in the trains, maybe once a week. He could feel her staring at the back of his head. He looked back at her and saw her shaking her head. He stumbled and went down on one knee, clanging his head against the stone walls, made soft by a fur of condensed train exhaust, cobwebs, and dust. She helped him to his feet. You don't seem like a snitch, Lawrence, but you're a monk. Are you going to turn me in for being suspicious? He took a second to parse this out. I don't work for the Securitat, he said. It seemed like the best way to answer. She snorted. That's not what we hear. Come on. They're going to start shouting at us if we don't move. 
They walked the rest of the way to an emergency staircase together and emerged out of a sidewalk grating, blinking in the remains of the autumn sunlight, a bloody color on the glass of the high-rises. She looked at him and made a face. You're filthy, Lawrence. She thumped at his sleeves and great dirty clouds rose off them. He looked down at the knees of his pants and saw that they were hung with boogers of dust. The New Yorkers who streamed past them ducked to avoid the dirty clouds. Where can I clean up? he said. Where are you staying? I was thinking I'd see about getting a room at the Y, or a backpacker's hostel, somewhere to stay until I'm done. Done? I'm on a complicated errand, trying to locate someone who used to be in the order. Her face grew hard again. No one gets out alive, huh? He felt himself blushing. It's not like that. Wow, you've got strange ideas about us. I want to find this guy because he disappeared under mysterious circumstances, and I want to... How to explain anomalies to an outsider. It's a thing we do, unravel mysteries. It makes us better people. Better people? She snorted again. Better than what? Don't answer. Come on, I live near here. You can wash up at my place and be on your way. You're not going to get into any backpacker's hostel looking like you just crawled out of a sewer. You're more likely to get detained for being an indigent of suspicious character. He let her steer him a few yards uptown. You think that I work for the Securitat, but you're inviting me into your home? She shook her head and led him around a corner along a long cross-town block, and then turned back uptown. No, she said, I think you're a confused stranger who is apt to get himself into some trouble if someone doesn't take you in hand and help you get smart fast. It doesn't cost me anything to lend a hand, and you don't seem like the kind of guy who'd mug, rape, and kill an old lady. The discipline, he said, is all about keeping track of the way that the world is and comparing it to your internal perceptions all the time. When I entered the order, I was really big, fat, I mean. The discipline made me log every bit of food I ate, and I discovered a few important things. First, I was eating about twenty times a day, just grazing on whatever happened to be around. Second, that I was consuming about four thousand calories a day mostly in industrial sugars like high-fructose corn syrup. Just knowing how I ate made a gigantic difference. I felt like I ate sensibly, always ordering a salad with lunch and dinner, but I missed the fact that I was glooping on half a cup of sweetened, high-fat dressing and having a cookie or two every hour between lunch and dinner and a half pint of ice cream before bed most nights. But it wasn't just food. In the order, we keep track of everything. Our typing patterns, our sleeping patterns, our moods, our reading habits. I discovered that I read faster when I've been sleeping more. So now, when I need to really get through a lot of reading, I make sure I sleep more. Used to be I'd try to stay up all night with pots of coffee to get the reading done. Of course, the more sleep-deprived I was, the slower I read... And the slower I read, the more I needed to stay up to catch up with the reading. No wonder college was such a blur. So that's why I've stayed. It's empiricism. It's as old as Newton, as the Enlightenment. He took another sip of his water, which tasted like New York tap water had always tasted, pretty good, in fact, and which he hadn't tasted for sixteen years. The woman was called Posy, and her old leather sofa was worn but well-loved, and smelled of saddle soap. She was watching him from a kitchen chair she'd brought around to the living room of the tiny apartment, rubbing her stockinged feet over the good wool carpet that showed a few old stains, hiding beneath strategically placed furnishings and knick-knacks. He had to tell her the rest, of course. You couldn't understand the order unless you understood the rest. I'm a screw-up posy, or at least I was. We all were smart and motivated and promising, but just a wretched person to be around. Angry, bitter, all those smarts turned on biting the heads off of the people who were dumb enough to care about me or employ me, and so smart that I could talk myself into believing that it was all everyone else's fault, the idiots. It took instrumentation, empiricism, to get me to understand the patterns of my own life, to master my life, to become the person I wanted to be. Well, you seem like a perfectly nice young man now, Posy said. That was clearly his cue to go, 
and he'd changed into a fresh set of trousers, but he couldn't go, not until he'd picked apart something she'd said earlier. Why did you think I was a snitch? I think you know that very well, Lawrence, she said. I can't imagine someone who's so into measuring and understanding the world could possibly have missed it. Now he knew what she was talking about. We just do contract work for the Securitat. It's just one of the ways the order sustains itself. The founders had gone into business refilling toner cartridges, which was like the 21st century equivalent of keeping bees or brewing dark, thick beer. They'd branched out into remote IT administration, then into data mining and security, which was a natural for people with order training. But it's all anonymized. We don't snitch on people. We report on anomalous events. We do it for lots of different companies, too, not just the Securitat. Posey walked over to the window behind her small dining room table, rolling away a couple of handsome old chairs on casters to reach it. She looked down over the billion lights of Manhattan, stretching all the way downtown to Brooklyn. She motioned to him to come over, and he squeezed in beside her. They were on the twenty-third floor, and it had been many years since he'd stood this high and looked down. The world is different from high up. There, she said, pointing at an apartment building across the way. There, you see it, with the broken windows? He saw it, the windows covered in cardboard. They took them away last week. I don't know why. You never know why. You become a person of interest, and they take you away. And then later, they always find a reason to keep you away. Lawrence's hackles were coming up. He found stuff that didn't belong in the data. He didn't arrest people. So if they always find a reason to keep you away, doesn't that mean... She looked like she wanted to slap him, and he took a step back. We're all guilty of something, Lawrence. That's how the game is rigged. Look closely at anyone's life, and you'll find what? A little black marketeering? A copyright infringement? Some cash economy business with unreported income? Something obscene in your internet use? Something in your bloodstream that shouldn't be there? I bought that sofa from a cop, Lawrence. Bought it ten years ago when he was leaving the building. He didn't give me a receipt and didn't collect tax, and technically that makes us offenders. She slapped the radiator. I overrode the governor on this ten minutes after they installed it. Everyone does it. They make it easy. You just stick a penny between two contacts and, hey, presto, the city can't turn your heat down anymore. They wouldn't make it so easy if they didn't expect everyone to do it. And once everyone's done it, we're all guilty. The people across the street, they were Pakistani or maybe Sri Lankan or Bangladeshi. I'd see the wife at the service laundry. Nice, professional lady, always lugging around a couple kids on their way to or from daycare. Is she... Posy broke off and stared again. I once saw her reach for her change, and her sleeve rode up, and there was a number tattooed there, there on her wrist. Posy shuddered. When they took her and her husband and their kids, she stood at the window and pounded at it and screamed for help. You could hear her from here. That's terrible, Lawrence said. But what does it have to do with the order? She sat back down. For someone who is supposed to know himself, you're not very good at connecting the dots. Lawrence stood up. He felt an obscure need to apologize. Instead, he thanked her and put his glass in the sink. She shook his hand solemnly. Take care out there, she said. Good luck finding your escapee. Here's what Lawrence knew about Zbigniew Krotowski. He had been inducted into the order four years earlier. He was a native-born New Yorker. He had spent his first two years in the order trying to coax some of the elders into a variety of pointless flame wars about the ethics of working for the Securitat, and then had settled into being a very productive member. He spent his 20% time, the time when each monk had to pursue non-work-related projects, building aerial photography rigs out of box kites and tiny cameras that the monks installed on their systems to help them monitor their body mechanics and ergonomic posture. Zbigkrot performed in the 85th percentile of the order, which was respectable enough. Lawrence had started there and had crept up and down, as low as 70 and as high as 88, depending on how he was doing in the rest of his life. 
The big crowd was active in the gardens, both the big ones where they grew their produce, and a little allotment garden where he indulged in Baroque crossbreeding experiments, which were in vogue among the monks then. The Securitat stream to which he'd added, sixty-eight bites, was long gone, but it was the kind of thing that the order handled on a routine basis. Given the timing and other characteristics, Lawrence thought it was probably a stream of purchase data from hardware and grocery stores to be inspected for unusual patterns that might indicate someone buying bomb ingredients. The Big Crote had worked on this kind of data thousands of times before, six times just that day. He'd added the sixty-eight bytes and then left, invoking his right to do so at the lone gate. The gatekeeper on duty remembered him carrying a little rucksack and mentioning that he was going to see his sister in New York. The Big Crote once had a sister in New York. That much could be ascertained. Anya Krotowski had lived on 23rd Street in a co-op near Lexington, but that had been four years previous, when he joined the order, and she wasn't there any more. Her numbers all rang dead. The apartment building had once been a pleasant, middle-class sort of place, with a red awning and a niche for a doorman. Now it had become more run-down, the awning's edges frayed, one pane of lobby glass broken out and replaced with a sheet of cardboard. The doorman was long gone. It seemed to Lawrence that this fate had befallen many of the city's buildings. They reminded him of the buildings he'd seen in Belgrade one time, when he'd been sent out to brief a gang of outsourced programmers his boss had hired, neglected for years, indifferently patched by residents who had limited access to materials. It was the dinner hour, and a steady trickle of people were letting themselves into Anya's old building. Lawrence watched a couple of them enter the building and noticed something wonderful and sad. As they approached the building, their faces were the hard masks of city dwellers, not meeting anyone's eye, clipping along at a fast pace that said, Don't screw with me! But once they passed the threshold of their building and the door closed behind them, their whole affect changed. They slumped, they smiled at one another, they leaned against the mailboxes, and set down their bags, and took off their hats, and fluffed their hair, and turned back into people. He remembered that feeling from his life before, the sense of having two faces, the one he showed to the world, and the one that he reserved for home. In the order, he only wore one face, one that he knew in exquisite detail. He approached the door now, and his pan started to throb ominously, letting him know that he was enduring hostile probes. The building wanted to know who he was and what business he had there, and it was attempting to fingerprint everything about him, from his pan, to his gait, to his face. He took up a position by the door and dialed back the pan's response to a dull pulse. He waited for a few minutes until one of the residents came down, a middle-aged man with a dog, a little sickly-looking schnauzer with gray in its muzzle. "'Can I help you?' the man said from the other side of the security door, not unlatching it. I'm looking for Anya Krotowski, he said. I'm trying to track down her brother. The man looked him up and down. Please step away from the door. He took a few steps back. Does Ms. Krotowski still live here? The man considered. I'm sorry, sir. I can't help you. He waited for Lawrence to react. You don't know, or you can't help me. Don't wait under this awning. The police come if anyone waits under this awning for more than three minutes. The man opened the door and walked away with his dog. His phone rang before the next resident arrived. He cocked his head to answer it, then remembered that his life logger was dead and dug in his jacket for a mic. There was one at his wrist pulse points used by the health array. He unvelcroed it and held it to his mouth. Hello? It's Gerda, boy -o. Wanted to know how your anomaly was going. Not good, he said. I'm at the sister's place, and they don't want to talk to me. You're walking up to strangers and asking them about one of their neighbors, huh? He winced. Put it that way, yeah, okay. I understand why this doesn't work. But, Gerda, I feel like Rip Van Winkle here. I keep putting my foot in it. It's so different. People are people, Lawrence. Every bad behavior and every good one lurks within us. They were all there when you were in the world, in different proportion, with different triggers, but all there. 
You know yourself very well. Can you observe the people around you with the same keen attention? He felt slightly put upon. That's what I'm trying. Then you'll get there eventually. What, you're in a hurry? Well, no. He didn't have any kind of timeline. Some people chased anomalies for years. But truth be told, he wanted to get out of the city and back onto campus. I'm thinking of coming back to campus to sleep. Gerda clucked. Don't give in to the agoraphobia, Lawrence. Hang in there. You haven't even heard my news yet, and you're already ready to give up? What news? And I'm not giving up. Just want to sleep in my own bed. The entry checkpoints, Lawrence. You cannot do this job if you're going to spend four hours a day in security queues. Anyway, the news. It wasn't the first time he did it. I've been running the logs back three years, and I've found at least a dozen streams that he tampered with. Each time he used a different technique. This was the first time we caught him. Used some pretty subtle tripwires when he did it, so he'd know if anyone ever caught on. Must have spent his whole life living on edge, waiting for that moment, waiting to bug out. Must have been a hard life. What was he doing? Spying? Most assuredly, Gerda said. But for whom? For the enemy? The Securitat? They'd considered going to the Securitat with the information, but why bother? The Order did business with the Securitat, but tried never to interact with them on any other terms. The Securitat and the Order had an implicit understanding. So long as the Order was performing excellent data analysis, it didn't have to fret the kind of overt scrutiny that prevailed in the real world. Undoubtedly, the Securitat kept satellite eyes, data snoopers, wiretaps, millimeter radar, and every other conceivable surveillance trained on each campus in the world. But at the end of the day, they were just badly socialized geeks who'd left the world, and useful geeks at that. The Securitat treated the order the way that Lawrence's old bosses treated the company's sysadmins, expendable geeks who no one cared about, so long as nothing went wrong. No, there was no sense in telling the Securitat about the 68 bytes. Why would the Securitat poison its own data streams? You know that when the Soviets pulled out of Finland, they found 40 kilometers of wiretapping wire in KGB headquarters. The building was only 12 stories tall. Spying begets spying. The worst, most dangerous enemy the Securitat has is the Securitat. There were Securitat vans on the street around him, going past every now and again, eerily silent engines playing their cheerful music. He stepped back into shadow, then thought better of it and stood under a pool of light. Okay, so it was a habit. How do I find him? No one in the sisters' building will talk to me. You need to put them at their ease. Tell them the truth. That often works. You know how people feel about the order out here? He thought of Posey. I don't know if the truth is going to work here. You've been in the order for sixteen years. You're not just some fumble-tongued outcast anymore. Go talk to them. But go, Lawrence, go. You're a smart guy. You'll figure it out. He went. Residents were coming home every few minutes now, carrying grocery bags, walking dogs, or dragging their tired feet. He almost approached a young woman, then figured that she wouldn't want to talk to a strange man on the street at night. He picked a guy in his thirties, wearing jeans and a huge old vintage coat that looked like it had come off the eastern front. Excuse me, he said. I'm trying to find someone who used to live here. The guy stopped and looked Lawrence up and down. He had a handsome sweater on underneath his coat, designy and cosmopolitan, the kind of thing that made Lawrence think of Milan or Paris. Lawrence was keenly aware of his generic order-issued suit, a brown, rumpled, ill-fitting thing, topped with a polymer coat that, while warm, hardly flattered. Good luck with that, he said, then started to move past. Please, Lawrence said, I'm, I'm not used to how things are around here. There's probably some way I could ask you this that would put you at your ease, but I don't know what it is. I'm not good with people, but I really need to find this person. She used to live here. The man stopped, looked at him again. He seemed to recognize something in Lawrence, or maybe it was that he was disarmed by Lawrence's honesty. Why would you want to do that? It's a long story, 
he said. Basically, though, I'm a monk from the Order of Reflective Analytics, and one of our guys has disappeared. His sister used to live here. Maybe she still does. And I wanted to ask her if she knew where I could find him. Let me guess. None of my neighbors wanted to help you. You're only the second guy I've asked, but yeah, pretty much. Out here in the real world, we don't really talk about each other to strangers. Too much like being a snitch. Lucky for you, my sister's in the order, out in Oregon, so I know you're not all a bunch of snoops and stoolies. Who are you looking for? Lawrence felt a rush of gratitude for this man. Anya Krotowski, number 11J. Oh, the man said, well, yeah, I can see why you'd have a hard time with the neighbors when it comes to old Anya. She was well-liked around here, before she went. Where'd she go? When? What's your name, friend? Lawrence? Lawrence, Anya went. Middle of the night kind of thing? No one heard a thing. The CCTV stopped working that night. Nothing on the drive the next day. No footage at all. Like she skipped out? They stopped delivering flyers to her door. There's only one power stronger than direct marketing. The Securitat took her? That's what we figured. Nothing left in her place. Not a stick of furniture. We don't talk about it much. Not the thing that it pays to take an interest in. How long ago? Two years ago, he said. A few more residents pushed past them. Listen, I approve of what you people do in there, more or less. It's good that there's a place for the people who don't, you know, who don't have a place out here. But the way you make your living... I told my sister about this the last time she visited, and she got very angry with me. She didn't see the difference between watching yourself and being watched. Lawrence nodded. Well, that's true enough. We don't draw a really sharp distinction. We all get to see one another's stats. It keeps us honest. That's fine, if you have the choice, but... He broke off, looking self-conscious. Lawrence reminded himself that they were on a public street, the cameras on them, people passing by. Was one of them a snitch? The Securitat had talked about putting him away for a month just for logging them. They could watch him all they wanted, but he couldn't look at them. I see the point. He sighed. He was cold and it was full autumn dark now. He still didn't have a room for the night, and he didn't have any idea how he'd find Anya, much less Zvigrot. He began to understand why anomalies were such a big deal. He'd walked 18,453 steps that day, about triple what he did on campus. His heart rate had spiked several times, but not from exertion, stress. He could feel it in his muscles now. He should really do some biofeedback, try to calm down, then run back his life logger and make some notes on how he'd reacted to people through the day. But the life logger was gone, and he barely managed 22 seconds his first time on the biofeedback. His next ten scores were much worse. It was the hotel room. It had once been an office, and before that it had been half a hotel room. There were still scuff marks on the floor from where the wheeled office chair had dug into the scratched lino. The false wall that divided the room in half was as thin as paper, and Lawrence could hear every snuffle from the other side. The door to Lawrence's room had been rudely hacked in, and weak light shone through an irregular crack over the jam. The old New Yorker hotel had seen better days, but it was what he could afford, and it was central, and he could hear New York outside the window. He'd gotten the half of the hotel room with the window in it. The lights twinkled just as he remembered them, and he still got a swimmy, vertiginous feeling when he looked down from the great height. The clerk had taken his photo and biometrics— and had handed him a tracker key that his pan was monitoring with tangible suspicion. It radiated his identity every few yards, and in the elevator. It even seemed to track which part of the minuscule room he was in. What the hell did the hotel do with all this information? Oh, right. It shipped it off to the Securitat, who shipped it to the order, where it was processed for suspicious anomalies. No wonder there was so much work for them on campus. Multiply the New Yorker times a hundred thousand hotels, two hundred thousand schools, a million cabs across the nation. There was no danger of the order running out of work. The hotel's network tried to keep him from establishing a secure connection back to the order's network, 
but the order's countermeasures were better than the half-assed ones at the hotel. It took a lot of tunneling and wrapping, but in short measure he had a strong private line back to the campus, albeit a slow line, what with all the jiggery-pokery he had to go through. Gerda had left him with her file on Zbigkrot and his activities on the network. He had several known associates on campus, people he ate with or playing on intramural teams with or did a little extreme programming with. Gerda had bulk messaged them all with an oblique query about his personal life and had forwarded the responses to Lawrence. There was a mountain of them, and he started to plow through them. He started by compiling stats on them, length, vocabulary, number of paragraphs, and then started with the outliers. The shortest ones were polite shrugs, apologies, don't have anything to say. The long ones, phew, they sorted into two categories, general whining, mostly from noobs who were still getting accustomed to the way of the order, and protracted complaints from old hands who'd worked with Zbigkrot long enough to decide that he was incorrigible. Lawrence sorted these quickly, then took a glance at the median responses and confirmed that they appeared to be largely unhelpful generalizations of the sort that you might produce on a co-worker evaluation form, a proliferation of null adjectives like satisfactory, pleasant, fine. Somewhere in this haystack, Lawrence did a quick word count and came back with 140,000 words, about two good novels worth of reading, was a needle, a clue that would show him the way to unravel the anomaly. It would take him a couple days at least to sort through it all in depth. He ducked downstairs and bought some groceries at an all-night grocery store in Penn Station and went back to his room, ready to settle in and get the work done. He could use a few days' holiday from New York, anyway. About time Z Big Noob did a runner. He never had a moment's happiness here, and I never figured out why he'd bother hanging around when he hated it all so much. Ever meet the kind of guy who wanted to tell you just how much you shouldn't be enjoying the things you enjoy? The kind of guy who could explain in detail exactly why your passions were stupid? That was him. Brother Antony, why are you wasting your time collecting tin toys? They're badly made, unlovely, and represent, at best, a history of slave labor, starting with your cherished made-in-occupied-Japan tanks. Christ, why not collect rape camp macrame while you're at it? He had choice words for all of us about our passions, but I was singled out because I liked to extreme program in my room, which I'd spent a lot of time decorating, See pick below, and yes, I built and sanded and mounted every one of those shelves by hand. See magnification shot for detail on the joinery. Couldn't even drive a nail when I got here. Not that there are any nails in there. It's all precision-fitted tongue and groove. Holy moly, lasers totally rock. But he reserved his worst criticism for the order itself. You know the litany. We're a cult. We're brainwashed. We're dupes of the Securitat. He was convinced that every instrument in the place was feeding up to the Securitat itself. He'd mutter about this constantly whenever we got a new stream to work on. Is this your life log, Brother Antony? Mine? The number of flushes per shitter in the west wing of campus? And it was no good trying to reason with him. He just didn't acknowledge the benefit of introspection. It's no different from them, he'd say, jerking his thumb up at the ceiling, as though there was a Securitat mic and camera hidden there. You're just flooding yourself with useless information, trying to find the useful parts. Why not make some predictions about which part of your life you need to pay attention to, rather than spying on every process? You're a spy in your own body. So, why did I work with him? I'll tell you. First, he was a shit-hot programmer. I know his stats say he was way down in the 78th percentile, but he could make every line of code that I wrote smarter. We just don't have a way of measuring that kind of effect. Yes, someone should write one. I've been noodling with the framework for it for months now. Second, there was something dreadfully fun about listening him light into other people, their ridiculous passions and interests. He could be incredibly funny, and he was incisive, if not insightful. It's shameful, but there you have it. I am imperfect. Finally, when he wasn't being a dick, he was a good guy to have in your corner. 
He was our rugby team's fullback, the baseball team's shortstop, the tank on our MMOG raids. You could rely on him. So I'm going to miss him, weirdly. If he's gone for good, I wouldn't put it past him to stroll back onto campus some day and say, What? What? I just took a little French leave. Jesus, overreact much? Plenty of the notes ran in this direction, but this was the most articulate. Lawrence read it through three times before adding it to the file of useful stuff. It was a small pile. Still, Gerda kept forwarding him responses. The late responders had some useful things to say. He mentioned a sister, only once. A whole bunch of us were talking about how our families were really supportive of our coming to the Order, and after it had gone round the whole circle, he just kind of looked at the sky and said, My sister thought I was an idiot to go inside. I asked her what she thought I should do, and she said, If I was you, kid, I'd just disappear before someone disappeared me. Naturally, we all wanted to know what he meant by that. I'm not very good at bullshitting, and that's a vital skill in today's world. She was better at it than me, when she worked at it. But she was the kind of person who'd let her guard slip every now and then. Lawrence noted that Zbigkrot had used the past tense to describe his sister. He'd have known about her being disappeared then. He stared at the walls of his hotel room. The room next door was occupied by at least four people, and he couldn't even imagine how you'd get that many people inside. He didn't know how four people could all stand in the room, let alone lie down and sleep. But there were definitely four voices from next door, talking in Chinese. New York was outside the window and far below, and the sun had come up far enough that everything was bright and reflective, the cars and the buildings, and the glints from sunglasses far below. He wasn't getting anywhere with the docks, the sister, the data streams, and there was New York just outside the window. He dug under the bed and excavated his boots, recoiling from soft, dust-furred old socks and worse, underneath the mattress. The Securitat man pointed to Lawrence as he walked past Penn Station. Lawrence stopped and pointed at himself in a who-me gesture. The Securitat man pointed again, then pointed to his alcove next to the entrance. Lawrence's pan didn't like the Securitat man's incursions and tried to wipe itself. Sir, he said, my pan is going nuts. May I put down my arms so I can tell it to let you in? The Securitat man acted as though he hadn't heard, just continued to wave his hands slowly over Lawrence's body. Come with me, the Securitat man said pointing to the door on the other side of the alcove that led into a narrow corridor into the bowels of Penn Station. The door led out onto the concourse, thronged with people shoving past each other, disgorged by train after train. Though none made eye contact with them or each other, they parted magically before them, leaving them with a clear path. Lawrence's pan was not helping him, Every inch of his body itched as it nagged at him about the depredations it was facing from the station and the Securitat man. This put him seriously on edge and made his heart and breathing go crazy, triggering another round of warnings from his pan, which wanted him to calm down, but wouldn't help. This was a bad failure mode, one he'd never experienced before. He'd have to file a bug report. Someday. The Securitat's outpost in Penn Station was as clean as a dentist's office, but with mesh-reinforced windows and locks that made three distinct clicks and a soft hiss when the door closed. The Securitat man impersonally shackled Lawrence to a plastic chair that was bolted into the floor and then went off to a check-in kiosk that he whispered into and prodded at. There was no one else in evidence, but there were huge CCTV cameras so big that they seemed to be throwbacks to an earlier era, some Paleolithic ancestor of the modern camera. These cameras were so big because they were meant to be seen, meant to let you know that you were being watched. The Securitat man took him away again, stood him in an interview room where the cameras were once again invaluable evidence. Explain everything, the Securitat man said. He rolled up his mask so that Lawrence could see his face, young and hard. He'd been in diapers when Lawrence went into the order. And so Lawrence began to explain, but he didn't want to explain everything. 
Telling this man about Zbigkrot tampering with Securitat data streams would not be good. Telling him about the disappearance of Anya Krotowski would be even worse. So, he lied. He was already so stressed out that there was no way the lies would register as extraordinary to the censors that were doubtless trained on him. He told the Securitat man that he was in the world to find an order member who'd taken his leave, because the order wanted to talk to him about coming back. He told the man that he'd been trying to locate Zbigkrot by following up on his old contacts. He told the Securitat man that he expected to find Zbigkrot within a day or two and would be going back to the order. He implied that he was crucial to the order and that he worked for the Securitat all the time, that he and the Securitat man were on the same fundamental mission, on the same team. The Securitat man's face remained an impassive mask throughout. He touched an ear bead from time to time, cocking his head slightly to listen. Someone else was listening to Lawrence's testimony and feeding him more material. The Securitat man scooted his chair closer to Lawrence, leaned in close, searching his face. We don't have any record of this Krotowski person, he said. I advise you to go home and forget about him. The words were said without any inflection at all, and that was scariest of all. Lawrence had no doubt about what this meant. There were no records because Zbigniew Krotowski was erased. Lawrence wondered what he was supposed to say to this armed child now. Did he lay his finger alongside of his nose and wink? Apologize for wasting his time? Everyone told him to listen before he spoke here. Should he just wait? Thank you for telling me so, he said. I appreciate the advice. He hoped it didn't sound sarcastic. The Securitat man nodded. You need to adjust the settings on your pan. It reads like it's got something to hide. Here in the world, it has to accede to lawful read attempts without hesitation. Will you configure it? Lawrence nodded vigorously. While he'd recounted his story, he'd imagined spending a month in a cell while the Securitat looked into his deeds and history. Now it seemed like he might be on the streets in a matter of minutes. Thank you for your cooperation. The man didn't say it. It was a recording, played by hidden speakers, triggered by some unseen agency, and on hearing it, the Securitat man stood and opened the door, waiting for the three distinct clicks and the hiss before tugging at the handle. They stood before the door to the guard's niche in front of Penn Station, and the man rolled up his mask again. This time he was smiling an easy smile, and the hardness had melted a little from around his eyes. You want a tip, buddy? Sure. Look, this is New York. We all just want to get along here. There's a lot of bad guys out there. They got some kind of beef. They want to fuck with us. We don't want to let them do that. You want to be safe here? You got to show New York that you're not a bad guy, that you're not here to fuck with us. We're the city's protectors, and we can spot someone who doesn't belong here the way your body can spot a cold germ. The way you're walking around here, looking around, acting. I could tell you didn't belong from a hundred yards. You want to avoid trouble. You get less strange, fast. You get me? I get you, he said. Thank you, sir. Before the Securitat man could say any more, Lawrence was on his way. The man from Anya's building had a different sweater on, but the new one, bulky wool, the color of good chocolate, was every bit as handsome as the one he'd had on before. He was wearing some kind of citrusy cologne, and his hair fell around his ears in little waves that looked so natural they had to be fake. Lawrence saw him across the Starbucks and had a crazy urge to duck away and change into better clothes, just so he wouldn't look like such a fucking hayseed next to this guy. I'm a New Yorker, he thought, or at least I was. I belong here. Hey, Lawrence, fancy meeting you here. He shook Lawrence's hand and gave him a wry, you and me in it together, smile. How's the vision quest coming? Huh? The anomaly. That's what you're chasing, aren't you? It's your little rite of passage. My sister had one last year. Figured out that some guy who traveled from Fort Worth to Portland, Oregon, every week was actually a fictional construct invented by cargo smugglers who used his seat to plant a series of mules running heroin and cash. She was so proud afterwards that I couldn't get her to shut up about it. You had the holy fire the other night when I saw you. 
Lawrence felt himself blushing. It's not really holy, all that religious stuff. It's just a metaphor. We're not really spiritual. Oh, the distinction between the spiritual and the material is pretty arbitrary anyway. Don't worry. I don't think you're a cultist or anything. No more than any of us anyway. So, how's it going? I think it's over, he said. Dead end. Maybe I'll get an easier anomaly next time. Sounds awful. I didn't think you were allowed to give up on anomalies. Lawrence looked around to see if anyone was listening to them. This one leads to the Securitat, he said. In a sense, you could say that I've solved it. I think the guy I'm looking for ended up with his sister. The man's expression froze, not moving one iota. You must be disappointed, he said in neutral tones. Oh, well. He leaned over the condiment bar to get a napkin and wrestled with the dispenser for a moment. It didn't cooperate, and he ended up holding fifty napkins. He made a disgusted noise and said, Can you help me get these back into the dispenser? Lawrence pushed at the dispenser and let the man feed it his excess napkins, arranging them neatly. While he did this, he contrived to hand Lawrence a card, which Lawrence cupped in his palm and then ditched into his inside jacket pocket, under the pretense of reaching in to adjust his pan. Thanks, the man said. Well, I guess you'll be going back to your campus now. In the morning, Lawrence said. I figured I'd see some New York first, play tourist, catch a Broadway show. The man laughed. All right, then. You enjoy it. He did nothing significant as he shook Lawrence's hand and left, holding his paper cup. He did nothing to indicate that he just brought Lawrence into some kind of illegal conspiracy. Lawrence read the note later, on a bench in Bryant Park, holding a paper bag of roasted chestnuts and fastidiously piling the husks next to him as he peeled them away. It was a neatly cut rectangle of card, sliced from a health food cereal box. Lettered on the back of it in pencil were two short lines. Wednesdays, 8.30 p.m., Half Moon Cafe, 164 Second Avenue. The address was on the Lower East Side, a neighborhood that had been scorchingly trendy the last time Lawrence had been there. More importantly, it was Wednesday. The Half Moon Cafe turned out to be one of those New York places that are so incredibly hip they don't have a sign or any outward indication of their existence. Number 164 was a frosted glass door between a dry cleaner's and a Pakistani grocery store, propped open with a squashed Mountain Dew can. Lawrence opened the door, heart pounding, and slipped inside. A long, dark corridor stretched away before him, with a single door at the end, open a crack, dim light spilling out of it. He walked quickly down the corridor, sure that there were cameras observing him. The door at the end of the hallway had a sheet of paper on it, with Half Moon Cafe laser printed in its center. Good food smells came from behind it, and the clink of cutlery and soft conversation. He nudged it open and found himself in a dim, flickering room lit by candles and draped with gathered curtains, that turned the walls into the proscenia of a grand and ancient stage. There were four or five small tables, and a long one at the back of the room, crowded with people, with wine and ice buckets at either end. A very pretty girl stood at the podium before him, dressed in a conservative suit, but with her hair shaved into a half-inch brush of electric blue. She lifted an eyebrow at him, as though she was sharing a joke with him, and said, Welcome to the Half Moon. Do you have a reservation? Lawrence had carefully shredded the bit of cardboard and dropped its tatters in six different trash cans, feeling like a real spy as he did so, and realizing at the same time that going to all these different cans was probably anomalous enough in itself to draw suspicion. A friend told me he'd meet me here, he said. What was your friend's name? Lawrence stuck his chin in the top of his coat to tell his pan to stop warning him that he was breathing too shallowly. I don't know, he said. He craned his neck to look behind her at the tables. He couldn't see the man, but it was so dark in the restaurant. You made it, huh? The man had yet another fantastic sweater on, this one with a tight herringbone weave and ribbing down the sleeves. He caught Lawrence sizing him up and grinned. 
my weakness. The world's wool farmers would starve if it wasn't for me. He patted the greeter on the hand. He's at our table. She gave Lawrence a knowing smile and the tiniest hint of a wink. Nice of you to come, he said, as they threaded their way slowly through the crowded tables, past couples having murmured conversations over candlelight, intense business dinners, an old couple eating in silence with evident relish, especially as it's your last night in the city. What kind of restaurant is this? Oh, it's not any kind of restaurant at all. Private kitchen. Ormond, he owns the place and cooks like a wizard. He runs this little place off the books for his friends to eat in. We come every Wednesday. That's his vegan night. You'd be amazed with what that guy can do with some greens and a sweet potato. And the cacao nib and avocado chili chocolate is something else. The large table was crowded with men and women in their thirties, people who had the look of belonging. They dressed well in fabrics that draped or clung like someone had thought about it, with jewelry that combined old pieces of brass with modern plastics and heavy clay beads that clicked like pool balls. The women were beautiful, or at least handsome, one woman with cheekbones like snow plows and a jawline as long as a ski slope was possibly the most striking person he'd ever seen up close. The men were handsome, or at least craggy, with three-day beards or neat, full mustaches. They were talking in twos and threes, passing around overflowing dishes of steaming greens and oranges and browns, chatting and forking by turns. Everyone, I'd like you to meet my guest for the evening. The man gestured at Lawrence. Lawrence hadn't told the man his name yet, but he made it seem like he was being gracious and letting Lawrence introduce himself. Lawrence, he said, giving a little wave. Just in New York for one more night, he said, still waving. He stopped waving. The closest people, including the striking woman with the cheekbones, waved back, smiling. The furthest people stopped talking and tipped their forks at him, or at least cocked their heads. Sara, the cheekbones woman said, pronouncing the first A long, Sara, and making it sound unpretentious. The low-key buzzing from Lawrence's pen warned him that he was still overwrought, breathing badly, heart thudding. Who were these people? And I'm Randy, the man said. Sorry, I should have said that sooner. The food was passed down to his end. It was delicious, almost as good as the food at the campus, which was saying something. There was a dedicated cadre of cooks there who made gastronomy their 20% projects using elaborate computational models to create dishes that were always different and always delicious. The big difference was the company. These people didn't have to retreat to belong. They belonged right here. Sara told him about her job managing a specialist antiquarian bookstore, and there were a hundred stories about her customers and their funny ways. Randy worked at an architectural design firm, and he had done some work at Sara's bookstore. Down the table there were actors and waiters and an insurance person and someone who did something in city government, and they all ate and talked and made him feel like he was a different kind of man, the kind of man who could live on the outside. The coals of the conversation banked over port and coffees as they drifted away in twos and threes. Sara was the last to leave, and she gave him a little hug and a kiss on the cheek. Safe travels, Lawrence. Her perfume was like an orange on Christmas morning, something from his childhood. He hadn't thought of his childhood in decades. Randy and he looked at each other over the litter on the table. The server brought a check over on a small silver tray, and Randy took a quick look at it. He drew a wad of twenties in a bulldog clip out of his inside coat pocket and counted off a large stack, then handed the tray to the server, all before Lawrence could even dig in his pocket. Please, let me contribute, he managed, just as the server disappeared. Not necessary, Randy said, setting the clip down on the table. There was still a rather thick wad of money there. Lawrence hadn't been much of a cash user before he went into the order, and he'd seen hardly any spent since he came back out into the world. It seemed rather antiquarian, with its elaborate engraving, but the notes were crisp, as though freshly minted. The government still pressed the notes, even if they were hardly used any longer. I can afford it. 
It was a very fine dinner. You have interesting friends. Sara is lovely, he said. She and I, well, we had a thing once. She's a remarkable person. Of course, you're a remarkable person too, Lawrence. Lawrence's pan reminded him again that he was getting edgy. He shushed it. You're smart. We know that. 88th percentile. Looks like you could go higher, judging from the work we've evaluated for you. I can't say your performance as a private eye is very good, though. If I hadn't intervened, you'd still be standing outside Anya's apartment building, harassing her neighbors. His pan was ready to call for an ambulance. Lawrence looked down and saw his hands clenched into fists. You're secure, Tot, he said. Let me put it this way, the man said, leaning back. I'm not one of Anya's neighbors. You're secure, Tot, Lawrence said again. I haven't done anything wrong. You came here, Randy said. You had every reason to believe that you were taking part in something illegal. You lied to the Securitat man at Penn Station today. Lawrence switched his Pan's feedback mechanisms off altogether. Posey, at her window, a penny stuck in the governor of her radiator, rose in his mind. Everyone was treating me like a criminal. From the minute I stepped out of the order, you all treated me like a criminal. That made me act like one. Everyone has to act like a criminal here. That's the hypocrisy of the world. That honest people end up acting like crooks, because the world treats them like crooks. Maybe we treat them like crooks because they act so crooked. You've got it all backwards, Lawrence said. The causal arrow runs the other direction. You treat us like criminals, and the only way to get by is to act criminal. If I'd told the Securitat man in Penn Station the truth, you build a wall around the order, don't you, to keep us out because we're barbarians, to keep you in because you're too fragile? What does that treatment do, Lawrence? Lawrence slapped his hand on the table, and the crystal rang, but no one in the restaurant noticed. They were all studiously ignoring them. It's to keep you out, all of you, who treated us. Randy stood up from the table. Bulky figures stepped out of the shadows behind them. Behind their armor, the Securitat people could have been white or black, old or young. Lawrence could only treat them as Securitat. He rose slowly from his chair and put his arms out, as though surrendering. As soon as the Securitat officers relaxed by a tiny hair, treating him as someone who was surrendering, he dropped backwards over the chair behind him, knocking over a little two-seat table and whacking his head on the floor so hard it rang like a gong. He scrambled to his feet and charged pell-mell for the door, sweeping the empty tables out of the way as he ran. He caught a glimpse of the pretty waitress standing by her podium at the front of the restaurant as he banged out the door, her eyes wide and her hands up as though to ward off a blow. He caromed off the wall of the dark corridor and ran for the glass door that led out to Second Avenue, where cars hissed by in the night. He made it onto the sidewalk, crashed into a burly man in a Mets cap, bounced off him, and ran downtown, the people on the sidewalk leaping clear of him. He made it two whole storefronts. All the running around on the campus handball courts had given him a pretty good pace and wind, before someone tackled him from behind. He scrambled and squirmed and turned around. It was the guy in the Mets hat. His breath smelled of onions, and he was panting, his lips pulled back. Watch where you're going, he said, and then he was lifted free, jerked to his feet. The blood sang in Lawrence's ears, and he had just enough time to register that the big guy had been lifted by two blank, armored Securitat officers before he flipped over onto his knees and used the posture like a runner's crouch to take off again. He got maybe ten feet before he was clobbered by a bolt of lightning that made every muscle in his body lock into rigid agony. He pitched forward, face first, not feeling anything except the terrible electric fire from the taser bolt in his back. His pan died with a sizzle up and down every haptic point in his suit, and between that and the electricity, he flung his arms and legs out in an agonized X, while his neck thrashed, grating his face over the sidewalk. Something went horribly crunch in his nose. The room had the same kind of locks as the Securitat room in Penn Station. He'd awakened in the corner of the room, his face taped up and aching. There was no toilet, but there was a chair, bolted to the floor, 
and three prominent video cameras. They left him there for some time, alone with his thoughts and the deepening throb from his face, his knees, the palms of his hands. His hands and knees had been sanded raw, and there was grit and glass and bits of pebble embedded under the skin, which oozed blood. His thoughts wanted to return to the predicament. They wanted to fill him with despair for his situation. They wanted to make him panic and weep with the anticipation of the cells, the confession, the life he'd had and the life he would get. He didn't let them. He had spent sixteen years mastering his thoughts, and he would master them now. He breathed deeply, noticing the places where his body was tight and trembling, thinking each muscle into tranquility, even his aching face, letting his jaw drop open. Every time his thoughts went back to the predicament, he scrawled their anxious message on a streamer of mental ribbon, which he allowed to slip through his mental fingers and sail away. Sixteen years of doing this had made him an expert, and even so it was not easy. The worries rose and streamed away as fast as his mind's hand could write them. But as always, he was finally able to master his mind, to find relaxation and calm at the bottom of the thrashing, churning vat of despair. When Randy came in, Lawrence heard each bolt click and the hiss of air as from a great distance, and he surfaced from his calm, watching Randy cross the floor, bearing his own chair. Innocent people don't run, Lawrence. That's a rather self-serving hypothesis, Lawrence said. The cool ribbons of worry slithered through his mind like satin, floating off into the ether around them. You appear to have made up your mind, though. I wonder at you. You don't seem like an idiot. How have you managed to convince yourself that this, he gestured around at the room, is a good idea? I mean, this is just... Randy waved him silent. The interrogation in this room flows in one direction, Lawrence. This is not a dialogue. Have you ever noticed that when you're uncomfortable with something, you talk louder and lean forward a little? A lot of people have that tell. Do you work with Securitat data streams, Lawrence? I work with large amounts of data, including a lot of material from the Securitat. It's rarely in clear text, though. Mostly I'm doing SIGINT, signals intelligence. I analyze the timing, frequency, and length of different kinds of data to see if I can spot anomalies. That's with a lowercase a, by the way. He was warming up to the subject now. His face hurt when he talked, but when he thought about what to say, the hurt went away, as did the vision of the cell where he would go next. It's the kind of thing that works best when you don't know what's in the payload of the data you're looking at. That would just distract me. It's like a magician's trick with a rabbit or a glass of water. You focus on the rabbit or on the water and what you expect of them, and are flummoxed when the magician does something unexpected. If he used pebbles, though, it might seem absolutely ordinary. Do you know what Zbigniew Krotoski was working on? No, there's no way for me to know that. The streams are enciphered at the router with his public key, and re-scrambled after he's done with them. It's all zero knowledge. But you don't have zero knowledge, do you? Lawrence found himself grinning, which hurt a lot, and which caused a little more blood to leak out of his nose and over his lips in a hot trickle. Well, signals intelligence being what it is, I was able to discover that it was a Securitat stream and that it wasn't the first one he'd worked on, nor the first one he'd altered. He altered a stream? Lawrence lost his smile. I hadn't told you that part yet, had I? No. Randy leaned forward. But you will now. The blue silk ribbons slid through Lawrence's mental fingers as he sat in his cell, which was barely lit and tiny and padded and utterly devoid of furniture. High above him, a ring of glittering red LEDs cast no visible light. They would be infrared lights, the better for the hidden cameras to see him. It was dark, so he saw nothing, but for the infrared cameras, it might as well have been broad daylight. The asymmetry was one of the things he inscribed on a blue ribbon and floated away. The cell wasn't perfectly soundproof. There was a gaseous hiss that reverberated through it every 46 to 53 breaths, which he assumed was the regular opening and shutting of the heavy door that led to the cell block 
deep within the Securitat building. That would be a patrol, or a regular report, or someone with a weak bladder. There was a softer, regular grinding that he felt more than heard, a subway train running very regular. That was the New York rumble, and it felt a little like his pan's reassuring purring. There was his breathing, deep and oceanic, and there was the sound in his mind's ear, the sound of the streamers hissing away into the ether. He'd gone out in the world, and now he'd gone back into a cell. He supposed that it was meant to sweat him, to make him mad, to make him make mistakes. But he had been trained by sixteen years in the order, and this was not sweating him at all. Come along, then. The door opened with a cotton-soft sound from its balanced hinges, letting light into the room and giving him the squints. I wondered about your friends, Lawrence said, all those people at the restaurant. Oh. Randy said. He was a black silhouette in the doorway. Well, you know, honor among thieves. Rank half its privileges. They were caught, he said. Everyone gets caught, Randy said. I suppose it's easy when everybody is guilty, he thought of Posey. You just pick a skill set, find someone with those skills, and then figure out what that person is guilty of. Recruiting made simple. Not so simple as all that, Randy said. You'd be amazed at the difficulties we face. Zbigniew Krotowski was one of yours. Randy's silhouette, now resolving into features, clothes, another sweater, this one with a high collar and squared-off shoulders, made a little movement that Lawrence knew meant yes. Randy was all tells, no matter how suave and collected he seemed. He must have been really up to something when they caught him. Come along, Randy said again, and extended a hand to him. He allowed himself to be lifted. The scabs at his knees made crackling noises, and there was the hot, wet feeling of fresh blood on his calves. Do you withhold medical attention until I give you what you want? Is that it? Randy put an affectionate hand on his shoulder. You seem to have it all figured out, don't you? Not all of it. I don't know why you haven't told me what it is you want yet. That would have been simpler, I think. I guess you could say that we're just looking for the right way to ask you. The way to ask me a question that I can't say no to? Was it the sister? Is that what you had on him? He was useful because he was so eager to prove that he was smarter than everyone else. You needed him to edit your own data streams? Randy just looked at him calmly. Why would the Securitat need to change its own streams? Why couldn't they just arrest whomever they wanted on whatever pretext they wanted? Who'd be immune to— Then he realized who'd be immune to the Securitat. The Securitat would be. You used him to nail other Securitat officers. Randy's blank look didn't change. Lawrence realized that he would never leave this building. Even if his body left, now he would be tied to it forever. He breathed. He tried for that oceanic quality of breath, the susurration of the blue silk ribbons inscribed with his worries. It wouldn't come. Come along now, Randy said, and pulled him down the corridor to the main door. It hissed as it opened, and behind it was an old Securitat man, legs crossed painfully, weak bladder, Lawrence knew. Here's the thing, Randy said. The system isn't going to go away, no matter what we do. The Securitat's here forever. We've treated everyone like a criminal for too long now. Everyone's really a criminal now. If we dismantled tomorrow, there'd be chaos, bombings, murder sprees. We're not going anywhere. Randy's office was comfortable. He had some beautiful vintage circus posters. The bearded lady, the sword swallower, the hoochie-coochie girl, framed on the wall and a cracked leather sofa that made amiable exhalations of good tobacco smell, mixed with years of saddle soap, when he settled into it. Randy reached onto a tall mahogany bookcase and handed him down a first-aid kit. There was a bottle of alcohol in it and a lot of gauze pads. Gingerly, Lawrence began to clean out the wounds on his legs and hands, then started in on his face. The blood ran down and dripped onto the slate-tiled floor, almost invisible. Randy handed him a waste paper bin, and it slowly filled with the bloody gauze. Looks painful, Randy said. Just skinned. I have a vicious headache, though. 
That's the taser hangover. It goes away. There's some codeine tablets in the pill case. Take it easy on them. They'll put you to sleep. While Lawrence taped large pieces of gauze over the cleaned-out corrugations in his skin, Randy tapped idly at a screen on his desk. It felt almost as though he'd dropped in on someone's hot desk back at the order. Lawrence felt a sharp knife of homesickness and wondered if Gerda was okay. Do you really have a sister? I do, in Oregon, in the order. Does she work for you? Randy snorted. Of course not. I wouldn't do that to her. But the people who run me, they know that they can get to me through her, so in a sense we both work for them. And I work for you. That's the general idea. Zbigkrot spooked when you got on to him, so he's long gone. Long gone, as in. This is one of those things where we don't say. Maybe he disappeared and got away clean, took his sister with him. Maybe he disappeared into our operations, not knowing is the kind of thing that keeps our other workers on their game. And I'm one of your workers. Like I said, the system isn't going anywhere. You met the gang tonight. We've all been caught at one time or another. Our little cozy club manages to make the best of things. You saw us. It's not a bad life at all. And we think that all things considered, we make the world a better place. Someone would be doing our job, might as well be us. At least we managed to weed out the real retarded sadists. He sipped a little coffee from a thermos cup on his desk. That's where the big croat came in. He helped you with retarded sadists? For the most part. Power corrupts, of course, but it attracts the corrupt, too. There's a certain kind of person who grows up wanting to be a Securitat officer. And me? You? I would do this, too. You catch on fast. The outside wall of campus was imposing. Tall, sheathed in seamless metal, painted uniform gray. Nothing grew for several yards around it, as though the world was shrinking back from it. How did Zbigkrot get off campus? That's a question that should have occurred to him when he left the campus. He was embarrassed that it took him this long to come up with it, but it was a damned good question. Trying to force the gate. What was it the old brother on the gate had said? Pressurized. Blowouts. The walls rigged to come down in an instant. If the big crow had left, he'd walked out, the normal way, while someone at the gate watched him go, and he'd left no record of it. Someone, working on campus, had altered the stream of data fountaining off the front gate to remove the record of it. There was more than one forager there. It hadn't just been the big crow working for the Securitat. He'd belonged in the order. He'd learned how to know himself, how to see himself, with the scalding objective logic that he'd normally reserved for everyone else. The anomaly had seemed like such a bit of fun, like he was leveling up to the next stage of his progress. He called Greta. They'd given him a new pen, one that had a shunt, that delivered a copy of all his data to the Securitat. Since he'd first booted it, it had felt strange and invasive, every buzz and warning coming with the haunted feeling, the watched feeling. You, huh? It's very good to hear your voice, he said. He meant it. He wondered if she knew about the Securitat's campus snitches. He wondered if she was one. But it was good to hear her voice. His pan let him know that whatever he was doing was making him feel great. He didn't need his pan to tell him that, though. I worried when you didn't check in for a couple days. Well, about that. Yes? If he told her, she'd be in it, too, if she wasn't already. If he told her, they'd figure out what they could get on her. He should just tell her nothing. Just go on inside and twist the occasional data stream. He could be better at it than Zbigrot. No one would ever make an anomaly out of him. Besides, so what if they did? It would be a few hours, days, months, or years, that he could live on campus. And if it wasn't him, it would be someone else. It would be someone else. I just wanted to say goodbye, and thanks. I suspect I'm not going to see you again. Off in the distance now, the sound of the Securitat van's happy little song. His pan let him know that he was breathing quickly and shallowly, and he slowed his breathing down until it let up on him. Lawrence? He hung up. The Securitat van was visible now, streaking toward the campus wall. 
He closed his eyes and watched the blue satin ribbons tumble like silky water licking over a waterfall. He could get to the place that Campus took him to anywhere. That was all that mattered. Oblivion, a journey. Vandana Singh. Vandana Singh, users.rcn.com slash singvan, S-I-N-G-H-V-A-N, lives with her family in Framingham, Massachusetts. She is a college teacher with a Ph.D. in theoretical particle physics. She was born and brought up in New Delhi, India, and is a card-carrying alien writing science fiction. Her parents both had graduate degrees in English literature. I grew up as much with Shakespeare and Keats as I did with the great Indian epics and literary writers in Hindi, such as the inimitable Prem Chand. My mother and grandmother told us the Ramayana and Mahabharata and various folk tales and village lore. In my teen years and early adulthood, I also became involved, in a modest and occasional way, in environmental and women's movements, which had a lasting impact on my worldview. And I love this genre for its imaginative richness, its vast canvas, and the sophistication with which its best practitioners wield their pens. Her first short story collection, The Woman Who Thought She Was a Planet, came out in fall 2008 in India from Zuban Books and Penguin India. Her novella Distances was published in 2008 by Aqueduct Press. Oblivion, A Journey, appeared in the original anthology Clockwork Phoenix, edited by Mike Allen. It presents an Indian post-human future in which synthetic and naturally born people mingle across the colonized galaxy. One woman's life is controlled by an ancient revenge myth. It is interesting to compare it to Fury, another space opera appearing later in this book. Memory is a strange thing. I haven't changed my sex in 83 years. I was born female, in a world of peace and quietude, yet I have an incomplete recollection of my childhood. Perhaps it is partly a failure of the imagination that it is so hard to believe, in this age of ours, that there was once such a place as green and slow as my world shell, Ramastal. It was the last of the great world shells to fall, so any memory of childhood is contaminated with what came after, the deaths of all I loved, the burning of the cities, the slow, cancerous spread of Hirasaur's culture machines that changed my birthplace beyond recognition. So instead of one seamless continuum of growing and learning to be in this world, my memory of my life is fragmentary. I remember my childhood name, Lilavati. I remember those great sigh beasts the Hayatis, swaying down the streets in a procession and their hot, vegetable-scented breath ruffling my hair. There are glimpses, as through a tattered veil, of steep, vertical gardens, cascading greenery, a familiar face looking out at me from a window hewn in a cliff, and in the background the song of falling water. Then everything is obscured by smoke. I am in a room surrounded by pillars of fire, and through the haze I see the torn pages of the Ramayan floating in the air, burning, their edges crumpling like black lace. I am half comatose with heat and smoke. My throat is parched and sore, my eyes sting, and then there are strange metallic faces reaching out to me, the stuff of my nightmares. Behind them is a person all aflame, her arms outstretched running toward me, but she falls, and I am carried away through the smoke and the screaming. I still see the woman in my dreams and wonder if she was my mother. In my later life as a refugee, first on the world of Barana, and after that everywhere and nowhere, there is nothing much worth recalling. Foster homes, poverty, my incarceration in some kind of soulless educational institution, the banality of the daily struggle to survive. But there are moments in my life that are seared into my mind forever, instants that were pivotal, life-changing, each a conspiracy of temporal nexuses, a concatenation of events that made me what I am. This is not an excuse. I could have chosen a different way to be, but I did not know then that I had a choice. 
This is the first of those moments. The last time I was a woman, some ninety years ago in my personal time frame. I was calling myself Ela then, and doing some planet hopping, working the cruisers and blowing the credits at each stop. I found myself on planet Vilasa, a rich and decadent world under the sway of the Samarin conglomerate. I was in one of those deep city bars where it's always night, where sunshine is like a childhood memory, where the air is thick with smoke, incipient violence, and bumblebees. I don't remember who I was with, but the place was crowded with humans, native and off-world, as well as mutants and akalchis. There was a bee buzzing in my ear, promising me seven kinds of bliss, designed especially for my personality and physical type. If only I'd agree to let the Samarin corporate entity take over half my brain. I swatted it. It fell into my plate and buzzed pathetically, and Tanny waving, before it became non-functional. Somehow I found this funny. I still remember throwing back my head and laughing. My fingers, slight and brown, curved around my glass. The drink, half-drunk, a glutinous purple drop sliding down the outer surface reflected on the glass a confusion of lights and moving shapes, and the gleam, sudden and terrifying, of steel. There was a scream, and the sound of glass breaking that seemed to go on forever. This was no barroom brawl. The raiders were harvesters. I remember getting up to run. I remember the terrified crowd pressing around me, and then I was falling, kicked, and stepped upon in the stampede. Somehow I pushed myself to safety under a table next to a stranger a pale woman with long black hair and eyes like green fire. She looked at me with her mouth open, saying one word, No, then. A harvester got her. It put its metal hands around her throat and put its scissor-like mouth to her chest. As she bled and writhed, it rasped one long word, interspersed with a sequence of numbers. Her body turned rigid and still, her face twisted with horror. Her green eyes froze, in a way that was simultaneously aware and locked in the moment of torment. It was then that I realized that she was a Nakalchi, a biosynthetic being spawned from a mother machine. The name of the mother machine is what pushes a Nakalchi into the catatonic state that is Shunyath. When they enter Shunyath, they relive the moment when that name was spoken. Since the Nakalchis are practically immortal— capable of dying only through accident or violence, Shunyath is their way of going to the next stage. Usually, a Nakalchi who has wearied of existence will go to one of their priests, who will put the candidate in a meditative state of absolute calm and surrender. Then the priest will utter the name of the mother machine, such names being known only to the priests and guarded with their lives, so that the Nakalchi may then contemplate eternity in peace. For first-generation Akalchis, Shunyat is not reversible. That is when I realized that this woman was one of the ancients, one of the Nakalchis, who had helped humankind find its way to the stars. So for her, frozen in the state of Shunyat, it would seem as though she was being strangled by the harvester all the rest of her days. No wonder she had asked me for no then, for death— she had known the harvesters had come for her. She had known what they would do. I remember thinking, in one of those apparently timeless moments that terror brings, somebody should kill the poor woman. She was obviously the target of the raid. But to my horrified surprise, the harvester turned from her to me, even as I was sliding away from under the table to a safer place. While the harvester had me pinned to the floor, its long, flexible electrodes crawled all over my skin as it violated my humanness, my womanness, with its multiple limbs. Through the tears and blood I saw myriad reflections of myself in those dark compound eyes, from which looked not only the primitive consciousness of the harvester, but the eyes of whoever manipulated it, the person or entity who, not content with finding their target, fed like a starving animal on the terror of a bystander. In those eyes I was a stranger, a non-person, a piece of meat that jerked and gibbered in pain. Then, for a moment, I thought I saw the burning woman from my memories of childhood standing behind the harvester. This is death, I said to myself, relieved. 
but the harvester left me a few hair breaths short of death and moved on to its next victim. I don't know how many they killed or maimed that night. The Nakalchi woman they took away. I remember thinking, through the long months of pain and nightmares that followed, that I wish I had died. But I lived. I took no joy in it. All that gave my mind some respite from its constant seething was a game I invented. I would find the identity of the person responsible for the harvester raid, and I would kill them. Find and kill. I went through endless permutations of people and ways of killing in my head. Eventually it was no longer a game. I moved to another planet, changed my sex to one of the betweens. Over the years I changed my body even further, ruthlessly replacing soft, yielding flesh with coralloid implants that grew me my own armor plating. Other people shuddered when I walked by. I became an interplanetary investigator of small crime and fraud, solving trivial little cases for the rich and compromised while biding my time. It was already suspected that the man responsible for the harvester attacks that terrorized whole planets during the Samarin era was no other than the governing mind of the Samarin corporate entity, Hirasor. The proof took many years and great effort on the part of several people, including myself, but it came at last. Nothing could be done, however, because Hirasor was more powerful than any man alive. His icons were everywhere, dark, shoulder-length hair framing a lean, aristocratic face with hungry eyes. The embroidered silk collar, the rose in his buttonhole. It came out then that he had a private museum of first-generation Nalkalchis, locked in Shunyath in various states of suffering. A connoisseur of pain was Hirasor. But to me he was also Hirasor, destroyer of worlds. He had killed me once already by destroying my world shell, Ramastal, it was one of the epic world shells, a chain of island satellites, natural and artificial, that ringed the star Agni. Here we learned, lived, and enacted our lives, based on that ancient Indic epic, the Ramayan, one of those timeless stories that condense in their poetry the essence of what it means to be human. Then Samarin had infiltrated, attacking and destroying at first, then doing what they called rebuilding substituting for the complexity and beauty of the Ramayan, an inanely simplified, sugary, cultural matrix that drew on all the darkness and pettiness in human nature. Ramastal broke up, dissolved by the monocultural machine that was Samarin. I suffered less than my fellow citizens. Being a child, I could not contribute a brain share to Samarin. I grew up a refugee, moving restlessly from one inhabited world to the next, trying and failing to find my center. Most of the ordinary citizens of these worlds had never heard of the Ramayan epic, or anything else that had been meaningful to me in that lost past life. In my unimaginable solitude, my only defense was to act like them, to be what they considered normal. When the harvesters invaded the bar, I had been living the fashionably disconnected life that Samarin-dominated cultures think is the only way to be. Hirasor was so powerful that among my people his nickname was Ravan Tenheads, after the demon in the epic Ramayan. Near the end of the story, the hero, Ram, tries to kill Ravan by cutting off his heads, one by one, but the heads simply grow back. In a similar manner, if a rival corporation or a society of free citizens managed to destroy one Samarin conglomerate, another would spring up almost immediately in its place. It and Hirasor seemed almost mythic in their indestructibility. What I wanted to do was to find Hirasor's secret vulnerability, as Ram does in the epic. Shoot an arrow into Ravan's navel, he is told. The navel is the center of Ravan's power. When Ram does so, the great demon dies at last. But Samarin, and with it Hirasor, declined slowly, without my help. An ingeniously designed brain-share virus locked Samarin's client slaves, several million people, into a synced epileptic state. After that, Generosity Corps, that had likely developed the virus, began its ascent to power, while the Samarin entity gradually disintegrated. Pieces of it were bought by other conglomerates, their data extracted through torture. Then they were mind-wiped, until the name Samarin, 
only evoked a ghost of a memory, accompanied by a shudder. But Hirasor lived on. He was still rich enough to evade justice. Rumors of his death appeared frequently in the news feeds for a while, and a documentary was made about him, but over time people forgot. There were other things, such as the discovery of the worlds of the Hitor, and the threats and rumors of war with that unimaginably alien species. Give it up, said the few people in whom I had confided. Forget Hirasor and get on with your life. But finding Hirasor was the only thing between me and death by my own hand. Each time I opened my case files on him, each time his image sprang up and I looked into his eyes, I remembered the harvester, I remembered the burning woman. Despite all the reconstructive work my body had undergone, my old wounds ached, find, and kill. Only then would I know peace. I knew more about Hirasor than anyone else did, although it was little enough. He liked absinthe and roses. He had a perfect memory. He was fastidious about his appearance, every hair in place, fingers elegant and manicured, the signature ear studs small and precisely placed on each earlobe. His clothing was made from the silk of sapient worms. He had no confidant but for the chief of his guards, a Nakalchi female called Suvarna, a walking weapon who was also his lover. He wrote her poetry that was remarkable for its lyrical use of three languages, and equally remarkable for its sadistic imagery. Later I killed three of his functionaries to learn his unique identity number. It did me no good, or so I thought, then. In the years of his decline, he lost his harvester units. His three main hideouts were found and his assets destroyed. His loyal bands of followers dwindled to one, Suvarna. And yet he seemed more slippery and elusive than ever. Although he left trails of blood and shattered lives in his wake, he managed to elude me with trickery and firepower. He left me messages in blood. Sometimes it was the name of a planet or a city. I would go there and find, too late, another clue spelled out in corpses. It was as though we were playing an elaborate game across the inhabited worlds, with him always in the lead. Slowly, the universe began to take less and less notice. We were two lone players on a vast stage, and the audience had other, larger-scale horrors to occupy them. I began to think of myself as a modern-day Ram. In the Ramayan epic, Prince Ram's wife, Sita, is abducted by the ten-headed demon, Ravan. Prince Ram, beloved by all, has no difficulty raising an army of animals and people and following Ravan to his kingdom. I was no prince. But Hirasor had stolen my whole world, as surely as Ravan stole Sita. I could not bring back Ramastal or my childhood, but I could bring Hirasor down. Unlike Ram, I would have to do it alone. Alone. Sifting through travel records, bribing petty little mercenaries who may have had dealings with his people, tracking down witnesses at the scene of each orgy of violence trying to think like him, to stand in his shoes and wonder, what would he do next? I would sleep only when I could no longer stand. Sleep brought a recurring nightmare. Here a sore standing before me at last. I shoot an arrow into his navel, and as he falls, I leap upon him and put my hands around his throat. I am certain he is dying, but then I see his face change, become familiar, become my own face. I feel his hands on my throat. I would wake up in a sweat and know that in the end it was going to be only one of us who would prevail, him or me. But first I had to find him. So I worked obsessively, following him around from place to place, always one step behind. Then quite suddenly the trail got cold. I searched, sent my agents from planet to planet, nothing but silence. I paced up and down my room brooding for days. What was he waiting for? What was he about to do? Into this empty, waiting time came something I had not expected, a reason to live that had nothing to do with Hirasor. Her name was Danu. She was an urbanologist for whom I had performed a small service. She was a small, fierce, determined woman with long black hair turning to gray that she tied in a braid. The job I did for her was shoddily done, and she demanded a reason. I'm preoccupied with something more important, I snapped wanting her out of my office and my life. Tell me, she said, 
sitting down and waiting with her whole body, her eyes mocking and intrigued. So I did. We became lovers, Danu and I. Somehow she found her way past the armor plating of my mind and body. She found cracks and interstices, living flesh that remembered loving touch, regions of vulnerability that I hadn't cauterized out of myself. Here is a memory fragment. We lie in bed in my dingy room, with moonlight coming in through the narrow window, and the sounds outside of voices raised in argument, and the sweaty chemical scent of the dead river that lies like an outstretched arm across this nameless foul city. She is a shadow, a ghost, limbed with silver, turned into a stranger by the near darkness. I find this suddenly disturbing. I turn her over so that the light falls full on her face. I don't know what I look like to her. I don't know what I am. I've been calling myself Vikram for a few years, but that doesn't tell me anything. Tell me a secret, she says, something about yourself that nobody knows. I pull myself together, settle down next to her, and stare at the ceiling. I don't know what to tell her, but something escapes my lips unbidden. I want to die, I say, surprising myself because, lately, I haven't been thinking about death. But it's true, and also not true, because I want this moment forever, the light from the broken moon Yagos silvering her hair, and the way she looks at me when I say that, a long, slow, sad, unsurprised look. She begins to say something, but I stop her. Your turn, I say. I'll tell you what I want to know more than anything, she says after a pause. I want to know what it is like to be somebody else. I remember, as a very small child, standing with my mother on a balcony, watching the most amazing fireworks display I had ever seen. It made me happy. I looked at my mother to share that joy, and found that she was crying. It was then that I realized that I was a different person from her, that she was in some profound way a stranger. Since then I've sought strangeness. I've wanted to know what it is like to be a tree a sapient worm, and most of all, a made being. Like an Akalchi or a cognizant city, can you imagine what the universe would look like to an entity like that? We talk all night. She teaches me what she has learned about Nakalchis and cognizant cities, corporate entities and mother machines, in particular their rituals of death, because that is what interests me. I realize during the conversation that I am no more than a vessel for the death of another, and that is perhaps why I seek my own. Sometime during the night, she teaches me the song with which Nakalchi's welcome know then, their conception of death. She learned it from a Nakalchi priest who was dying, who wanted someone to say the words to him. I cannot pretend to understand the lore and mysticism that the priests have developed around know then which to me is simply irreversible non-functionality, the death that comes to us all, or the philosophical comparison between Nothen and Shunyath. Danu tries to explain. If you go into Shunyath, you contemplate what Nakalchis call the river, which is inadequately translated as the cosmic stream of being. If you go into Nothen, with the last song echoing in your mind, then you are the river. You are no longer separate from it. You become the river, see? No, I don't see. Never mind, she says, laughing at me. She says the words of the last song, breathing it out into the moonlit air. It has a pleasing, sonorous lilt. It is supposed to induce a state of acceptance and peace in a dying Nakalchi. I am not sure why, but there are tears in my eyes as I repeat it after her, in the gray, hushed light of dawn. Shanti, no then ke agaman, na duch na dard. Lying with her, seeing her hair unbound on my pillow like seaweed, I find myself in a still place, as though between breaths. Hirasor does not walk the paths that Danu and I tread. Looking back, I see how the paths branch out of each temporal nexus. For every pivotal event in my life, there was always more than one possible path I could have taken. This is the path I chose. I had accompanied Danu during one of her urbanology expeditions. We were in the bowels of a dying cognizant city on the ruined planet Murrah. 
This was the first time she had had a chance to explore what was probably one of the earliest cognizant cities in the galaxy. She was a few levels below me, attempting to salvage what was left of the city's mind. All its recorded history and culture, its ruminations over the years of its existence, lay spooled in cavernous darkness below. The inhabitants had been evacuated, and even now I could see the last of the ships, a glint or two in a reddening sky, over the bleak mountains of Murrah's northern continent. I was perched on the highest ramparts, standing by our flyer, and looking out for rogue destroyer bots. Every now and then I saw one rise up, a distant speck, and crash into the cityscape in a small fireball. Thin spires of smoke rose all around me, but there was as yet nothing amiss where I was standing. Then I lost Danu's signal. I searched the skies, found them clear of bots, and descended quickly into the worn-like passageways that led into the city's heart. Two levels later, my wristband beeped. She was in range. I'm all right, Vikram, she said to my anxious query. She sounded breathless with excitement. I had to go down a couple of levels to find the rest of the databanks. This city is one of the first cognizant cities ever made. They still have direct human-to-city interfaces. I am hooking up to talk to it as I record. Go on up. I'll only be a few minutes, I promise. When I relive that moment, I think of the things I could have done. I could have insisted on going down to where she was, or persuaded her to leave everything and come, or I could have been more careful going up so I wouldn't lose my way. But I did lose my way. It was only one wrong turn, and I was about to retrace my steps. I had the flyer's reassuring signal on my wristband as a guide. But what made me pause was curiosity, or fate. I found myself in the doorway of an enormous chamber, which smelled faintly of blood and hydrogen peroxide, and was lit by periodic blue flashes like lightning. I saw the great monstrous hulk of an old-fashioned mother machine, her long-abandoned teats spewing an oily broth, her flailing arms beating the air over the shattered remains of her multiple wombs. She was old. It had been a long time since she had brought any Nakalchis to life. As I stared at her, I realized, from what pictures Danu had shown me of ancient maid beings, that she was probably a first-generation mother machine, a priceless collector's item, salvaged from who knew where, abandoned in the evacuation of the city. And now the city's madness was destroying what little functionality she had, taking her to know then. Moved by a sudden impulse, I went up to her and spoke the words of peace. Shanti. No then ke agaman na duk na dard. Peace. As no then comes, there is no sorrow, no pain. I regretted my impulse almost immediately because after I stopped, the mother machine began to recite the names of her children, the first part of her death ritual. In her final moments, she had mistaken me for an Akalchi priest. I don't know what made me stay. There was something mesmerizing about that old, metallic voice in the darkness and the proximity of death. Perhaps I was a little annoyed with Danu for delaying, for wanting to join with the city in an orgy of mutual understanding. Danu's signal flickered with reassuring regularity on my wristband. Then I heard the mother machine utter the name that to me meant more than life itself, Hirasor. I will remember that moment until I die. The grating voice of the mother machine, the dull booms in the distance, the floor shaking below my feet, and that pungent, smoky darkness, pierced by occasional sparks of blue lightning. In the midst of it, clear as a bell, the name, or rather, Hirosaur's unique numerical identifier. Each of us had our identity numbers, given to us at birth, and I was one of the few people who knew Hirosaur's. But I had never suspected he was an Akalchi partly because of Nakalchi lore and history. There never had been any confirmed master criminals who were Nakalchi, conceived as they had once been, to gently shepherd the human race toward the stars. Meanwhile, the great uprising of the Nakalchis in times long before Samarin, the consciousness debates that had preceded them, had all ensured that they were treated on par with human beings. So I had no way of knowing from the number alone. 
You can't tell from appearance or behavior either, because Nakalchis claim access to the full range of human emotion, or, if their priests are to be believed, to more than that. By now, even we humans are so augmented and enhanced that the functional difference between Nakalchi and human is very small, but important. To me, the difference meant, at last, the possibility of vengeance. Here a sore, a first-generation Nakalchi. That is why I had to wait. That is why I couldn't go down to find Danu, why I ignored her frantic signals on my wristband. I had to wait for the mother machine to tell me her name. At last, she said it. Ekadri Samayada Janini, intermingled with a sequence of numbers that made up a prime. I left her, then, to die. I left repeating her name, what would always be to me the word, so I would not forget. The floor was twisting and bucking beneath my feet, and a lone siren was blaring somewhere above me. I staggered against the rusting metal wall of the passage, and remembered Danu. I got up. I went back. I wish I could say that I went into the bowels of the city, braved everything to find her and rescue her. But I didn't. I went down until I was stopped by the rubble of fallen masonry. Her signal still flickered on my wristband, but she did not answer my query. There was a seismic shudder far below me, and a long sigh, a wind that blew through the wrecked passageways, running invisible fingers through my hair. I sensed, or imagined, Danu's breath flowing with the breath of the dying city, her consciousness entangled inextricably with that of her host. But as I turned away, I knew also that my real reason for abandoning her was that I was the only living being who had the means to bring Hirasor down. For that, I couldn't risk my life. The roof of the passageway began to collapse. I was running now, veering from one side to another, to prevent being hit by debris. I burst into open air, my chest aching, and flung myself into the flyer. As I rose up, three destroyer bots honed into the very spot I had vacated. I had no time to activate the flyer's defenses. A great fireball blossomed below me. I felt its heat as I piloted the rocking craft upward through the tumultuous air. Up in the cool heights, I saw that there was blood flowing down my right arm. My shoulder hurt. I looked down and saw the myriad fires blooming, forming and dissolving shapes that my imagination brought to life. Monsters, and, lastly, a woman, arms outstretched, burning. In the Ramayan, Ram braves all to recover his consort Sita from the demon Ravan. But near the end of the story he loses her through his own foolishness. He turns her away, exiles her, as he himself was once exiled, and buries himself in the task of ruling his kingdom. All that, the war, the heroes killed, for nothing. One of the most moving scenes in the epic is at the end of the story, when Ram goes down on his knees before Sita in the forest, begging her forgiveness and asking her to come back to him. She accepts his apology, but she does not belong to him. She never has. She calls to her mother, the earth. A great fissure opens in the ground, and Sita goes home. In the One Thousand Commentaries, there are different views on the significance of Sita. Some interpret her as signifying that which is lost to us. For a long time I had thought of Sita as my world, my childhood. I had seen myself as Ram, raising an army to win back, not those irredeemable things, but a chance for survival. Abandoned by my fellow investigators, hunting for Hirasor alone, I had, after a while, given up on analogies. Certainly I had never thought of Danu as Sita. Danu was what I had to sacrifice to reach Hirasor, to rescue Sita. Danu would never belong to me anyway, I told myself. She could have come up out of the city at any time. It was her obsession with the maid beings that led to her death. Sometimes I was angry with her. At other times I wept, thinking of the fall of her hair in the moonlight. At odd moments during my renewed pursuit of Hirasor, she would come unbidden into my mind, and I would wonder what her last moments had been like. Had she seen the universe through the eyes of the dying city? Had she had her epiphany? But I had little time for regret. My life narrowed down to one thing. Find Hirasor. I set various agents sifting through mountains of possible leads. I re-established contact with criminal informers, 
coaxed or threatened information from scores of witnesses. At night I lay sleepless in my lonely bed, thinking of what I would do when I found Hirasor. My mind ran through scenario after scenario. I had to first put him in a hundred kinds of agony. Then I would say the name of the mother machine and lock him in Shunyath forever. His silence lasted over two years. Then, at last, one of my agents picked up his trail. This time, curiously, it was not marked with blood. No small, artistically arranged orgy of violence betrayed his presence. All I had was proof, from a transit shuttle record, that he had been headed for the planet Gridakuta two months ago. I went to Gridakuta. Apparently he had headed straight for the Buddhist monastery of Lei, without any attempt at covering his tracks. I went to the monastery, suspecting a trap. There, to my angry surprise, I found him gone. An elderly monk told me that, yes, Hirasor had been there. What had he done during his stay? Apparently nothing but walk around in the hill gardens and read in the library. Where was he now? He said to tell you that he had gone to oblivion, the monk said, watching me. But why don't you stay here a while before you go? There is no hurry. Hirasor is not running any more. Why don't you walk the gardens and ease your burdens a little? They let me search the grounds and the building, but there was no sign of Hirasor. I wondered if he had really gone to Oblivion, a planet about which I knew little, except that it was as close to hell as you could get among the inhabited worlds. It made no sense that he would go to such an uncomfortable place. While I was wondering what to do, I walked briefly in the gardens with the monk, Chituri. I told him a little about myself and my quest. In return, he confided to me that he had been a World Shell citizen, too, before the fall. His World Shell had been Gilgamesh. There is no doubt that there was some magic about the place, because I stayed longer than I intended. The gardens in the terraced hills were tranquil, verdant, misty with waterfalls. Amid groves of moss-laden stone trees, pale clusters of flowers hung in the sweet air. Memories of Ramastal, which had faded with time, returned to me vividly. Meanwhile, Chituri tried to persuade me to stay, to give up my quest for justice. As we walked, he would tell me stories from the Indic tradition, even resorting to his knowledge of the Ramayan. Don't you see? He would tell me. It is only when Ram forgets the god in him, forgets he is an avatar of Vishnu, that he acts foolishly. What is evil but ignorance of our true nature? You are forgetting that Ravan is the villain of the story, not Ram, I would say coldly. If you want to talk about evil, talk about him. But, Paren, he said, using the name I had given him, don't your commentaries say that the entire epic is more than a literal telling of an old heroic tale? That the great battle is really the battle within? He had a peculiar way of sidling up to me, of speaking as though imparting a great confidence, and yet his manner was ingratiating, tentative. He hardly spoke above a whisper. I guessed he had suffered much before his arrival here, but I took a dislike to him after a while. For me, this period was, like the time I had met Danu, only an interstice, a time to catch my breath before resuming my quest. I was not interested in academic discourses on morality. Chituri did not understand that. He had seen Hirasor walk these very gardens, Hirasor, who had brought down his world as well as mine, and he had done nothing. I finished my researches on the planet Oblivion and made arrangements to go there. It was a difficult place to get to, since there was only one settlement, if one could call it that, and only a small scientific research craft visited at rather long intervals. The day I left, Chichuri again tried to persuade me to give up my pursuit of Hirasor. He did this in his usual oblique way of telling me a story. This time it was an ancient Buddhist tale about a murderer called Ungli Mal. Ungli Mal had been a bandit in the time of the Buddha, a man so depraved that he wore the fingers of his victims as a garland around his neck. The Buddha was the only man he waylaid, who was unafraid of death who faced him empty-handed with compassion. Eventually, Ungli Mal, despite all he had been, became a Buddhist monk and a great teacher. If you are trying to persuade me that Hirasor has become a saint, I said between clenched teeth, 
You must think me naive indeed. He is still the man who butchered millions, destroyed countless worlds. He will not escape justice. That was not the point of my story, Chituri said, rather sadly. I was glad not to see his face again. Oblivion, they say, is another word for hell. A bleak world, barely habitable. It was once known as Dilasha and was considered a reasonable candidate for terraforming. Those hopes have long since vanished. The habitable zones are deserts, subject to violent dust storms, and all indigenous life is primitive, bacterial, algal, and inimical to coexisting with humans. But all this does not explain why the planet Oblivion is hell. Oblivion earns its name because those who stay there long enough slowly lose their minds. It begins with forgetting and slips of tongue, peculiar speech disorders, waking terrors, and finally silence. The rescue teams, who first observed the early explorers, consisting of both human and Nakalchi, could only speculate as to why the subjects walked around without apparent purpose, neglecting the basic needs of their bodies, muttering in unknown languages, reacting to things that nobody else could see. The second stage was one of great distress. The subjects howled or whimpered and ran about the compound as though to escape a terrible, invisible enemy. They could still at times respond to their names. They would look up when called, frowning, as though trying to remember who they had been. Sometimes they would weep in the arms of the staff. A terrible, heart-rending weeping it was. The final stage was silence and withdrawal. In this last stage, the sufferers seemed to have completely lost any knowledge of who they were. They did not respond to their names or to instructions. They wandered around with dead eyes, tracing out complicated patterns with their feet. Only three victims had been taken off planet. When removed in the second stage, they would resist with maniacal strength. Both such subjects had met violent death at their own hand. The third had been in the final stage and had simply faded away after removal, although he had been in fine shape physically. However, an autopsy had revealed a bizarre restructuring of his brain that no scientist had yet explained. So, now all that is left of the original settlement on Oblivion is a study center where the remaining subjects are incarcerated. Regulations decree that nobody can stay on Oblivion for more than 110 local days. It's after that that most people seem to start losing their minds, although in some rare cases 20 days is enough. There are theories, volatile compounds containing nanoorganisms that are slowly released by the soil, pervading everything, that act like psychotropic drugs, low-frequency sound waves that boom through the barren hills, disturbing the inner functioning of the body, peculiar surges in radioactive emissions in the environs, but none of these are adequate explanations. Oblivion remains a mystery. So I came at last to Oblivion to the final confrontation. It was a fitting place for a last stand. The dome town was mostly uninhabited, the empty buildings testament to the defeated hopes of the original settlers. The insane were housed in a primitive building built around a dusty compound. The skeleton crew that had managed the place for the last shift was irritable and moody, waiting to be taken off planet in a week, and the few scientists looked depressed and preoccupied. Nobody seemed interested in talking with me, despite the fact that I was apparently a representative of a rich philanthropist considering a major donation. Everyone seemed curiously lacking in vitality or enthusiasm, as though under the influence of some drug. Within a few hours of my stay there, I, too, felt a distinct mental lethargy, punctuated by spikes of nervousness and paranoia. The medic who examined me, a thin, dark, spidery man, was pessimistic. "'You're one of those who will succumb first, he said, not without some relish. "'This is a terrible place. Affects some people much more quickly than others. Get out while you can, or you'll be joining them.' He waved his long fingers toward the observation window behind him. There was something ghoulish about the way he stood watching the crazies describing for me in painful detail every stage of the terrible sickness. The afflicted, men, women, most of them half-naked, wandered aimlessly around the yard, 
muttering, and drawing patterns in the dust with their feet. Some wailed incessantly, beating their chests, while others tore at their clothes. Still others sat very quietly on the ground, looking straight ahead of them with blank eyes. I felt as though their pain and confusion was somehow connected to me, that theirs was a sorrow that was drawing me in slowly. The dust patterns on the ground, the subject of much debate among the scientists, seemed almost to make sense, as though they were the script of a language I had known and forgotten. I shivered and looked away. The medic was right. I couldn't stay here long. But when I looked back into the compound, there was Hirasor. He came into the yard through a door in the wall. A tall man, he now walked with a slight shuffle. He sat down on an unoccupied bench and watched the sufferers. I couldn't see his face clearly, but the gait and the arrogant set of the shoulders was unmistakable. My heart started hammering. That's the other visitor, the medic said, noting the slight start I gave. Claims to be interested in our subjects, but he seems to have problems of his own. He didn't explain. Hirosaur sat for a while, then moved his hands upward in a gesture that I didn't recognize, and returned through the door, which shut behind him. I went into my narrow cell of a room to make my plans. It was hard to think clearly. Blood, revenge, murder, the sufferings of those who had lost to Hirosaur, my own long years of trailing him, giving up love and life for this one obsession. These thoughts reverberated in my mind. When I closed my eyes, I saw Hirosaur's face, or the harvester's toothed mouth. When I opened them, I saw the stark, claustrophobic room, and the view from the skylight of a yellow dust plume over the dome. The air smelled faintly of dust and burning. I knew then that Hirosaur had chosen wisely. I didn't know to what extent he, as an Akalchi, and a hardened one at that, would be affected by the place, but he had gambled on it being a disadvantage for me. The next day there was a message from him, an audio, giving me the location of his rooms, and telling me that he would let me know when I should come, when Suvarna was not around. Bring your weapons, he said. This is the last memory fragment, the one most fresh in my mind. I had been waiting for days. Hirosor and I would make an appointment, then he would abruptly cancel it because Suvarna had returned unexpectedly to their quarters. He did not want her to be in the way. I could sense that, like me, he wanted our final confrontation to be between us alone. At times I suspected that he was playing with me, that I should be more circumspect, perhaps induce someone to spy on him. But this was not the time to play detective. It was fitting that at the end there should be no tricks and subterfuges, only him and me face to face at last. There was no doubt that he was wearing me down, however. I lay restlessly in my room, plagued by headaches and nightmares. I started at every sound, and the dust devils visible from my window became fiery-eyed monsters. Thus Hirosor and I waited, like illicit lovers, for the final assignation. Then his summons came. I will remember that last journey to the end of my days. My armor-plated body, all weapons systems readied the dull booming pain in my head keeping time with my footsteps, the walk through the complex, through which the other inhabitants seemed to float like ghosts, everything tinged faintly with red, as though the world itself is rusting, the stairs, dusted with oblivion's fine grit, the door, a white rectangle that scans me with a round eye and opens in silence. Inside is a sparsely furnished receiving room. On a low divan sits a woman, her hair cascades over her shoulders in black waves. Her legs are crossed, her long, tapering, steel-tipped fingers folded over one knee. Her eyes are a metallic dark gray, multifaceted, like the eyes of moths. A quick blink in the direction of the door behind me, and it shuts. Greeting, Suvarna, I say, as calmly as I can, after the first heart-stopping moment. Where's Hirosor? Out, she says. I intercepted some of his messages to you. It was I who sent you the last one. I am standing before her, outwardly calm, inwardly berating myself for my foolishness. Her Nakalchi eyes track every move I might make, every muscle twitch. My business is with Hirosor, I say. I am determined that at the end of it all she will not stand between Hirosor and I. But she will be hard to kill. 
I don't think you understand, she says, rising. She's an impressive woman, tall, all teeth and muscle, but also beautiful. This may be a game for you and him, she says, but my job is to keep him alive. If it hadn't been for you, he wouldn't have taken to planet hopping. He wouldn't have found this accursed place. It's time we stopped playing, Vikram, or whatever you are calling yourself now. I can sense her coming alive, the way a killer weapon comes alive when it finds its target. Through the fog in my brain it occurs to me that Suvarna might be Hirasor's sibling, birthed by the same mother machine. I say the word. What? she says. She laughs. Are you trying to distract me with nonsense? So it means nothing to her. She raises a fingertip. The next moment my alarm system begins to scream coordinates and trajectories. I leap aside just as a spot on the wall behind me blackens with heat. I remember that she likes to play. If only you'd left us alone, she says, watching me. Hirasor is old and sated now, Vikram. All he wants, I want, is to be left in peace. Don't give me this old man nonsense, I say breathlessly. I know Hirasor is an Akalchi. He could live for hundreds of years. She stares at me, the perfect mouth hanging slack with surprise. I tongue a mouth dart, but she recovers quickly, catching it in midair with a burst of flame. It falls smoking to the floor. How did you find out? Before I can answer, a door opens behind her. I see real terror on her face, then, as Hirasor walks into the room. Except for the slight shuffle, he still walks tall, like Ravan Tenheads. Get out, she tells him, covering the ground between them in long strides, watching me all the time. I'll deal with him. He gives her a glance of pure hatred. Let me fight my battles, will you? A look passes between them, and I see in that instant that what they had once shared has turned bitter, that they are locked in their relationship out of habit and necessity rather than passion, hating each other and yet unable to let go. I study him as they glare at each other. One of her eyes is still tracking me. Now that I see him at close range, I am shocked by his appearance, how he has fallen. All that is left of his affectations is the silk tunic with the embroidered collar. His hair is ragged and unkempt, and his face, lean and aristocratic as a prize hound's, is covered with scars. His burning dark eyes look out as though from a cage. I remember those eyes. I remember him peering down at me from the harvester's face. Silently I mouth the word, waiting until he will be in my power. He has turned toward me. He holds out his hands to show that they are empty. I want to die, he says. Even here, I can't get rid of, I can't go on. I have a perfect memory. I remember everything I have ever done, whether awake or in my dreams. All I want now is death, at your hands. No, no, Suvarna says to him. Don't talk like that. I won't let anyone kill you. She holds his arm, trying to pull him away. Her voice rises in a scream. Don't let him kill you. I'll be all alone. She thinks it will get better with time, he says to me, ignoring her. But I want to end it more than anything. I have had not a moment, not one moment of peace. Six times I tried to kill myself, and six times she prevented me. He turns to her. Foolish, Suvarna. We are all, all alone. I can't allow you to interfere this time. Now go away and let me die. He pushes her suddenly and violently, throwing her across the room. She lies against the far wall in a huddle, staring at him with wide, shocked eyes. Death is not what I had in mind, I say, coming closer. Death would be too good for you, Hirasor. I bring my armored hands up to his throat. He stands in front of me, not resisting, waiting. For a moment I think it is the old dream again, him and me at each other's throats at the world's end, but it is all going wrong. His wild eyes beg me for death. He shudders violently. I dig my claws into his neck, feel the pulse of the machine that he is, prepare myself to rip him half to death, to say the word that will condemn him to perpetual hell, a hair's breadth short of death. Please, please hurry. He begs, half choking, not understanding what it is I am giving him. I cannot do it, this pathetic being, Hirasor, destroyer of worlds. He is no adversary. He sickens me. Besides, he is in hell already, without my help. 
I let my hands fall. Live, then, I say angrily, backing toward the door. His nostrils flare, his eyes widen. He begins a terrible, high-pitched keening, clawing with his hands at his face and hair. Suvarna, who seems to have forgotten about me, has stumbled to her feet and is by his side in an instant. She puts her long arms around him. You are safe now, she says, crooning, putting her red lips to his hair. I'll take care of him later. Nobody will take you away from me. Let me go, Suvarna, he weeps. Leave me here on oblivion. Leave me alone. As he thrashes in her arms, she says it, loudly and clearly, the word which I had let slip in one panicked moment. He becomes limp in her arms, his horrified gaze locked on hers. She lets him down gently on the divan. She will not be alone now. She will have the perpetually suffering Hirasor to care for all her life. I shoot him once, in the chest. She falls in a heap by his side, screaming and cursing. Over the wreck of his body, the slow and certain ebbing of his consciousness, I begin to speak the words of passing. Shanti, no then ke agaman, na duk na dard. And I walk out of the room. Hirosor got his freedom, but what of me, the man-woman with a hundred aliases, none of which were rum, after all? There I was, boarding the first shuttle out of oblivion, cheated of true victory at the end, my life's purpose lost. I had been tempted to stay on, to live with the crazies, and let my mind descend into chaos— but the people there wouldn't let me. They seemed to think Suvarna had killed Hirasor. Nobody cared to connect me directly with the crime, but his violent death was enough for them to send the stranger packing. I don't know what happened to Suvarna. I never saw her again. At the first opportunity, I switched from the shuttle to a passenger ship that made numerous stops on various inhabited worlds, thinking I might go back to my last residence on the planet Manaus. But when it came time to disembark, I couldn't manage to do it. I am still on the ship, waiting until the impulse comes, if it ever will, to step out under the skies of a new world and begin another life. What has passed from my life, my personal Ramayan, comes back to me in tattered little pieces, pages torn from a book, burning, blowing in the wind, like patterns drawn in the dust, half familiar, a language once understood, then forgotten. Here are some things I have discovered about myself. I have no pleasure in life. I like nothing. Definitely not absinthe or roses. I want to die, but a curious inertia keeps me from it. The things of the world seem heavy, and time slow. I still have nightmares about the burning woman. Sometimes I dream that Danu has a mantra that will bring me peace, and I am looking for her in the tunnels of a dying city, its walls collapsing around me, but she is nowhere to be found. I never dream of Hirasor, except as a presence behind my consciousness, like a second pair of eyes, a faint ghost, a memory. There are moments when I wonder what led a first-generation Akalchi to become a monster. The Ramayan says that even Ravan was once a good man, before he fell prey to hubris and lost his way. If legend is to be believed, there is a cave on some abandoned planet where copies of the first-generation Akalchis are hidden. Were I to come across it, would I find Hirasor's duplicate in an ice-cold crypt, dreaming, innocent as a child? Lately I have begun to let myself remember that last climactic moment of my encounter with Hirasor. I shot my Ravan, I tell myself trying to infuse into my mind a sense of victory, despite the loss of the chance for true revenge. But I no longer know what any of those words mean. Victory, revenge. Still, there is a solidity about that moment, when I shot him, small though it is against the backdrop of all the years I've lived. That moment, it feels as tangible as a key held in the hand. What doors it might open, I do not know, although I am certain that Sita does not wait behind any of them. Perhaps it is enough that it tells me there are doors. The House Left Empty Robert Reed Robert Reed, www.robertreedwriter.com, lives in Nebraska with his wife and daughter and is a Nebraska science fiction renaissance of one. His is the most prolific SF writer of high-quality short fiction writing today. 
he has had stories appear in at least one of the annual Year's Best anthologies in every year since 1992. He has had 11 novels published, starting with The Lee Shore in 1987 and most recently The Well of Stars in 2004. He has had over 180 shorter works published in a variety of magazines and anthologies. Eleven of those stories were published in The Dragons of Spring Place, 1999, and twelve more in his second collection, The Cuckoo's Boys, 2005. He is perhaps most famous for his Marrow Universe, novels and stories that take place in a huge, ancient, space-faring environment. He is currently working on quite a lot, including a YA novel using his Marrow Universe. He published at least five stories worthy of being in a year's best volume in 2008. The House Left Empty was published in Asimov's. It is set in a dystopian future after the disintegration of most large-scale government. A package containing a strange machine arrives for a scientist gone elsewhere from what is left of the government. The truck was long and white, with a name I didn't recognize stenciled on the side. But that doesn't mean much, what with new delivery services springing up every other day. It was the details I noticed, and I've always been good with details. No serious business would call itself something as drab as rapid distribution. The truck's body had been grown from a top-notch Ford Chevy schematic, tires woven from pricey diamond-studded glass. But the machine acted heavier than I expected, as if somebody had thrown extra steel and aluminum into the recipe just to help a pair of comatose industries. Instead of a joystick, the driver was holding on to a heavily padded, old-fashioned steering wheel, and he was locked in place with three fat seat belts, a cumbersome buckle stuck over his poor groin. Standard federal issue, fancy and inefficient. And not for the first time, I wondered why we still pretend to pay taxes to the remnants of our once national government. It was mid-morning, I was sitting in my living room, considering my options for the rest of the day. My roof tiles were clean, house batteries already charged, the extra juice feeding into the SG's communal bank. The factory inside my garage had its marching orders, facsimile milk and bananas, a new garden hose, and a dozen pairs of socks. And it certainly didn't want my help with those chores. I could have been out in my yard, but last night's downpour had left the ground too soggy to work. I could attack one of the six or seven books I'd been wrestling with lately, or go online, on some errand sure to lead to a hundred distractions. But with the early warm weather, what I was thinking about was a bike ride. I have four fresh-grown bikes, each designed for a different kind of wandering, but even a decision that simple requires some careful, lazy consideration. Then the delivery truck drove past my house. I heard the bang when it hit the pothole up the street and then the long white body swung into view. I immediately spotted the uniformed driver clinging to his steering wheel, trying to read the number that I'd painted beside my front door. He was young and definitely nervous, which was only natural, since he obviously didn't know RSG. But he saw something worthwhile, pulling up alongside the far curb and parking. The uniform was tan and unmemorable. A clipboard rested on his lap, with a finger leading the way, he reread the address that he was searching for. Then he glanced back up the street. His sliding door was pulled open, but the crash harness wouldn't let him get a good look. So he killed the engine and punched the buckle and climbed down, carrying the clipboard in one hand and noticing me as he strode past my window. I considered waving, but decided otherwise. The delivery man disappeared for a couple minutes. I wanted to watch him trying to do his job but my instincts are usually wiser in these matters, and they told me to do nothing, just sit and wait, guessing that he'd come looking for me eventually, which he did. If anything, the poor guy was more nervous than before, and deep inside, a little angry. He didn't want to be here. He was having real troubles with our streets and numbers. My guess then, and still, is that he was using a badly compromised database. Not an unlikely explanation, what with the EMP blasts over Washington and New York, followed by the grand meltdown of the original Internet. Of course, he could have been hunting for me, but that seemed unlikely, and maybe I didn't want to be found. Climbing back into his truck, 
He turned on the engine with his thumbprint and a keypad. I couldn't hear the A.I.'s warning voice, but judging by the guy's body language, he didn't want to bother with any damned harness. Real quick, he looked in through my window, into my house, straight at me, sitting on my black facsimile leather sofa. Then he drove up to the next corner and turned and came back again, ending up parked two doors west of me. This time I got up off the sofa and watched. His best guess was that the smallest house on my street was the one he wanted. Several minutes were invested in ringing the bell while knocking harder and harder at the old front door. Then, after giving the window blinds a long study, he kneeled to look down into the window well, trying to decide if someone was lurking in the cool, damp basement. Nobody was. With no other choice, he finally stood and walked my way, sucking at his teeth, one of his hands beating at the clipboard. I went into the bedroom and waited. When the bell rang, I waited some more, just to make him wonder if he had seen me in the first place. Then I opened the door and said, Yeah? without unlatching the storm. What's up? The guy was older than I'd first guessed, and up close, he looked like the sort who's usually sharpened together. Organization mattered to this man. He didn't approve of mix-ups, but he'd been in this delivery game long enough to recognize trouble when it had its jaws around him. Sorry to bother you, sir. No problem. But can I ask, do you know your neighbors? A few of them. He glanced down at the clipboard's display, just to be sure before saying, Penderlick? No. Ivan Penderlick? What's that first name? Ivan? He said hopefully. No. I shook my head. Doesn't ring any bell. This wasn't the news he was hoping for. But maybe I've seen him, I mentioned. What's this Ivan guy look like? That could be a perfectly natural question. But the delivery man had to shake his head, admitting they didn't give me any photo. The meltdown's first targets were the federal servers. That's when I opened the storm door, proving that I trusted the man. Okay, what address are you chasing? 4744 Mayapple Lane, he read out loud. Are you 4754 Mayapple? That's the old system. I realize that, sir. We pulled out of the city six years ago. I reported, new names for our streets and new numbers. He flinched, as if his belly ached. Then I had to ask, you from around here? Yes, sir. As liars go, he was awful. I asked, which SG do you belong to? He offered a random name. I nodded. How's life up there? Fine. Lying made him squirm. Looking at the clipboard, he asked, were you once 4754 Mayapple? I was, I said. The house two doors down? That ranch house? Was it 4744? No, I don't think so. You don't think so? I'm pretty sure it wasn't. Sorry. Minor league mix-ups happened all too often. I could tell from the delivery man's stooped shoulders and the hard-chewed lower lip. Call out for help, I suggested. Our cell tower can get you anywhere in the world, if you're patient. But he didn't want that. Unless his hair caught fire, he wouldn't involve his bosses. Mayapple was a short street, I mentioned. Go west, on the other side of the park, and you'd pick it up again. Of course, that's a different SG now. The street's got a new name. I don't remember what. But I'd bet anything there's a house waiting. Some place that used to be 3744 Mayapple. Could that be your answer? Your first four is actually a three instead? An unlikely explanation, yet he had to nod and hope. But then, as he turned away, he thought to ask, The name Penderlick doesn't mean anything to you? Anything at all? Sorry, no. Unlike that delivery man, I am a superb liar. Our self-governing district is one of the best in the area. At least, we like to think so. About 500 homes stand on this side of the park, along with two bars and a public hall, an automated health clinic and a human dentist, plus a cell tower on talking terms to 20 others, and one big shop that can grow almost anything you can't, and one tiny but very useful service station that not only has liquor to sell on the average day, but can keep almost any machine functioning. One of the station mechanics lives one street over from me. We're friends, maybe good friends, but that wasn't the reason I half ran to his front door. 
His name is Jack, but everybody knows him as Gus. What do you think he was doing here? Gus asked me. Bringing something special, I allowed. I mean, if you're the feds and you're going to send out an entire truck just for Ivan, well, it's going to be an important shipment, whatever it is. Gus was a tough old gentleman who liked his hair short and his tattoos prominently displayed. Nodding, he asked, Have you seen our neighbor lately? Ivan was never my neighbor. I took over my present house a couple years after he moved out of his. But has he been around lately? Gus asked. Not since he cut his grass last year, I allowed. Early November, maybe. It was March, now. A delivery, huh? From Rapid Distribution. Yeah, that's going to be a government name. Gus was grinning. Didn't I tell you? Ivan was important back when. You said so. You do like I told you. Search out his name. When I was a kid, the internet was simple and quick. But that was before the EMP blasts and the meltdown. Databases aren't just corrupted nowadays. AI parasites are still running wild, producing lies and their own security barriers. What I could be sure of was a string of unreadable papers and a few tiny news items. Not much information, maybe, but enough to make me accept the idea that my almost neighbor had once been a heavyweight in the world of science. Governmental science, to be precise. How'd Ivan look last time you saw him? Okay, I guess. How was his weight? He looked skinny, I admitted. Cancer skinny or fit skinny? I couldn't remember. Gus used to be friendly with the old Ph.D. Of course, you mentioned that Ivan lives with his daughter now. The daughter, is it? Gus knew me well enough to laugh. You didn't tell him, did you? It slipped my mind. He threw me a suspicious stare. And is there some compelling reason why you came racing over here two minutes before I'm supposed to go to work? That delivery man will come back again, I promised. If the daughter isn't in their files, sure. Somebody's going to make a couple more stabs to deliver the package, whatever it is. I didn't tell him that the house was empty. What if he shows and finds an old guy sitting on the porch of that house, enjoying the spring sun? I'm supposed to be Ivan? Sure. What if it's valuable, this delivery is? Well, then, I said, I guess that depends on how valuable valuable is, if you know what I mean. I'm not old, but I'm old enough to remember when the world felt enormous and everybody was busy buying crap and selling crap, using their profits to move fast across the globe. In those times, life was fat and sweet and perfectly reasonable. Why shouldn't seven billion souls fight for their slice of the endless well? But still, not everybody agreed with the plan. Environmentalists had valid points. Apocalyptic religions had a strong urge toward mayhem. Some governments tried cracking down on all kinds of enemies, real and otherwise. And that spawned some tough-minded groups that wanted to remake the world along any of a hundred different lines. Our past leaders made some spectacularly lousy decisions, and those decisions led to some brutal years. But it wasn't all just chaos and famine and economic collapse. Good things happened while I was a young man, like the cheap black tiles that every roof wears today, supplying enough electricity to keep people lit up and comfortable, like the engineered bugs that swim inside everybody's biotank, cleaning our water better than any of the defunct sewage systems ever could and the nanological factories that an average guy can assemble inside his garage, using them to grow and harvest most of the possessions that he could possibly need, including respectable food and fashionable clothes, carbon-hulled bicycles, and computers that haven't required improvement for the last ten years. The old nation-states are mangled. But without any burning need, nobody seems eager to resurrect what used to be. The old communications and spy satellites have been lost, destroyed by the space debris and radioactive residues stuck in orbit. There are days when I think that it would make sense to reconstitute that old network, but there just aren't enough hands or money, at least for the time being. A few physical commodities still demand physical transportation. Fancy products protected by the best patents or their own innate complexities one-of-a-kind items with deep sentimental attachments, and certain rare raw materials. 
but I don't usually hunger for vials of iridium or a kidney grown in some distant vat. My needs are more than being met by my patch of dirt and my black rooftop. That old world was gigantic, but mine is small. Five hundred houses and a slice of parkland, plus the old, mostly empty roads that cut through our little nation, and the pipes and gas mains eroding away under our feet. As an SG, we take care of ourselves. We have laws and we have conventions and routes that feuding parties can use if they can't answer their troubles privately. We have a good school for the few kids getting born these days. We even have a system for helping people suffering through a stretch of lousy luck. Which is why nobody remembers the last time anybody in our little nation had to go hungry or feel cold. But that doesn't mean we can quit worrying about bad times. While we sat on Ivan's front steps, I gave Gus one half of a freshly cultured facsimile orange, and as we sucked on the sweet juice, we discussed the latest news from places that seemed as distant as the far side of the moon. Ivan's house was the oldest and least impressive on the block, a shabby ranch-style home wearing asphalt roof tiles and aluminum siding. What interested me about his property was the lot itself, double-sized and most of it hidden from the street. The backyard was long and sunny, and I'd walked its green grass enough times to feel sure that the ground was rich, uncontaminated by any careless excavations over the past century. My ground is the opposite. Fill earth clay, packed down by machines and chronic abuse. And even though our facsimile foods are nutritious and halfway tasty, everybody enjoys the real tomatoes and squash and raspberries that we grow every summer. I mentioned the long yard to Gus, and not for the first time. It would be nice, he agreed, stuffing the orange rind into the pocket where he always kept his compostables. We could build a community garden, maybe. It'd help people keep busy and happy. People were already happy. This would just add to our reasons. I hear a truck, he said, tipping his head now. A low, powerful rumble was approaching. We were a couple blocks from the main arterial, but without traffic sounds carried. I stood. Good luck, Gus. Ivan, he corrected. Ivan, yeah. My ground was too wet to work but that's what I was pretending to do when the white truck drove past. I had a shovel in my hand, eyes staring at a lump of clayish mud. If the driver looked at me, I didn't see it. This time, the delivery man knew exactly where he was going. I didn't look up until I heard the two men talking. At a distance, words didn't carry, but I could tell one of them was nervous and the other was confident. One of them was a long way from home, while the other looked as if he belonged nowhere else in the world but lounging on that front porch. The driver must have asked for identification, leading Gus to give some story about not having any. Who needs a driver's license in a world where people rarely travel? The delivery man probably heard that excuse every day, but there were rules. He couldn't just give what he had to anybody, could he? Then I made out the loud, certain words. Well, I am Ivan Penderlick. Just ask anybody. I stood there, waiting to be asked. My plan was to say, Oh, this is Ivan, what's his name? I don't talk to the guy much, you see. I just knew him as the professor. But the delivery man didn't want to bother with witnesses. He probably had a sense for when locals didn't approve of the old government, which was another hazard in his daily duties, I would think. All he wanted was a little reassurance. Gus nodded pretending to understand. Then he opened the front door that we had jimmied just ten minutes ago. Reaching inside, he pulled out a photograph of himself and his own daughter, and instantly he began spinning a convincing story that might or might not match any sketchy biography that the driver was carrying with him. Good enough, was the verdict. The driver vanished inside his truck, then returned with a dark wooden box just big enough and just heavy enough to require both arms to carry it. At first, Gus refused to accept the delivery. I watched him demanding identification before he signed for anything. How else would he know this was on the up and up? His complaining won a hard stare, but then several documents were shown, and with no small amount of relief, the two men parted, each thrilled by the prospect of never seeing the other again. 
burning booze, the truck left for its next delivery somewhere in the wilderness that used to be the United States. Gus set the box on the front steps, using a screwdriver to pry up a few big staples. I walked toward him. Part of me expected an explosion, though I can't tell you why. Mostly I was hoping for something with value, something that could offer an ambitious man some leverage. But there was no way I would have expected the hunk of machinery Gus found wrapped inside a sleeve of aerogel, or the simple note stuck under the lid. Ivan, in a better world, this would be where it belongs. I stared at the device, not sure what to think. Know what you're seeing? my friend asked. No, I admitted. What? A starship, the older man remarked. Then he sat on the stairs, drooping as if weak. Who would have believed it, huh? What we had in our hands was a model, I told myself, a mock-up. Something slapped together in an old-style machine shop, using materials that might look and feel genuine, but was built for no other purpose than to convince visiting senators and the captains of industry that such wonders were possible if only they would throw so many billions toward this glorious, astonishing future. It isn't real, I said. Gus made soft, doubting sounds. Somebody found it on a shelf somewhere. I was piecing together a believable story. Somebody who remembers Ivan and thought the old man would appreciate the gift. Except, said Gus, except what? He handed the starship to me and closed the empty box. And after running a mechanic's thick hand along one edge, he mentioned, This isn't just a run-of-the-mill packing crate. It was a walnut box. A nice box, sure. Then he turned it ninety degrees, revealing a small brass plaque that identified the contents as being number 18 in an initial culture of 63. That's exactly how many starships they made, he told me. The number was familiar, but I had to ask, why 63? Our 21 closest star systems were targeted, he explained. The railgun was supposed to launch three of these wonders at each of them. The ball in my hands was black and slick, a little bigger than a basketball, and heavier than seemed natural. When I was a kid, I'd gone bowling once or twice. This ball was heavier than those. There were a lot of tiny holes and a couple large pits, and I thought I could see where fins and limbs might pop out or unfold. Of course the starship was a model. Anything else was too incredible. But just the idea that it might be real made me hold it carefully, but away from my body, away from my groin. It won't be radioactive, Gus said. They never bothered fueling things. I'm practically sure of it, if you say so. I handed it back to him. But he didn't hug the ball either, I noticed. So, I said, do you know where the daughter lives? Gus didn't seem to hear me. Even if this is a model, I mentioned, Ivan's going to be thrilled to get it, which could earn me some goodwill points in the process. I know, said Gus. Where the daughter lives? That too. But I just figured how to see if this is real or not. He was holding the mystery with both hands, and after showing me a little smile, the kind of grin a wicked boy uses with his best body, Gus gave a grunt and flung our treasure straight ahead. I wasn't ready. Stunned, I watched it climb in a high arc before dropping to the sidewalk, delivering a terrific blow that I heard and felt, leaving the gray concrete chipped and the starship rolling with a certain majesty over the curb and out into the street. I ran our treasure down, ready to be angry. But except for a little dust to wipe away, the starship hadn't noticed any of the abuse. Is that enough proof? I asked doubtfully. Unless you've got a sophisticated materials lab tucked in your basement somewhere. I'll check. He laughed. Then he said, The daughter lives in the old High Park area. I got the original address written down somewhere. And I had a stack of maps pulled out of old phone books. Give us enough time, and we'd probably be able to find the right front door. I made noise about getting one of the bikes and my big trailer. Gus set the starship back into its aerogel sleeve and then into the box. Then he closed the lid and shook his head, remarking to me, With a supremely important occasion like this, I believe we should drive. Our SG has some community cars and small trucks. 
while a few households have their own little putt-putts. Even if you don't drive much, it's halfway easy to keep your vehicle working, what with a factory in every garage and experts like us to putter in the gaps. My friend had a certain client in mind, and while I found my best map of the old city and packed a lunch for each of us, he wandered around the corner to ask one very big favor. By the time I stepped outside again, he was waiting at the end of the drive, sitting behind the joystick of a 2021 Ferrari. That was Mr. Bleakin's baby, manufactured in his own garage by Nanologicals, steered along by some semi-official schematics, fed nothing but pot metals and stolen pipes, and a lot of plastic trash left over from the last century. If we're going to ride with the starship, Gus pointed out, we should have a halfway appropriate vehicle. We weren't going to get twenty miles to the gallon of alcohol, but just the power of that machine made this into a wondrous adventure. With our prize stowed in the tiny trunk, I asked, So what if number eighteen is genuine? Gus pushed the joystick forward, and in an instant we were sprinting out into the wide, empty street. You hear me? I asked. Most of the time. I waited. I was expecting that question, he admitted. Glad to be predictable. The first big intersection was marked with stop signs, but even at a distance it was easy to see that nobody was coming. Gus accelerated and blew through, but then as soon as we rolled out of our SG, he throttled back to what was probably a quick but legal speed. So, what if? I started asking again. You think we should beg for more? More than just ground for our crops? Maybe. If you think about how much money went to making sixty-three of these machines— don't forget the railgun, Gus mentioned. Before the project ended, they had most of the pieces in orbit, along with enough solar panels to light up half of the United States. You don't hear those two words much anymore, United States. Do you know how this probe would have worked? He asked me. I was watching houses slipping past, and then all at once there was nothing but empty businesses, a strip mall, a couple of abandoned service stations, and then another strip mall, this one with a couple of stores that might have been occupied, a hair-cutting place and some kind of pet store, two little traces of commerce tucked into the new world order. I didn't often come this way when I biked. There were prettier, easier routes. But I could see where some people would pay for a good barber. As for pets, cats were running free everywhere, but not many dogs or hamsters or parakeets either. So until we can grow critters like them in our garages and basements, shops like that would survive. The railgun would have fired our probe like a cannonball, I answered, which is one reason why it has to be tough. Gus explained, that shell is almost unbreakable, and the guts too, because of the crushing G-forces. I had known Gus for years, but he was revealing interests that I had never suspected. How long would it have taken? I asked, testing him to reach the target star a few centuries. What a crazy, crazy project. That's what I thought, but I was careful not to be too honest. Three probes to each star system, each one talking to each other too, and occasionally shouting back to us. He scratched his chin, adding, they would have saved most of their energy for those few days when they'd fly past their targets. Fly past? You mean they weren't going into orbit or anything? Too much momentum. No engines to slow them down. Gus paused for a moment, and then asked, Do I turn here? Left, I think? The Ferrari changed its momentum without complaint. I had to say, it seems a huge waste. What? Throwing half a trillion dollars or whatever it was at the stars, and getting nothing out of it but a quick look-see? With a hard voice, he said, You're young. I don't feel that young anymore, but I asked, So what? You don't remember how things were. Gus shrugged and gave a big sigh before adding, The probe couldn't go into orbit, but do you know what's inside that black ball? I said, No. I looked down at the map and said, Right, turn here, right. We were cruising up a fresh street. Some of the houses were abandoned. No, most of them were. Now I remembered another reason why I never came this way on my bike. Political troubles in a couple SGs had gotten out of hand. 
In the end, the emergency council dispatched police to mash down the troubles, teaching all the parties to act nice. What's inside the black ball? I asked, prompting him. The original nanachines, he told me, which I halfway remembered, maybe. Tiny bits of diamond dust filled with devices and knowledge. He came to another intersection. Straight? Looks like. I had the old address circled on the yellowed map. Anyway, said Gus, those bits of dust would have been squirted free long before the star was reached. They had tiny, tiny parachutes that would have opened. Light sails, really. The sunlight would have killed their velocity down to where they would start to drift. Each probe carried a few thousand of those amazing little devices. And if one or two landed on a useful asteroid, they would have come awake and started eating sunlight for energy, feed on rock, and divide themselves a million, million times. And eventually, we would have a large, loud, automated base permanently on station, screaming back at us. In a few centuries' time, I said. He nodded. As good as our shops are, as much crap as we can make from nothing but trash and orange peels, the marvels sleeping in that pregnant machine make our tools look like stone knives and flintlock pistols. Which is when I pointed out, so maybe this starship thing is worth a whole lot. Gus slowed the car and then looked over at me. I'm just mentioning the obvious, I said. And for the first and only time, Gus told me, I like you, Josh, I do. But that doesn't mean I have illusions when it comes to your nature, or infinite patience with your scheming either. Understood? I gave a nod. Then he shoved the joystick forward, pressing me hard, into the rich, fake leather of the seat. It was easy to see why old Ivan abandoned his little house to live with his daughter. Every building standing just outside her large SG had been torn down, and people with resources and a lot to lose had built themselves a wall with the rubble, a tall, thick, castle-worthy wall made from the scavenged bricks and stone, concrete blocks and two-by-fours. I'd heard stories about High Park, but until that moment I hadn't bothered coming up this way. At least twenty signs warned off the curious and uninvited. There was only one entranceway that we could find, and it was guarded by military-grade robots and a tall titanium gate. We parked outside and approaching on foot, me walking a half-step behind Gus. Weapons at the ready, the robots studied our faces while searching their databases for any useful clues to our identities and natures. I decided to let my friend do the talking. Quietly, gently, Gus explained that an important package had been delivered to the wrong address, and, if possible, would they please inform Ivan Penderlick that his old neighbors had come to pay their respects? A call was made on our behalf. After what seemed like an hour, the gate unlocked with a sharp thunk, and we were told to leave our vehicle where it was. Only our bodies and the package would be allowed inside the compound. There are SGs, and there are SGs. No doubt this was the best one I'd ever seen. Every house was big and well-maintained, sitting in the middle of huge lawns that were covered with greenhouses and extra solar panels, towering windmills and enough cell phone antennas to keep every resident connected to the world at the same time. The house that we wanted was wearing a richer and blacker and much more efficient brand of solar paneling. The greenhouses were top of the line, too. Of course, I could always build my own greenhouses, but without the power for climate control, the plants would freeze during the cold winter nights, and come summer, when the sun was its best, everything inside the transparent structures would flash fry. Stopping on the front walk, I stared at red tomatoes begging to be picked. Carrying the walnut box, Gus reached the front door before me, and he said, Ma'am, before turning back to me, saying, Come on, Josh, we're expected. The daughter was Gus's age, give or take but she didn't look like the tattoo kind of gal. The woman said, My father's sleeping now. Could I get you gentlemen something to drink? Gus said, Water. I said the same, adding, Thank you, ma'am. She came back with a pitcher filled with ice water and three tall glasses, and once everybody was sitting politely, she asked if she could see what was inside the mysterious box. Gus handled the unveiling. 
I watched the lady's face. All it took was a glance, and she knew what she was seeing. Her dark eyes grew big, and the mouth opened for a long moment, empty of words, but obviously impressed. Then Gus said, We'd like your father to have this, naturally. She didn't seem to hear him. With a slow nod, she asked, Exactly how did you come by this object? I jumped in, telling the story quickly, passing over details that might make us out to be in the wrong. At the end of the story, she sighed. Then she heard a sound that neither of us had noticed. Suddenly she stood up and said, Dad's awake now. Just a minute, please. We were left alone for a couple of minutes. But I had the strong feeling that various eyes, electronic and otherwise, were keeping watch over us. When the daughter returned, a skeletal figure was walking at her side, guided along by one of her hands, and a smooth, slow voice that kept telling him, This way, Dad. This way. This way. Winter had transformed old Ivan. He was a shell. He was wasted and vacant and simple, sitting where he was told to sit, and looking down into the box only when his daughter commanded him to do that. For a long moment he stared at the amazing machine that he once helped build. Then he looked up, and with a voice surprisingly strong and passionate, he said, I'm hungry. I want to eat. Sure, Dad. I'll get you something right now. But she didn't do anything. She just sat for another couple moments, staring at the precious object that he hadn't recognized. One last time, I looked at the starship, and then Gus took me by the elbow and took us toward the front door. Anyway, he said to the daughter, it's his, it's yours. Maybe he'll remember it later, she said coolly, without real hope. Then I said, we were hoping, ma'am, hoping that we could earn something for our trouble today. Gus gave me a cutting look. But our hostess seemed pleased. Her suspicions about us had been vindicated. With a suspicious smile, she asked, What would you like? It's about that empty house. I admitted, Yes. And the lot it sits on? I added, As it is, all of that is going to waste. She looked at Gus now. I'm surprised, she admitted. You people could have taken it over, and who would have stopped you? Except it's not ours. Gus allowed. How many times had I dreamed of doing just that? But our SG has its rules, and there's no more getting around them. I should warn you, she mentioned. I promised my dad that as long as he's alive, that house remains his. But when he is gone, I will send word to you, and after that you and your people will be free to do whatever you want with the building and its land. Is that fair? More than fair, Gus agreed. But how about today? I asked. Suddenly both of them were throwing daggers with their eyes, but I just laughed it off, suggesting, what about a sack of fresh tomatoes? Would that be too much trouble, ma'am? For maybe half the drive home, Gus said nothing. I thought he was angry with me. I couldn't take it seriously, but I was thinking of charming words when he broke the silence. Out of nowhere, Gus said, this is what makes me sad and it had nothing to do with me. Think of everything we've got in our lives, he said. The water that we clean for ourselves, the food we grow in our garages, the easy power and the machinery, plus all the independence that comes with the SG life. These aren't tiny blessings, Josh. A century ago, no one was able to stand apart from the rest of the world so completely, so thoroughly. I guess not, I allowed. But there's this big, big house, you see, and it's just sitting empty. Ivan's place isn't big, I reminded him. But then Gus pointed at the sky, shaking his head sadly as he began to speak again. With even the most basic tools, you and I and the rest of our SG could equip our own starship. Not a little ball thrown out of a cannon. No, I'm talking about an asteroid or comet with us safe in the middle starting a 10,000-year voyage to whichever sun we want our descendants to see first. I guess that would work, I allowed. The biggest house of all is the universe, and it's going to waste, Gus said. Then he pushed the joystick forward, pushing the big engine up to where it finally began to come awake. Sometimes I wish that we'd taken a different turn, he called out. Who doesn't think that, I asked, watching our speed pick up the world around us starting to blur.